All right, what is up guys? It is Storm back here with another video and in this one I'm bringing you the full story to the Golden Fox and Naruto story. But before we begin, if you like the content you're seeing, be sure to subscribe, like, and comment. If you want some dope channel merch, the link to that will be down in the description below. And if you want to see more of me, go subscribe to my other channels or go follow me on Twitter and Instagram, which will all be linked down below as well. Oh, and another thing real quick. I started this series about a year ago, and of course my videos have gotten a lot better. So the audio might sound a little bit worse and the thumbnail is obviously going to look worse than what my thumbnails are now. So just bear that in mind, both all that out of the way, why don't we just dive right on in. Naruto's POV. Konoha, the village hidden in the leaves. One of the strongest villages of the five shinobi villages. It has been my home for 12 long years. To others, 12 years may not be a long time. However, only a few people have shouldered the burden that I had to shoulder throughout my life. I, Naruto Uzumaki, was chosen to carry the QB that attacked the village 12 years prior. I often wonder why I was chosen out of so many kids. Was there no other child that the fourth could have placed this curse on? Why me? This is probably the only question that I want answered. It seems that we tend not to get what we want. A couple of months back, the only question that I wanted an answer to was, why was I hated by the adults so much? After Mizuki had informed me that I was the jailer of the strongest of the tailed beasts, it all became clear. The stares, the remarks, were all because of what they thought I was. It seems that the kids in my age group followed their parents' lead by treating me like I was nothing. The pranks, the loud and brash attitude that I displayed was a cry for attention. All I ever wanted was for people to acknowledge my existence. I think that's why Old Man Third never punished me for my many transgressions. He was the only one who knew why I committed those pranks. Being alone is hell, a hell that I do not wish upon anyone. I used to sit in the swing and watch the other kids with their parents, and it would pain me. I wish that I could experience what they had at least once in my life. Well, I guess you could say that Eruka Sensei is like the father I never had. He gives advice and he treats me like I'm somebody. He was even willing to sacrifice his life to save mine. That's the sort of thing a loving father would do. The closest thing I had to a mother is a 50 year old who doesn't look a day over 30. Ren Masunade cares for me deeply. When we first met, I wanted to punch her lights out for disrespecting the old man's sacrifice by saying the position of Hokage wasn't shit. We fought, but she was clearly my better. She seemed as though she could care less about what happened to anyone. However, Jiraiya told me when we got to the village that she had protected me from Orochimaru. He told me that she had taken a sword to the heart. He also informed me that she told Orochimaru that I was going to be Hokage someday. She believed me to protect me from harm. That is something that a mother would do. I'm glad there are at least two people that care for me. I thought that Team 7 would become the family that I always wanted. That, however, was not meant to be. Kakashi Sensei, who wasn't really a sensei, well not to me at least, never showed any interest in me. When I won against Kiba in the tournament, he didn't even congratulate me on my victory. I guess that was reserved for his favorite student. I asked him to train me, but he made up an excuse about how bad my chakra control was. That was the whole reason I asked him to help me, but whatever. I guess training Sasuke was a higher priority. Sakura is no different. It is always Sasuke this and Sasuke that. Even when I saved her from Gara, she assumed it was Sasuke. He told her that it was me, but did I get a thank you? Nope, I got nothing. 
The event that showed that I would never have her was when I dragged Tsunade to heal Sasuke. I saw her at his bedside. To me, it looked like she hadn't left since he was placed there. When Granny healed him and he woke up, she hugged him as if he was the most precious thing ever. It pained me to see that Sasuke had me beat again. This time, he did it without even trying. I never understood Sasuke. Here's a guy who was loved by all throughout the village, yet he chooses to be lonely. He was born with the most feared bloodline limit. He is extremely gifted and has every girl in the village after him. He also had Kakashi train him personally. He had everything and he threw it away all for vengeance. He even shoved the Jidori into my chest. I always saw him as a friend, a rival, a brother. Now all I see is a guy who took the easy way out to obtain power. I promised Sakura that I would bring him back, but I failed to do so. I really did try for her sake. During those four days that I spent recovering in the hospital, I had expected Sakura to visit, but she never did. I will never forget the day that I was released. I would be forever chained by it. Flashback. The villager stares were even colder than before. I even heard some comments that suggested that I was responsible for Sasuke's betrayal of Konoha. I ignored it and continued home. I was glad to see Sakura about a block ahead of me. She was with that crazy blonde girl, Ino. I ran up to greet them. As I called out her name, she didn't even acknowledge me. When I stopped her, she had a look in her eyes that indicated that she was mad at me. I just smiled. Hey Sakura, she responded. What do you want, Naruto? I looked down because of the guilt of not fulfilling my promise. Sakura, I'm sorry that I couldn't bring Sasuke back. Her response was something that I had not expected. Sorry? Sorry that you couldn't keep your promise? No, Naruto. I'm sorry for believing that a dead lass like you would bring Sasuke back. Sakura, I really tried, but tried? Yeah, right. You didn't try. Why would you try to save Sasuke? You knew I liked him, and I bet you thought that if he was out of the picture, then I would say yes to a date. Sakura, that's not true. I really tried to bring him back. Enough, Naruto. Get this through your head. I have never liked you, and never will. Ino spoke in a defending tone. Sakura, I understand that you have feelings for Sasuke, but that's going too far. Not even Naruto deserves that. Sakura glared at Ino. Ino, this has nothing to do with you, so mind your own business. Ino glared at the pink-haired Kunoichi. Naruto spoke once more. Sakura, no matter what I did or said, Sasuke didn't want to come back. But don't worry, I will bring him back for you. Save your promises for someone else. The only thing that I want you to do for me is to never speak to me again. I wish that it was you who left, and not Sasuke. Sakura ran off. Naruto stood there, feeling as though someone had told him his dog died. He felt pain in his heart. The girl he would have done anything for to protect had broken his heart. Ino looked at Sakura, who was running off into the distance and back at Naruto. She felt sorry for what had happened. He looked really hurt by Sakura's words, she thought. Ino spoke. You know, Naruto, I think she's just upset. No, she doesn't deserve any excuses, you know. I thought she was my friend. I guess I was wrong. I have to go home. I guess I'll see you later. Bye. End of flashback. I thought that it couldn't get any worse than that, but I would be proven wrong once again. A week later, I was called before the council. The council had declared that it was my fault for the injuries that my comrades had sustained. I was also blamed for not returning Sasuke back to the village. I tried to plead my case, but it fell on deaf ears. The worst I thought was going to happen was a six-month suspension of my ninja license. But they did something that I'd never expect. I was banished from Konoha. My dream of being Hokage died that day. Jiraiya tried to plead that I had helped fend off Gaara during the sound and sand invasion, but it fell on deaf ears once again. Granny didn't have the power to go against the council and was unable to save me from this fate. 
The day I was scheduled to leave, I went to Granny's office. Since I wasn't going to be Hokage, I felt that there was no reason to keep the necklace. I gave it back to her and left. And also asked her to give Iruka back the headband he had given me. Jiraiya offered to train me for the next three years, but I told him that he didn't need to. He insisted, but I declined, and told him not to worry and that I would be okay. He respected my decision, but he decided to give me some scrolls with some techniques. He told me that he was leaving the village and wasn't stepping foot into it again. Perry Sage told me where to find him whenever I wanted to learn some S-Class Jutsus. I left two days after the village. I could see the villagers look at me with smirks on their faces. It was fine. I was giving them what they had wanted for so long. My departure. Konoha was no longer my home. It was time for me to find a new home. I made a vow that I would become the greatest ninja ever. It's been six years since I was banished. During that time, I met and trained with ninjas from other villages, as well as samurais. When I left, I headed to the Land of Waves to see Tazuna and his family. I only stayed three months before I went to the Land of Water. I ran into a missing nin by the name of Saichi Kaito. He was one of the seven swordsmen of the mist. I followed him around for the next two years learning all that I could from him. During this time, we did missions together and became like brothers. After two years passed, I decided it was time to part ways. I was still on a quest for strength, so I needed to continue on my path. My departure from Kaito Sensei led me to the land of seas, where I met a samurai clan known as the Minashu clan. I thought I had already learned all I needed about Kenjutsu, but I was wrong. The samurai took me in and trained me under the heavenly sword. Since I knew how to wield a sword, it only took me a year to master the style. By the time I had finished mastering the style, I considered myself one of the top 10 ninjas in the world. I know that sounds cocky, but I believed it to be true. The next year was spent with Jiraiya perfecting my training in ninjutsu, and taking on missions after a year of training with the Minashu. I also learned some genjutsu from the scrolls, and from Jiraiya as well. My skills had improved greatly during that time. No longer was I the dead last or the idiot. I am known throughout the ninja world as the Golden Fox. I guess I got that name due to my yellow hair and whisker marks. During this time, Konoha had defeated the Sound Village, killing Orochimaru in the process. Miyakotsuki was dealt with a couple of months later. I'd like to say I had a big part in that. After all, I did kill three members. I softened them up for Konoha and Zuna. Sasuke finally got his revenge and killed his brother. I heard that the village accepted him back after his betrayal. My sources have informed me that all he got was a year of probation. He is now currently a Jonin and an Anbu squad captain. Two years after the fall of the Sound and Akatsuki, the Cloud declared war on the Leaf for unknown reasons. The war doesn't concern me. I live in the Land of Sun, and now with my fiance and her mother. I met Yumi when I was 17. I remember the day we met. I saved her from some thugs who tried to rob her and possibly force themselves on her. When I looked at her, I was mesmerized by her long brown hair, her green eyes, and her shapely body. After I saved her life, she insisted that I have dinner with her and her mother, so I did. Her mother, Mai, who looked like an older version of Yumi, accepted me with open arms. From that day, Yumi and I were always together. Peaceful as things were, I knew it wouldn't last for long. It never does. Outside of the greenhouse, made of wood with the farm in the back, sitting in a chair on the porch with Yumi cuddled up to me, I noticed the presence of five people. Judging by the way they moved, it had to be ninja. I didn't alert Yumi to their presence. I didn't want her to get scared. Within a matter of seconds, five shurikens flew at me and Yumi. I used the substitution jutsu. 
I was behind the ninja, holding a kunai at the throat. But I was found that I couldn't move. It was the Kage Main. There was only one person I knew who could do this technique. End of Naruto's POV. Shikamaru, you can let me go now. I wasn't going to hurt your friend here. Also, tell Shino, Neji, and Tenten that they can come out now. Soon enough, Neji, Shino, Tenten, and Shikamaru came into view. They lifted up their mask so I could see their faces. Shikamaru released the Shadow Possession Jutsu. I decided to speak to the ninja I was behind. You can remove your mask as well, Eno. She complied. Yumi and her mother came from the house to see if I was okay. Shikamaru spoke. Lady Tsunade had asked us to track you down. I told her how troublesome it would be, but she had insisted that we find you. Neji stepped forth to speak. Naruto, Lady Tsunade has requested that you return back with us to Konoha. I looked at Neji and laughed. <laughs> she requests that I come back. Tell her I'm no longer a shinobi of the leaf and I'm not obligated to do as she says. Ino decided to speak. Naruto, she asked us to bring you back. Please come back with us. Tell me, Ino, what could she want from me? She didn't want anything the past six years. Why now, all of a sudden? Shino spoke in his usual tone. Naruto Uzumaki. The fifth wishes for you to assist us in this war with the cloud. I walked past the ninjas from Konoha and headed to the doorway towards my fiance, who was looking worried. I stopped and spoke, instead of trying to get me to fight Konoha's battle. You should be preparing for attacks from the Cloud Ninja. Tell Granny that I said good luck defeating the Cloud. Naruto, how could you turn your back on your home? It's your duty to protect the leaf, Ten Ten said desperately. It's not my home. It never was. That place was hell to me. I was hated by every villager in that village. I was also banished by the council. So tell me, Tenten, would you consider a place that exiled you a home? There was complete silence. I thought so. Tell Granny that the only way I will fight for Konoha is if she's willing to pay for my services. My going rate isn't cheap, though. Tell her I want 70 million Ryu for my services and an additional 20 million bonus. Take that offer to her and come back to let me know her decision. That's an outrageous figure, Naruto, Ino stated. Well, I told you I don't come cheap. I'm sure the cloud will have no problem paying the bill. Shikamaru sighed. Uh, if that's all you request, then pack your things, Naruto. We want to get back to Konoha ASAP, Ino spoke. Shikamaru, you can't be serious. That is too much money for it. she interrupted. Well, Lady Tsunade did say, no matter what it took. Did you actually think that's what she meant, Neji? Asked Tenten incredulously. Our mission states that we bring Naruto Uzumaki back with us to Konoha. After that, it's no longer our responsibility, Shino stated. Shikamaru looked at Naruto. So, are you coming or what? Naruto fixed his gaze on Shikamaru. On one more condition. What is it now that you demand? Ino spat out. Naruto turned at the door, where his fiance and mother-in-law-to-be were standing. They come with me. When word gets out that I'm fighting on Konoha's side, the cloud will send ninjas to use them as bait against me, at least in the leaf. I know that they will be safe. Shikamaru thought to himself. What a troublesome guy. After closing his eyes and reopening, he spoke. Fine, as long as you're coming, I could care less about who you bring with you. Naruto gave the group a large grin. Then it settled, all the part in two hours. He walked towards Yumi. She had a sad look in her eyes. Truth be told, Yumi didn't want Naruto to be a ninja anymore for fear of losing him. Even so, she knew he was a ninja through and through, and she respected it. He placed his hand gently on her face, pulling it up so his eyes couldn't meet hers. Don't worry, nothing will happen to me. That, I can promise. Come on, we have to pack our stuff so we can get out of here. With that said, they broke free from each other's embrace and headed into the house. 
Yumi's mother invited the other ninjas into the house. After two hours had passed, everyone was now ready to head out. Naruto was dressed in a black short sleeve shirt with black sweatpants to match. He wore bandages around his shin the way Kakashi did. He also had on black ninja sandals. His sword was placed on his back. The sword was eloquent. One couldn't see the blade, but judging by the black and gold handle and the black case with the golden fox carved on it, it was safe to say that the sword could cut through almost anything. He got the sword from Ryuho Minashu, the head of the samurai clan who had taught him personally. Yumi was wearing a brown long sleeve shirt and beige pants. Her sandals matched the color of her shirt. Mai had on a long blue sleeve shirt, black pants, and black sandals, much like Naruto's. Naruto put Yumi on his back, while Neji carried Yumi's mother. The other three carried the small book bags that the three residents of the Sun Country had packed. In a matter of seconds, they took to the trees. It would only take an hour to reach the docks, where a ship was waiting to escort them to Konoha, where it would take about two hours to arrive there. Three hours later, in Konoha, in the Hokage Tower, behind the desk of the Hokage office, sat a 56-year-old blonde woman, who could pass for 20 doing paperwork. With a war going on and missions to complete, she was exhausted. She was trying to find ways to end this war. She tried presenting a treaty to the Raikage, but the young prick didn't want a treaty. For the last 8 months, the war went on with no side gaining an upper ground. She honestly didn't know what the war was for, but she believed that the young Rakage just wanted to prove his country was stronger than the leaf. She felt that there were better ways to go about doing this, but it was his village after all. She ran hers, and that was all that mattered. Sitting with her right arm holding up her head, Tsunade looked at the door when her assistant came in. Lady Tsunade, Shikamaru's team has returned with Naruto. They're in the waiting room, Shizuna stated. Shizune, send them in. Shikamaru and the rest of his team entered with Naruto, and two people she didn't recognize. When she saw Naruto, she was trying to hold back her tears. She kept them from falling, and she began to speak. Naruto, I'm glad that you could make it. I thought that you were going to turn down my request, she said with happiness in her voice. I did turn down your request. The only reason I'm here is because you're paying for my services, he responded. One of her eyebrows slightly elevated. Paying for your services, so you're not doing this to help the leaf? She questioned. Naruto gave her a smirk. Tsunade, do you really think that would have fight for this village after what they did to me? No, I'm not here to protect your village. I'm here because of the 90 million Ryu and being paid for my services. She felt a pain in her heart when he said her name instead of Granny. She knew then that the relationship had changed. She blamed herself for that. She got mad at the fact that he was fighting only for money. She responded in an angry tone. So, you only fight for money now. Whatever happened to the kid that fought to protect his precious people? Did you forget about that or what? He smiled at her, then placed his arms around Yumi. I do fight for my precious people. That never has and never will change. However, there is no one here in Konoha that is precious to me. So, there is no reason whatsoever to fight for anyone here. If you're not willing to pay for my services, then I will leave and return to my life. So, what's it gonna be? Sonata sighed. <sighs> Very well then, before we can pay for your services, you must be brought before the council so they can approve of it. Neji, would you escort Naruto's guest to the hotel? Naruto, follow me. Naruto kissed his girl. I'll see you as soon as I'm done, okay? Yumi nodded her head in agreement. Exiting the office, Mai and Yumi followed behind Neji while Naruto and Tsunade headed to the council room. Tsunade started a conversation with the man who was an inch or two shorter than Jiraiya. So tell me, Naruto, who are those two back there? My fiance and her mother. Judging by the tone in his voice, she could clearly see that he didn't really want to talk. She still decided to give some answers about the girl and what he did during the last six years. She knew he was strong. Just mentioning his name in the rock, rain, mist, and grass caused panic. The man who stood next to her was arguably the most feared ninja in the world. She spoke once more. Um, Naruto, how did you guys meet? 
Naruto, who never even looked at her. I'm touched that you want to know about my life, but I really don't feel the need to tell you. She hadn't expected Naruto to be this cold. She knew that there was a chance that he would despise her in this village for what transpired six years ago, but she was hoping he didn't. Deep inside, she was hoping that he would be happy to return, but she knew that it would only be in her fantasy. After a minute of walking, they finally reached the council room in the Hokage Tower. Inside the big room was a long square table that sat 14. The room was like a cave in the sense that the light only illuminated enough for one to see everything in their surroundings. On the walls were pictures. Naruto recognized that some were the Hokages of the past. Tsunade motioned for him to sit. She walked to the other end of the room and took her seat, which faced Naruto's. There were 12 other members seated. The order was as followed. On Naruto's left, Inoichi Yamanaka was seated at the first seat. Shikaku Nara was seated at the second. Shousua Akimichi the third seat. Shibi Aburame was seated in the fourth seat. And Wei Jin was seated in the fifth seat. On Naruto's right, Sume Inazuka was seated in their first seat. Yashi Hyuga was seated in the second seat. Tsuki Hawaidu was in the third seat. Koi Karai was seated in the fourth seat. And Waga Kataki was seated in the fifth seat. At the head of the council table, Amura Mitokado sat on Tsunade's right, while Koharu Utatane sat on her left. Tsunade was the first to speak. Naruto, do you know why we had asked you to return to Konoha? Naruto folded his arms and looked away. I'm here because the shinobi of the leaf are weak and you need me to save their asses. Everyone in the room, with the exception of Tsunade, narrowed their eyes at Naruto. She just let out a sigh at his comments. Koharu spoke next. Naruto Uzumaki, you will show respect while you are in the presence of the council. It's true that your assistance is needed, but you will show some respect. Naruto looked at the old woman and smiled. You talk to me as if I'm one of your shinobi. I don't have to show any of you any respect. You guys want my help. Not the other way around, and besides, respect is earned, not given away so freely. Koharu was angry. She was about to say something when Hiyashi decided to make comment. We have very competent ninjas. We thought that you would love the opportunity that we had decided to present to you. Naruto looked at Hiyashi curiously. Oh, what opportunity are you talking about? To become a shinobi of the leaf again, Shinade said proudly. Naruto looked at Tsunade. So that's the opportunity that the Hyuga was talking about. Wow, I really don't know what to say, Naruto replied with a hint of sarcasm. The council members did not catch it. Suki, a middle-aged woman with white green hair and brown eyes, looked at the QB container with a smile. You don't have to say anything. We will reinstate you as a leaf shinobi and promote you to Jonin. Seeing as you're ranked and as an S-class ninja in the bingo book, it wouldn't be a problem to do so. You get to enjoy life in Konoha like you did before you left. Naruto looked at Suki like he was about to cry with joy. I just want to say... Everyone in the council was smiling. They knew the boy would fight for them as long as they offered him the chance to return home. There was no way he was going to turn down this offer. On the other hand, Tsunade wasn't fooled by Naruto's act for a minute. She looked at Naruto and knew what was coming. When hell freezes over, the council gasped in shock. They soon narrowed their eyes at the blonde. You kicked me out because you said I was the reason why everyone got injured in the mission to rescue Sasuke, and it was also my fault for his defection. I'm sure we all know why you really banished me, but I'm not going to get into that. As for being a shinobi of Konoha, thanks, but no thanks. Inoichi spoke up. Naruto, be reasonable. What about your dream? Being a Konoha ninja, you would once again have the chance to become Okage. That dream died the day I was left to rot by this village. That day was also the birth of a new dream. And what was that dream? Tsunade questioned. To become the strongest ninja in the world. Since there is no longer a dream, and is now a reality, I really have no more dreams to pursue. 
There was laughter around the table from council members. Waga, Kataki, an old man with gray hair, black eyes, and a scar on his cheek, made a comment. You may be powerful, kid, but you're not the strongest ninja in the world. Tsunade and Jiraiya are still the best ninjas around. Just because you have that fox to draw power off of doesn't make you the strongest. Hiyashi spoke. That's a borrowed strength. Don't sit there and get cocky, kid. Who said anything about using the QB? Yes, it's true that I can draw his power. But I haven't drawn his power ever since I was 12. I say I'm the strongest because I know what I'm capable of, even without the fox's power. All of you, on the other hand, have no idea. Tsunade ended their squabble. Naruto doesn't really want to become a ninja of Konoha. Although it saddens me, I respect his wishes. For his services, he asked for a fee of 90 million Ryu. Homura Mitokado was outraged. You will not be bullied by some brat. This is an outrageous demand, Tsunade. The vein on Tsunade's head started to bulge. Not another word, Homura. Although this is an outrageous demand, we did ask him for his help. Besides, Naruto's allegiance to Konoha and his reputation might get the rain to force the cloud to sign a treaty of neutrality. The council knew she was right. It was no doubt that Naruto was feared throughout the rain, who was allied with the cloud in this war. They knew this was the reason Tsunade suggested that they offer Naruto to become a shinobi again. She also had feelings for the boy as well. Tsunade spoke once more. All in favor for paying of the services of Naruto Uzumaki. Everyone raised their hand. Tsunade smiled. Well, Naruto, we held up our end, so it's time you held up yours. We will discuss the payment plan at a later date. You are to report to my office at 9 a.m. tomorrow, where you will be placed on a team with Junins and Jonins. Tell me who I'm working with and what the mission is. I'd rather know now. While well, you're teaming up, with four Chunians and two Jonians for this mission, Tsunade replied. I asked who they were, not their ranks. For the sake of this mission, I need to know who they are and their capabilities. Tsunade leant back in her chair and spoke. Very well. The members of your team will be Konohamaru Sarutobi, Udon, Hanabi Hyuga, Hinata Hyuga, Sakura Haruno, and Sasuke Uchiha, acting as squad leader. Naruto stroked his chin. Why are there two Hugas? Honestly, I think one's enough. Hinata and my option should be adequate for this mission. The other Hyuga isn't really needed. Hiyashi's anger was visible to everyone in the council. They all knew how highly he thought of Hanabi, and for Naruto to say that he preferred Hinata over Hanabi was crazy. Hiyashi spoke. Hanabi is the best that Hyuga has to offer. If anything, Hinata is the one not needed on this mission. She is weak. If we're going to suggest a Hyuga, never suggest the weakest of them all. Naruto shook his head in agreement. You're right. Hiyashi smiled at the boy. Naruto returned the smile and then spoke again. Since Neji is clearly the strongest Hyuga, why not have him replace them both? Shikaku actually smiled at Naruto's comment. He knew Naruto was getting under the skin of Hiyashi. He also was glad that he knocked him down a peg by stating that Neji, a member of the branch house, was stronger than the heir of the main house. Tsunade wanted to laugh, but decided to continue. Naruto, both Hyugas are capable. Neji isn't on this team, because I need his presence elsewhere. This team I've selected is perfect for the mission at hand. Okay, please inform me of their skills, Naruto replied. Konohamaru's taijutsu is superb. His ninjutsu is a little above average, and his genjutsu is mediocre. Udon is the strategist of the team. You've worked with Shikamaru. Udon is the next best thing. All of his other skills are mediocre. Udon may be good, but I would trust a plan developed by Shikamaru with my life. Anyway, please continue. Right, Hinabi is arguably the best Junin in the village. Her taijutsu skills are superb, and her ability to see through genjutsu as well. Hinata is basically the same as Hinabi, but Hinabi's taijutsu is slightly better. Sakura is the medic of the team. She will not try to fight, but don't worry about protecting her. I've trained her so she is more than capable of handling herself. Sasuke is probably the best ninja in the village. Sasuke isn't really lacking in any skills. Okay, I think that's good enough. 
Shausa finally decided to speak. You know all of their skills, but nobody really knows yours. Tsunade looked at the big bone man, then back at Naruto. So Naruto, what are your skills? Naruto stroked his chin again. Well, my taijutsu, in my opinion, is second to none. My dinjutsu is excellent, and although I'm not a master at genjutsu, I am exceptional in it. And my kenjutsu is only second to one. Tsunade looked at Naruto. She wanted to question him more, but she wouldn't get the answers she wanted. So, she decided to end the meeting. This meeting is over. Naruto, report to my office at 9am. I will tell you the mission overview then. Naruto got up and left the council room. Naruto exited the building and decided to head over to the hotel where his fiance and her mother were. However, he smelled something that he hadn't smelled or eaten in a long time. Ichiraku Ramen. Naruto walked in and took a seat. The old man who ran the shop was behind the counter cooking. He heard the person come in. He didn't turn around to greet the person. Welcome to Ichiraku. How may I help you? Naruto spoke. Old man, you can start by getting your number one customer a big bowl of miso ramen. The old man turned around once he heard the guy say he was his number one customer. When he saw the blonde sitting there, he was excited with joy. Is that you, Naruto? It's so good to see you. This place wasn't the same without you. Well, I had no control over that, but I'm here now, and I haven't had a good bowl of ramen in six years. Well, don't worry. This one is on the house. I'm just glad you're back, the old man said. Naruto just smiled at the old man. He was happy to be back at the stand. This place was a safe haven while living in the village. Naruto looked all over the shop, but couldn't find what he was looking for. Hey, where is Ayame? Looking for me? Naruto turned to where he heard the voice. He saw Ayame by the door, which led to the storage at the back of the shop in her apron. She really didn't change all that much in his opinion. If anything, she looked better than what he remembered. Ayame, it's so good to see you. I've really missed you and the old man. Ayame smiled. I missed you too, Naruto. Anyway, what brings you back into town? Naruto's face became serious. Just business. I don't know how long I will be here, but I'm leaving when my job is complete. That's too bad. Father and I really missed you. Well, Naruto, I have a lot of work to do, but come by the shop again so we can catch up, okay? Naruto smiled at the girl. Will do. See you later, Naruto. She waved and headed back to the storage area at the back of the shop. Later, Ayame. While Naruto was chowing down, the old man leaned on the counter. She's right, you know. Things haven't been the same since you left. I heard uh, what happened, if there was anything that I could have done. He cut the old man off. Don't worry about it. I know you would have. Well, I have to go. Thanks for the meal. Naruto got up from the chair and headed to the hotel. As he walked, he could see the people staring at him. Not the same cold stares. Those stares were out of curiousness. He figured it wouldn't be long till word got out about him. Naruto stopped and looked at the hotel. He'd finally arrived. After asking the receptionist what room Yumi and Mai was in, he headed to the room. Mai was in the room next to Yumi. Naruto knocked on the door to Yumi's room. At the door stood the prettiest woman he would ever see. Hey sweetie, she embraced him in a hug. After they broke away, they entered the room. Yumi decided to speak. Naruto, are you okay? I was so worried about you. I'm fine. Anyway, what did you do in the hour that I was gone? Yumi walked to the bed and sat down. Not much really. I was waiting for you to come back so that you could show me around. I mean, if that's okay with you. She knew Naruto's history, so she didn't want to force him into showing her around. Naruto, who was leaning against the wall, walked up and sat next to Yumi. Okay, I'll show you around if that's what you want. Besides, there's one person I want you to meet. She looked at him with a questionable look. Who might this person be? Iruka sensei I haven't seen him in a while, and I want you to meet him. She smiled. Sure, but can we go before it gets dark? What about your mother? Maybe she wants to come with, Naruto asked. She asked the guy with the white eyes to show her to the bathhouse, but the girl with the blonde hair volunteered. Naruto knew that she was talking about Ino. He knew Ino wouldn't pass up on this opportunity to try and get Mai to tell her about himself. Naruto didn't worry about it. Mai didn't know what he did prior to meeting her and Yumi. 
Eno was fishing in a pond with no fish. He laughed in his head, knowing that the girl would be mad when she didn't get the information she wanted. The couple exited the hotel and was walking through the busy village. Naruto grabbed Yumi's hand while they walked down the street. Naruto felt he was being watched. Judging by the stuff of the person, he knew that it was his old Jonin instructor. He stopped. Yumi got curious, then looked at Naruto. Naruto, why did we stop? Is something wrong? Naruto looked down at the woman who was a head shorter than him. No, nothing's wrong. We're just being followed, but don't worry, we're not in any danger. With that, Naruto turned to face straight ahead. Kakashi, Asuma, Karana, and Guy, you can all come out now. Asuma appeared directly in front of Naruto. Guy appeared on Yumi's left, Karana on Naruto's right, and Kakashi was lying in the tree pretending to read his book. Yo, Naruto, Kakashi folded his book and appeared next to Asuma. What do you want, Kakashi? Kakashi had expected that from Naruto. Kurenai was looking in awe at how much Naruto had grown. She thought if he was a couple of years older and she wasn't seeing Asuma, she would consider dating him. Guy spoke in his usual manner. Naruto, it's so good to see you again. Are you enjoying your springtime of youth? It's good to have you as a leaf ninja again. Naruto looked at Guy with a serious leaf. I'm not a leaf shinobi. Asuma responded in shock. What? I thought that they reinstated you. Naruto turned to Asuma. They wanted to reinstate me, but I declined. Why would you do that, Naruto? Kurenai asked. Do you actually think that I would want to be a shinobi of this village after what happened six years ago? I'm not fighting for this village out of love or loyalty. I'm only here to fulfill my end of a deal. Kakashi spoke. So, what is the deal that has brought you back here? I'm being paid 90 million Ryu for my services. After the job is done, I'm leaving this place, he said in disgust. Kurenai was shocked that he was being paid that much, but more shocked that the council had approved. Naruto was getting annoyed, to say the very least. Kakashi, if you don't want anything, please leave me alone. Kakashi looked at Naruto, and he looked at the girl who was holding onto his left arm. Naruto. Who's your friend? This is Yumi, my fiance. Karanai looked at the girl. She knew her former student was going to be crushed when she found out that Naruto was engaged. She knew how much the girl cared for Naruto and how hurt and depressed she was when he left. Karanai remembered it had taken the girl almost a year to get out of her depression. God gave Naruto a nice guy pose. Naruto, you have chosen a beautiful flower to share the springtime of youth with. Um, thanks, guy, Naruto replied with a clueless expression. Asuma spoke. Naruto, you made quite a name for yourself. You asked Kakashi what we wanted. Well, the reason we're here is, Naruto interjected. You're here to measure my skills. I knew that Tsunade would send somebody to test my skills. No matter, you guys won't see much. I don't intend to break a sweat. Kakashi looked at Naruto with wonder. He wondered if Naruto really came so far that he could dispatch four of Konoha's elites. Asuma broke his concentration. I don't think we'll be that easy to beat. Naruto replied. Alright, let's get this over with, okay? I promised Yumi that I'd show her around. Kakashi decided to speak. Meet us at Team 7 former training ground. With that, all four Jonin vanished. Naruto looked at Yumi. Walk around and have fun. I'll find you when I'm done. How long do you think you're going to be? Eh, five, ten minutes tops, Naruto replied. Okay, but you better be back by that time. You know how I hate it when you're late, right? Yumi glared dangerously at Naruto. The blonde warrior gulped. He would rather face an army of Hokage than face an upset Yumi. Don't worry, I'll be back within the time. I promise. He kissed her cheek and was off. She looked at the town to see so many shops. She decided to walk until she saw a clothes shop. Team 7 training ground. Naruto appeared a minute after Kakashi, Kurenai, Asuma, and Guy did. Naruto was standing in the middle while being surrounded by the four Jonins. Kakashi lifted up his headband to reveal his Sharingan. Guy took a fighting stance. Kurenai did the same. Asuma pulled out his knuckle knives. Kakashi and Guy were standing in front of him while Kurenai and Asuma stood behind him. Kurenai started off by creating an illusion. Naruto was impressed, to say the least. Everyone disappeared from view. 
All he saw was a barren wasteland, devoid of anything. He knew his eyes were deceiving him. So he pulled a black cloth out of his pocket and covered his eyes. Kurnai took to the trees after her jutsu took effect. She was watching and wondered why he did that. She then realized he was blocking its vision. She didn't believe he could beat the illusion by doing this. She knew better than anyone that the illusion also messes with her hearing and sense of smell as well. The only other people that could defeat this genjutsu were Uchiha's, Hyuga's, and people who were masters of genjutsus. Naruto was impressed, but he knew that this was no ordinary genjutsu. He knew that everything that he smelled and heard were distractions from his real targets. But as good of a genjutsu as this was, Naruto knew this wouldn't work on him. He decided who would be the first one he would take out. Naruto vanished from everyone's sight. Kakashi realized where Naruto went. His eyes went wide. He looked at the tree Kurenai was in. Kurenai, watch out! She turned her head to face the person behind her. Black and gold would be the last thing she would see. Naruto hit her in the back of her neck. He placed his sword back on his back. He then grabbed her and leapt down to the ground, where they were still watching. He laid her down in the middle of the field. That genjutsu was one of the strongest I've ever faced. But no genjutsu will be effective against me. I may not be that good at performing them, but I mastered a way to counter all of them. Since the nuisance is out of the way, let us continue. Naruto took out the blindfold. Asuma was shocked that Naruto had broken Kurenai's strongest genjutsu. How the hell did you break it? No one with the exception of the Uchiha and the Hyuga could break that jutsu. Naruto looked at Asuma. Your eyes aren't the only thing to see with. There is one thing that a ninja can't mask, no matter what, and that is their chakra signature. I knew where you all were at because I could sense your chakra. So now that you know how I broke it, care to continue? Kashi formed hand seals, he then shouted, Fire style, Phoenix Flower Jutsu. Naruto flipped out of the way of the fireballs that were heading his way. He jumped onto a tree only to find Asuma beside him. Asuma threw a kick with his left leg. Naruto side flipped out of the tree onto the training ground. Guy appeared on his right. He threw a punch that Naruto ducked under. But before Naruto could counter, he saw two kunais heading in his direction from his left. The kunai hit him dead on. Guy jumped back after seeing Naruto was hit. It's over, Naruto. Naruto looked up at Guy and smirked. Sorry, Guy, but I'm not the real one. The clone then pooped out of existence. Kashi, who had thrown the kunai, had his eyes widened when he realized what Naruto had done. If anyone could see under his mask, they would have seen him smiling. All Guy saw was Asuma falling out of the tree. He was clearly out cold. Naruto landed next to Asuma. And then there was two, but before we continue, Guy, could you take off your weights? I would like to fight you at your fullest. Guy gave Naruto the nice guy pose. Since you act so nicely, I'll do so. Guy took off the rest of his weights. Kakashi appeared next to Guy. He whispered so Naruto couldn't hear the two. Listen, Guy, he's better than I expected him to be. Keep your guard up. Guy shook his head. He dashed off to face Naruto. Guy threw a kick with his right foot. Naruto blocked. Guy was moving so fast that Naruto found himself on the defensive. He knew Guy was fast, but this was incredible. Naruto blocked a punch, but he wasn't so lucky with the next punch. Naruto, my taijutsu is superior to yours, but I will say that you are extremely talented. However, you lack the speed. Naruto smirked. Then, let's say I get rid of my ankle weights. I'll get rid of the rest, but judging by your speed without your weights, that will be necessary. Naruto took off the sticker scrolls that were taped on the side of his sandals. He looked at Guy before blurring out of his sight. He appeared in front of Guy with his hand plated in the man's stomach. Guy looked in shock before he fell over, clutching his stomach. Naruto then turns his attention to Kakashi. Kakashi and Naruto took to the air. Kakashi threw a punch which Naruto blocked with ease, and he flipped over Kakashi's punch, landing in front of a tree. As soon as the copy ninja landed, he threw at least seven shuriken. Naruto dodged them all. The white-haired ninja was expecting them to, for Naruto wasn't his real target. Naruto realized his mistake, but the wires wrapped around him, pinning him to the tree. Kakashi walked up to Naruto. You did well, but you failed to look underneath the underneath. Naruto just looked at Kakashi. 
No, I did. Maybe you should. Naruto turned into a log of wood. A pair of hands broke through the ground and grabbed his feet. Before he could move, he felt the blade of a sword pressed against his throat. This is over, Kakashi. You all lose. If this was a real mission, you would all be dead. Kakashi was shocked, to say the least. You make a clone. When I saw you throwing the shuriken, I used substitution. Then I made a clone to grab you from underneath. And that was all the time I needed to get behind you. Naruto placed the sword back in his holster. Kakashi turned around to face him. You've gotten better. I heard the rumors and assumed you were good, but I didn't expect you to be this good. Well, I've been turning my ass off since I left here. Anyway, as fun as it was to beat all of you guys in it, Naruto looked at his wrist. Watch. Seven minutes span. I really have to get back to Yumi. Later. With that, Naruto disappeared. On a nearby tree, Tsunade watched the whole thing in awe. She had just witnessed Naruto dispatch four of Konoha's elite Jonin without even breaking a sweat. She spoke out loud to no one in particular. How did he get so strong? He has trained himself beyond human limits. She looked over to her right to see a man she hadn't seen in approximately six years. The only word that she could utter was... Jiraiya. Tsunade looked over to the man that was once her teammate. To her, not much had changed about him. He still wore the exact same outfit that he wore before he left the village, vowing not to return again. She wondered if he still sees her as a friend or as a traitor of some sorts. After all, wasn't this how Naruto saw her? Jiraiya decided to break the silence. It's been a while, Tsunade. Yes, it most certainly has. What brings you back? She asked. Jiraiya, who was leaning against a tree, broke eye contact with the woman before him to look off into space. Well, I haven't seen my student in six months. I decided it would be nice to see him. She had a sad look on her face. Oh, is that the only reason? He decided to meet her eyes again. No. The slug princess was now curious, then what's your other reason? My other reason is to be able to tell you not to do it. She had an idea of what he was getting at. Jiraiya, more so than probably anyone else, knew how she felt about Naruto. Tsunade knew deep down why Jiraiya told her not to do it, but she decided to question it anyway. Why wouldn't I do it, huh? Give me one good reason. His eyes visibly showed his anger. Give you a reason. I can give you a whole list of reasons, but I won't. But I will give you a reason that should be good enough. For the first time in his life, he is happy. Don't try to ruin his happiness. Please. Tsunade looked at her feet. Jiraiya, he belongs home in this village. I have to try and make him see that. I just wish the Toad Hermit stopped her before she could finish. You just wish that you can correct your mistake. And like Don and Nawaki, where you didn't have control over the situations. Tsunade tensed up at the mention of her lover and brother. You had full control over the situation with Naruto. Tsunade knew everything Jiraiya had said was right. She could have forced the council to give in, but instead she had agreed to banish Naruto. She never had any intention on making his banishment permanent. She was going to have him return in a couple of years and tell everyone of his heritage. She believed that this would make people accept him more. A tear fell down her cheek. I did what I felt was best for Naruto and the village at the time. Naruto needed to get away, and I believed that in time, the villagers would get over what they believed Naruto to be. I sent some of his friends to search for him after three years had passed. They never were able to find him because he covered up his tracks so well. I planned on telling the village of his heritage when he returned. She turned to Jiraiya with tears falling down her face. Jiraiya, please understand that I never wanted to hurt him. I love him as if he was my own son. He is the only reason why I've remained Hokage. My goal is to free this village of its hate. Jiraiya, I fear that I've lost the chance to make amends. It hurts because I'm the only one who has caused more pain. Jiraiya, I don't know what to do. 
The blonde placed her hand in her face to grieve. Jiraiya decided to jump to the branch that she was on to console her. He wrapped his arms around her and let her cry in his chest. I thought that you wanted him to serve the village because of his skills. I didn't know that you were doing this because he believed it would benefit him. Now, I know what you're really after, Jiraiya stated. Tsunade looked up into his eyes. Jiraiya, how can I get him to stay? The village needs him more than ever. He carries the will of fire in him. It's going to be hard to get him to return. You'll have to sit down with him and talk to him and explain why you did what you did. I know you care about him, but he feels that you have betrayed him. Honestly, I thought you did too. Now that I heard your reasons for doing what you did, you did what you felt was best. Even if it was the wrong decision. Did you ever tell him about his father? She questioned while wiping away her tears. Jiraiya broke the embrace between the two of them. I was planning on telling him of his heritage this year. His father knew that his enemies would harm his son with him gone. So he wanted Naruto to be told when he was 18. He figured Naruto would be strong enough to handle his enemies by then. He willed me and Saratobi sensei to let Naruto know of his heritage when he became of age. I'm curious, how did you find out that the fourth was Naruto's father? I have access to the Hokage's personal files. It was only a matter of time before I found out who his parents were, but it was smart of Saratobi sensei to change his last name. Even though they look alike, people wouldn't question it because they simply had different last names, she replied. Yeah, that's what for Naruto's protection as well. He decided to give the boy his mother's maiden name. Only Saratobi sensei and I knew who Naruto's mother was. Minato kept that hidden from everyone else. There was no way anyone could have figured it out. It was set up perfectly. Tsunade spoke once more. Well, it wasn't set up that perfect. One person did manage to figure it out. Jiraiya was shocked, to say the least. He wondered who was smart enough to figure it out. Really? Who is this person? He's Konoha's lead strategist, she replied. What's his name? he asked. Shikamaru Nara. Somewhere across town in a barbecue shack. Achoo! A young man with a lazy look thought, my allergies must be acting up again. How troublesome. Back to across town at the trees near Training Ground 7. How did he figure it out? Jiraiya asked. He said he put two and two together. He came to my office about two weeks after Naruto left. Flashback. Tsunade was sitting at her desk in her office. She was going over the decision she made two weeks ago. Tsunade's assistant, Shizune, came in her office holding a cute little pig in her arms. Lady Tsunade, Shikamaru is here to see you. The fifth motioned for her to send him in. Shikamaru stood before her in his tuning vest. She motioned for him to take a seat. What brings you here, Shikamaru? I wish to ask you a personal question. She rested her elbows on the desk. She then placed her head on the back of her hands for support. What's your question? Why'd you kick Naruto out of this village, knowing the sacrifice that his father made to protect it. She decided to make up a factious story about Naruto's parents, so the boy wouldn't press the matter further. What are you talking about? Naruto was an orphan. No one uh, knows who his parents are. Shikamaru looked at her with a serious look. You can play dumb all you want, but I know the truth. You're right, Naruto was an orphan. But I started to think, why did the villagers hate Naruto so much? I mean, he was a prankster, but that's not a good enough reason to hate him as much as the villagers did. So, I started putting things together. Tsunade knew where he was going with this. She prayed that she was wrong. So tell me, what did you find out? First, I remembered our academy days. My parents, and most of the parents, correction of all the parents, told their kids to stay away from him because he was nothing but trouble. I also overheard some old man calling them a good-for-nothing monster, but why would they call him that? This is a theory you came up with, so you tell me, Hokage stated. 
the lazy tuning continued. It wasn't until recently that I started to think things over. Before, it was just too troublesome. Then, it all hit me like a ton of bricks. The one clue that put all the pieces together was the fact about Naruto's birthday. It's not unusual for someone to be born on October 10th, but he was born exactly when the QB attacked. I only knew his birthday because I overheard Hinata asking Aruka sensei his birthday. She never specified her real reason, but I figured out her reason when he came to class the next day sporting a pair of goggles on his head, telling Aruka that someone gave him a birthday gift. You're rambling, Shikamaru, the fifth stated in a bored tone. I suppose, but here's what I came up with. There was no way the fourth could kill the QB. Do you doubt his skills? No, just stating a fact. I did some research of my own. I asked Gara's sister about the demon that was sealed inside of him. I asked her why they didn't kill it like the fourth had killed the QB. She laughed at me and told me that there was no way for a human to kill a demon. She believed that the fourth had to seal it inside of something. I was informed the demon that was inside of Gara was the one-tailed demon, Shukaku. I thought it was too troublesome to argue about how the fourth had killed the nine tails, but she made me wonder, how do you kill a demon? So I started to research demons. She was right, there is no way you can kill a demon. Since the QB is the strongest of the tailed beasts, the only way he could be defeated was by sealing him inside of something. You can't seal it in an adult because the adult would die. The only feasible option is a newborn so both the demon and the newborn's chakra could fuse. What are you getting at, Shikamaru? She said in a tone that was openly showed that her patience was wearing thin. Naruto is hated by the village. His birthday is the day the QB attacked. The red chakra he used to beat Neji in the tuning exams. What I'm getting at is that Naruto is the container for the QB and the son of the fourth Okage. There was a minute of silence. How did you know? She questioned. Know that he was the son of the fourth? Yes. Tell me how? She asked. After I figured out that he was the container for the QB, the rest fell into place. Everyone said the fourth was an honorable man, so there is no way he would ask a villager to sacrifice one of their babies. So I figured he would sacrifice his own son instead. Also, the blonde hair and blue eyes are a dead giveaway. The fifth spoke. You know all of this. What else do you know? Well, that's where you come in to fill in the blanks. You see, I know that the fourth's name was Minato Namikaze. The history files never said anything about him having a kid or even a wife. So I looked up the name Uzumaki in the historical archives and found the name of a woman called Kushina Uzumaki. I figured that she is Naruto's mother and the fourth's wife. You seem to know more than you should. What do you need me to fill in? She questioned. Why were his marriage and his son hidden from the village? Tsunade got up to look out the window. She looked at the setting sun. With her hands behind her back, she kept her gaze at the sky. Tsunade spoke. I don't know why his marriage was hidden, but if I had to guess, it was to protect his wife from his enemies. As for Naruto, I suspect a third had a hand in covering up his heritage to the village. I believe he did this for the same reason that the fourth covered up his marriage. It makes sense. The fourth did have many enemies because of the Iwa slash Konoha war. What better way to get payback on a man than to go after his family? The lazy Chinese replied. She turned to Shikamaru. You seem to know everything I know. As for me banishing Naruto, it was for his own good as well as the village. This village hates him, so I sent him away in hopes he would get stronger. I know Jiraiya is keeping tabs on him, so I don't have to worry about his safety. When the time is right, I plan to send for him to tell him and the village everything. Well, if that is all, then you are dismissed. Shikamaru got up out of the chair 
and left the office in the flashback. So, you do know me as well as I thought, the perverted hermit responded. I knew you wouldn't leave him to die, Tsunade stated. Well, I did keep tabs on him, but I wasn't with him. Let's just say that I influenced his training more than he knows. How so? she questioned. Jirai responded, well, I followed him to the land of water. There, I met with an old friend by the name of Kaito Saichi. Her eyes widened. One of the seven swordsmen of the mist? Last I heard, he was a ruthless, missing ninja. No, he just left his country because he discovered the corruption of his village and the Mizukage. Since he owed me a favor, I asked him to train Naruto in the art of the sword. I also asked that he teach him some water jutsus and better chakra control. He complied and kept me updated on Naruto's performance. He left Kaito after two years of training with him and doing missions. Wait a minute, he was only 14 then. What did he do during the next year? She asked. Well, he went to the land of sea. I got word that was where he was heading, so I asked a dear friend of mine by the name of Ryuho to finish up his sword training. The perverted hermit replied, Impossible, there is no way that a samurai and the best one in the world of that would train a ninja in his art, stated the fifth bluntly. Well, he was returning a favor, not to me anyways. You see, Minato had introduced him to his wife, so I suggested it was only right that he returned the favor by retraining Minato's only son. I also informed him to keep Naruto's heritage a secret. We set it up so that he challenged Naruto to a sword fight. He won of course and offered to train Naruto. Because of his previous sword training under Kaito, it only took him a year to master the style. So he wasn't kidding when he said that his sword skills were only second to one, stated this luck princess. Nope, the kid really is a great swordsman. Anyway, the day he left the Minashu clan, I was waiting for him outside of the compound. I informed him it was time to finish his training. For the next year, I worked him into the ground. When he left me, there was no doubt in my mind that he was one of the strongest fighters in the world. He said confidently, I knew you would protect him. I'm just glad it was long enough for us to defeat the Akatsuki and the Sound. If they would have gotten to him, I don't know what I would have done. Jiraiya spoke once more. Well, he was the reason you guys beat the Akatsuki in the first place. Her curiosity forced her to ask, how did you figure so? Well, he did take out three of four of their key members. He took out Aang, Kazuya, Iwa's gemstone, Hoshu Bai of the rain, and the leader, Soku Sucho, the clouds, red lightning, he stated. Jiraiya, out of the top five S-class criminals in the bingo book, he just named three. Those fighters would be hard for even us to beat. The Slug Princess stated, The only ones who could give a run for our money is Red Lightning, Orochimaru, and Itachi, he replied. Well, since all of them are dead, the only ones who could give us a run for our money now are Sasuke and Naruto, she stated. So, he did kill Itachi. You know, Orochimaru only went after him because he couldn't defeat Itachi, Jiraiya replied. Yeah, that's what I figured. Anyway, those two are probably stronger than us now, told the white-haired man. Jiraiya wondered if Tsunade was going to retire soon. He knew that she always wanted to give her position to Naruto, but since he was no longer a member of the village, she wondered who would be selected to be the sixth Hokage. Tsunade, have you decided who will replace you as Hokage? She simply replied, No. There was an uncomfortable silence. The wind began to pick up, rustling her blonde pigtails and her green robe, and his white hair as well as his red robe. So, are you just going to leave the position unfilled? She responded. I already told the council that I will not be selecting the successor. So, they had decided to select Sasuke Uchiha as the sixth. You already know who I wanted to replace me. 
Giving her a light-hearted smile, he placed a hand on her shoulder. Yeah, I do. Anyway, let's get out of this tree and head to a local bar. I think we could both use some sake. She smiled at the white-haired man. Sounds like a great plan. Jiraiya and Tsunade jumped out of the trees and headed back to the town. Naruto had just finished his fight with Kakashi and the other Jonins. He was now looking for Yumi, but he couldn't find her anywhere. He looked up at his watch and knew that his 10 minutes were almost up. Thank Naruto, where the hell could she be? In that instant, he got it. He ran to the nearest clothing shop in the area. Naruto entered the shop and found Yumi looking at some shirts. He let out a sigh of relief. He decided to slide behind her, putting his hands over her eyes. Guess who? Yumi smiled, already knowing it was her loving Naruto. I suspect it's my Naruto, but he said that he would be here in 5 minutes. Oh, that's right, you said 10 minutes max. I guess they must have been good if they kept you for more than 5 minutes. Either that, or you're not a very good ninja. Naruto took his hands away from her eyes when they spoke. That was cold, Yumi, but I'll show you how great of a ninja I am. She quirked her eyebrow. How you intend to do that? Lord is Maki. He gave her an evil smile. Like this. He started tickling her all over. She was helpless to do anything but giggle. He finally stopped with a satisfied smirk. The great Uzumaki is always triumphant in the end. She walked up to him and tiptoed to his ear to speak, so no one could hear but him. He may have won the battle, but my lingerie will win the war. I see. It seems that I will never win a war against you, he said in a defeated tone. She walked back to look at the clothes. She then turned her head slightly to reveal a smile that spread across her face. Nope, not ever. He scratched the back of his head, a habit which had survived with him from his ginning days. Well, I guess I can live with that. Are you almost done? I want to go see Uruka sensei Actually, I've been done for a while. I was just waiting for you, Yumi replied. Really? Where are the shopping bags? Naruto questioned. I had them delivered to the hotel. There was a little boy in here looking for some clothes, so I asked him if he would take my clothes back to the hotel for me. I paid him for his services, of course. When we return, I'll just pick them up at the front desk. Alright, let's go. Naruto extended his hand for Yumi to grab. They exited the shop and headed to the academy. It was late in the afternoon and class was already out. Naruto knew that Iruka would be grading papers in his class. Naruto and Yumi arrived at the academy. Naruto was taken into his surroundings and reminiscing about his childhood. Although he did have a bad childhood, but there were some good times. He remembered a time when Choji, Shikamaru, Kiba, and himself had ditched Iruka and ran out of the classroom after he had given them an important lecture. He entered the class, but he didn't see Aruka. He saw a bowl of ramen on the side of a desk filled with paper. He guessed Aruka had stepped out for a second, so he decided to look around. He looked at the seats, which were the same. He looked at the seat that him and Choji used to sit in and exchange snacks. He looked up to the seat at the back of the class where him and Shikamaru used to sleep. He then smiled to himself. Ah, those were some good times. Unknowingly to Naruto and Yumi, a man with a hairstyle that resembled a pineapple and a scar lying across his nose entered the room. Excuse me, may I help the two of you? Iruka asked. Yumi turned her gaze from the window to the man who had entered the room. Naruto, however, decided to not turn around. He just closed his eyes and smiled. It's been a while, eh, Iruka sensei Naruto turned around to face the man he saw as a father figure. Iruka gasped in shock. He couldn't believe the person before his eyes. After looking Naruto up and down to make sure it was him, he revealed a smile. Naruto, is it really you? The one and only, he replied proudly. Iruka and Naruto seemed to move uh, simultaneously. They embraced each other in a hug, which was to be expected since they hadn't seen each other in years. They broke their embrace. Iruka was first to speak. Naruto, how have you been? I was worried sick. Where did you go? Are you okay? A drop of sweat appeared in the back of Naruto's head. Slow down, 
you got it himself. I've been good. Did you get the letters that I sent you? Each one that you sent me. I just wish you left an address. I'll get right back. The academy teacher replied. Aruka looked at Naruto. He realized that there was a lady standing next to him. Naruto, uh, who is your friend? Oh, where are my manners? Aruka-sensei, this is Yumi. Yumi, meet Aruka-sensei. Naruto introduced the two. They both shook hands. So, this is the Yumi that I've been hearing so much about in your letters. Naruto, you have a beautiful girlfriend. Aruka complimented. Yumi blushed. Why, well, thank you, sir. And soon to be wife. Naruto muttered softly so no one could hear. Please just call me Aruka. Naruto spoke before silence could take over. Aruka-sensei, I assume you gave me up to Granny? Aruka looked like he was about to apologize, but Naruto cut him off before he could say anything. Don't worry about it. I know you wouldn't have done it if you thought they were going to hurt me. Aruka spoke. I only did it because that they said they were going to reinstate you as a ninja again. I know it's selfish, but I just wanted you back home so I could see you. Don't worry, I'm here for the time being. I've got a feeling I'm going to be here for a while, so we will definitely have time to catch up. The ninja, known as the Golden Fox, replied. Naruto grabbed Yumi's hand, and they both headed towards the exit. Aruka spoke before they left. Naruto, it is really good to see you again. Naruto stopped at the doorway. It's good to see you too, Aruka-sensei. It's good to see you too. Naruto and Yumi exited the classroom. Aruka went back to his desk and returned to grading papers. He opened his desk drawer to reveal a blue headband with a leaf symbol engraved in the metal plate. He smiled at the sight of the blue headband. After closing the drawer, he returned back to grading papers. At a local barbecue shack, sitting on a table with a grill in the middle, that seated at least 12 or 12 jonins. The jonins that were sitting at the restaurant were Anko, Kuranai, Asuma, Kakashi, Kai, Genma, Neji, Ebisu, Shikamaru, Choji, Tenten, and Rock Lee. Guy was telling all of those who had not participated in the skirmish with Naruto about how easily they were defeated. Everyone with the exception of Kuranai, Asuma, and Kakashi were shocked. Impossible, there is no way he could beat all four of you, Anko stated. I wish that was true, Anko, but you made us look like rookies who didn't know their place, Asuma said, preparing to smoke a cigarette. He's that good, Anko. He even broke my powerful Genjutsu, Karnai replied. Everyone was shocked. The Senbon fell out of Genma's mouth. Karnai was the village's Genjutsu specialist. To hear that Naruto broke out of her most powerful Genjutsu was surprising. Shikamaru decided to speak. I bet the Hokage put you up to the troublesome task of testing Naruto's abilities. Yes, she did. Truth be told, I didn't expect him to improve that much. If I had to guess, I would say he's on par with Sasuke, Kakashi replied. Ebisu spoke. You may be right. Neji, who was sipping his tea, put it down to speak. I don't know what his skill level is, but he most certainly improved. He looked at Tenten and Shikamaru. You two had to notice it when we were sent to retrieve him. Tenten wondered what Neji was getting at. What do you mean, Neji? Shikamaru answered. He means how Naruto was able to get behind Inu without her even noticing till the kunai was at her neck. To tell you the truth, I don't think my shadow bind would have helped him if he was serious. He even knew who we were. He called all of us out, remember? Asuma remembering what Naruto had said before, he knocked Kurnai out. Well, he did say something about seeing without your eyes before he knocked Kurnai out. What do you think he meant by that? He questioned. Kakashi decided to answer. He told us that he was able to sense our chakra signatures. I'm guessing that's how he was able to defeat Kurnai's Genjutsu. Well, I wonder who is stronger. Naruto or Sasuke, Anka replied. Tenten responded, probably Sasuke. He did defeat Itachi, who was said to be even stronger than Orochimaru. Anko looked at Tenten. You're probably right. Sasuke is in line to be the next Okage. He also knows tons of jutsus. Neji wasn't so sure that Sasuke was stronger. 
He knew that Naruto was playing with him and the others back in the land of sun. He knew there was a lot more to Naruto than meets the eye. Well, that might be a fair fight. We'll see in the near future. We are going on a mission together tomorrow, Shikamaru said. Tenten spoke. They were teammates. I'm sure that they won't fight. You're wrong, Kakashi interrupted. Sasuke and Naruto are rivals. Although they worked well together when the situation called for it, they were always trying to outdo the other. They always fought each other. I think Naruto was the reason Sasuke defected in the first place. What do you mean? Kurt and I wondered. Sasuke was always number one in his class. Naruto was the dead last. Sasuke saw that Naruto was improving greatly and thought that he wasn't progressing fast enough. The day after Tsunade had returned, I found them on the roof fighting. I had to interject before they killed each other. Sasuke with a Chidori in his left hand was about to collide with the Rasengan in Naruto's right hand. He knows the Rasengan? Anko yelled out. Almost everyone at the table was shocked, while some were confused. What is the Rasengan? Choji asked with food in his mouth. I think it's a swirling ball of chakra gathered in the hand. Am I right, Kakashi? Shikamaru questioned. Yes, but how do you know he knew that technique? He used it on one of the sound ninjas on our mission to retrieve Sasuke, Shikamaru explained. It's also an A-ring jutsu, only known to Jiraiya and the fourth, Kurt and I replied. A fight between the two is almost inevitable, Kakashi stated. Well, Sasuke did defeat Gara, who has Shikaku still inside of him, so I'm sure he can best even Naruto, Tenten stated. You're wrong, Shikamaru stated. Wrong about Sasuke being able to beat Naruto, Tenten replied. No, you're wrong about Sasuke defeating Gara. Naruto was the one who defeated Gara. Everyone at the table was in shock. Kakashi was curious, but he'd always thought that Sasuke defeated Gara. All the villagers had thought that it was their precious Uchiha. Shikamaru was one of the few that knew the truth. Tamari saw the whole battle. She told me that Naruto saved Sasuke from being killed by Gara. Well, here's how she described it. Gara had jumped at Sasuke again, but Sakura jumped in front of him. He slammed her into a tree. He used a giant handmaid out of sand to press her against the tree and render her unconscious. I was also told that Naruto created at least 50 shadow clones. He then proceeded to beat Gara. When Gara transformed into his Shikaku state, Naruto summoned a giant toad. Naruto can summon Gimabunta as well? Kurnai asked with wide eyes. Not surprising, seeing as Lord Jirai trained him for the third round of the junior exams, Abisu stated. I thought that you trained him, Abisu, Kakashi asked. Well, I was going to. I decided to work on his chakra control, so I took him to the hot springs. I figure that it would give him more incentive to stay above water since the water there was hot. Sure, that's the reason, pervert, Genma said, nudging him in the waist, grinning. I'm not a pervert, I did it for his benefit, really. Anyway, we met Lord Jirai there and he took over Naruto's training. Well, like I was saying, Tamaru said Naruto summoned a huge frog to fight Gara. Long story short, Naruto defeated Gara. Not everyone's precious Uchiha. What's that supposed to mean? Anko asked with a little anger in her voice. Shikamaru stood up. It's too troublesome to explain. Besides, I have to hand in my mission report, so I will see you guys. Shikamaru headed to the exit. Naruto and Yumi were walking down the street. Since the sun was setting, they decided to head back to the hotel. Naruto heard a woman's voice call his name, and Yumi turned around to see a brunette with clouds cover her private areas. Naruto just smiled. Yumi was furious at the woman until she transformed into a teenage boy with the standard uniform of a leaf chunin. Big Brother Naruto, that was a smoker of a jutsu, eh? The teen stated. Naruto just smiled. Konohamaru, I'm not a kid anymore, so I forbid you to use that ridiculous jutsu. Yumi was thinking to herself. That's a pathetic ninja technique if I've ever seen one. It's appalling to all women. That's something a pervert would use and enjoy. Good thing my Naruto is in the category of the former or the latter. She was pleased with her husband to be. Now let me show you the ultimate sexy jutsu ever created too, man. Realizing what Naruto had said, Yumi responded with a slap at the back of his head. 
idiot. If I ever catch you doing something as ridiculous as that, you can forget about the marriage. Naruto recovered from the smack. He then greeted Konohamaru. Hey Konohamaru, how's it hanging? Pretty good, bro. I heard we're doing a mission together tomorrow. It's going to be wicked awesome to work with you, bro. I know you have tons of kick-ass jutsus, Konohamaru said with excitement. Yeah, I know a lot of jutsus. Maybe I can show you one, Naruto said. Yumi glared at him. It better not be the one that you were talking about earlier, or else. Naruto put his hand up in defense. No, 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 it's something different completely. Konohamaru spoke. Hey bro, who's the hot chick? Is she your... Konohamaru showed Naruto his pinky. Running from ear to ear, Naruto replied. Yep, I did pretty well for myself, don't you think? What about you, Konohamaru? You have a special girl. Well, I like Hanabi Yuga, but I don't think she likes anyone. She acts if she's too good to socialize with me. But for some reason, I still like her. Konohamaru confessed his feelings toward the Yuga heir to Naruto. Don't worry, Konohamaru. Most Yugas are snobs. If you can't convince her to see how great you are, then it's her loss. Naruto gave his opinion. Naruto and Konohamaru were smiling. Both of their ninjas' senses kicked in. They quickly turned to the right to see five kunais coming their direction. Naruto grabbed Yumi before she knew what was going on and flipped out of the way. Konohamaru sensed the kunais and flipped out of the way. Naruto landed a foot away from where the kunai was embedded in the floor. He looked in the direction where the kunai came from. On the roof stood a man with a jonin vest. Black sweats with the shins bandaged and a black long sleeve shirt. On the arm of his shirt was the symbol of the Uchiha clan. Naruto narrowed his eyes at recognizing at who it was. And in an angry tone, he decided to speak. Sasuke Uchiha. Sasuke flipped off of the roof and landed in front of Naruto. He sported his infamous smirk. You're as slow as ever, dope. Naruto basically growled his next comment. What do you want, Sasuke? Yumi was looking at Sasuke. Naruto had told her about Sasuke and how they fought at this place called the Valley of the End, but never told her the details of the battle. All he said was that he lost. Just he came to check out if the rumors were true, Sasuke entered. And those rumors would be, and you were back in town. I also heard that you beat Kakashi, Guy, Kurna, and Asuma. Not bad, dope, Uchiha replied. Naruto was wearing a smirk. A lot has changed. No offense, but you're not even a match for me, Sasuke. Sasuke's eyes narrowed. He was pissed. Naruto knew. That would anger Sasuke. That's exactly what he wanted. Sasuke calmed down. Your girlfriend is pretty attractive. Getting her is probably the only thing you did right. Naruto was getting pissed. He knew that Sasuke was doing this because he was doing the same thing. I never knew you liked girls, Sasuke. I mean, you always rejected your fangirls. I always thought you played for the other team. Konohamaru and Yumi could feel the tension between the two. They knew that the two were about to explode. Yumi decided to grab Naruto's arm and drag him back to the hotel. Naruto, let's go. Naruto nodded and decided to walk off. Sasuke spoke. Being saved by a girl. That's what I expected of you. Dope. Naruto stopped immediately. He was now officially pissed. He was not going to let this slide. He turned to face Sasuke against Yumi's protest. You know, Sasuke, I don't like fighting with words. I'd rather use my fist. Sasuke smirked. He had gotten what he wanted. There's a training area about a mile from here. I could do a lot of talking there if you'd like. Sasuke pointed to Yumi. Bring her too. I want her to see you get your ass kicked. He then poofed away to the training ground. Naruto looked at Konohamaru who was next to him. Protect her when we go to the training ground. Konohamaru was worried for Naruto. He knew that Sasuke was probably the strongest in the village. Big brother Naruto, I don't think you should fight Sasuke. And why shouldn't I? Naruto asked. Because he's going to be the sixth Okage, the team stated. Naruto became even angrier after that revelation. He just kept thinking about how it was unfair that Sasuke got everything. He had to work hard to get anything, and everything just seems to just fall in Sasuke's lap. Sasuke was number one at school. Sasuke had the affection of the girl he once cared for deeply. 
Sasuke was personally trained by their Jonin instructor while he was left to rot. Now it seems that Sasuke was going to live the dream which he wished deep down he could live. It was just so unfair. He looked at Konohamaru. Well, I guess you get to see them my powers in the level of Akage. Meet me there. Naruto poofed to the training ground 7. Sasuke was standing in the middle of the clearing. Naruto and Sasuke were staring at each other intently. The power that was radiating off of them was similar to when Orochimaru and the fifth were fighting. They just stood there looking at each other for two minutes. Konohamaru had arrived with Yumi. They were a distance away. Kashi and those who were at the barbecue shack had felt the immense power and came to check it out. They all landed next to Konohamaru. The Anbu squad came when they felt Sasuke and an unfamiliar power. They surrounded Naruto. Sasuke spoke to the Anbu squad. Stand down. A man with a bear mask spoke. Lord Sasuke, we have a duty to take in anyone who acts against the shinobi of the leaf. I said to stand down. Don't get involved no matter what happens. He said this while looking at Naruto the whole time. The Anbu squad decided to watch the fight. Tsunade and Jiraiya walked up next to the small group that consisted of ninjas. What's going on here? Tsunade asked. Older brother Naruto is about to kick Sasuke's ass, Konohamaru replied. Hanabi, who was training with Hinata, had felt the power that came from them earlier. Her and Hinata had arrived in time to hear Konohamaru's proclamation. She decided to comment on what she thought to be a ridiculous comment. You really are a fool, monkey boy. Naruto can't beat Lord Sasuke. He's going to be the sixth. No way he loses to him. Naruto looked to his left to see a lot of ninjas looking at him and Sasuke. He saw Konohamaru with Yumi. She was the only person he was looking for. However, he saw the one person that had broke his heart six years ago. His eyes narrowed when she came next to Tsunade. The pink-haired Konoichi, known as Sakura, had not changed a bit. Granted, she got taller and her wardrobe now consisted of a red top, a beige skirt with black shorts under, and black knee-high sandals. Naruto just smiled. This was the perfect opportunity to beat Sasuke in front of Kakashi, Sakura, and everyone else. He turned back to Sasuke and was smiling. Sasuke was curious. What are you smiling at, dope? Just smiling at how I'm going to show everyone how weak you really are, Sasuke. Sasuke's eyes narrowed at that statement. Naruto calling Sasuke was one thing, but saying that he was a fag boy was over the line. He shifted into a fighting stance. Then show me, with pleasure. Naruto and Sasuke formed hand seals faster than anyone could follow. They both yelled, Fire style, dragon flame jutsu. A big dragon flew from both of their mouths. Both dragons collided and canceled each other out. No one could see what would happen after that due to the dirt blocking their vision. Tsunade was about to stop their battle when Jiraiya grabbed her. Don't get involved. They have some unresolved issues that they need to settle. Just sit back and watch the show. I guarantee that we won't see a fight like this again. Sakura was looking, trying to see what was happening. Neji saw her worry, so he decided to tell her what was happening. They are engaging in a taijutsu match. Neither one is getting the upper hand. When the dust cleared, everyone saw both fighters blocking the other's punches and kicks. Sasuke did a roundhouse kick that sent Naruto into a nearby tree. Everyone was looking on in amazement. Naruto rubbed his jaw. Damn, he's good. I didn't want to do this, but I guess I have no choice. Naruto walked back to the clearing where Sasuke stood in his fighting stance. That was a nice kick, but let's stop playing with each other. How about you take off your weights, and I take off mine so we can pick up where we left off six years ago? Naruto complimented. Sasuke spoke in a mocking tone. You sure that's what you want? When I take off my weights, this fight is going to be more or less over. Just take them off already, Naruto said in a bored tone. Both warriors took off their weights. Sasuke took off his wrist, ankle, and vest, which were all weighted. Naruto took off the weight tag that was in his shoes. He also took off the ones that were under his wristbands, as well as the one that was under his shirt and pants. Naruto was ready. Both warriors blurred out of everyone's sight. Kashi was stunned. Anko spoke. What the hell? Where did they go? They're moving at a high speed. I can follow them, but barely. They are exchanging blows, he commented. 
Out of everyone that was there, only Jiraiya and Tsunade saw what was exactly happening. Kashi, Lee, and Guy were barely keeping up with the speed. Jiraiya, who was looking at the fight, intently smiled. He knew what had just happened. Sasuke had just got kicked in his face. Everyone except those who could follow the light had saw Sasuke fly into a tree. Edgy smirk. It looks like the Uchiha is eating dirt. Most of the ninjas that were there couldn't believe what they had just heard. Sasuke was on par with the fifth. When a lot of ninjas and Sasuke fans saw that he was pulling himself out of the little ditch, they were surprised to say the least. Impossible, I never seen anyone who was able to lay a hit on Lord Sasuke, an Anbu guard said. What does that guy think he is, hurting Sasuke, said a dream fangirl. Give me a look at that girl. That's my Naruto, this Sasuke of yours can't ever beat my Naruto. Not that tensed up, that's what the girl had said. The happiness that she held regarding his return had died there and then. I should have told uh, him how I felt when we were younger. I should have followed my heart and lived with him when I saw him leave that day. I just wish that her thoughts were cut off by the Anbu man with the frog mask who looked at Yumi. You mean Naruto as in the golden fox? She looked back at Naruto who was waiting for Sasuke to pull himself together. The very same. Sasuke finally got up. His lip was bleeding. He wiped the blood away with the back of his hand. He smiled. The dope got better. No matter, I'm still gonna kick his ass. Sasuke did some hand seals. When he was finished, his right hand was holding his left wrist. The Shidori was forming his left hand. Naruto held out his right hand to form the Rasengan. I held back last time, Sasuke. This time, I won't. The promise that I made with Sakura no longer applies. You better come at me with everything you got. Sakura heard Naruto had called her by her clan name instead of her given name. She was hurt, but after what she did to him, she couldn't blame him. She just hoped that he and Sasuke didn't get hurt. She looked at Yumi, who had earlier told the Chunin that Naruto wouldn't lose to Sasuke. She wondered if this girl was Naruto's girlfriend. Sasuke knew that Naruto was serious. He always wondered why Naruto held back. Now, he had his answer. It was because of Sakura. Sasuke looked at Naruto with a steely gaze. A plan to do just that. They continued to look at each other for a second. In the second that seemed like an eternity ended, they both took off at each other, armed with two of the most fearsome jutsus ever created. Everyone looked on in awe, waiting to see what happened next. Next chapter, more on the Naruto and Sasuke battle. This is going to be a battle for the ages, it's rival against rival, Rasengan against Chidori. Tune in to find out how the battle concludes. Naruto and Sasuke ran at full speed toward one another. The distance, which seemed like a mile, began to close. The sound of a thousand birds was heard throughout the area. As Sasuke ran forward, the ground underneath his Chidori began to break like grass. Subjected to a high pitch, Naruto's Rasengan was a perfect orb, with the chakra spinning inside of it. Sasuke pulled his arm back. Naruto did the same with his right hand, both preparing to thrust forward their trademark attacks. Both warriors thrust their arms towards one another, and before their jutsus made contact, they yelled, Rasengan! Chidori! Both jutsus made contact. There was a big flash of light emitted from the jutsus that caused everyone to squint. When the light died down and both figures were visible, everyone saw both warriors trying to overpower the other. Kakashi was looking on in shock. Jiraiya was wearing a grin. And Sakura looked like she was worried. Sakura was about to say something to Kakashi, but before she could, an explosion had occurred. She quickly turned away from the copy ninja to see what had happened between Naruto and Sasuke. Both warriors were flying back in the direction that came. Naruto did a flip mid-flight too and landed on his feet. He stood as if nothing had happened. Sasuke did the same. Sasuke was furious that his attack didn't work. He had put everything he had and it was cancelled out. But that wasn't really the thing that made him furious. What really pissed him off was that Naruto was standing there, 
as if he was unfazed by his attack at all. Sasuke thought to himself, How the hell can he stand there and act like that didn't faze him? I know he's hurt. The dope is just acting tough. No matter. I'll prove that I'm stronger. Naruto was a little surprised that his attack was equal ground. But he wasn't that surprised since he didn't put everything he had into it. Naruto thought to himself, I should have pumped more chakra into my Rasengan. I wouldn't be standing there all nonchalant. This is going to be so fun, but he has no idea that I'm still holding back. Jiraiya wondered why Naruto didn't pump more into his Rasengan. He knew what Naruto was capable of with that technique, and by no chance should the Chidori should have equaled it in power. He spoke his thoughts. Naruto, why didn't you put more power into the Rasengan? Tsunade looked at Jiraiya. You're telling me that he's not going all out? Jiraiya realized that he spoke out loud. He cursed himself for that. He wanted Naruto to surprise them with what he was holding back. To keep the surprise, the Toad Hermit decided to keep his answer short. No. No, he is not going all out. Everyone's attention turned to Jiraiya. He could sense that everyone was looking at him. Some probably wanted to ask questions. He responded before anyone could question him on how he knew that Naruto was holding back. Don't worry, you will all see in due time. Naruto looked at Sasuke. He smirked. Then he spoke. Hey Sasuke, let's take this up a notch. Sasuke gave his infamous smirk. Sure, let's do that. Sasuke vanished from sight. Naruto's eyes went wide. He didn't even see where Sasuke went until he felt the kick planted on his chin. Naruto was suspended in midair. Sasuke appeared directly behind him. Naruto turned his head slightly to see a smirking Sasuke. From here on out, it's all original, the Uchiha stated. Sasuke threw a punch with his left, expecting Naruto to block it. He swung around, making Naruto think that he was going to kick with his right leg. He then planted the back of his left hand, which was balled up into a fist, into Naruto's face. Naruto was sent hurling into the ground. Sasuke punched him in the stomach with his right hand, and then he followed it with his left. Both punches was followed by Sasuke doing a front flip that landed on Naruto's stomach. Sasuke yelled, Lion's Barrage! Sasuke bent his body so he could do a backflip. He smiled as he looked at Naruto. Everyone else looked on. Konohamaru, Yumi, and Tsunade looked on in shock. Everyone else seemed to expect this. Hanabi looked at Konohamaru then laughed. He said he was going to kick whose ass. Pathetic. He stood no chance. Konohamaru couldn't say anything. She was right. Naruto was lying before Sasuke, beaten. From what he could see, Naruto was passed out. He was hoping that his brother would knock the arrogant Uchiha down a bit. He wasn't the only one. Neji had wanted this too. Jiraiya was cool as a cucumber. He didn't look surprised about what just happened. Jiraiya just smiled. Neji caught on to this. Something wasn't right. He believed the old man knew something. Hinata was hoping that Naruto got back up. No one took notice, but she was glaring at Sasuke. Sasuke stood there triumphant. He began to speak. You have improved, dope, but I'm still better. Do you really think you are better than me? It's sad her girlfriend had to see this, but you're too weak to do anything. I am your better. Know it and understand it. <laughs> the golden fox, more like the beaten kitten. Still think of me as the dead last I see familiar voice stated. Sasuke's eyes went wide. He looked at Naruto, who was in a crater. Naruto turned into a huge rock. Sasuke's eyes narrowed out of anger. Naruto had escaped his lion's barrage. Everyone looked behind them to see Naruto standing on a tree branch, arms folded, while leaning on the trunk of the tree. He jumped down and landed behind everyone that was gathered. He walked up to Yumi, who was happy that he was okay. He smiled at her and spoke. Don't worry, that kick was weak. Anyway, I had to kick everyone's precious Sasuke. Tsunade and Jiraiya laughed at the remark. Neji grinned at it. Lee and Guy's jaw were hanging at what Naruto said. The 
Before Naruto proceeded, he stopped and looked at Hanabi with cold eyes. It seems that you are wrong about me. I think it's time that I show everyone that Sasuke isn't so great. Since he said I was pathetic, I will leave you with no doubts about my ability after this battle. Naruto turned to look at Jiraiya with a serious look, then he smiled. Pervy Sage, I think it's time I become the feather, don't you think? Jiraiya nodded with a smile. Do what you want, just don't embarrass him too much. Not a problem, Naruto stated. He walked until everyone was at least 10 feet behind him. If Lux could kill, then Sasuke's glare would have killed Naruto. Naruto just kept on smiling. You're probably wondering how I escaped from the technique you stole from Lee. Well, it wasn't hard. When he brought down her foot down to kick me, I shielded my chest area with chakra. Much like how Neji does, I then used a substitution with a nearby rock, and the rest is self-explanatory. Sasuke's eyes remained narrowed at the QB container. He was pissed that Naruto escaped his mind's barrage without a scratch. He closed his eyes to calm himself. He then smiled. He still had a few aces up his sleeve, so he shouldn't get too worked up. Sasuke thought to himself, I could use the Magekyo power. He's fast. My Sharingan doesn't have time to efficiently counter. Well, the Mangekyo would help as long as I don't use Tsukiyomi. Matarasu or Susano. With the Mangekyo, I'd be able to predict his movements better and counter accordingly. The regular Sharingan couldn't keep up with the speed, but these eyes will. Naruto, you should consider yourself lucky. You're the second person who has forced me to use the Mangekyo. He opened his eyes. Naruto wondered what Sasuke had planned. He then realized what happened when Sasuke had opened his eyes to reveal the Mangekyo. Naruto got into a battle stance. His eyes now were directed at Sasuke's feet. Part of Naruto's training was to prepare him to fight Itachi. He knew how to protect an opponent's movement through their feet. He knew that Sasuke could do what Itachi did to Sasuke so many years ago. Naruto, you're the second person that I've shown these eyes to. You should feel honored. These eyes are more powerful than the regular Sharingan. I hope you're ready to lose, dope, Sasuke said confidently. Naruto got into a fighting stance. Naruto took off towards Sasuke. When he prepared to throw a right to Sasuke's face, Naruto found that a foot was placed into his stomach before his punch could connect. Sasuke punched Naruto in the face with his left hand. He stumbled back. Sasuke flipped over Naruto and landed behind him. He then did a roundhouse with his left foot which connected with Naruto's head. They sent him flying in the distance before he hit the ground and skidded a few feet before coming to a stop. Sasuke stood in his fighting stance with an aura of superiority. Naruto got up. His black short sleeve shirt looked ragged. Smudges of dirt were plastered on his face. Sasuke had smudges of dirt on his face as well. His black long sleeve Uchiha shirt was tattered, but not as bad as Naruto's. The group of watchers were focused on this high Jonin level the Kage battle. A voice from behind caught everyone's attention. It seems everyone is right here, right, Akamaru? The dog walking beside the boy with a gray jacket, black shirt underneath. Black shorts that ended two inches above his black sandals. Hinata walked up to pet the white dog. So, Naruto is fighting Sasuke. Akamaru smelled the prisons. I was surprised when I got back from my mission to hear Akamaru tell me that Naruto was here. Kiba spoke to Hinata. She looked at him while petting Akamaru. Yes, Naruto and Sasuke are fighting. Hinata turned her head to look at Naruto. Sasuke is using the Mangekyo, so I don't know how he plans to win. Hinata commented sadly. Everyone heard noise near the tree Naruto was in a few minutes or so ago. They turned their heads to see Ino and Shikamaru. The two looked like they were fighting. Shikamaru, why are you complaining that I asked you to come here with me? You weren't doing anything but laying in your backyard looking at the sky, Ino stated. Coming here to see Naruto and Sasuke fight doesn't interest me. I'm sure that they could have resolved these issues without me being a spectator. Ino just grabbed Shikamaru while she leapt off the tree onto the ground. They both landed and joined the rest of the ninjas that were watching the battle. 
Ino looked at Sakura. She wondered what was going through Sakura's mind. Sakura, are you okay? Ino asked. Yes, I'm fine. Sakura answered. Yumi saw Ino standing by Sakura. The last time she saw the girl, she had offered to take her mother to the hot springs to relax. Yumi walked over to Ino, followed by Konohamaru. Excuse me, Ino, but do you know where my mother is? Ino took her attention off of Sakura to look at Yumi. Oh, my. Asked that I escort to the hotel, she said she was tired. Yumi smiled at the girl. Thank you, Ino. Shikamaru walked up to Sanade and Jiraiya. So, how's Naruto doing? Shikamaru asked. He doesn't seem to be fair and too good. Sasuke just activated his Mangekyo and he has the advantage in speed now. He's beating Naruto to a pulp, as you can see. The fifth pointed out. Sasuke won't have the advantage for long, Jiraiya stated. Never taking his eyes off the student, everyone who heard what he said turned to face him. Neji looked at the Toad Hermit. Care to clarify? Jiraiya closed his eyes and smiled. He then opened his eyes to face the Hugo Prodigy. Naruto has yet to reveal his true power. Watch, because this fight is about to get real interesting. Kakashi decided to speak to Jiraiya. Lord Jiraiya, with all due respect, how do you figure Naruto isn't going all out? It looks like he's doing everything he can to keep up with Sasuke, but he's failing horribly. Dry gave a Kakashi a look of disgust. You're like Sarutobi Sensei in many aspects. Always put your time and energy into the student you favored among all the others. You don't know and will never know what Naruto is capable of, because everyone believes that it's better to train a genius than someone who would have to actually put effort into training. You ignored him, pushed him to the side so you could focus on Sasuke. Your sensei never did that, Kakashi. He would be disappointed in you. Kakashi put his head down in shame. It was all true. It wasn't that he didn't like Naruto, just that Kakashi felt that Sasuke would be a better ninja. So he decided to hone his skills instead. Hell, he even helped Sakura work on Genjutsu. The only thing that he helped Naruto was with his tree climbing exercise. He taught Sasuke the Chidori, his prized technique. Sakura couldn't believe what she heard Jiraiya accuse Kakashi of. Sure, Sasuke did get more attention, but that was because he had the Sharingan and Kakashi was the only one in the village who could train him on how to use it. Lord Jiraiya, Kakashi Sensei has been fair to all of us, he showed me Genjutsu. Granted, he helped Sasuke more, but that's because he had to train him on how to use the Sharingan better. The pink cured, Konoichi said. Jiraiya looked at her with equal disgust. Yet, you didn't mention what he taught Naruto. I'm not surprised, seeing as you spent most of your time focusing on Sasuke, so there's no way you would know if he trained Naruto. Sakura, you watch this battle more than anyone. In a way, this battle has a lot to do with you. Shinade looked at Jiraiya with a question look. How does this battle involve Sakura? Shikamaru decided to answer. It's because Naruto promised to return Sasuke to Sakura who wouldn't hurt anymore. From what he told me, he looked at Ino. Sakura stated that she hated Naruto, and she called him a dead last, who should have left instead of Sasuke. He looked at Sakura. I was there when he promised that he would bring back the guy who turned on us for power, for your sake. If what Lord Jiraiya says about Naruto is correct, then you more than anyone should watch this fight. So now I looked at Shikamaru. You only answered my question halfway, how does this involve Sakura and why should she watch? The shadow user turned to look at Tsunade with a lazy expression. I was going to answer, but it's too troublesome to explain. Tsunade gritted her teeth. Why you little? And she spoke before the Hokage could pound the Nara. It's obvious. Everyone turned to face Neji. Neji continued once he had everyone's attention. I was also there when Naruto made her that promise. The reason this battle has to do with Sakura is because Naruto wants to prove a point to her. And what point is he trying to get across? Ino asked. All his life, he was behind Sasuke. Everyone seems to love Sasuke and hate Naruto. He's been fighting all his life to be accepted, but to no avail, this village has never accepted him. Naruto cared deeply for Sakura. He would have gone to hell and back for her. If I know Naruto, he's going to show Sakura that he is stronger than Sasuke. 
and not the dead last she called him. Neji turned to face Sakura. In a sick way, he's still trying to prove himself to you. Everyone turned around when they heard Naruto crash in the ground. Naruto's shirt had rips in it. Blood was coming from his lip. He picked himself up. Sasuke looked at Naruto. Naruto, give up. You can't win. You can't keep up with me. There's no way you could win. Sasuke said to his blonde opponent with confidence. Naruto wiped the blood from his mouth. He smiled at what Sasuke said. You're right about one thing. I can't win. Not in my current state, at least. I wasn't expecting to do this, Sasuke. But you left me no choice. Naruto spread his legs apart until he was crouching down. His arms came together to form an X. His index finger and middle finger were the only fingers extended on both hands. Purple surrounded Naruto's body. All over his body, purple seals that looked like tattoos covered his body. All those who were looking at the fight were curious to what Naruto was doing, but only a select few knew what those seals actually meant. Sonata's eyes were wide in shock. The same could be said for Kakashi and Gai. There's no way, but how? I, I thought Gai tried to form a sentence. Kakashi couldn't even answer. He was speechless. So, this is what Jiraiya was talking about. I hope Sasuke has a plan because the Mangekyo isn't going to be enough. The copy ninja thought to himself. Tsunade looked at Jiraiya. Those seals, Jiraiya. Those are gravity seals, right? He nodded his head to confirm the question Tsunade had asked. You know was confused by the whole ordeal. Excuse me, but what are gravity seals? Guy spoke. No surprise, no one has used them in over 20 years. Gravity seals are seals that are placed on the body. A seal master paints them on the person who requests to have them. Or if the person is a seal master, he can draw the seals in the visible part of his body. Seeing as Naruto has it all over his back, a seal master did the procedure for him. To answer your question, gravity seals are like weights, but much better. Using a hand seal that's formatted to the seals, a person could increase the gravity of the seals. They affect the whole body, whereas the weights that we and I wear only target certain muscles. Imagine this, if you will. If the gravity was to elevate, it would feel heavier, making it harder to move as fast as we normally would. Doing this constantly, you would get used to the gravity until it felt normal to you. Now, going back to the gravity before adapting to the gravity of the seal, your strength and speed would increase exponentially. Kakashi got over a shock. The last person who was capable of creating the gravity seal was the four. Well, he was the last person in this village anyway. He turned to Jiraiya, who created the seals for Naruto. Tsunade answered. Judging by the design, it was... Naya White Toe. White Diamond. Guy's eyes went wide. Really? Kurnai was clueless. She had no idea who they were talking about. Guy, who is this Naya Waito? Okami Nofusa, the seal mistress. I think that's how you say it, Guy said. Kurnai's eyes went wide. She knew the reputation of the seal mistress. Whilst every ninja in her age group end up knew about the seal mistress. Her skills at seals were comparable to Tsunade's skills in medicine. Kurt and I looked back at the fight. He didn't even have to go all out on us. He was playing with us the whole time. And this kid has come a long way. Lee looked at Guy with enthusiasm. Guy Sensei, do you think that she can place those seals on me? Sorry Lee, but I have no idea where she is. She disappeared 20 years ago and no one knows where she is. But don't worry, Lee. We will have to increase your weights. He gave the nice guy pose. Lee was on the verge of tears. Guy Sensei! Lee! Guy Sensei! Lee! Tsunade cut the two men who were embracing one another in a hug. Jiraiya, did you take Naruto to see Naya? No. Naruto had the seals done while he was with Saiji Kaito. It seems Kaito and Naya are good friends. I even asked Naruto where she was, but he told me that part of their deal for giving him the gravity seals was to never reveal her location. All I can tell you is that those gravity seals are different than to what we were used to seeing. How so? Sanai asked. 
Well, for one, the gravity sets we were used to seeing had to be painted on and had to have a mark where it withdrew from, much like a curse seal. The difference is that this seal doesn't have a mark of origin. Instead, the marks aren't visible. They're only visible because Naruto has deactivated them, and in a minute, they'll fade to match his complexion. When he activates them again, the purple marks will appear again, but they will fade all the same. You only see the marks when he activates and deactivates the seals. So, as Jiraiya had finished explaining how the seal worked, Naruto's seals disappeared. Jiraiya continued to watch Naruto finish the process of releasing the seals. The process is complete. Naruto, who was glowing purple, positioned himself to stand upright again. The purple glow had receded, as well as the seals. Naruto went through hand seals faster than anyone could see. Doro Numina Jutsu! Sasuke jumped in the air when he realized the hand seals Naruto was forming. Sasuke was in the air looking at Naruto. In an instant, Naruto vanished from his sight. You certainly move fast when you're in danger, Sasuke heard a voice from behind him. He was shocked at the speed Naruto moved at. Not even his Mangekyo, the ultimate dojutsu, could follow his current speed. Naruto did a roundhouse kick, sending Sasuke to the ground. Sasuke landed only to be kicked in his back. He skidded to stop face first. Sasuke picked himself up off of the ground. Naruto charged the Uchiha. Sasuke blocked the first punch, but was unsuccessful blocking the next seven. He was lifted in the air by an uppercut, landing on his back. Sasuke got up again. This time, his eyes showed how enraged he was. He calmed down and spoke. So, you're using a seal now to increase your powers. It won't matter. I will still beat you. I am using a seal, but it doesn't give me power. The seals you saw on me were gravity seals. They were activated when we were fighting earlier. I deactivated them because I couldn't keep up with your speed with them on. Just think of them as training wings, but only better, Naruto clarified. Sasuke's eyes opened more than usual. And you tell me that Naruto grinned. Correct. This is my true speed and power. No curse seal, no alternative power source, no blood limit, no nothing. It's all me. Sasuke couldn't believe that the dope surpassed him. His speed was nothing short of amazing, but he would never admit that to Naruto. Sasuke had one option, but he knew that would be taxing his chakra. He hated to admit to himself, but Naruto had outclassed him. Damn, how did this happen? I defeated Itachi and Orochimaru, and now Naruto stands before me, stronger than them both. I have to use it. Susanoo will give me the power and the speed to match him. Sasuke smiled a genuine smile at Naruto. Why should I be mad? He did this fair and square. I hate to say it, dope, but you've earned it. Let's see if he'll go for this. Put it on, Naruto, Sasuke said with no malice or hate. But what on? I have no idea what you're talking about. Naruto knew what Sasuke was talking about, but why did he ask him to do this? Naruto put on the headband. We did fight as equals back then. We shall do so again now. So please put the headband on. I know you have it, Sasuke stated. It was true. Naruto had the headband in his kunai pouch. Naruto smiled at Sasuke. I guess it's appropriate that I wear a headband illustrating that I no longer hold ideals of belief. I don't know why you're asking me to do this. He proceeds to wrap Sasuke's headband around his head. Because you're strong. Sasuke gave Naruto a serious look. And you once said that the headband represents we fight on equal ground. I knew you were conscious when you knocked me out last time. Why didn't you kill me? Naruto asked. Killing my best friend is something I can never do. I'm not my brother. I would never kill you for power, Sasuke answered truthfully. Naruto became enraged. Best friend? When best friend you know shows a Chidori through his best friend's chest, huh? All the spectators couldn't believe what they just heard, especially Kakashi and Sakura. Kakashi couldn't believe he taught Sasuke the move to protect his friends, and Sakura couldn't believe that Sasuke would do that to Naruto. But she couldn't be mad, since what she did was no better. It may have not have been physically painful, but it was all the same to Naruto. Naruto called himself, and then continued. 
You know, Kakashi did teach something that I am grateful to have learned. He taught me what a friend is. Even if he never was really a friend to me, he once said to us, In the ninja world, those who break the rules are scum, that's true. But those who abandon their friends are worse than scum. Sasuke, you are scum, along with Kakashi and Sakura. I thought of you all as friends, but I doubt the feeling was mutual. You have no idea what it is to be a friend. Sasuke, really hoped that things were different between us, but as they stand, there is nothing left for us but to fight. Taking a fighting stance, he smiled at Sasuke. Don't hold back. Sasuke was still smiling. I don't intend to. Sasuke's mangekyo started to glow red. A strange aura. The color of the ocean surrounded its body. Naruto smiled as he felt the aura coming off Sasuke. Sasuke was smiling too. He was finally able to go all out. He hadn't done so since his bout with Itachi. Jiraiya looked at Tsunade. He shoved his Shidori through Naruto's chest. I'm guessing you didn't know until now. The fox must have healed him before he came back to the village. His words echoed so only her ears could hear. Yes, it seems so. Tsunade's eyes were glued on the two fighters on the battlefield while answering. Yumi hadn't noticed Jiraiya there. She walked up to him. Hello, Purvy Sage. How have you been? Jiraiya was cursing Naruto for rubbing off on her in his head. I'm fine. So Yumi, Shinade told me that your mother was here. Where is she now? She's at the hotel. Purvy Sage, stay away from my mother. I know what you have in mind. She glared at the pervert. Putting his hands in defense? No, it's nothing like that. It's just that we had a good time talking last time. I seen her, that's all. Try about to himself. Plus, she gave some good ideas for my last book. I got to pick her brain for more ideas. That book was my bestseller. With a look of worry, Yumi looked at Jiraiya. Jiraiya, that guy is glowing. Do you think that Naruto will be okay? Big Brother Naruto is going to be fine. You see his speed, it's on a whole new level. He's going to be fine, Yumi. But Ahamaru short the worried girl. Sasuke could feel the power coursing through his veins. The power he felt was unreal. Sasuke looked at both of his hands, both had the ocean color aura around it. The Uchiha looked back at Naruto, and then, in a split second, he vanished. He appeared directly behind Naruto. He aimed a kick with his right leg to the right side of Naruto's head. The kick never connected. Naruto blocked with his right arm. He then pivoted 180 degrees to plant his left fist in Sasuke's gut. This was blocked. Naruto threw right to Sasuke's face. He barely blocked it. The kick that followed wasn't blocked. He then took the hit in his face. This sent him up in the air, but he backflipped to land. Naruto vanished from everyone's sight, except Sasuke and a few others. He knew Naruto was about 10 yards to the left of him. He caught him performing seals, and then he stopped. Sasuke knew by the seals Naruto had formed, he was going to fire a water bullet at him. Zutan, Kiritama no Jutsu are the words that Naruto whispered to himself when water in the form of bullets shot out of his mouth. All the projectiles were aiming for Sasuke. Sasuke jumped into the air to avoid the bullets of water that impacted the area ground where he once stood. The only Uchiha clan member went through the hand seals of his own. Katon, Usenka no Jutsu. The fireballs were on their way to Naruto. Before they made contact, Mizu no Tate. After shouting out his technique, his body was encapsulated with water. The fireballs died out as soon as they hit Naruto's water. Sasuke landed back on the ground. The blue aura was still surrounding his body when Naruto dropped his shield. Uchiha was preparing another technique. Raiku Dekiki. Naruto found himself dodging lightning coming from the sky. That was aimed at him. Damn these lightning strikes. If my gravity seals were still activated, I'd be done for. Naruto kept dodging until the technique died down. He was panting, due to the speed at which he had to dodge. You seem tired. Don't tell me that's all you have, the Uchiha stated, taunting his opponent. Nope, not at all. Naruto moved too fast for almost everyone to see. He appeared in front of Sasuke. He threw a punch, which the Mangekyo wielder blocked. Both ninjas exchanged blows that were cancelled out by the other. This continued for two more minutes until Naruto started to notice something. Is it just me, or is Sasuke slowing down? 
As realization dawned on Naruto, he realized what was happening. This technique he's using to enhance his speed and power uses up a lot of chakra. That's why every blow that I countered was aimed at areas to knock me out. He's trying to finish it. He knows that my speed and power is my own, so when his technique dies out, he won't be able to keep up. Sorry Sasuke, but I figured out how this technique operates. You won't be winning today. Naruto tilted his head to the left to avoid a punch. He then countered with his left to the gut, a right to the face, and a roundhouse with his right that sent Sasuke to the ground. Sasuke wiped off the blood that was coming from his mouth. He then stood up again. Naruto was watching Sasuke closely. He wondered if Sasuke realized that this battle was over. He knew Sasuke would never admit it, but deep down, he believed that he had to know. Sasuke, this fight is over. You can't beat me, Naruto said uh, this without showing any emotions. That technique can only be used when you activate the Mangekyo, correct? He asked the question more so to himself than Sasuke. Naruto continued to give his analysis. I see that it eats away at your chakra, which means that the technique was designed to be used to end a fight quickly. The technique was ineffective against me because of my speed and power, not just the power boost that you got from the technique. But unlike your technique, which seems to be fizzling out as we speak, my natural attributes won't fade. The blue aura covering Sasuke began to fade until it was completely gone. The Mangekyo Sharingan disappeared, revealing his onyx eyes. Sasuke knew that if he didn't think of something fast, then this fight was over. What should I do? If I use a Madarasu, then I will drain a significant portion of my chakra. If I use the curse seal in conjunction with the Mangekyo, then no. He's still not using that power that he used in our last fight. If I use that now and exhaust myself, then he could call forth that red chakra and win this fight. A thought came to him. I got it. I'll use. His train of thought was cut off by a kick to the face. Naruto continued the assault on his former teammate. Sasuke was defensiveless to stop him. Naruto was moving so fast that he couldn't manage time to block. Naruto was picking Uchiha apart. The people in the crowd couldn't believe what they were seeing. Sasuke, who was in line to be the next Hokage, was getting beat senseless. Hell yeah! Go Naruto! Kick that pompous Uchiha's ass! Kia shouted, pumping his fist. Rubbing his ears, Shikamaru tried to recover from Kiba's loud cheers. Kiba, could you be any louder? Naruto is winning. It's pointless yelling. Come on, Shikamaru. You can't tell me you're not enjoying this. Kiba said uh, this while having his hand around the shadow user. Shikamaru broke free of the embrace. He then shrugged. I'm only here because Ino felt two immense chakras. I was actually watching the sunset, but the sun is setting, and it looks like I won't be doing what I intended to do. Why didn't you just tell her you didn't feel like coming, did she ask? It would have been so goddamn troublesome to argue with you, know. She would have kept nagging until I said yes, so to avoid her arguing, I decided to come. She's more troublesome than my mom. You know, had overheard what Shikamaru had said. She was not happy, to say the least. She balled her fist and planted it in Shikamaru's head. He was now face first into the dirt. Shikamaru, how dare you call me an nag? If you weren't such a lazy person, no one would have to force you to do things. Another thing, how dare you? Shikamaru rolled on his back to look at the sun setting. Not to sell. Keep your mouth shut. It's less troublesome in the long run. Naruto was attacking Sasuke with a barrage of kicks and punches. Naruto flipped over Sasuke. When he landed, he quickly did a backflip kick. Sasuke went in two feet off the ground before landing on his back. Naruto resumed his fighting stance. Sasuke got back up off the ground. His eyes were fixed on Naruto's. Keep him focused on my eyes. That's it, Naruto. And now, Sasuke activated his Sharingan, so after it went into its Mangekyo form. Naruto had no time to react. He found himself in one of Sasuke's ultimate techniques. Naruto looked around. The sky was red. Every object he could see was black. He looked at his hands to see it was black as well. Where the hell am I? Here in the world of Tsukiyomi, this is the ultimate Genjutsu. There is no escape. I control everything here. Sasuke's voice echoed through the world of Tsukiyomi. Naruto was looking around. Suddenly, he saw Iruka in front of him, dead. Naruto let a tear fall from his eye. Then, he heard a familiar voice scream. He ran in the direction of the voice. He saw Yumi tied to a pole. 
When he tried to run to free her, he was frozen in place. He found himself tied to a cross. All he could do was watch as Sasuke appeared in front of him. I control everything in here, Naruto. Sasuke then turned to Yumi, and I control her life as well. Sasuke walked up to Yumi and placed the sword that he held at her throat. Please don't, Naruto pleaded. Sasuke gave an evil grin before he slit her throat. Sasuke appeared in front of Naruto. He pointed the spot where he just slit Yumi's throat. Her dead form faded, and she then reappeared again. You will watch me kill her over and over for the next 72 hours also. A hundred of Sasuke's appeared in front of Naruto. I will be impaling you with shurikens. All the Sasuke's threw the shurikens, all hit Naruto, who screamed as they made contact. It's only an illusion, but this pain is real. Damn, how can I break this jutsu? Naruto, who's bleeding all over, smirked at Sasuke. Fox, free me from this damn illusion. Naruto hated asking the fox for favors, but the fox wasn't that bad. Well, he started getting better when Naruto became strong. He stopped calling him a weak container. So, finally you want my help. You haven't asked for my help in six years. Ironically, it was to fight this idiot. Just break this jutsu. If I had experienced this technique before, I would have tried to develop a counter for it. Besides, I know you want me to see me kick his ass, Naruto said to the fox. This is a pretty good technique for a human. It is very hard, near impossible for humans to counter. I will break this technique because I refuse for people to see my container as weak, the fox stated. Aw, sounds like you're kinda worried about me. I didn't know that the king of all the tailed beasts could care for a lowly human, Naruto said sarcastically. The cubie growled. Damn you, fourth. I wish I was free from this prison. If I were free, I doubt you would talk to me in such a manner. If I was free, I would feast in your corpse. I would... God damn it, just break the technique. I'm tired of hearing you would eat me if you were free. Say something new, you damn fox. <laughs> you got guts, kid. I'll give you that. Okay, let me break this pathetic technique of this bastard. Sasuke wondering why Naruto was smirking at him. Didn't he know that there's no escaping from this technique? Sasuke was about to say something when Yumi disappeared. All of his copies of himself disappeared as well. Sasuke looked at Naruto. What's going on? Smirking. I'm breaking this jutsu. That's what's going on. Sasuke tried to control his world to no avail. Sasuke started to feel hot. The world around him started to burn. Flames were everywhere. He couldn't move. He was trapped in the fire. He felt the flames burn his skin. Naruto vanished from his post and all Sasuke remembered was screaming. Naruto dropped down to one knee, gasping for air. Sasuke clutched his head and then dropped his knees to the floor, panting. He looked at Naruto with shock in his eyes. What the hell are you? Still panting, he smiled. The one who's going to kick your ass. I must admit, that was the best genjutsu ever, but I have my aces at my sleeve as well. Both warriors, who were about 10 yards away from one another, stood on their feet. Naruto was feeling the mental effects of Tsukiyomi, and Sasuke was feeling pain all over. Sasuke activated his Mangekyo Sharingan again, and it faded as soon as his technique was broken. Kurna, who specialized in genjutsu, knew that it was impossible to counter this technique. Tsukiyomi was the ultimate genjutsu. How in the hell did he counter that technique? By all accounts, he should not be fighting, he should be in a coma. I wouldn't have believed it if I didn't see it, that's all Kakashi could say. Asuma's cigarettes was already on the ground. He was watching the fight without saying a word to anyone, but he was speechless. Now speechless was an understatement. Anko couldn't grasp how he did it. Neji was curious as well, but he didn't expect anything less from Naruto. If one thing is for sure, it's that Naruto is full of surprises. Nabi was watching in utter shock. She couldn't believe that someone was not only standing toe to toe with Sasuke, but that said person was winning. Talk about shock to the system. She looked at Konohamaru and frowned. She was going to prove her wrong for once. She hated being proven wrong. The Uchiha did the hand seals necessary. His right hand was now clutching his left wrist. Electricity was visible in his left hand that was palm side down. A ring of chakra was on the ground. He stood in the middle. Naruto wasted no time for his Rasengan. 
This Rasengan was different from its usual Rasengan. The inside became more of a royal blue, while the outside was the color of his chakra. This time, he put as much power as possible. One thing that both ninjas knew, certain, was that this attack would decide the battle. Guy looked at Kakashi. It seems that he's going to use Raikiri. Looks like he's going to go all out. Who do you think will win? I don't know, but both techniques are powerful. We'll see in a few minutes, I'm sure. Naruto and Sasuke held their gaze on one another. Naruto, it seems we're back to where we finished our last battle. Let's see if your Sengon can stand up to my Raikiri, the Uchiha stated. This ends now, Sasuke. It's time we settle the score. He said in a serious manner. Both warriors took off. They were running toward it, and ended the battle. Sasuke and Naruto were closing the distance that separated them. When they finally got within reaching distance, they readied their techniques to make contact. Naruto and Sasuke looked in each other's eyes. Odama Rasengan! Raikiri! Both techniques collided. Everything went white. The whitelessness enveloped the landscape, taking the vision of all who were looking at this fight. When the light died down, there was a crater where both fighters had collided. Instincts took over. Sakura and Yumi both ran to the crater. Everyone followed suit. Yumi and Sakura arrived at the crater at the same time. Their eyes widened the sight before them. Everyone reached the crater as well. The same expression came across their face when they looked inside of the crater. Inside the crater, Naruto stood over the unconscious Sasuke. His eyes were focused on the Sharingan wielder. Naruto then untied the headband around his head. He placed the headband on Sasuke's chest, then picked him up, bridal style. He walked towards the crowd. When he got near Sakura and Kakashi, he laid Sasuke down. Don't worry, Kakashi. I didn't kill your prize student. I just knocked him out. He should wake up in an hour or so. He said, uh, void of emotions. He cringed when he didn't add the sensei. With the exception of Jiraiya, they looked at him in shock, but he ignored it. He walked past everyone and went straight to Yumi, who was next to Konamaru. I think we should get some rest. Let's head back to the hotel. Yumi looked at him. He had cuts and scrapes all over his body. Sakura walked up to Naruto and smiled. Naruto, you're injured. Let me heal you. Sakura went to place her hands above his arm to kill the cut, but he slapped it away. He turned away and walked off. Sakura looked as his back moved away from her. Naruto, please let me heal you. He stopped and turned around. He looked at Ino. If memory serves me right, Ino. Didn't Haruno tell me never to speak to her again? He finally turned his gaze at Sakura. The only reason you want to help me now is because you feel guilty. I don't need your help. As far as I'm concerned, you're dead to me. Sakura felt as if a knife went into her heart. His words stung her. Tears were swelling up in her eyes. Naruto gave a smirk. Did my words hurt you? I'm glad now you understand how I felt. Sakura, you're pathetic. Tears slid down her cheek. Naruto, we were friends. Why would you say such a hurtful thing? He spoke once more. Sakura, let's get one thing straight. You and I were never friends. I only had a few people that I could call friends in this village. You treated me badly whenever I tried to be friends with you. Whenever Sasuke and I argued, you would take his side. I did everything I could to prove that I was worthy of your friendship. I even protected you and this village from Gara. Still, everyone hated me. If it wasn't for me, he pointed at Tsunade. She wouldn't be Hokage of this village. Hell, if it wasn't for me, he pointed at Kakashi. Zabuza would have killed him. He paused for a second. Sakura. Don't ever speak to me again. Maybe you should have let Gara kill you, since you're so pathetic. Kakashi came to her defense. Naruto, that's enough. You've gone too far. Naruto glared at the man with the mask. It's just like Hatake to protect his two precious students. I don't see how this involves you. Stay out of this scum. Kakashi gritted his teeth under his mask. Naruto smiled, knowing he got a rise out of him. What, did I say something that pissed off the great Hatake? It must have been when I called you scum. Don't get mad. I call it like I see it. How do you figure that I'm scum, Naruto, he asked in a normal, calm facade. You consider people who abandon their friends and comrades as scum. Right, I guess it goes without saying, he calmly replied. Naruto spoke once more. You abandoned me to train Sasuke during the Chunin exams, when I asked for your help. You taught him and Sakura, but whenever I asked for your help, you said eh, that my chakra control was horrible. Not once did you recommend something that would help me gain better chakra control. How does it feel to have your best student beaten by the one you consider to be your worst? He looked at the Anbu members and the Chunin and the Joni fangirls. This is the guy you worship? Is this your sex Okage? He couldn't even beat me and you expect him to protect the village? 
Gambu members and the fangirl Kunoichis were fuming. He then turned his gaze to Sonate. Your successor sucks. So, do you believe I'm worthy of the 90 million Ryu since I beat the soon to be sixth? Naruto looked at all the female Kunoichis swooning over Sasuke. He knew no matter what he did, Sasuke would always have the respect. He proved that he had the strength to be Okage, but he would never have the title. He knew that this village would never accept him, no matter what. Sometimes he wondered why he didn't start his own village. He stored that thought. He might do that. Hey Hatake, when he wakes up, ask him how does he feel to lose to the dead last. Also, how does it feel to know that he can't beat me? Naruto was taunting Kakashi. Naruto stopped acting like an ass and stopped being mean, Yumi said slightly mad at him. For the first time, Naruto looked at Yumi with hate in his eyes. You only know them for a minute and you take up for them? They treat me like crap and it's okay, but I speak how I feel and I'm an ass? No, Yumi. You're an ass for taking up for all these people who would probably want you dead for being associated with me. Naruto turned around and stormed off, leaving Yumi shocked. Where are you going, Naruto? The concerned girlfriend asked. What does it matter? The words escaped his mouth in a sad tone. She turned to Jiraiya. Why is he acting like this? I never once saw him belittle someone. He always encouraged others to do their best. The Toad Hermit decided to answer. Many people in this village hate Naruto. I'm sure you know why, but he won't talk about that here. This village has done nothing to help him or make him believe in himself. True, he could have decided not to taunt everyone here, but to understand why he acts this way to most of the people here. You will have to ask Naruto, Yumi. It's simple. When a person gives all they have to others and gets nothing in return, it's only natural. They become cold and bitter to those they have given their all to. Everyone turned around to hear the unknown stranger speak. With his mini afro, black jacket, black pants, and black sandals, Shino had gained the attention of everyone. Tsunade looked at Sasuke. Kakashi, take Sasuke home, and everyone else go about your business. Everyone started to walk off. Konohamaru walked up to Yumi. Let me walk you back to the hotel Yumi Nichon. Don't worry, Naruto Nissan is going to be okay. Yumi looked up and smiled. I'm sure he will. I'm sure he will. Yumi and Konohamaru walked in the direction of the hotel. Shikamaru was still lying on the ground. The moon looks nice from here. Maybe I should get home. He thought it over for a second. On second thought, I think I'll wait here for a second. I already dealt with one troublesome woman today. I don't need to hear my mom bitch about me being lazy. I don't know about how my dad does it. Being wit is so troublesome. The lazy Jonin continued to look at the moon and the stars and the sky. On top of the Hokage monument sat a lone young man who was looking off into the night sky. Sitting on the head of the fourth Hokage, Naruto sat in deep thought. Naruto thought about Yumi and what he said to her. Realizing what he said to her, he sighed. He also was aware of the fact that the council and everyone else in the village was going to hate him for what he did to their precious Sasuke. No matter what he did for Konoha, he always would be seen as the demon. His thoughts also flashed back to his dream to become Hokage. Or rather, his former dream. He clenched his dirt smudged fist. Everything he ever tried to work for, Sasuke seemed to get without trying. He hated to admit it to himself, but he was jealous of Sasuke. His thoughts drifted to when he first met Konohamaru. He remembered what he told the boy all those years ago. He remembered looking at the third's grandson in the eyes and saying, there are no shortcuts. Oh, how true that was. For all the strength that he possesses, he had to work hard to obtain it. Sasuke had the Sharingan and could copy everything. He himself, on the other hand, trained his body to the brink. Maybe that's why Kakashi trained Sasuke instead. He didn't really have to teach, Naruto wondered. I knew you would be up here, the perverted hermit spoke, breaking his concentration. Naruto looked up to see a sensei giving him a warm smile. When you want, pervy sage, the blonde questioned. He was now looking at a sensei with a look that gave off no emotion. To see how you were doing, Jiraiya answered. Jiraiya may not have been able to see the emotion on Naruto's face, but he knew that if he was on the monument, then he was sad. This was one of the few places that Naruto went when he was sad. Jiraiya knew this after watching Naruto a few times. Naruto, you can't lie to me. 
I know you're probably a bit angry, but what you said to Sakura and Kakashi was wrong. Naruto's eyes showed fury. He thought he was coming up here to talk to him about anything, but he never did think it was about his treatment to those two. If he had said Yumi, then he would have not gone angry, but to those two, and expect him not to feel what he felt was absurd to him. Just when I thought you were here to talk to me about Yumi or something else, you bring up Kakashi and Haruno. Every time I speak how I feel, it's a problem, but others can speak to me any way they feel and get away with it. Tough luck, if I hurt anyone's feelings, I don't give a crap. Naruto spat out in an anger-filled tone. Dry spoke. So you don't care if you hurt Yumi? Naruto's anger died down immediately. Naruto knew he was wrong for yelling at her, but he was just mad. Jiraiya gave a sigh. <sighs> Look, Naruto, I'm not here to tell you to apologize to anyone. That decision is solely on you, but I will say this. Grow up, Naruto. Naruto's eyes widened at what his teacher said, and when they narrowed just as quickly as they widened. Grow up? I grew up as soon as the woman I saw as the only mother I'd ever had kicked me out of the village. I grew up when the girl I gave my all to please has told me nothing as more than of an annoyance. I grew up when my friend shoved a chidori through my chest. I grew up when my sensei refused to train me to train another student. I grew up when the day my dream was killed. I grew when I finally realized that no matter what I did for this village, they would always see me as nothing more than a demon that destroyed their families. Now you stand here and tell me to grow up. I've grown up, so don't stand there and say something like that to me. Jiraiya's eyes never broke contact with the student. Naruto, you have grown up into a strong, brave, and decent human being. I never doubted that you have grown up, but you haven't grown up enough to put the past behind you. Naruto's eyes fixed on the ground. Why should I put the past behind me? The past is part of who I am. He pointed to the village. They can't seem to put the past behind them, so why should I? Naruto looked at Jiraiya, searching for the answer, as if it was in the hermit's eyes. Jiraiya placed a hand on his student's shoulder and smiled. Because Naruto, you're better than them. I watched you grow from an annoying, overconfident, loudmouthed brat and into an annoying, overconfident, loudmouthed young man. A young man that I'm proud of. Naruto smiled. He always thought of Jiraiya as a grandfather, so for him to feel that he was proud of him made the blonde boy feel happy. Naruto's smile quickly turned into a look of sadness. I'm glad that you're proud of me, but how do I put the past behind me when it hurts so much? He shrugged his shoulders. Honestly, I don't know Naruto. However, I do know that hate will not change anything. Naruto, the past is the past, so don't let it hurt you. Look towards the future now. You have Yumi now. Doesn't the future look better than the past? Also, you proved to everyone in this village who called you a monster in the dead last. Wrong. You beat their precious Uchiha, and when you did get strong enough, you didn't take out your aggressions on them. So I know you could leave the past in the past. That's why you are better than them. Naruto looked towards the stars in the sky. He was contemplating on everything that Jiraiya had told him. He was right. Naruto didn't grow up enough to put the past behind him. Also, he had Yumi, and that was a gift from God in his eyes. He knew that his future no longer lied in Konoha, but he did have a few people here that cared for him. That was enough, so he made a resolution to just let it go. Everything would start off with a clean slate. As far as Kakashi, Sakura, and Sasuke was concerned. He would no longer hold grudges because he was better than that. He looked back at Drive. You're right, pervy sage. I am better than them. I'll put the past behind me. From this day forward, I will start with a new slate with everyone. Sakura, Kakashi, Sasuke, even Granny. I won't hold a grudge because in the end, it was I who turned out for the better. I've given my word, and I never go back on my word, because that is my nindo, my ninja way. Thanks, Pervy Sage, for making me see what I should have seen all along. Who would have thought a perverted old man could be so wise? 
Well, I do have my moments. Anyway, I think you should go talk to Tsunade. He dropped a smile and gave Naruto a look to illustrate his seriousness. You should know that she didn't want to banish you. I know she didn't want to, but it just hurt. I know she has obligations to Hokage, but I just wished she was there for me. The council was against me from day one. They saw their chance to get rid of me, and they did, Naruto said. Jiraiya continued looking into his student's eyes. Naruto, be careful. The council is against you. Even though the Hokage who has the most power, her power is not absolute. If everyone on the council comes together, they can overthrow even her rule. They will band together and try to send you on suicide missions. So Naruto, be careful. Naruto took it all in. You're probably right. It did seem that everyone was against me in that meeting besides Granny. I know they probably are trying to kill two birds with one stone. They're hoping that I can help end this war and die in the process. Well, I'm going to take everything that they will and can throw at me. Jiraiya smiled at his students' comments. He knew how the council members hated Naruto. He knew that as soon as they got the chance, they would send him into a suicide mission. Or it would at least be one for anyone else. They're going to be disappointed when he completes every mission that they throw at him. He broke free from his train of thought. Naruto, it's getting late. Maybe you should go to your hotel room. Naruto nodded in agreement. I probably should. Yumi is going to be worried sick. I just hope she didn't tell Mai. The last thing I need is her screaming at me. So, Purvy Sage, where are you going? Jiraiya gave his student a cheesy smile. I'm going to continue my research. I'll see you before you leave for your mission tomorrow. Later. Naruto frowned at his sensei's actions. Perverted hermit. Going to a whorehouse isn't research. It's just you're getting pleasure. Naruto shook his head at the thought of Jiraiya and some poor lady. He then headed back to the town below. Before he went to the hotel, he had to do something else. Uchiha district. Naruto had walked in the Uchiha district. When he was young, he remembers it being full of life. As it stands today, there's nothing more than an eerie ghost town. Naruto walked to the house that housed the only member of the Uchiha clan. Sasuke was sitting in his living room with Kakashi and Sakura. Sakura followed Kakashi to make sure that Sasuke was okay. Sasuke, on the other hand, was in deep thought. He couldn't fathom that Naruto had beaten him. Not only that, but Naruto had rendered Tsukiyomi useless. Just how strong are you, Naruto? This question ran through Sasuke's head until the sound of the door broke his concentration. Sasuke went to answer the door. He was surprised at who was standing before him. Naruto looked at Sasuke. Can I come in? We need to talk. Sasuke thought about it for a minute. Should he let him in, or should he just slam the door in his face? Sasuke decided to let Naruto in. Naruto entered the house to see Sakura and Kakashi standing in the living room. Kakashi and Sakura looked at Naruto, clearly curious as to why he was there. Naruto decided to speak. Great, you're all here. I won't have to track you two down. Kakashi wondered what Naruto wanted. Naruto, do you wish to say something that we should all hear? He shook his head. Yes. He took a deep breath before continuing. <sighs> I'm just here to say I'm sorry. Kashi, I didn't mean what I said to you. Well, I did, but I'm sorry about it. He then looked at Sakura. Look, Sakura. I know what I said was wrong, and maybe I shouldn't have said it, but I only said it because I was angry. I don't wish death on anyone, and it was wrong to wish it on you. Sakura smiled a genuine smile. She then walked up to the taller blonde. Naruto, it is I who should be apologizing to you. You were right about saying that I wasn't a good friend to you. You did more than I could ask any friend to do. What I said all those years ago was wrong, and I'm truly sorry. Please, forgive me. Naruto looked at Sakura. Sakura, I forgive you, but I will never forget it. He looked at Kakashi and Sasuke before placing his eyes back on Sakura. Although I may never forget, that doesn't mean we can't start fresh. From this day forth, we're going to wipe the slate clean. What do you say? 
Tears slid down the pink Noichi's eyes. She immediately rushed and hugged Naruto. Naruto, I don't know why you're doing this when you have every right to hate me, but I promise that I will try to be a good friend. Sakura let Naruto go to wipe her eye dry. Naruto then turned to Sasuke. I hope we can put the past behind us, Sasuke. Sasuke, who was leaning on the wall by the door, nodded. Sure, I guess we could do that. Naruto then turned to Kakashi. Is this okay with you? A copy ninja smiled behind his mask. Join Naruto. Sounds perfect. Naruto looked at Sasuke. Well, I better head back to the hotel. We have a mission tomorrow and I'm getting tired. Sasuke opened the door as Naruto walked towards the head to the hotel. When Naruto was at the end of the walkway, Sakura screamed out, Naruto! Sakura yelled. He turned to look at her. She was smiling at the blonde ninja. Thank you. Naruto gave her a slight nod, then continued to the hotel. Pervy Sage was right. No need to hold grudges, because I am better than that. Naruto arrived at the hotel ten minutes later. Naruto was walking to his room when he saw Jiraiya coming out of Mai's room. Jiraiya turned to see Naruto and let out a breath in shock. What are you doing here, Pervy Sage? I was talking to Mai. Jiraiya responded nervously. Well, you better hope that Yumi doesn't find out that you're asking her mother for advice on your book. I would hate to see what she would do to you. Jiraiya was shocked. How, how did you find out about that? Naruto snorted. I have ears, you know. When you visited last time, I heard her offer to give you pointers. Yumi doesn't know that her mother is a pervert just like you. I won't tell her because it would devastate her. Anyway, I didn't see you, and this little talk never happened, so good night. Naruto walked past Jiraiya and headed straight for his room. Jiraiya scratched his head. He didn't think about it too much. Phase 1 of his information gathering was done. Now it was time to start phase 2, which involved liquor, lipstick, and waking up the next day rather happy. He exited the hotel, seeking what he dubbed his inspiration. Naruto entered the room. Yumi was laying on the bed with her back towards the door. He decided to slip out of his clothes and jump in the shower. Ten minutes later, he exited the shower in shorts and a white A-shirt. He decided to slip into bed without waking Yumi. Naruto slipped under the covers. He then placed his arm around Yumi. I know you're not asleep, Yumi. I just want to apologize for what I said to you. If I hurt your feelings, it was not my intention. I love you too much to ever hurt you. He whispered the words into her ear. Naruto got no response. He didn't expect one. After all he did, call her an ass. Naruto put his hands behind his head and just looked at the ceiling. He felt an arm wrap around his waist and head rest on his chest. Let's just get some sleep, Naruto. It's been a very long day. He smiled at his girlfriend before they both drifted into the land of dreams. The sunlight cast itself onto the eyes of the female with brown hair. Yumi brought her hands forth to shield her eyes from the brightness of the sun. She opened her eyes slowly to adjust to her surroundings. She rolled over to place her arm around Naruto, only to find that he was not there. The focus in her eyes became clear. She could now see that the blonde was no longer by her side. She saw him sitting in a chair a couple of feet away. He was fully dressed in a black jacket with orange lining and matching pants. As he was slipping his sandals on his feet, he looked at Yumi and smiled. Good morning, sleepyhead, he said in a playful tone to the girl on the bed. She sat up and looked at him. Good morning, Naruto. Leaving so soon? Yeah, I have to be the Hokage Tower in 20 minutes. Granny is going to give us our mission today. I don't know what type of mission it is or how long I'm going to be gone, he informed the girl. She got out of bed and walked up to him and sat on his lap. Well, I'm gonna take a shower. You should probably get going. You don't want to be late. It gives people a bad impression, you know. Naruto stood up. Yes, I know. Well, Yumi, I'm off. I'll see you. Naruto walked to the door, but before he could open it to leave, he heard Yumi speak. Naruto? He turned to face his girl. Yes, she walked up and kissed him on the lips. Be careful, okay? He gave her one of his infamous grins. Don't worry, I'll be fine. He exited the hotel room, leaving Yumi behind. 
Yumi, who was still in her white pajama pants and sky blue tank top, proceeded to the bathroom to freshen up. Hokage Tower, 20 minutes later. Naruto walked into Tsunade's office with no time to spare. He looked around, and from what he could see, everyone who was assigned to the mission was there. Everyone was dressed in the standard Chunin and Jonin uniform. Tsunade looked at Naruto, who finally landed his eyes on her. Glad you could join us, Naruto. Now that you're here, I will go over the mission briefing. This mission is an A-rank mission with the possibility of turning into an S-class mission. Your mission is to infiltrate a Cloud Ninja outpost on the outskirts of the Land of Lightning. You are to recover a blueprint layout to a ninja base in the Land of Lightning. Naruto spoke first. It's so important the ninja base that would force you to assign a mission to recover a blueprint for it. The fifth leaned back in our chair. In one of our previous missions, we obtained a prisoner from the Cloud. After being tortured by Ibiki, he gave us an info, but not entirely enough. So I had uh, Ino Yamanaka search his memories, and she discovered that the base had battle plans that they intended to use on us. Ino also discovered that the blueprints to his base was located where I previously stated. Do you understand why this mission is so vital? Naruto shook his head. Yes. Tsunade spoke. Good. Sasuke will be acting as team leader for this mission. Sakura, you will be head medic, and Udon will be the lead strategist. If there's nothing else, then you guys are dismissed. Naruto looked directly into the Hokage's eyes and spoke. There is something that I wish to request. Tsunade eyed him suspiciously. What is your request? I request that you make me squad leader on this mission. Naruto stated his request, which shocked everyone. Sasuke glared at Naruto. In his mind, Naruto was questioning his leadership, and he didn't like it. He was an Anbu captain, and his team was by far the most successful Anbu squad in the Leaf, with a zero casualty rate. By Naruto asking to lead this mission made him furious. Lady Hokage, I am more than capable of leading this squad. My mission success rate proves that fact. Sasuke spoke in a tone that hid his anger. Naruto looked at Sasuke. I wasn't questioning if you were capable or not. I just thought that I would be the best option for this particular mission. Hanabi decided to speak. Why? Because you beat Lord Sasuke? Just because you won that little fight doesn't mean you're qualified to lead. Naruto turned to the person who spoke. That's not it. I'm sure Sasuke could lead this mission perfectly, but my connections in the Land of Lightning are well suited for this mission. Tsunade was deep in thought. Naruto did have a point. He probably was fit to lead, but she didn't know how well it would go over with everyone else. Thinking it over for a while, she finally came to a decision. First, I would like to ask everyone here who they think should be leader. Based on your votes, I will select the leader for this mission. Hanabi quickly responded. I elect Lord Sasuke. Udon was next to respond. Sasuke. Konohamaru followed. Naruto. Kinanda spoke in a soft voice. Naruto. Sakura was the last to respond. She looked at both Naruto and Sasuke, and back to Tsunade. I choose Sasuke. Naruto just shook his head and looked at Tsunade. Fine, I thought that it would be best since I'd been to the cloud a number of times on missions, but if this is the decision, then I will comply. Tsunade spoke once more. Okay, you have your mission. You are to meet up at the gate at noon and head out. Dismissed. Naruto was heading out, then he heard Okage's voice. Naruto, wait. I want you to stay. The blonde stopped and turned to face the fifth. He walked up to her desk. What do you want? She leaned forward with her chin resting on the back of her hands. Are you mad that Sasuke is leading this mission? No, was his only response. She looked at him again to read his emotions. The old Naruto would have been mad that Sasuke was leading, but this Naruto wasn't. She wondered, Naruto, you have to understand that they trust Sasuke, so that's why the majority thought he would be best to lead this mission. Naruto gave her a shrug. Whatever, I don't really care. You're paying me to do a job, so that's what I will do. I thought it would be beneficial when I lead because I know the geographical terrain and also I have a spy network. Anyway, I will do what Sasuke requires of me. No more, no less. Tsunade shook her head, pleased with this statement. Good, I just wanted to clear that up because the mission success is vital. Naruto headed to the exit. 
Yeah, I know. Well, I'm going back to the hotel. Later, Granny. Sunny's eyes widened in shock as he exited her office. A smile formed on her face and a tear slid down her cheek. He called me Granny. Naruto, you may not officially be the leader of this mission, but it will be you who will lead them to success. Naruto went back to the hotel. He entered his room to find Yumi and her mother sitting on the bed talking. Naruto smiled. Hey Mai, how is everything? The brown haired woman smiled. Pretty good, Yumi was telling me about you beating up some guy yesterday. She also told me you had a mission. I thought you weren't coming back today. Well, my, I do have a mission, but I don't have to leave until noon. I have two hours to prepare for my mission and get everything I need. Since I have all the equipment, I have two hours to blow. He answered his girlfriend's mother. Oh, okay, we're waiting for Eno. She promised to show me more of the village. Yumi is coming with us since you're going on a mission, Ma explained. Yumi looked at Naruto. Mother convinced me to tag along, so I decided to do so. I'm sure you're gonna have a good time. As soon as Naruto finished his words, there was a knock at the door. Naruto opened the door to find uh, that it was Eno. Eno, how is everything? It's good, how are you doing? Eno asked. Fine, well, I guess I should get out of here and let you girls enjoy your day. Later, Eno, uh, I'm sorry about holding that kunai in your neck. Naruto stated before he ran off. Eno looked at Mai and Yumi. So, you girls ready to go? Yes, Eno, I think we're ready. Mai responded. Let's go. I'm off for a week and I plan on enjoying myself. The life of a ninja is hard, you know. The blonde Kunoichi stated. Mai well, gave a slight laugh. I suppose, well, let's go so we can have some fun. Besides, I promised Jiraiya that I would meet up with him to discuss some matters. Yumi wondered what her mother had to talk to that pervert about. What you had to discuss with Jiraiya, mom. Mai didn't want to let her daughter know what was happening, so she decided to bend the truth a little. Uh, I'm not sure, but he said he needs my advice on something, although I'm clueless to what that might be. Yumi looked at her mother sideways. She didn't buy that lie for a second. Unknowing to her mother, Naruto and Jiraiya, Yumi knew that her mother was having Jiraiya write his dirty novel. When Jiraiya visited them for a week, she remembered waking up late to go to the bathroom. While going to the restroom, she heard her mother and Jiraiya discussing his book. She was giving him suggestions on what should be in the book and what should be omitted. I can't believe that my mother is giving Pervious Sage some ideas to write that book. Well, that book isn't all that bad. It did reveal some ways that I performed in Naruto that was very satisfactory. Blah, what the hell am I thinking? The book is a smut, plan, and simple. Naruto probably knows and doesn't want to tell me. Mine, I'll play stupid, you thought. Just watch yourself around him, Mom. He's a pervert, she warned her mother. Don't worry, Yumi. I'm a big girl. I'll be okay. My shorter daughter. With that being said, the ladies were off to tour the town. Yuka compound. Hinata was packing some clothes and extra tools for a little expedition. She looked over her stuff to see if she had everything. When she saw that she had everything she needed, she placed her backpack on her back and decided to head to the ramen stand and grab a quick meal before she left for the mission. While she entered the courtyard, she saw her father and her sister talking. Her father was alerted of her presence and signaled for her to join them. She became nervous as she got closer and could see the look on her father's face. Father, is there something that you wish to talk to me about? He looked at her with disgust. I heard about your mission from Manabi. Don't screw this up. She looked down. Yes, father, I will do my best not to be a burden. All you ever do is try and fail miserably. Just don't screw this mission up. What's this I hear you wanting that delinquent as the leader of this mission? Your sister said you voted for him instead of Sasuke. What is the meaning of this? He stared at her, waiting for an answer. Father, Naruto knows the geographical layout of the Land of Lightning. I thought we would benefit from his vast knowledge if he was to take lead. That's all, replied the pale-eyed girl. Yashi still eyed his eldest daughter with disgust. Like I said before, don't fail the mission. You should be a Jonin now, but you're still a Junin. In my eyes, you are pathetic. Hinata, you should be more like Hanabi. She'll probably become a Jonin on the next exam and surpass you once again. Sometimes, I wish she was the oldest. Hinata wanted to cry, but she told herself not to. Her father had always favored Hanabi over her. Why couldn't he see the things that she was good at? 
She might not be the best fighter, but she was gifted with making medicine. She also was kind, caring, and selfless, but none of those qualities mattered to her father. Sometimes she wished she wasn't a Hyuga. Maybe then life would have been better. She cleared her thoughts and did what she normally did in this situation. I'm sorry for being weak, father. I will try my best to become as strong as Nabi, father. She bowed and headed to the exit. Nabi bowed to her father and followed suit. The young Hyuga smirked. She was the reason why her father belittled her sister. Hinata deserved it for suggesting that blonde idiot lead the mission. That would show her to side with shinobis that are not of this village. She finally caught up to her sister. Hinata, where are you heading to? Hinata didn't want to speak to Anabi right now. However, she didn't want to be rude either, so she turned to Anabi. I was just heading to Ishiraku Ramen. Do you wish to come join me, sister? Anabi wore the same expression of disgust that her father had on earlier. I'll pass. I wouldn't be caught dead in that place. It's so beneath a Hyuga. Hinata knew her sister would decline. Most of the main family felt that they were better than everyone else, and her sister was no exception. Well, Hinabi, I guess I'll see you at the gate at noon. Goodbye. Hinata walked off, leaving Hinabi behind. Hinabi was about to take a step, but realized that she didn't have anywhere to go. She didn't have any friends because she chose not to associate with people weaker than herself. She looked at Hinata, walking away. She made a decision. Hinata, wait up. And each rocky ramen stand. Naruto and Konohamaru were sitting on a stool eating ramen. Bro, don't sweat it. At least we're on a mission together, eh? I wasn't really worrying about that, Konohamaru. He leading the mission doesn't affect my abilities. Anyway, why did you vote for me? Konohamaru sucked up the noodles that were hanging out of his mouth. Well, you seem like a better fit to be leader. You said you know your way around the land of lightning, right? I'm sure your knowledge is more vast than Sasuke, so that's why I thought you should lead. Oh, okay, that seems reasonable. Naruto replied. Hinata walked up to the stand. Hello, Naruto. Naruto turned to see Hinata. Well, Hinata, how are you? After what her father said, how could she be okay? She didn't want him to see that she wasn't so, she gave a big smile. I'm good. She sat on the stool to the right of Naruto. Ichiraku san, can I please have one miso ramen? He looked at Hinata and smiled. One miso coming up for the pretty young lady. Everyone turned to see who it was calling Hinata. Everyone saw that it was her younger sister. Hinabi finally arrived at the stand. Hinata, didn't you hear me calling you? Sorry, Hinabi, I didn't hear you. Hinata clearly was lying. She chose to ignore Hinabi. Right now, she didn't want to be bothered with her sister. Hi, Hinabi. Konohamaru greeted the young Hyuga with a faint blush on his cheeks. He turned to look at who spoke to her, only to see the third grandson, or Monkey Boy as she called him. What do you want, Monkey Boy? Konohamaru looked at the ground. She never was nice to him, no matter how much he tried to be nice to her. Naruto didn't know her long enough, but he did know he didn't like her. Every Hyuga in his opinion, with the exception of Neji and Hinata, were stuck-up snobs. Konohamaru, don't waste your energy being nice to people who always look at you like you're dirt. It's not worth it. Besides, you do much better than that ugly Hyuga. Naruto said this, trying to get a rise out of Nabi, and his plan worked to perfection. Who are you calling ugly, you maggot? I'm the heir to the Hyuga, and I'm currently the strongest Jin in the village. How dare you speak ill of me? Naruto stopped eating his ramen and turned to face Hinata's sister. You don't wish for people to speak ill to you, but yet... You still speak to others in the way that you wish not to be spoken to. Calling Konohamaru a monkey boy is an insult to him. It's not only an insult to him, but it's an insult to his grandfather, who gave his life for you unappreciated villagers. By you calling him monkey is mocking his grandfather's legacy. Now, if you are joking with him, then it wouldn't be a problem, but you clearly think you're better than him, and that's a problem. She smirked. So what if I think I'm better? It's not as if it isn't true. I'm a genius. He's a pathetic monkey boy. I will always be better than that loser. Naruto shook his head. I hate that word, genius. Everyone think that being born with the ability to pick up things quicker than others make them superior. Neji was a genius, and I beat him. Sasuke was a genius, and both Rock Lee and I beat him. Both of us were dead last in our graduating class. I came across a lot of so-called geniuses, and in the end, they all lost to me. You want to know what being a genius means? It means absolutely nothing. The only thing that means anything is hard work. 
Lee understands, Inata understands, and Konohamaru understands that hard work will surpass a genius any day. It was luck that you beat Neji and Sasuke, I'm sure you can't beat them again if you tried. Once a loser, always a loser, is what I say, was Nobby's response. Whatever, you pale-eyed freak. I think I just lost my appetite by looking at your ugly face. Sorry, Hinata, but you're the prettiest Yuga female I know. It's sad because you seem to have taken in all the looks, leaving her with the short end of the stick. Well, I'll catch you guys later. Naruto walked away. Hinabi had her fist clenched. How dare he insult my eyes? He insulted me and my family with that statement. No one defiles the name of that Yuga and insult our bloodline. Who does he think he is to insult our legacy? Hinabi's eyes widened at what she was about to say. She realized that it hurt when he called her a pale-eyed freak. She wondered if this is how Konohamaru felt when she called him monkey boy. Hanabi closed her eyes. She prepared herself to do what she was about to do. She then opened herself and turned to Konohamaru. I'm sorry for calling you monkey boy. Hinata and Konohamaru were shocked that Hanabi had apologized. Konohamaru smiled. Hanabi, would you like to take a walk with me? No. She turned and walked off, leaving the boy defeated. Hinata touched his shoulder. Don't worry, Konohamaru. I'm sure my sister will like you someday. He looked at Hinata and gave a weak smile. I hope so. I really hope so. Two hours later. Hanabi sat on top of the gate, waiting for the rest of the team. She was at the very same spot for the last two hours, thinking about that idiot Naruto, and about Konohamaru. Looking at it from Naruto's perspective, she knew she was wrong for calling him Monkey Boy. What she didn't understand is, after all her insults, he still tried to be nice to her. It doesn't matter if she was thinking it over too much anyway. Care if I join you, Lord Hyuga? Naruto said mockingly. Nabi tensed up slightly. How the hell did he sneak up on me? I didn't even sense his presence. If he was an enemy of mine, I would be dead right now. She looked at the blonde. Do whatever you want. Naruto sat down next to her. Sasuke and Sakura are on their way. Konohamaru and Hinata are also on their way, as well as Udon. How do you know this? Can you detect them? She questioned. Actually, I see them walking towards the gate, Naruto stated. A couple of minutes later, Sasuke and company arrived at the gate. Nabi and Naruto jumped down, landing next to the group. Okay everyone, this is my first time working with some of you, and for others, this is not. Those who I work with know that I'm about being efficient as possible. Our goal is to get the scroll. We are to get in and get out, undetected. Nabi, he looked at her, gaining her attention. This is my first time working with you, but I have worked with Hinata and Neji before. If you're anything like these two, then we should get along fine. Udon, I work with you on a number of occasions, and for those that don't know all strategy and planning, we'll go through him. If you have a better idea, feel free to let us hear it. Sakura is the medic, so our goal is to make sure she's safe at all times. However, Sakura is capable of handling herself, so don't worry too much. Naruto. Sasuke turned to Naruto. We haven't worked together in a while, so I really don't know what you're capable of besides a Shadow Clone Jutsu. All I know is that you and I are the strongest here, so that should be good enough. Naruto was laughing and said, Leave it to Sasuke to not say that I'm better than him, but you're right. You have no idea what I'm capable of because I didn't show that much in our fight now, did I? Naruto decided to ask Sasuke a question. What is the formation pattern? Sasuke was shocked that Naruto asked this. Well, I was going to have Hinata in the front, Udon directly behind to signal us. Both me and you are going to be at Sakura's sides. I'm on her right, while you are on her left. We're the most capable to protect the medic, but we're also the most capable to provide support to the others in case of an ambush. Konohamaru will be directly behind Sakura, and Hanabi will be scanning the back to make sure we're not being followed. Does anyone have any other questions? Everyone shook their heads. The group walked past the gates and took to the trees in no time. They were heading to the land of lightning. Everyone took the formation that Sasuke had planned. Naruto looked at the Uchiha. Sasuke, moving at a fast pace, is going to take us about three days to get to the land of lightning. That's where the rest stops. I was thinking maybe we could head to a dock in the land of rice, northeast of here. 
From there, we could charter a boat that would have us in the land of lightning by tomorrow. Sasuke closed his eyes to think it over. No, cloud ninjas are all over the land of rice. There is no way we could elude them. We're better off going by foot if we plan on getting into the lightning undetected. We can always disguise ourselves in Naruto. Never got to finish his sentence. I said no. Sasuke elevated his voice so Naruto understood his decision was final. It won't work. I'll figure how to get us into the lightning. First, we're going to stop at Ricefield Village in the land of rice and rest for the night. We should arrive there in about 7 hours if they keep up this pace. From there, we'll review the map and go with our best feasible option. Naruto narrowed his eyes. The bastard didn't even listen to what I had to say. I could have gotten us in the land of lightning, no problem. My friend owns a dock there, he could have gotten us in a freight ship heading there. We could have been there by early morning tomorrow. Oh well, he did say we're stopping to rest in Ricefield Village. I'm sure Sasume and her clan are keeping a close eye on Cloud Ninjas. Maybe she could give me information on their movements in the land of rice. Seven hours later, Naruto and company just arrive at their intended destination. They were walking through the busy town. Even at night, when the sun was setting, Ricefield Village was busy with people. Sasuke directed everyone to the hotel they were staying at. Sasuke wanted to talk to the receptionist while everyone was waiting for him. Sasuke returned to the group. Okay, we're sharing rooms. The girls will be in 305 and the guys will be in 306. I'm heading to the room. Udon, I think it's time we take a look at that map to decide our route. Sasuke turned to everyone else. The rest of you guys are free to do whatever. Try to keep a low profile. Also, we're leaving here at 5 a.m. sharp, so keep that in mind if any of you plan on staying out late. With that, Sasuke and Udon headed to their rooms. Hanabi looked at Hinata. Sister, are you hungry? She nodded yes, indicating that she was hungry. I saw a steakhouse not far from here. Let's get dinner. Hanabi turned to Sakura. Would you care to join us, Sakura? Sure, Sakura responded. Hanabi turned to Naruto and Konohamaru, regretting what she was about to ask. Would you two like to join us as well? Sure, I'm in, Konohamaru said with excitement. I'll pass, Naruto said, heading towards the exit. He looked at Konohamaru. Tell Sasuke I'll catch up with you guys if I'm not here by 5 a.m. Sakura wondered if Naruto was mad at her, choosing Sasuke for being team leader or mad at the fact that Sasuke rejected his idea, which in her opinion was not that bad. Naruto, where are you going? He looked at Sakura. I'm going to get some information from a friend about the activity of the cloud and rain ninjas in this country. Sasuke may want to select the best route, but he forgot to factor in that we might encounter enemy ninjas. Maybe he did factor it all in and just wants to fight. I, however, wish to end this mission as quick as possible without having to fight. Anyway, I probably won't be back here tonight, so I'll see you guys later. Before he left, he performed a transformation, transforming into a brown-haired man with brown eyes and civilian clothing. He turned to Hinata. Hinata, I think it would be wise if you and Hinabi were to transform. Being the Hyuga main members, you guys might get recognized. Sakura, you and Konohamaru might want to change too. Incognito is the key here. We don't want to alert any ninjas. And if they see Hyugas, then our cover is as good as blown. Well, I'll see you guys. Naruto headed out of the hotel with his new look and headed to the south of the village. He was heading into Fuma territory. As he was walking, he noticed Shuriken flying at him. He jumped out of the way to avoid the metallic projectiles. Before he could do anything, he was surrounded by a group of Fuma clan members. A girl with long orange hair spoke. You are trespassing on Fuma territory. State your business or leave. Naruto smiled at the girl she recognized. I'm surprised that you don't remember me, Sasume. It hasn't been that long for you to forget about me. A smoke cloud surrounded the person in front of her. When it cleared, she was smiling from ear to ear. Naruto! She ran, jumped into the arms of the man standing before her. When the other Fumas saw that he was no threat, they stood down. She looked up to the man who was taller than her. It's good to see you, Naruto. What brings you here? Well, I'm here on a mission. I'm going to the Land of Lightning. My group just stopped to rest. I have to leave in the morning, but I couldn't pass through here without seeing you, so how is everything? Devon Shinobi questioned. It's great. Ever since the sound fell two years ago, everything has been good. 
However, this war between the leaf and the cloud is making things worse. My grandfather fears that we might have another ninja war on our hands if Kiri gets involved. So far, they remain neutral, but you never know. Naruto spoke. Yeah, you're right. I hope that there won't be another war. But either way, I'm in it now. So, what village are you working for? Sasume questioned. His expression became serious. Konoha was all that he said. So, helping your home village. How noble of you, she said, proud of him. I'm not really helping, it's more like they're paying me for my services. Not to correct the girl's assumption. Really? How much are they paying you? Let me guess, 10 million Ryu, 20 million Ryu, or what? 90 million, Naruto simply said. Sasume's mouth was hanging open. 10 million was high, 20 million was pushing it, but 90? That was just beyond anything she could conceive. Wow, they must really want your services. They probably only paid you that much for what you did in the rain and rock, since those two are allied with the cloud. So I know you're not here on a social call, so what do you want? Naruto scratched the back of his head while smiling. Well, I do wish it was a social call. He removed his hand from his head and gave Sasume a steely gaze. However, my mission is a dangerous one. I know you guys keep tabs on all the ninjas in this area. Care to give me a breakdown on where they patrol and an estimate on how many to expect? Sasume's facial expression became serious. The ninjas are patrolling the borders between Rice and lightning. There are a few cloud, rain, and rock ninjas patrolling about a couple miles west of here. Some have set up camps about 10 miles north of here. The way they're set up, it seems that they're expecting Konoha ninjas. Let's go inside my house so I can give you their locations and a map. Sasume led the blonde to her two story house. They entered the two story home, which consisted of a living room that was furnished decently enough, and the kitchen was a regular green colored kitchen. Naruto didn't get to see the rest of the house because Sasume offered him a seat on the burgundy couch. Naruto took a seat while the orange haired girl headed upstairs. She came back downstairs about 3 minutes later with a map and a red marker. She laid the map on the coffee table. He came closer when he saw that she was about to give him the location of the enemies. She circled the spot on the northern part of the map. Okay, this is where the camps are exactly. It's just past this pond. She circled an area on the side of the map that indicated west. This area is where they're patrolling. She drew a line from where the camp was located to where the patrol area was located. They only patrol west of the campsite. Why would they do that? It, it doesn't make any sense, Naruto wondered. It makes perfect sense. Whoever passes by the patrol team will more than likely run into the border patrol teams, which patrols the border of the Lightning Country. Naruto, getting into the lightning is not going to be easy, Sasume pointed out. Naruto studied the map to find an alternative route. Damn, if only Sasuke would have listened to me. We could have been in the land of lightning already. Now, we gotta do this the hard way. She shook here. Your task is most certainly not an easy one. I wish there was a way to avoid the border patrol, but I don't think there will be a way to do so. Naruto looked at the map more carefully. He smiled when his eyes landed on the enemy camp. There's a way, but the chance of it being successful all depends on my team's speed. Hmm, what do you mean by that? She questioned. Naruto began to explain. The border patrol usually patrols a certain area at certain times. It usually takes them about 5 to 10 minutes to come back to an area they previously checked. No, they tend not to come back because they plant traps that would be hard for the enemy to maneuver through. Avoiding traps should be easy enough. The only question is if my team is fast enough to get past the area undetected. I know that my team leader and I won't have any problems. However, I can't account for the others. I don't know. It's a slim chance, but if it avoids fighting, then it's a good choice. That might be possible, Sasuke agreed. Yeah, I just hope my team is working on something better. I really don't want to have to kill any ninjas. That would only alert them of our presence, which would compromise the mission, the blonde stated. Naruto rolled up the map, then slipped it into the inner lining of his jacket. Well, Sasume, it was really good to see you again. I wish I could stay, but duty calls. Later, Sasume. Before Naruto got to the door. Naruto, be careful. 
The rain has not forgotten what you did. They won't hesitate to hurt you, so please be careful. Naruto turned to his friend and gave her a smile of reassurance. Don't worry, I'll be fine. Naruto transformed back into the state he was in before he came to the Fumo Clan district. He headed back to the hotel. An hour or so had passed since he left the group to seek out Sasume. While walking, he thought about what Sasume said. I don't only have to worry about rain ninjas, I also have to deal with rock ninjas. They want my head for what I did a year ago, and because I look like the yellow flash of Konoha, it doesn't matter. I'm quite sure their caucus told them to flee on sight after what happened and the earth and rain countries. But still, someone will try to confront me to make a name. We have to go off the radar for this mission. My reputation makes me a liability. Naruto thought to himself. After a few minutes of walking, Naruto found himself back at the hotel. He headed straight for the room the boys were staying at. When he opened the door, he found that everyone was in the room. All eyes turned to him. Where did you go? I called a team meeting 30 minutes ago, Sasuke stated. Naruto walked up to the room, who surrounded a table with a map on it. He examined the map for a couple of seconds before picking it up and ripping it. Sasuke narrowed his eyes while the others wondered why he destroyed the map. What the hell? It took us nearly 30 minutes of trying to figure out the best route that would lead us closer to the target destination. Naruto ignored Sasuke and placed his hand inside his jacket to retrieve the map Sasuke gave him. He proceeded to unfold the map. He then laid it across the table so everyone could see it. I'm sorry Sasuke, but I could bet that you didn't take into account that they have a camp located here. You guys also didn't factor in that in taking the route they have suggested will lead us right into border patrol. I knew we could take them, but a result in the failure of our mission. The best plan that I came up with is that we try to slip past border patrol when they pass one of their checkpoints. If you don't like my plan, then come up with something better. You have all the information that you need there. I'm going to sleep. Wake me up when we get ready to head out. Naruto flopped in the bed in the far right corner of the room. Udon looked at the map carefully, looking for flaws. If the enemy camp's patrols were located where this map indicated them to be, then Naruto's plan was the only course of action. He thought about another option, then looked at Naruto. Hey Naruto, you mentioned something about getting to lightning on a boat. I think that would be our best option at this point. Naruto sat up to look at Udon. The opportunity has passed. There is only one boat that goes to lightning from the dock. I talked about it and it leaves at 3 in the afternoon every day. This right now is the only option. I did my part so I'll leave it up to you guys to figure it out. Naruto was getting ready to lay down when Sasuke decided to speak. Where did you get this map from? How do you even know that the information on it is even credible? Naruto sat back up looking annoyed by Sasuke's remark. A friend of mine, who is a fellow ninja, lives here in Rice and knows this country pretty well. My friend, who has kept a close eye on the movements of cloud, rain, and rock ninjas in this area, gave me this information. So, that is how the information is credible. If you don't think so, then don't follow it. It's your team, Sasuke. It will fail or succeed through you. So, do whatever you want with it. Sasuke narrowed his eyes at Naruto out of frustration. Naruto saw this and flopped back down to relax all the while smiling at his head. He knew Sasuke might not believe the info, but he was required to do right by the team. Naruto had just forced him to follow to his plan without throwing a punch. He just hoped that they could get through the border patrol without being detected. He looked up at the ceiling until he fell into a deep slumber. Sasuke and the others were still going over the plan. Udon looked at the map. This is the only option that we have if the map is correct. The boat would have been a good idea, but that is an option. Well, I guess we'll go with this. I think we should get some sleep so we can move at the crack of dawn. Sasuke regrettably shook his head in agreement. Hinata, Sakura, Hanabi, and Konohamaru all agreed as well. The girls left the boys and headed to their room to get some sleep. Both Konohamaru and Udon went to lay on the beds that they picked to sleep on. Sasuke stood by the table, still looking at the map. He tried to find flaws in Naruto's plan, but couldn't find anything. Even if he did, would it matter since his plan is the only option? Sasuke looked at the map one more time before walking over to his bed. You need 
all the rest he could possibly get. This mission would be one of his toughest yet. That he was sure of. Naruto had awakened to see that Sasuke was already up and dressed. After letting his eyes get adjusted to his surrounding, he then looked around to see that the beds around him were neatly made. He then turned his head to Sasuke. What time is it? It's 3 in the morning. Everyone is up getting prepared. I suggest you clean up so we can be prepared to move out at 0400 hours. This was the response given by Sasuke. Naruto slowly lifted himself out of the bed. He walked to the bathroom to freshen himself up. Before he walked past Sasuke, who was leaning against a wall in the bathroom with his arms folded, Uchiha spoke. I'll be in the girls' room. I expect you to be in there in 15 minutes, so we can go over a few things. Naruto looked at Sasuke and nodded. He then entered the bathroom to freshen up. Sasuke left the room and headed to the room that belonged to the females in the group. The holder of the Sharingan entered the room. Sakura was sitting on a bed next to Hanabi and looked up. Oh, Sasuke, you're here. All of us are ready to head out whenever you are. I assume that Naruto is getting ready as we speak. He nodded. Yes, in a bit. Sakura, where are Hinata, Konohamaru, and Udon? They went to get something to eat at the local tavern, Sakura answered. Sasuke went to lean on a wall next to the window. Hanabi was fixing the gloves on her hand. Her chunin slash jonin vest was lying neatly on the floor next to her sandals. The said Noichi placed her headband on her forehead. She then slipped into her black sandals and put on her vest. Sakura was already fully dressed in the standard chunin slash jonin outfit. Just when Sakura got off of the bed to stand up, Hinata, Konohamaru, and Udon walked into the room. Hello, Hanabi. Konohamaru greeted the younger Hyuka. She liked the boy. Hello. She returned the greeting emotionlessly. Sakura looked at Hinata, who was standing next to Konohamaru. So, what'd you guys get? We got some rice bowls and some water from a local shop that was surprisingly open at this hour. Hinata responded. Hinata looked around the room, seeing one person missing from the group. Sakura, where's Naruto? Sakura spoke up. He should be here any minute. Right on cue, Naruto walked into the room, sporting a navy blue jacket and pants with blue sandals. His outfit was an exact copy of almost everyone else's, excluding the vest. Sasuke wore a black outfit with the Uchiha symbol on the back of his vest. Morning everyone, Naruto said, greeting everyone in the room. Everyone with the exception of Hanabi and Sasuke returned the greeting. Sasuke walked up to the table that was similar to the one in the boys' room. He then laid out the map and ordered everyone to gather around. Sasuke pointed to a marking on the map. Okay, we're here and we need to go there. According to Naruto's intel, we should run into the enemy ninjas about here. Getting past the ninjas really isn't the problem. The problem is getting across the border undetected. If I were by myself, then it would be no problem to do so. But there is a group of us and we all vary in speed. Sakura, Naruto, and I have to be necessary to get past undetected. You four, on the other hand, I'm not so sure about, which is why we're leaving in about 45 minutes. I see. You want us to stay under the cover of night. Even if we don't have the speed, getting across undetected should be easier. The darkness gives us a great advantage, Hanabi said, understanding Sasuke's intentions. Naruto looked at Hinabi. That's not the only reason we have the advantage. She gave Naruto a questionable look. Care to elaborate on what you mean by that not being our only advantage? Sasuke spoke before Naruto could explain. What I think Naruto means is we're at an advantage because we have two Hyugas, whose Byakugan can see in night as if it were day. The enemy doesn't have this advantage, but we do, and it'll help us get past the border patrol. That's what you're going to say, right Naruto? Yeah, something along those lines. Jeez, you're not to cut me off, Sasuke. Naruto thought. Sasuke continued to speak. We're going to use the same formation that we used yesterday. Also, we're going to be stopping in a town about six miles east of the ninja outpost we are to infiltrate. We'll rest there until about 6.30 p.m. Then we will make our move on the base. I want us in and out by 8 p.m. Naruto gave a slight smirk. 
I have to admit that you have a perfect plan, Sasuke. It seems that you are somewhat familiar with the Land of Lightning. Sasuke took his eyes uh, off of the map. I've been there once. And you notice that minor detail by just being there once? Naruto questioned. I try to not overlook anything. A minor detail can be monumental to the success of a mission. Sasuke responded. So true. Most shinobi forget that, and it's most often times their downfall. Konohamaru, along with Hanabi, Hinata, and Udon, were looking at the two former members of the well-known Team 7. Why do we have to be in and out by 8pm, and what is that minor detail that you two speak of? Konohamaru asked. Sakura was the one to respond. It's simple, Konohamaru. The sun sets at approximately 7.30 every day in the Land of Lightning. By the time we have the scroll, we have come here to obtain it, and it'll be hard to track us. Kazuha will be under the cover of the night. That is what Sasuke and Naruto meant by that minor detail. It's easy to overlook, but it really shouldn't be. I have to say that this is a great plan, Sasuke. Out of the corner of his eye, Naruto looked at Sakura and smirked. I'm impressed that you noticed that detail as well, so it seems that you have gotten better while I was gone. You two aren't the only ones who were trained by Sanin. Besides, I've been in the Land of Lightning once on a reconnaissance mission. I don't know my way around the country like you, but I do know when to look for advantages, Sakura said, grinning from ear to ear. And Abi looked at Sasuke. So, what is our contingency plan? Konohamaru looked at Hanabi quizzically. Contingency plan? What do you mean by contingency? She looked at him with annoyance. Are you serious? You are the grandson of the third, and you don't know what I mean by contingency? Hinata spoke up while looking at Konohamaru. It means backup plan, Konohamaru. Oh, okay, he said with a better understanding. There isn't one. Naruto's words filled the air so Hanabi could hear. The younger Hyuga spoke in an aggressive manner. What do you mean there isn't one? We need a backup plan in case this one fails. Sasuke turns his attention to the young Hyuga. This is the only option. Our village is at war with the cloud, rain, and rock, so it's safe to assume that their ninjas are everywhere. Also, he pointed to Naruto. His presence puts us in even more danger. Everyone turned to Naruto. Sakura was first to speak. What do you mean by putting us at even more risk, Naruto? He means that ninjas from the rain and rock village are ordered to kill me on sight, Naruto answered. Hanabi became more curious by this new development. You must have done something for them to want to kill you on sight. What did you do? Naruto got a sad look in his eyes. He closed his eyes to hide his emotions. He spoke in a calm manner. I don't want to talk about it. All you need to know is that they want my head. We don't spoke up. So that clears up the mystery. Hanabi looked at the Chunin who wore glasses. What do you mean by that? Udon decided to answer a question. If you guys were to look at the bingo book more often, you would see that Naruto is listed as an S-Class ninja. I believe the exact words were Wanted for crimes committed in rain and earth country. Extremely dangerous. Avoid at all costs. Am I right, Sasuke? Yes. Udon, I believe it was along those lines. He looked at Naruto. I could care less why you would do what you did. I'm sure you had your reasons, but if I feel that you are a danger to everyone else in this mission, I will dismiss you. I have a zero casualty rate for teams that I lead, and I would like to keep it that way, the Uchiha said. Naruto nodded in understanding. Personally, he didn't want to put everyone in danger, but he knew that he would if he was discovered in the Land of Lightning. They clearly had the advantage, and they would send out a large amount of ninjas to apprehend him. He wasn't really worrying about himself. He knew he would be alright, but his team was a different story. If the enemy got a hold of his teammates, they would use them for leverage to get Naruto. His thoughts were interrupted by Hinata. Naruto isn't the only one that put this mission at risk. Hanabi and I also put this mission at risk as well. You're right, it seems that the cloud has been after the secrets of the Byakugan since the beginning. This is a delicate situation, but we are the best of the best, Sakura said, trying to boost the team's morale. Hell yeah we are, Konamaru shattered in agreement, and I'll be like him to be more annoyed. Although I don't share his enthusiasm, I am inclined to agree. Lady Tanade wouldn't have liked this group if she didn't believe in us. 
It's time. Let's go, Sasuke informed his team. The team filled out of the room and sped off to their intended destination. It only took them two minutes to reach the forest. They immediately took to the trees. It would only take them 20 minutes to reach the enemy camp and another hour or so to reach the border. Sasuke spoke. Hanabi, do you see anything? Yes, about five miles ahead, there are 16, 17, 18. There are 18 ninjas ahead of us. There are eight cloud ninjas, seven rain ninjas, and three rock ninjas to be exact. The young Kyuga answered. The lack of rock ninja clearly shows that they are having a hard time with Suna forces. That's most likely why there is a low number of rock ninjas, the blonde shinobi pointed out. Sakura spoke. It would seem that our allies in the sand are doing a good job of keeping rock ninjas out of our territory, as well as others. Hanabi came to a sudden halt and caused everyone to stop. She scanned the area looking for something that might be hidden. When she found what she was looking for, she turned to Sasuke. It seems that there are numerous traps set up. How shall we proceed, Sasuke? Sasuke thought to himself for a moment. He finally had a solution. Hinata, come here to the front with Hinabi. You two will guide us through these traps, since the two of you have the eyes necessary. It shouldn't be a problem. Hanabi and Hinata led the group. The group surprisingly got past the enemy with ease. In fact, all of them felt that it was too easy, but they knew that the hard part was probably getting past the border. They had about an hour until they reached the border, and time was of the essence. The group was slowly losing their advantage. The sun was set to rise soon. One hour later, the group reached the border of the land of lightning and rice. They stopped to scout the area. Hinata was looking around to see if she saw any more ninjas. She quickly spotted 11 cloud guards about a mile west of her and 20 more about 3 miles east of her. She knew Hinabi saw what she saw as well. Sasuke, there are 11 guards a mile west of here and 20 more 3 miles east of here. The ninjas that are 3 miles east of here aren't the problem. It's the 11 ninjas a mile west away from here. They're moving pretty fast and should be closing in on this location in about 5 minutes, Yata said, informing our squad. We have no choice. Everyone, we move now at top speed. We can't afford to get spotted. The next village is only 4 miles north of here. First to file out will be Udon, followed by Konohamaru, Hinata, Hanabi, Sakura, Naruto, and myself. We move now. Sasuke gave the command and everyone was gone from their previous spot. The team was moving at top speed. Naruto was looking at the sky. The sun was slowly coming over the horizon. And this was bad. They had a possibility of getting caught if they didn't get to the nearby village soon. Running for approximately 3 minutes, the team had crossed the border and were now officially in the land of lightning. Naruto stopped immediately. This caught the attention of Sasuke, who yelled for everyone else to slow down. The team was in the middle of a cornfield of a farm that was not too far from their current destination. Sasuke walked up to Naruto and asked, Why did you stop? We can't enter a village in the land of lightning without disguising ourselves. I'm sure that there are cloud ninjas all over this country. Besides, Hinata and Hinabi are holders of the Yakugan. With them walking around as themselves, we are at risk of being exposed. Also, I'm quite sure I'm in their bingo book, so it'll be easy to point me out as well. Naruto's right, Sasuke. We can't take that chance. It compromises our mission, Udon stated. Sasuke nodded. You're right. It'll be easy to point out those two and yourself. The rest of us don't really need to change, but I recommend that we all change our appearance. We use these transformations in the presence of the townspeople. Once we check into the hotel, we will transform back to conserve chakra. We will rent two rooms like last time. I expect everyone to get a decent sleep and be up no later than 1 p.m. Everyone performed a transformation. Sasuke was now a man with long brown hair and blue eyes who wore black pants and a white shirt. Sakura's hair was now purple, but her eye color remained the same. She now wore a red shirt with white pants. Hinata changed her eye color to purple. She now wore a sky blue jacket with a hood and perfect capri pants. Hanabi's shirt was purple along with her pants. She changed her eye color to light brown. Udon only changed his clothes to a blue sweatshirt and gray shorts that fell two inches below the knees. Naruto changed his hair and his eye color to brown. He was now wearing a bright orange shirt with black pants. Konohamaru's transformation surprised everyone. We all glared at the boy who had no idea 
why they were looking at him like that. What's the matter? Something on my face? The boy questioned. And Abby walked up and smacked him in the head. What the hell are you thinking about transforming into a girl who looks like a slut? Ah, oh, you're such an idiot. Actually, Konohamaru might be onto something here. This might work in our favor after all, Naruto said to the young Hyuga. See, Nabi? Big brother Naruto doesn't think my transformation is a bad idea, Konohamaru said proudly. What do you mean by Naruto? Not to ask. She suddenly saw that Naruto had a sinister look in his eyes. Last time I saw that look in his eyes, he painted the Hokage Monument the next day. I don't like that look. What are your plans, bro? Konohamaru wondered. Naruto, still with the sinister look in his eyes, smiled at the group. Well, Hinata, I was thinking we could use Konohamaru to get some information, that's all. Sakura and Sasuke gave Naruto suspicious looks. Is he suggesting what I think he's suggesting? Not the two former members of Team 7. Sasuke smirked. I have to say, Naruto, that this is a great idea. What about you, Sakura? Do you agree? It's wrong on so many levels, but since Konohamaru has the right idea of transforming into a female and dressed like that, no less, I'd say he deserves what's in store for him, Sakura said with a smirk forming on her face as well. You know, his eyes widened at what Naruto was getting at. You can't be serious, Naruto. You wouldn't subject Konohamaru to that, would you? It's not my call, but I think Sasuke would disagree with me. Would you, Sasuke? Naruto asked the squad captain. No disagreements here. It's actually good for the mission, Sasuke said with his arms folded and his eyes closed while nodding. Why is this idiot transformation into a girl good for the mission? Nabi asked Sasuke. Because I don't think you or any of the girls will want to degrade yourself. and There is no chance in hell that I'm going to do it, Sasuke said. Konohamaru was now nervous. What is it that I have to do? Naruto looked at Konohamaru. Konohamaru, you're going to use a sexy jutsu for the purpose it was created. I thought it was made for a... Wait a minute, you, you can't be serious, Big Brother Naruto. I refuse to do this. You guys can't make me. There's no chance in hell, Konohamaru said with a tone of finality. You're doing this, and that's final. If you don't, I will have you doing D-rank missions for the next two years. So, I ask you, do you refuse or accept to do this? Sasuke asked the transformed Chunin. <sighs> I'll do it, Konohamaru said in a low grunt. All right now, that's settled, let's head into town. The main road is over there, let's go. The team was now walking through the cornfield to the road that headed to the town. They reached the road in no time and were now on their way to town. The Leaf Squad made it to town around 6 in the morning. The sun was finally out and it was shining brightly. The group checked into the hotel and everyone went to sleep. And all decided to wake up at 1 p.m. to prepare for the mission that would occur later in the evening. Midday in Konoha. Yumi was walking down the street with Ino. Ino had insisted that she take her out again today since they had a good time yesterday. Ino decided that today would be different. Today would be the day she would get information on Naruto. The only thing she got out of Yumi yesterday was that he had a frog wallet. Ino decided to invite Yumi to join her and a few others for lunch. The ladies arrived at the local barbecue shack, where they were greeted by a large group. The group consisted of Anko, Kurenai, Guy, Asuma, Tenten, Choji, Rock Lee, and Ebisu. Ino, followed closely by Yumi, walked up to the group. Hey guys, how's it hanging? Everything is fine, you know. Would you and your guest care to join us? We offered. Sure, why not? You know, and Yumi sat with the group. I'll go look at Yumi. So, you're Naruto's friend, eh? Yumi nodded in agreement. Yes, I'm Naruto's girlfriend. Why do you ask? Just curious, that's all. Uncle answered. So, we meet again, Yumi. It is a pleasure, as always. The beautiful green beast will voluntarily pay for the meal of your choice. Guy flashed Yumi a smile that caused a sweat to form on everyone's head. Anko nudged Guy. Careful, Guy, you wouldn't want Naruto to get jealous now, would you? Don't worry about Naruto, he's not the jealous type. Besides, I don't think Guy was hitting on me, Yumi answered. Ino spoke. If he isn't the jealous type, then what type of guy is he? Ino asked, hoping to gain insight on what Naruto was up to for the past six years. Yumi thought for a minute before answering Ino's question. Well, I would say that he is loyal, sweet, and working, selfless, and caring. 
He sounds wonderful from your description, Yumi, the red eyed Jonin stated. Ten Ten spoke. He also forgot to mention that he is super strong. He even beat Sasuke. Yumi smiled at Ten Ten. He is strong, but I could care less. To me, he is just Naruto. Yumi, do you know the location of the lady that gave Naruto his gravity seals? Lee asked. Sorry, Lee. I don't know. Honestly, I didn't know he had the gravity seal thing until he fought that Sasuke guy, Yumi answered. Lee put his head down in defeat, only to have Guy cheer him up. Everyone ignored the two and continued talking. I wondered how Naruto got so strong. Yumi, did he ever tell you where he went when he left the village? Ino asked. Well, he told me he trained with the ninja and that he also trained with the samurai. What do you want to know? Yumi questioned. Just curious, that's all. He beat our future Hokage, just wondering about the training that he went under. I mean, it had to be something if he beat Sasuke. You know, reasoned, not trying to seem suspicious. Well, you'll have to ask Naruto when he gets back from his mission. I'm sure he'll tell you if you ask him, said the brown-haired girl. That's why I asked you, because there's no way that he'll tell any of us, you know, thought. Kerr and I spoke up once more. I'm curious, Yumi. Did Naruto ever tell you about his exploits in Raining Earth Country? Yumi knew the story. Naruto told her what he did and why he did it. She wasn't mad. In fact, she believed it was a noble thing to do. She looked at the Junin. Yes, I know what he did, and I know his reason. However, he will tell you his reason for his actions. I will not tell you why he did it, what he did, because uh, it's not my place. Everyone at the table, with the exception of Abisu, knew what he did. Tenten, Lee, Ino, and Choji, Anko were in the Anbu, so they knew about what happened. Although Ino didn't believe that he was as good as his reputation had warranted. When they went to retrieve him and he placed a kunai at her neck without her detecting him, she knew that the rumors were true. Tenten now knew for a fact that the rumors were true. Just by a fight with Sasuke, Karnai, Asuma, and Guy basically knew about every S-class, A-class, and B-class ninja in the bingo book. Even though it wasn't stated in the bingo book, which was odd to them, they made it their business to know why he was listed. Those who didn't know what he did knew that he was feared in those countries. However, there were some that were clueless to what he did, mostly the Chunins and a few Jonins, Sakura and Hinata included. Abisu knew Naruto was feared in those countries, but he had no idea what he did to be feared. What did he do that caused him to be ranked in S-Class? You might want to ask the Hokage that information is restricted, Kashi stated outside of the window while reading his book. Kuranai eye twitched. How long have you been there, Kakashi? Kakashi folded his book and put it in his pouch. I was here for five minutes, but you guys seem to be enjoying yourselves, so I didn't want to ruin the moment. Anyway, Ebisu, you probably don't know this info because it's mostly told to field ninjas who usually take high-risk missions. Field ninjas who take high-risk missions have a high chance of running into high-level ninjas. It's only reasonable that they know who they're up against. And that explains why Sakura doesn't know. She spends most of her time at the hospital and rarely goes on missions, Hino stated. Hinata doesn't know either. I wonder if her opinion of him will change when she finds out. Hinata's former sensei thought. It doesn't matter. Everyone who doesn't know will find out soon enough. Anyway, I'm off. I have a mission. You guys have a nice day. Kashi waved at everyone. He walked away from the window. Guy decided to change the subject. Yumi, how do you like Konoha? The village is okay. I received some glares from the villagers, but I guess that's because of Naruto's situation. Yumi replied. I wonder if she's referring to the fox or because he defeated Sasuke in combat. Guy thought to himself. Yeah, I guess, I mean, when you beat the village's precious Uchiha, you're bound to receive hate, Joji said. Ten Ten looked at Joji. First, Shikamaru, now you two. What do you guys have against Sasuke? Joji's steely gaze focused on Ten Ten. He's a traitor to this village. You would do good to remember that. He's going to be Hokage, Joji. You'll know that a Hokage fights to protect the village, and even sacrifice their life if necessary, Ino said in Ten Ten's defense. He may be Hokage, but to me, he will always be a traitor. As a leaf ninja, it's my duty to follow the orders of the Hokage, but that doesn't mean I have to respect the Hokage. I'm not hungry anymore. I think I'll go for a walk. I'll see you guys later. Joji placed his money on the table to pay his bill, then walked out of the restaurant. Asuma sighed. He then pulled out a cigarette to smoke. Uncle looked at Joji's retreating form. 
I wonder why he and most of the guys that graduated in his year don't like Sasuke. Was it because he was more popular? Lee answered a question. I think it has something to do with the mission to retrieve Sasuke, Anko. Most of us were hurt badly trying to retrieve Sasuke. Choji and Neji almost lost their lives, while Kiba, Akamaru, Shikamaru, and I were badly injured. I don't think that caused them to resent Sasuke. It has something to do with Naruto's exile. Most of us felt it was wrong that Naruto was blamed for the failed mission, but more mad at the fact that Sasuke was welcomed back with open arms. I don't hate anybody. It's not in my youthful nature, but what Choji said is true. He is a traitor and the village holds him on a pedestal. It's unfair and wrong. Ankur shrugged. Whatever, you guys might dislike him, but you will have to listen to him when he's leader of this village. Least it up. You're right. Excuse me, everyone, but I have to train. You guys enjoy your meal. Goodbye, Yumi. I hope we meet again. Lee bowed and walked off. Yumi was thinking about a certain blonde haired ninja and smiled. Naruto, please come back soon. 1 p.m. in a village in the land of lightning. Everyone was awake and gathered in the room that belonged to the guys. Sasuke was going over the plan. Okay, remember, we're here to leave this location at 1800 hours. I want to arrive at the ninja outpost no later than 1900 hours. Like I said in Rice, we are to be in and out within an hour. Sasuke looked at Konohamaru and flashed him a smirk. Since you have uh, volunteered your services, your job will be to get some info. I'm quite sure that there is a ninja that you can promise a good time and lower back here. Sasuke then turned his attention to Naruto. Naruto, I want you to scout the area by the base. Also take Hanabi with you. I think she could be beneficial to this reconnaissance assignment. Hanabi was about to protest but was cut off by Sasuke. That is final Hanabi. I don't care if you don't like Naruto. The only thing I care about is if you get the information that is needed. Why can't Hinata go? The girl asked. I want her, Udon, and Sakura to scout the town. Was the answer Sasuke had given. Everyone here has an assignment. What do you plan to do? Naruto directed his question at the last Uchiha. Sasuke answered, I'm going to watch over Konohamaru. When he succeeds, I will gather info from whatever ninja he brings back. But if he fails to do so, then it's not a big deal. Naruto spoke. I guess not. Nabi and I are the fail-safe plan, even if Konohamaru fails. We still will know the area and the ninja outpost pretty well. Okay, everyone, let's head out. Everyone headed out to their intended locations. 20 minutes later, near the outpost, Naruto and Hanabi were scouting around the area. Both were looking for around the base. Hanabi studied Naruto for a minute. What Sasuke said earlier about him had her wondering. Can I ask you something, Naruto? The blonde looked at the girl. Okay, I guess so. What did you do in the land of earth and rain that was so bad? Asked the Kyuga. Naruto looked at the girl for a second, then turned away. I said that I didn't want to talk about it, so drop it. Let's finish this mission so we can get back to the hotel. If you would Hanabi, please scan the building. Hanabi was mad that he didn't tell her, but she complied and scanned the building. She looked at Naruto. There are a total of 30 guards in the tower. There are 20 cloud, 6 rain, and 4 rock ninjas. The ninja outpost has three floors, and the scroll is heavily guarded. Let's go. I will brief you more when I inform the others. Both shinobi blurred out of existence. Konohamaru had convinced a young rock ninja to come back with him to his room. He had promised the rock ninja a good time. When he and the rock ninja entered the room, the rock ninja was quickly disabled by Sasuke. The rock ninja looked at Sasuke, then back at Konohamaru. What the hell is going on? The rock ninja asked. Konohamaru dropped the transformation and changed back to himself. The ninja was shocked at what he saw. He turned to see Sasuke that he had activated the Sharingan. This caused the ninja more fear. <laughs> You're Sasuke Uchiha, aren't you? The man asked in fear. Yes, and depending on how you answer, you might live. Now, I want information about the ninja outpost 20 miles from here. If you don't comply in your free will, then uh, I'll gain the info with my Sharingan. If it comes to that, I will torture you so bad that you'll be begging for me to kill you. So, are you going to make this easy, or are you going to make this hard? Sasuke said to the Chunin with a smile, hoping that he would choose the latter. The ninja from Rock trembled under Sasuke's eyes. I, I will tell you everything that I know, just don't kill me. Sakura, Udon, and Hinata entered the room to see that Konohamaru's mission was a success. They walked up behind Sasuke. 
who had the ninja on the floor against the wall. A few seconds later, Hanabi and Naruto entered into the room. The rock ninja caught a glimpse of Naruto and his eyes widened. He kept backing up, but he was blocked by the wall behind him. Naruto looked at the ninja and saw the fear in his eyes. Please don't kill me, I will tell you everything, just don't kill me, the ninja pleaded. Sasuke looked at Naruto, then back at the ninja and smiled. It seems he'll be useful. You better tell us what we want to know, or I'll sick my friend on you. I'll tell you everything, just don't let that monster hurt me, the rock ninja pleaded with Sasuke. Sakura glanced at Naruto. What did you do that has this man scared to death, Naruto? I wonder why I wasn't informed of what he did. I guess I'll have to question Lady Sinade about this. Hinata and the rest of the gang were thinking along the same lines as Sakura. Naruto was now pissed at being called a monster. He walked up to Ninja and picked him up with one hand. His eyes narrowed, causing him to get even more scared. What right do you have to call me a monster? I did what I did for a reason, and I will not hesitate to do it again if the situation arises. The ninja's eyes paled at Naruto's comment. You would do it again? Only a monster would feel no remorse for their actions. That might be true, but like I said, I won't hesitate if the situation arises again. Naruto dropped the ninja to the ground. Sasuke walked back up to the ninja to gather answers. Give us info on the base, Sasuke demanded. Uh, okay, there are three floors. There are at least 30 ninjas in the base, varying from cloud to rock into rain ninjas. The top floor is heavily guarded. There is a scroll, but only the cloud ninjas know what's in the scroll. That is all I know. Please don't kill me. They expect me back at the base in another hour, and if I don't turn up, they'll get suspicious. The ninja pleaded with Sasuke not to do anything rash. Sasuke activated his Sharingan, and the man passed out. What'd you do to him? Sakura asked. He'll forget what happened here, and he'll head back to work when he wakes up. We'll set up in the other room and go over our strategy there. Hanabi and Naruto will inform us of their findings, while you, Hinata, and Udon will inform us of this town's layout, Sasuke stated. Sasuke placed the guy on the bed and had Sakura take off his clothes to make it look like he and the Konohamaru's hench form had uh, an exciting time together. After Sakura undressed him, she and the others went to the other room that they had rented. 6.30 p.m. near the ninja outpost. The team was near the outpost and ready to make their move. Nabi and Hinata had their Byakugan activated. Sasuke's Sharingan was activated as well. Sasuke was in front of the group. He signaled for everyone to slow down. After a few minutes had passed, everyone got close to the outpost undetected. Sasuke decided it was time to hand out the wireless communication mics. From here on out, we're splitting up. Hinata, Sakura, and Udon are with Naruto. Hanabi and Konohamaru, you're with me. Naruto, your team will take the west wing, while my team will take the east. Since we know what to expect, we should be out of here soon. My team will go after the scroll, while your team will take out the guards on the first and second floor. You won't move until you confirm that your task is complete. We'll wait here for you to give the signal. Naruto nodded and his team headed out. They entered the outpost with no problem. Naruto used a Bainjutsu on the sixth guard that was on that floor. He then ordered Hinata to disable them with her gentle fist. After Hinata did, as he said, Naruto made shadow clones that replicated the ninjas while he and the others placed the guards dead bodies in a storage closet nearby. They moved onto the next floor and ran into nine guards. The same process was done to the guards on this floor that was done to the guards on the first level. Naruto wondered why this was so easy. He didn't complain, he just made sure that he was on guard. Level 1 and 2 cleared, Naruto said speaking into the wireless mic. Sasuke and the rest of his team had entered on the east wing. There were 13 more guards that had to be taken care of. Sasuke and Naruto both were thinking the same thing when they used the binding jutsu on the ninjas. What they didn't expect was three ninjas to be powerful to break free of it. The three ninjas were now looking at the Kunaha ninjas that outnumbered them. Well, if it isn't Sasuke Uchiha and Naruto Uzumaki, but Golden Fox himself, no wonder why my guards can't move. What are the chances of running into two of the most feared ninjas out here? Cloud Shinobi spoke. 
you do know that you will die here. You have no chance of winning, so move aside so we can get the scroll and we'll be on our way. Sasuke said flatly. The clown ninja narrowed his eyes at Sasuke. Don't underestimate us. It will be your downfall. Sasuke smirked the ninja. Oh, Hanabi, disable the ninjas caught in the binding jutsu. Hanabi disabled the ninja caught in the binding jutsu. The rock jonin and rain jonin were glaring at Naruto. Naruto Uzumaki, today you will die for what you did, the rock ninja said. I also have a score to settle with you, Uzumaki, the rain ninja said. Both jonins charged at Naruto, who didn't even prepare a defense. Currently in Konoha, a council had called a meeting concerning Naruto. Homura was the first to speak up. Tsunade, we want to discuss Naruto. We wish to give him mission suited to his capabilities. Tsunade glared at the old man. You want to give him suicide missions, is what you're trying to say. Koharu looked at the Hokage. I don't think the missions that we plan for him to take will be suicide. Judging by what he did in the rain in Earth Country, these missions shouldn't be too difficult. Hiyashi spoke. Lady Tsunade, Naruto is more than capable of handling missions that are in enemy territory. We feel he is the best candidate to do so. If you don't wish for him to be alone, then I will let you assign my eldest child to help him. She may be weak, but she is a Hyuga, and that is more than adequate. So now I give Hiyashi a look of disgust. I will not permit Naruto to take suicide missions. I will not do that to him or any of our ninjas. You are willing to endanger the life of a leaf shinobi, who happens to be your daughter by having her assigned to dangerous missions. She is a shinobi of the leaf. She knows the risk of being one, Hiyashi answered. What about the Byakugan? Hinata is the heir to the main house, but if that falls in the enemy hands, that could be disastrous for the leaf. Tsunade questioned Hiyashi. Don't worry about it. Hinata will become a branch member upon her return. The Byakugan will be safe even if she dies, Hiyashi informed the blonde. Do you think that sending my student to enemy territory is going to kill him off? You idiots are sadly mistaken. A voice was heard in the corner of the council room. Jiraiya, what are you doing here? This is a private meeting, Sonata informed her former teammate. Jiraiya came out of the shadows. A council who would exile the son of the village's greatest hero is dirt. But he turned to face the Hyuga, a man that is willing to send his daughter off to her death because she is deemed weak, doesn't deserve to call himself a man. You disgust me, Hyuga. Hiyashi's eyes narrowed at Jiraiya. If she is strong, then she won't die. The cage seal is being placed in her as a precaution. Besides, the boy is too powerful, and it is only a matter of time before the fox takes control. He should have died years ago. Jiraiya went to punch Hiyashi, but Tsunade appeared in front of him before he could connect. Jiraiya, he is entitled to his opinion. Besides, it's not worth it, Jiraiya. The frog hermit calmed down. Suki spoke up. Hiyashi is right, Jiraiya. The kid is becoming too strong. The fox is to attribute for his leaps in power. It's the only explanation why he beat the Uchiha. Jiraiya looked at the lady. Do you really believe that the fox power helped Naruto to become stronger than Sasuke? If you believe that, then you're sadly mistaken. Naruto doesn't use the fox power. He only uses his chakra. Tsunade was present in the fight. She could confirm along with a large number of the Anbu and most of your children that Naruto beat Sasuke using his own chakra. Jiraiya is right. The boy bested Sasuke on his own without the aid of the QB, Sinai told the rest of the council. Jinwei spoke. Then how did the boy get strong in a short amount of time, hmm? He's been training under Kaito Saichi, Ryuho Minashu, and Jiraiya. Under these threes, his skills would have increased greatly, but the reason why he has increased his signing levels is because of the gravity seals placed in him by Naya Hiwaito. There was a collective gasp among the council. Waido Suki was the first to speak. You mean to tell me that Uzen no Okami gave him gravity seals? Yes, so you see, it doesn't matter, Naruto will continue to get stronger. Tsunade let Naruto take those missions. I want to see the faces of the council when he exceeds your expectations. My student will succeed in everything you throw at him, Jirai said confidently. I will leave the decision to Naruto, Tsunade stated. Regardless of what you say, Jirai, the boy is a monster. Explain what he did in the earth and rain country then. Back at the ninja outpost, Sasuke defeated the cloud Jonin rather easily. 
It was the same for Naruto. He'd easily dispatch the Rock Jonin and the Rain Jonin. They were both on the ground, struggling to get up. I will not let you leave here alive, the Rock Ninja said in a breath. Neither will I. You had no right. No right, the Jonin from the Rain said before charging at Naruto. Naruto dodged the punch that was aimed for his head and countered with a punch to the shinobi's gut. The punch caused him to fall at Naruto's feet. Naruto looked down at the shinobi from the rain. You say I had no right when I did. But what gave your ninjas the right to do what they did? We have a different viewpoint on what's right and what's wrong. So in your eyes, and in the eyes of many, what I did was wrong. I don't care what you think. I did what I did, and it cannot be changed. Accept it, and deal with it. Back in Konoha, right and wrong is in the eye of the beholder. You all may believe what he did was wrong, but if you don't know his reason, then you shouldn't judge, Jiraiya stated in his student's defense. Sumi and Izuka looked at Jiraiya. Lord Jiraiya, what is his reason for slaughtering a platoon that consisted of 120 rain ninjas in their own country? Back at the outpost, the group with the exception of Sasuke was startled to find out that Naruto had murdered 120 rain ninjas. They couldn't believe what the rain ninjas said. This was Naruto that he was talking about. Naruto had his eyes focused on the man at his feet. I have my reasons. What's your shinobi reasons for doing what they did? The rock ninja saw that Naruto was focusing on the rain ninja. Now was his chance. When he went to attack, Naruto looked up at him to see him coming at him. The ninja never made contact. Sasuke sent the ninja into a wall with a kick to the jaw. The rock ninja struggled to get to his feet. How can you defend a murderer? Not only did he kill 120 range in OBE, he... Back in Konoha, Sume spoke again. He also killed 150 rock ninjas Jiraiya. He did this a couple of days after he slaughtered the rain ninjas. What is the justification for that? Outpost. Naruto answered. It was necessary. The ninja narrowed his eyes at the ninja who answered with no emotion in his voice. Sasuke looked at the ninja he had kicked. What does it matter? Your comrades are dead and there is nothing you can do to bring them back. Instead of worrying about your fallen comrades, you should focus on getting out of here alive, which at the moment is not likely to happen. Udon and Hanabi get the scroll. We only have 20 minutes to get out of here. The two ninjas followed Sasuke's command and came back out of the room with the scroll. Hanabi used the Byakugan to make sure that the scroll had blueprints to the ninja base deeper in the land of lightning. Seeing that, she handed it to Sasuke, who put it in his pouch. The ring ninja spoke. My brother was among the ninja that died that day. This guy was taken away as someone very precious to me, and for that, he will die. Sakura and Hinata had tears in their eyes, hearing what Naruto did. They couldn't believe the innocent boy had slaughtered close to 300 shinobis in a matter of a week. Sakura looked at Naruto and spoke through the sobs. Whatever happened to your ninja way, Naruto, it isn't like you just slaughter a bunch of people because you felt it was necessary. That isn't something Naruto would do. That is something a monster would do. Konoha. Kataki Waka spoke for the first time. Any way you slice a Jiraiya, your pupil is a monster. To do that because it was necessary is not justifiable. Jiraiya and Naruto both looked up and said in unison, Naruto, anyone in my shoes would have done the same, Jiraiya. Anyone in his shoes would have done the same. Hinata looked at Naruto. Naruto, maybe if you explained why you did what you did, then Sakura wouldn't be so judgmental. But not giving the reasons, it makes you look cold-hearted. Naruto looked at Hinata. The only ones who are cold-hearted are the ones who willingly use the little girl for leverage. Konoha. So you're saying that he slaughtered all those ninjas because of a little girl? Sanade questioned. She knew that Naruto did, but never knew the real reason. Unlike the others, she knew that Naruto wouldn't do this unless his reason was just. Jiraiya shook his head. Not just any little girl, he did it to protect Outpost. My sister. Not my blood sister, but she is someone that I consider his sister. Naruto turned to Sakura and glared. If you must know, Haruno, I will never break my ninja away. I made a promise to the little girl that I would be there for her always. If I let her die, then I would not have kept my promise. Don't make accusations when you don't know all the facts. If it was Leaf Ninjas that committed the act, then it would be over 300 Leaf Ninjas dead. To protect her life, I would kill anyone who harms her. 
think what you will of me. It really doesn't matter either way. Naruto stepped over the Rain Ninja and walked past Sakura. He stopped, then turned to speak to the Rock and Rain Ninjas. We're no different, you and I. You willingly attacked me because you lost someone precious to you. And I did what I did to protect my little sister. Our compassion for those we hold in our hearts will drive us to do what I feel is necessary to protect them or their name. I will not kill you here. You'll go back to your respective villages and tell your Kages that the next time they try to use anyone that I hold dear as leverage for an advantage at war, then you'll really see a monster. Naruto walked away from the group. Sasuke motioned for Hanabi to knock the guards out, then everyone followed him out of the outpost. It was 8 o'clock, and the sun was setting. The team was now heading back to Konoha. Sasuke gave Naruto the order to lead them to the docks in the Land of Lightning. Naruto had informed Sasuke while traveling that they would be in Rice Country by 11 that night. The only thing was that they had to reach the docks by 9 p.m. The squad headed through the woods to the docks in Kanha. This is all you need to know. Naruto will tell you if he wants to. It is in my place. I'm leaving O oh, and Yuga. Yashi like a dry. What? Naruto won't die, and he won't let your daughter die if she's his teammate. Even if you place the seal on her, she is going to live through any missions assigned to her. If Naruto has anything to say about it, Hiyashi spoke. I don't care what happens to Hinata. A defect isn't welcome in the Hyuga. Jiraiya shook his head and disappeared. So now he looked at the group of members. Naruto will get missions based on his approval. Also, I will assign Hinata as a permanent member of his team. She looked at the Hyuga head. I'm not doing this because you seek to weed out what you deem as weak in the eyes of the Hyuga. I'm doing this for Hinata. Even if I was to take the choice out of Naruto's hands, he wouldn't mind me giving him S-Class missions. Also, Hinata will become stronger by being with Naruto. The only thing holding her back is confidence. You all think that I have submitted to your decisions, but I have not. When it is all said and done, you will see why I have made the decision that I have made. This meeting is adjourned. All of you, get out of my sight. Sonate had left the meeting and headed to her office. When she got there, Jiraiya was sitting on the couch. She walked up to her desk and rubbed her temples. Want some sake? He walked up and sat in the chair next to her. I thought you would never ask. A docks, 45 minutes later. Naruto and the gang had yet to speak to each other. They arrived at the docks. Naruto had went to talk to the owner of the docks, who happened to be a friend of his. It's been a long time, Kabune. The short, balding old man looked and smiled at Naruto. It's been a long time, my boy. How's it been? Rumor has it that the Golden Fox has sided with the Leaf. That wouldn't be true, would it? Yes, old man. That is indeed true. More importantly, can you get us on the boat heading to Rice Country tonight? The old man looked at Naruto. No, not without payment, of course. Naruto sighed. He knew he was going to have to pay the old man. Naruto reached inside his jacket. Here, this is Icha Icha Paradise, make out tactics volume 8. This book is personally signed by Jiraiya himself, if you can get us on the boat. The old man went to grab the book, but Naruto raised his hand to avoid the man's hand from grabbing the book. This book is yours. The old man's eyes illustrated his happiness. Consider it a deal. Just give me that book and head to port 14. Tell Kukai that I said to let you on and consider this was his way of paying me back. I wish you good luck, Naruto, but I have to go to the bat. I mean to my office to straighten out a few things. Sweat formed on the back of everyone's head. Sakura looked at the old man. Walked away and thought, are all men perverted bastards? Inner Sakura chimed in. If I see Kakashi Sensei with that book when I get back, I'm going to kick his ass. Shanaro! Naruto motioned everyone to follow him to the port. Naruto informed the captain of what the old man said. The captain let him on the boat without hesitation. Naruto and the others were sitting in the cargo area of the ship when Hinata was first to speak. Naruto, I would like to know more about your sister, if you wish to tell us. That is, Hinata said in a low voice. Naruto looked at Hinata and smiled. Her name is Hayami Minashu, and she's eight years old. Hokage's office. The girl that was kidnapped was Ryuho's daughter. Okage asked Jiraiya. Yes, it seems that the rain and the rock combined forces to get the girl. I think their plan was to use the girl so Ryuho could train their soldiers in 
the heavenly sword style, Jiraiya answered. So Nari leaned back in her chair. So they had planned on using the girl so her father would train the soldiers. They had planned to attack us all this time. If Naruto didn't step in, I think Ryuho would have trained them. Family means more to him than his style. Even if it was unintentional, Naruto did this village another service. Back in the ship, you trained under a samurai, Naruto? He not asked. Yes, I did. It's part of the reason that I'm good with a sword, Naruto answered proudly. Sasuke was quiet the whole time, trying to figure out why Naruto would go so far for a little girl. He didn't understand it. He couldn't comprehend why. Sasuke looked up at the blue-eyed ninja and simply said, Why? Naruto looked at Sasuke. He studied Sasuke to find what Sasuke meant by that question. Naruto understood what Sasuke was asking. Why did I kill all of those men for one little girl? I thought I told you at the outpost. She's someone that I hold dear in my heart. If she or anyone that I cared about was in danger, I would do all that I can to protect them. You're still not telling us the other reason, Naruto. What is it? Sasuke asked. Naruto looked at the sky and smiled. She's the reason why I'm not a monster. She's the reason I'm not a cold-blooded killer. But most of all, she is the reason why I decided to not destroy the leaf. She was my savior. She saved me from my personal hell. The group took it all in. Everyone, with the exception of Sakura, Hinata, and Sasuke, couldn't believe that he had wanted to destroy the leaf. Naruto took his gaze off of the ceiling and looked at the group. To understand the reasons for my action, I should start from the day I left the village. So this time, I destroyed this ninjas. You guys might want to get comfortable. It's a very long story. Everyone inched closer to Naruto, preparing to hear his story. They all looked at him with anticipation in their eyes. Naruto looked at the group and said, It all started on the day that I was exiled in the village. Everyone stared at Naruto, who began to speak. It all started the day that I left the village. I felt no matter how hard I tried to get the villagers to acknowledge me, they never would. So, I decided to head to the Land of Waves. Flashback. Naruto was walking in the forest. He was mumbling to himself as he walked. Stupid village. I don't know why I ever tried. It doesn't matter anymore because they will see their mistake when I become stronger. Naruto drew a kunai from his pouch and slit the palm of his hand. He let the blood drop to the ground. I swear that I will become stronger. I won't take the easy way out like Sasuke. No, I will train to become the greatest ninja ever. Konoha, when I reach my goal, you better pray I put how I was treated behind me because I swear if I don't, I will crush the village. He didn't even bother with wrapping the deep wound and it began the healing process. As he walked away slowly, he looked back at the village and narrowed his eyes. They will see their mistake, one way or another. Naruto had walked for hours, trying to figure out where he should go. Finally, it came to him. Maybe I should visit Tazuna. That's what I'll do. I'll head to the Land of Waves. End the flashback. So, you went to see Tazuna and his family after you left? Sakura asked the blonde shinobi. He nodded. Yes, I did visit Tazuna and his family. It's funny, in Wave, I'm seen as a hero, but in my hometown, I'm nothing more than a person that the villagers hate without justified cause. You're a hero in the land of Waves, bro? Konamaru said, looking at his idol with stars in his eyes. I guess it has something to do with the mission that Team 7 had in the land of Waves. It shocked me too when I found out. What also shocked me was that they named their bridge the Great Naruto Bridge, Naruto said in a modest tone. Why did they name a bridge after you? You weren't the only one who helped on the mission, you know. Sasuke said with a slight hint of jealousy. Naruto just shrugged. I don't know, ask Tazuna the next time you see him. Would it have been better if it was named the Great Sasuke Bridge? Sasuke smirked at the blue-eyed young man. Of course it would have been better. You arrogant bastard, not even getting your ass kicked changed that fact, Naruto thought. Sakura spoke to break the tension between the two. Naruto, I think you should continue with your story. Naruto continued. Ah, where was I? Oh yeah, I went to visit Tazuna and his family. The village treated me like I was a human, so I decided to stay for a while. 
I was in the land of waves for three months, and then I left. Tazuna gave me a nice sum of money so I wouldn't go hungry during my travels. And then I headed to the land of water. While there, I met a missing ninja by the name of Kaito Saichi. Let me guess, you trained under him, right? Sasuke stated. Yes, I did train under him, Naruto said. Shocking that an S-class missing ninja would take time to train anyone, Udon stated. So that explains the water techniques he used against Lord Sasuke, and I'll be pointed out. How did you meet him, Naruto? Hinata asked in a soft tone. Flashback. I've been in this country for two months, and I still haven't found a ramen stand. I hope that this town has ramen or I'm gonna die, Naruto said out loud to himself. Naruto walked for ten minutes before he found what he was looking for. His eyes grew as wide as saucers, his mouth opened wide, dripping with saliva. Ramen, I can't believe that I found a ramen stand. Naruto ran up to the ramen and took a seat next to the man with short blue hair and green eyes. The said man was dressed in a white long sleeve shirt and gray sweats. The sandals he had on were the standard blue that almost every ninja wore. The guy gave Naruto a side glance before speaking. What's the matter with you kid? Is there something wrong with my face? Naruto shook his head. No, I just saw your sword and I assume that you're a ninja. Am I correct? Before the man brought noodles to his mouth, he spoke in a low tone. Yes. Naruto looked at the man. Judging by that headband, you're a missing ninja. Naruto gave the man a serious look. Train me. The man turns his attention to Naruto. You don't want to get involved with me, kid. You'll get hurt in the long run. I'm not even supposed to be in this country. I'm an S-class criminal, wanted for trying to assassinate a Mizukage. You'll have hunter ninjas on you if you get involved with me. But since I like you, I'll pay for your meal. Be safe, kid. The said ninja placed a stack of coins on the stand before walking off. Naruto stared at his back for a while. Shit, I didn't get his name. Oh well, I guess I'll eat some ramen. Naruto looked at the cook. Four bowls of miso ramen. The girl at the ramen stand smiled at Naruto and prepared his order. Naruto ate his food and left the ramen stand. He decided to go outside of the town to continue his training with the scrolls Jiraiya had given him. Naruto finally reached an area where he could train. He had been practicing basic fire jutsus well in the land of waves. He was trying to perfect them. Naruto did a katan gokaku no jutsu. He burned several trees in the area, but it wasn't good enough in his eyes. He was about to do it again, but he was interrupted by a voice from behind. The technique would be more effective if you relaxed a bit. Naruto turned to see the owner of the voice. Oh, it's you. What do you want? I don't have time to fool around. I have to train. The man looked over at Naruto before speaking. So, you think I'm a waste of your time, but yet you ask me to train you. Why is that? You're a ninja familiar with water-based jutsus. I thought I could benefit by learning as much as I could, but since you don't want to take me in, I have no time to waste, Naruto said before turning back to prepare for another fire technique. The guy spoke, interrupting him midway through seals. What if I decided to take you on? What do you plan to do with my training? Naruto turned back to the man. He thought about his question. He had vowed to become strong and gaining jutsus, was one way to that goal. He was mad at what the leaf did, and he wanted everyone that was against him to pay. But then he thought about Iruka, and how he would be affected if Naruto did what he had intended to do. Naruto didn't know what he would do, but he knew that it would help him survive another day, so he could decide. I don't know what I plan to do with the training that you wish to give me. All I know is that it would help me to survive another day, to make the decision on what to do, Naruto answered honestly. The man smiled at the boy. Good answer. Gather your belongings. We leave now. If I'm in this country for too long, the hunter ninjas will surely discover me. It would be hard to escape them with you, so we need to hurry. Naruto grabbed the backpack that was about 20 feet away from him, and walked back to the man. My name is Naruto Uzumaki. What's yours? The man looked at the young boy and smiled. My name is Kaito Saichi. Naruto and the man walked out of the forest and headed off into the distance, without another word said between them. End of flashback. So, that's how he met Kaito Saichi, Sakura stated, rhetorically. 
And that's how we met. I found out that he was a member of the Miss Seven Swordsman about a week later. Naruto informed the group. So bro, what did you learn while you trained under him? Konohamaru asked, showing interest in Naruto's training. Naruto spoke to answer the third grandson's question. Well, he trained me how to use a sword, showed me some water jutsus, and we did a mission together. He actually started calling me the Golden Fox. He said the way I tricked enemies and the whisker marks on my face reminded him of a fox. I guess Golden is because of the blonde hair. It seemed to catch on, but it wasn't a name that put fear into people's hearts until the incidents in the rain in Earth Country. Anyway, we traveled together for two whole years. That's how long it took for me to complete my training under him. Sasuke looked at Naruto. Naruto generalized his training, which meant that he was hiding something that he didn't want them to know. Sasuke didn't really care. The only thing he wondered was where Naruto got those gravity seals. He wanted to get them too. I'm curious, how did you get those gravity seals? He wanted to get them too. I'm curious, how did you get those gravity seals? Sasuke asked, causing everyone to turn to Naruto. Naruto spoke. I got the seals from Naya Hawaito. Fuzuza no Akami, Sakura said, uh, gaining the attention of everyone. So, you've heard of the seal mistress. It figures you are always the brainiac, Naruto said, with a hint of sarcasm. Well, actually, Lady Tsunade and Lord Jiraiya were talking about her, and Guy told us who she was. Sakura said, informing her former teammate. I just hope Hervey Sage doesn't tell Granny about where she's located. I hope he lied and said that he had no idea where she was. Knowing him, he probably did. Naruto thought to himself. Sasuke spoke again. Where is she now, Naruto? Maybe I could get her to place the seals on me to help elevate my training. The blonde ninja smirked at the Uchiha. That is for me to know, and for you to wish you knew. Sasuke narrowed his eyes at Naruto. Sasuke was about to speak, but Naruto cut him off before he could. Part of her giving me these seals, so uh, was I could never to reveal her location. I'm among the handful that knows where she's at. Like I would tell you, even if she didn't ask me to reveal her location. Sasuke was mad at the fact that he couldn't get those seals that Naruto had. Those seals would be helpful. Sasuke's train of thought was interrupted by Hanabi. How long have you had those seals? I got them after my first year with Kaito Sensei. He's among a handful of people who know her location. He decided to take me there to advance my training. Naruto stared off into space, losing himself in thoughts. Flashback. Naruto had a blindfold on, and he was being carried by a Sensei. Is this really necessary? I mean, I can walk and see, you know. I know, Naruto, but where we're going, no one knows about it but me and a select few. Who knows, after this, maybe you'll be among the few, Kaito said to his student. How long till we get there? Naruto asked in a bored tone. We're already here, Kaito entered a house with Naruto on his back. The man put Naruto down and then removed the blindfold from his eyes. His vision was a little blurred, but it cleared up soon after the blindfold was removed. Naruto saw a lady with long black hair, brown eyes, and lipstick that Tsunade wears. The lady was dressed in a purple kimono with small white flowers decorating it. She looked at Naruto and smiled. Sayor, Naruto is Maki. It's finally nice to meet you. I've heard so much about you from Kaito here, and I prefer to Hermit Sensei Jiraiya. Naruto looked at this beautiful, tan complexion woman with visible shock. You were trained by Pervy Sage. Thought the only person that he trained was the fourth. She smiled at the boy. I was on the beginning team, along with the fourth. What's your name? Naruto asked the woman. My name is Naya Hawaito, she answered the boy. It's nice to meet you, Naruto. So, what is a ninja of the leaf doing out here with the missing ninja from Kiri? The lady asked with a smile still on her face. Naruto's expression turned to one of anger. I was banished from that wretched village. I'm no longer a shinobi of the leaf. She looked surprised and a bit taken back by his comments. She was mad at the fact that her former teammates who sacrificed his only son for the sake of the village did not have his last wish come true. Granted, she wasn't in the village at the time Jiraiya had informed her of Minato's death. 
and had told her Minato's last words. She had offered to take the boy in, but Jiraiya had also informed her that Minato wanted Naruto to grow up in the leaf. The four seemed to believe that his son would be looked at as a hero. Now she knew his decision was proven wrong. She couldn't help but feel sorry for the young man in front of her. Naruto, why did they banish you from the village? Knowing the answer since Jiraiya told her days after he was banished. Jiraiya also informed her that the boy had no idea about his heritage. That made her angrier, but she knew that it was for the best, seeing as her teammates had numerous enemies. Naruto clenched his fist at the question, but he answered nonetheless. I was on a mission to retrieve Sasuke Uchiha, one of my former teammates. We fought at the Valley of the End, and I held back my attack, because if it had hit him, he would have died. He fled to a village to gain power from the man who killed the fifth Okage. So, your friend went to Orochimaru, I presume. Well, Naruto, you should put the past behind you and move on. She smiled at the younger man. Naruto wore a serious expression. I will not put the past behind me. It has made me strong, and it will continue to do so. The hate, the betrayal, the rejection, the loneliness are the ingredients that will make me into a great ninja. Konoha will regret that they blamed me for something that was out of my control. She just looked at the boy. She knew if his father was here, he would be ashamed to hear his son, but then again, he would probably be more ashamed of the village that he sacrificed himself for if he learned how they treated his son. Well, Naruto, you shouldn't attack Konoha. If you do, then you would be the monster that's sealed inside of you. Naruto's eyes widened. You know about the QB, but how? Who do you think helped with your fa friend being sealed inside your stomach? Whew, that was close, Naya thought. Naruto narrowed his eyes. So, you helped him place these wretched curse on me? Naruto closed his eyes as he looked down. He opened them while looking at the ground, only to have a sad expression on his face. Why? Why was I chosen to bear this curse? I didn't ask for this. What made the fourth choose me out of a hundred other kids in the village? She gave him a look of that indicated she felt sorry for him. Naruto, I don't know why you were selected. You see, I only helped the Zan seal, which took about two months to do so. The fourth came to me and asked me to help him with the seal to stop the QB. He came to me about four months prior with the prototype that he designed. The QB was rampaging lands southwest of Kika Island. It was estimated that it would take him about four months to reach Konoha. The seal was designed as a last resort. It took us a lot of sleepless nights to design the seal, but we did it. After spending two months here, he headed back to Konoha. All I know after that is that he sealed the beast inside of you. I was informed of this by Jiraiya Sensei. There was a long silence. Kaito walked up and placed a hand on Naruto. I don't know why he chose you. All I know is that he would have chose you if you didn't think you could handle it. Whatever. Why are we here, Kaito Sensei? Naruto asked. I think you're going to love this, Naruto, because this will make you stronger. Naya, if you will. The ninja from the mist said to the black haired woman. She looked at Naruto and started to explain. Okay, Naruto, you're brought here today because your sensei asked me to place gravity seals on you. Before you ask, let me explain. Gravity seals are seals that are placed in the body by someone who is good with seals, such as myself. The purpose of these seals is to make you stronger. They will do so by increasing the gravity on your body. While everyone is walking around in normal gravity field, you, on the other hand, will be walking in a gravity field slightly higher than normal. Naruto looked at her with a confused expression. She sighed, trying to figure a better way to explain it. Think of them as body weights, but a hundred times better. When you increase weights, you move slower. The same principle applies with gravity seals. However, taking weights off in the midst of combat is impossible to do. But with gravity seals, it's easier because all you need to do is have a hand seal or a hand seal is formatted to the seals. Also, gravity seals yield results faster than weights. I understand, so you're saying I can increase the seal with the hand sign if I wished. 
Naruto asks with visible interest. Yes, but you can also release them with a hand sign. So Naruto, do you want them, or do I have to find another way to repay your teacher? She asked the boy. Okay, fine, let's do it. This will be very beneficial, Naruto said with a smile on his face. 20 minutes had passed and Naruto was lying on a table with a towel covering his private area. There were purple seal marks painted all over his body. Naya did a few hand seals. She then placed the glowing index and middle finger of her right hand on Naruto's chest. When her two fingers made contact, all the seals started to glow bright purple. Naruto felt his whole body get slightly heavier than it was before. He looked at his body to see the seals had stopped glowing purple. Soon after the glow, they were gone completely. He looked at her. The seals are gone, but my body still feels heavy. Why? The seals only faded to match your skin color. They aren't gone, just invisible. When you deactivate the seals, they will reappear again, only to fade once more. No one will know you have the gravity seals until you confront them in battle, she explained to Kaito's student. Okay, so what are the hand seals to deactivate and activate the seals? I placed my index finger and my middle finger on your chest. That is the seals, but you are to cross your arms in an X shape. Then release the seals. The same process is used to activate them. Now, to increase the gravity of the seals, all you have to do is think about the increase while you're forming the seals. Right now, you're at times one the normal gravity, or level one, whatever you prefer to call it. It's going to take a while to get used to it, but I recommend that you don't elevate your level until you can move freely in times one, like you can in normal gravity, Naya informed him. An hour later, Naruto and Saichi were at the door preparing to leave. Naya smiled at Naruto. Naruto, since I have given you the seal, you have to give me your word that you will not tell anyone of this location. I do not wish to be found by anyone. So, do I have your word? Naruto nodded. You have my word. No one will know of this location. How can I trust your word? She asked. I never go back to my word. It's my nindo. My ninja way. Naruto told the lady. She smiled at the boy. Thank you, Naruto. If you need anything else, just come to me, but make sure you're not followed. Naruto and Kaito left the house and headed out. They sped off into the darkness of the night. End of flashback. Naruto. 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 Hinata said, trying to snap him out of his daze. Oh, uh, Hinata, I'm sorry. I must have zoned out there. Where was I again? Naruto asked the leaf ninjas gathered around him. Oh, I was telling you all about how he took me to get my gravity seals. Well, anyway, I followed him for another year after that. My training with him was done, and we both parted ways. I decided that I had to learn how to fend for myself and make it on my own. I headed to the land of sea, after doing some solo missions for a month. When I arrived in sea country, I spent two days there in a hotel. While walking down the street, I ran into a man who looked to be a swordsman. He insulted the design of my sword and said that I probably had no skill, so I challenged him to a duel. Hanabi spoke before anyone could. So what happened next? I challenged him and lost, but it was to be expected when the person you lose to is Ryuho Minashu, Naruto stated. So, why did he train you if you lost to him? Sasuke asked. He said he saw something in my form that he hadn't seen in a long time. He offered to train me and I accepted, Naruto said. What happened while you were training with him, bro? Konohamaru asked with excitement in his voice. I won't tell them everything about the training. They really don't need to know about that, Naruto thought. We introduced ourselves, and he decided to introduce me to his clan. Flashback. Naruto, I'm taking you to meet my clan. I think you're going to like my family. There are a lot of young girls in the village that will be taking a liking to you, I'm sure. I'm not gay or anything, but you are an attractive young man, and the women are going to swarm all over you, Ryuho said to his new apprentice. I really don't care for that. I have other goals to accomplish. Right now, women are not on the list, Naruto said eh, with an expressionless face. The man smiled at Naruto. You see that now, but we'll see what happens. Anyway, you're going to be staying with me. It should only take you a year to master the style. So, what are you planning on doing with the training? 
First, I have to deal with an organization that wants me dead for something that I have. Second, I have a village to decimate, Naruto said with slight anger in his voice at the last part. You sure have a lot of things that you have to do, but you're going to need an army to do the latter, Ryuho said jokingly. I won't need an army. I'm going to do it myself. For the crimes that they have committed against me, they will suffer. First, I'm going to deal with the Akatsuki. Next, I'm going to the sound. And I'm going to kick Sasuke Uchiha's ass and drag him back to Konoha. Only to show the villagers a true monster. Naruto said to Ryuho in a serious manner. Well, I hope you don't follow through on your revenge. A man must have honor. Where's the honor in destroying a village because you were mistreated? Rise above it and show them that you're better. The samurai master said that, hoping that his words would get through. Whatever, but the leaf village will fall regardless of what you say. Over the last two years, my hate and disgust for that village has grown. I told myself if I learned to put it behind me, then I would not show them what a monster truly is. But since I haven't, and as it stands now, the village will be destroyed, Naruto said making the man next to him shake his head. The two had finally reached the top of the long stairs. When they finally got to the top, a large estate was sitting at the top. Naruto took in the beautiful scenery. He saw a pond to his right and an assorted arrangement of followers all over. In his mind, the mansion easily fit 300 or more. He wasn't sure. Naruto, you'll be staying here with me and my family for a year. You will live in my section of the mansion with my wife my daughter, and myself. Come, let me show you the house. Ryuho walked forward and motioned Naruto to follow. They both entered the mansion. The mansion had an old traditional feel to Naruto, but it was definitely classy. Ryuho led Naruto to the section that his wife and daughter lived. When they entered the area, the little girl ran up to her father. Father, you're back. Did you bring me the candy that you promised? He scooped up the little girl. I'm sorry, honey, but I didn't get you any candy. Oh, where are my manners? Naruto, I would like you to meet my daughter, Hayami. Naruto nodded instead of saying hello. The little girl gave Naruto a cheeky smile. Ryuho's wife also walked up to the group. Ryuho pointed to his wife. This is my lovely wife, Kaori. Kaori extended her hand to Naruto. It's nice to meet you, Naruto. Well, if you'll excuse me, I have things to do. The lady with nice flowing lavender hair and green eyes walked past Naruto, Ryuho, and Hayami and headed out of her family's section of the mansion. Ryuho put his daughter on his neck and motioned Naruto to follow. They left Ryuho's section and walked further into the mansion. They finally arrived at a dojo on the east wing of the mansion. They walked in to see a man training about 20 boys and girls ages ranging from 12 to 15. The man motioned the group to stop. He walked up to Ryuho, the man with long black hair and a ponytail and eyes to match, was wearing a blue robe with a white tunic. He looked to be no more than 20. The said man had bowed before Ryuho. Hello, Lord Ryuho. What do I owe the pleasure of you coming to watch me teach one of my classes? I'm just giving my newest apprentice a tour. Shinji meet Naruto Uzumaki. Naruto Uzumaki meet Shinji Minashu, my nephew. The head of the Minashu clan introduced the two. Both men nodded to each other in acknowledgement. Shinji spoke. Lord Ryuho, I don't mean to be rude, but I was showing my students an advanced form of our style. It would be impossible to get them to concentrate and do well while under the eyes of the clan head. Ryuho nodded in agreement. I understand. I wasn't planning to stay long anyway. I just wanted to show Naruto the dojo and also inform you of the meeting taking place later on tonight. Thank you, Lord Ryuho. I will be at the meeting. Shinji bowed to his uncle and walked back to his class. Ryuho and Naruto walked out of the dojo with Hayami still on his father's shoulders. Naruto. He took Hayami off his neck. Can you watch her for a minute? I have business to take care of. I'm sure Hayami will be glad to show you the rest of the mansion. Right, Hayami? She nodded vigorously. Yes, father, I would. Good. Later, guys. 
He walked away from the two, disappearing into the distance. Naruto turned and walked away from the girl. She ran to his side. Hey, big brother Naruto, where are you going? Father asked me to take you on a tour. Don't you want to see the rest of this place? No, Naruto said, silencing the girl. She looked down at and looked back up at him, as if a thought just occurred to her. I know big brother Naruto. Do you want to play with me? We can play samurai together. Do you want to? No. Aren't there kids your age in this mansion or this village that you can play with for that matter? Naruto didn't even look down at the girl when he replied. The girl looked down at the ground. Sadness was visible in her eyes. My cousins say I'm too slow to play with them. And the kids in the village treat me the same. Nobody wants to be my friend. Naruto stopped and looked at the girl. She looked at him, waiting for him to speak. Life is cruel. Deal with it. I can tour the rest of this place by myself. Naruto said before leaving the girl all alone. And a flashback. So, what happened during your time there? Sasuke asked out of interest. I trained, of course. I learned more about using a sword than I ever thought possible, Naruto answered. Naruto, can you tell us more about Hayami and how she helped you? Hinata asked her crush. Naruto nodded to Hinata and continued with his tale. Flashback. Six months passed since Naruto arrived at the Minashu clan compound. Naruto ignored most of Ryuho's nieces and other female relatives' attempts at him. He also ignored the villagers' females' advances. Naruto was going to a store in town to get some ramen. As he was walking down the street, he saw some kids of Hayami's age teasing her. Hayami is a loser, purple-haired freak, bookworm nerd. Hayami started to cry as the kids continued to tease her. Cry baby, cry baby, Hayami is a cry baby. One of the boys teasing her pushed her on the ground. He went to kick her but found that something was holding him a few inches above the ground. Hayami looked up through her tears, elevating her voice out of joy. Big brother Naruto! The kids looked back to see who had him captive. He saw a teen about his sister's age, holding him with a serious look on his face. Their attention was broken when the teen and a couple of her friends walked onto the scene. The girl waved at Naruto who glanced at her. Hello Naruto-kun, the girl said uh, with emphasis on the kun. The girl recognized Naruto was holding her brother in his hands. What did my brother do, Naruto? Naruto threw the kid at her feet. He was picking on that little girl. If I see him picking on her again, he won't get off so easy. I apologize for his actions, so... What do you got to say for yourself, young man? The girl said with an angry look on her face. The boy and his friends looked at Ayami. We're sorry. Naruto turned his back on the crowd and continued with his business. Ayami saw Naruto walking away and ran up to him. Thank you for saving me, big brother Naruto. Where are you going? Can I come along? She asked with a pleading look in her eyes. Naruto looked at the girl for a moment. She's just like Mia since the villagers don't hate her, but her peers look down on her. Come on, let me treat you to some ramen. Her eyes became wide and glossy. Really, big brother Naruto? You mean it? Just come on before I change my mind, Naruto said walking off. The girl quickly caught up. Five months passed since then, and Hayami was the only person that Naruto was friendly with. He showed respect to her parents, but with her, he found someone he truly cared for. It was Hayami's bedtime, and Naruto was in the room with her. Big brother Naruto, you're leaving in a month, right? She said it with sadness in her voice. Yes, Hayami, I'll be leaving in a month. I have things to take care of, but don't worry, you'll see me again, he assured the little girl. Big brother Naruto, can you tell me a story? The girl asked. Naruto thought about a story he could tell her. He finally got it. Okay. There was once this great demon known as the QB. No one knows its reasons, but the great demon attacked a ninja village known as Konoha. The QB attacked the village, destroyed a lot of things, and killed a lot of people. Big brother Naruto, I don't like this story. I'm scared. The little girl said. He smiled at her. Don't worry, because the villager's hero shows up. Oh, so what happens when a hero shows up? A hero shows up and vows to defeat the monster. But the only way that he could defeat the monster was to seal it in the belly of a newborn. He did this, thus saving the village from the QB. Naruto stated, Did the 
kid die? She asked. No, the kid is very much alive. You see, the kid grew up with villagers who hated him because they thought that he was the fox. He had no family and no friends. One day, when the kid was 12, he was banished from his village. He now roams the globe, but no one knows where he is for sure, Naruto said. Oh, that is a sad story, big brother Naruto. I hope that he finds happiness. If I knew him, I would be his friend. He didn't choose to have the monster sealed in him. I hope to get to meet him someday so I can be his friend. Big brother Naruto, would you be his friend too? Ayami asked the boy she called brother. Naruto smiled and ruffled her hair. Yes, Ayami, I'd be his friend. Now, get some sleep. You have school in the morning. She sat up and gave him a hug. Good night. I love you, big brother Naruto. Naruto's eyes widened at that last statement. Nobody has ever said that to him. He shook off his shock and looked at the girl with a smile forming on his face. I love you too, Ayami. Naruto walked out of the room and closed the door behind him. He turned to his left to see Kiori leaning against the wall. A story. It was about you, wasn't it? Kiori asked. Naruto just nodded. He was about to walk away when her voice stopped him. You know, Naruto, not everyone eh, sees you as a monster. From hearing what Hayami said about you, wanting to be your friend, it's safe to say that she doesn't see you that way, and neither do I, the clan head's wife stated to the boy. I told her the story to see what she would think. Now I know that if she ever finds out that she won't treat me any different. It's late, I'm gonna go to bed. Good night, Kiori, Naruto said before heading to his bedroom. Good night, Naruto, the lady said before walking off to her room. The month went by fast, and Naruto was now ready to leave. He decided to take Pervy Sage up on his offer. So his next goal was to find uh, the perverted hermit. Naruto was at the stairs that were eight stories high and led back to the village. Everyone from the clan gathered. Ryuho spoke. Naruto, we're sure going to miss you around here. He's right, Naruto. I don't think my nieces want you to leave. They all look sad, Kiori said to the blonde. Well, I have more training to do, but don't worry. I will visit when I get the chance, Naruto told everyone. You promised big brother Naruto? Kiyami asked with tears in her eyes. He walked up to the girl and bent down to her height. Of course, he then took out a gold necklace with a fox pendant from his pants pocket and put it around the girl's neck. He then pulled his out from under his shirt. This chain here symbolizes our friendship, Hayami. It also shows that no matter where you are, I'm always with you. If you happen to be in danger, the necklace is also to show you that I'll be there to save you. Like you saved me, Naruto thought to himself. He stood up and rubbed her head. I hope you like it, and will treasure it as much as I treasure mine. I will treasure it always, big brother Naruto. Thank you for giving it to me. She jumped into his arms and hugged him. Naruto returned the embrace. He put the girl down. Well, I have to go, Ryo sensei Thanks for the sword. It's much better than my previous one. Where is the sword that you had originally had when you came here? Ryuho asked. I sealed it inside of a scroll. He then returned to Ryuho's wife. Thank you, Kiori, for understanding. I have to go, everyone. I will see you all soon. Naruto waved to everyone before running down the steps that curved around the mountain that the clan's house sat on. Naruto reached the end of the steps to see a man he hadn't seen in a long time sitting on a frog. Pervy Sage, what are you doing here? Naruto asked, shocked to see him. I'm here to see if you're going to accept the offer I gave you three years ago, Jiraiya informed the blonde shinobi. I was actually about to just come look for you. Well, no matter. Let's go. Lead the way, Pervy Sage, Naruto said. End of flashback. I trained with Jiraiya for a year, then I left him to wander around. Not entirely true. I did defeat three Akatsuki members, but they don't even know that. Maybe I should tell them. It would definitely make Sasuke jealous with envy. Nah, they don't need to know how strong I have truly become just yet, Naruto thought. So, Naruto, how did you meet Yumi? Hinata asked. Flashback. A year had passed since the Akatsuki had fallen. Naruto had engaged three members at separate times. 
The easiest of the three was my Haoshu, who was a rain ninja. Naruto won that fight with little effort. The next fight was against Aang Azuya, who was anything but easy. He fought Aang two months after his battle with Haoshu in order to defeat the gemstone. He had to lower the level of the gravity seal to one. When training with Jiraiya, it was at level two. He won the battle with minor damage. His next opponent was the strongest of them all. He fought Tosoku a month later. Naruto had to drop his gravity seal and remove his waist stickers completely to keep up with Tosoku, a missing ninja from the cloud. The battle was fierce, but Naruto had won. Barely. He smiled at his accomplishment. Since then, he had raised the gravity seal level to three. Naruto was walking down a street in a village in the land of sun on a beautiful sunny day looking for a clothes shop to buy a shirt. He walked past an alley and saw about three guys harassing a girl who was about his age. Naruto decided to help. He beat the three guys up and chased them off. He then helped the girl up and she introduced herself. Hi, I'm Yumi. You are. Naruto, it's nice to meet you, Yumi, Naruto said to the girl. It's nice to meet you. You saved me from those guys. If you hadn't come along, then they probably would have raped me. She was revolted by that thought. She broke herself from her thought and looked back at the blonde. As a token of my appreciation, I would like to cook you dinner, if that's okay. Okay, Naruto followed the girl to her house. She invited him in and introduced him to her mother. She told her mother all about what happened. Naruto stayed and at dinner with the ladies and was about to leave when they offered him to stay the night. He declined at first, but they kept insisting, so he caved in and decided to stay. A day turned into a week, and a week turned into two months. Naruto was living with them. During this time, he and Yumi had started dating. Naruto and Yumi were walking in the village holding hands. Naruto had offered to take her out to eat at a local outdoor restaurant. They took their seats and ordered their food. Naruto noticed that there were some ninjas from the rain talking amongst each other. He decided to eavesdrop. I wonder if that samurai Ryuho will comply. If he doesn't, then his daughter is going to die. The rain ninja said, It's good their Amakage and Iwa Sujikage had come to an alliance. If Ryuho trained both of our soldiers in his sword style, then we would be a very powerful ninja village, the other ninja said. Naruto clenched his teeth at what he heard. He stood up from the table. Yumi, I'm sorry, but something has come up. I have to leave ASAP. She frowned at him and nodded. Okay, let's go. It took Naruto and Yumi ten minutes to get to her house. He wasted no time throwing some clothes in his backpack. Yumi wondered why he was in a rush. Naruto, what's the rush? You just came back from a four day mission yesterday. Why are you leaving so soon? I heard that my little sister was just kidnapped. I'm going to the land of sea to see my sensei, Naruto said while throwing clothes in his backpack. The young man known as the Golden Fox finished packing his bag. He walked up to Yumi. Don't worry, I'm coming back. I don't know how long I'll be gone, but I will be back. She gave him a hug. Naruto broke the hug and ran out of the door. His destination, the land of sea. Please, Ayami, be safe, was the thought that ran through his head, and a flashback. So he immediately took off to the land of sea, would not confront the ninjas in town about the information not be said to the QB container. That seems logical, but they already stated that she was still alive. I needed to go see Ryuho Sensei and find out more about the kidnapping. Naruto explained his reason to the younger Hyuga. Flashback. Naruto had arrived in sea two days later. He went straight to the manor. He was informed that Ryuho and the council were in the conference room. Naruto burst through the doors, causing everyone to turn their heads and jump slightly. When everyone saw him, they looked at him with sad eyes, knowing why he was there. Naruto didn't pay attention to the others. He immediately looked at Ryuho. Where is she? He demanded. Ryuho looked at his apprentice for a minute before speaking. Last I got word, she was in the rain country. Yamakage has informed that she will be escorted to the earth country in two days. From that point, I have a week to decide, or they will start to send me pictures and video feeds on what they will do to her until I give in. So what are you just going to send her ass and do nothing? 
The anger was clear in his voice. He looked down for a split second before looking back at Naruto. Yes, I'm going to train their soldiers. I'm sorry, but family is more important than some technique or fighting style. Don't look at me like that, Naruto. I know the consequences and what will come of this, but my back is against the wall and I must do what I can. It's true that I'm the head of this clan, but that comes second to being a father. I will be leaving in the morning, Naruto. You are welcome to join. No, Naruto said. You don't want to help get back Lady Hayami? I thought she meant a lot to you, Shinji stated. She does. That's why I'll be going by myself. I will inform you when I have her, Naruto said walking to the exit. You're not going alone. She's my daughter, and I will protect her. Ryuho got up and walked over to Naruto. I know she's special to you, Naruto, but she's special to me too. We'll do this together, Naruto. Naruto broke down and started to cry. His sensei quickly hugged him. I promised that I would protect her. This happens. It's okay, Naruto. We'll get her back. He never finished his words. Naruto hit a pressure point on the back of his neck, causing the man to hit the ground. He turned and walked away. When he got near the exit, he stopped and looked back to everyone. When he wakes up, tell him I'm sorry. I will be back here with Hayami in a week. Naruto, don't be foolish. What do you plan to do against an army of ninja? Shinji asked. That's easy. If they get in my way, they will die. Naruto exited, leaving the council in shock. Naruto wasted no time running away from the mansion. His destination, the land of rain. I should arrive in rain country in two days. Hayami, I'm coming. Hold on, Naruto thought as he ran. Naruto arrived in the rain two days later. By keeping his ear to the ground, he got word of Hayami's location. She was at a camp a few miles away from Aimei village. Naruto wasted no time reaching the camp. He walked into a grassy field and saw a lot of tents. Naruto walked slowly into the camp when two shuriken flew at his feet, causing him to halt. You're passing through a ninja camp. Turn and head another way, or die, the ring ninja said to Naruto. I'm not a civilian. The sword on my back should indicate that. I'm just looking for... a friend. Naruto pulled out a picture that he had of Yumi. Did you by any chance see my friend here? Naruto noticed that more ninjas appeared surrounding him. One of the ninjas in the back spoke causing him to turn around. So, you have come for the little girl. She's not here. She left this location yesterday. Not that it matters. You'll never reach her because you will die here. Ninja were about to attack when a voice stopped him. Wait. The ninja who spoke landed in front of Naruto. If it isn't Naruto Uzumaki, the golden fox. How appropriate and ironic, he said, the last part indicating that he knew when Naruto had concealed inside of him. So, you're the kid who's listed in our bingo books as a B rank ninja. I don't see your traveling buddy Kaito here with you. Where is he? Naruto continues to stare at the man before him. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Aoi Rukushu, former shinobi of the leaf. I don't care where you're from, but since you do know about me, you should know what I'm capable of, Naruto told the man before him. Yes, but there are over a hundred ninjas here varying from Chunin to Jonin. Be smart, Naruto, and just leave. I will allow you to leave if you turn around. Aoi smiled at Naruto, waiting for him to just turn around and leave. You're in my way. Move or die. The choice is yours. Aoi snapped his fingers. The field was soon covered with ninjas. You left me no choice. Kill him now, and leave his body here for the crows. The ninjas rushed Naruto, performed his swamp of the underworld technique, causing the ninjas that charged Naruto to blindly to sink into the muddy swamp. Naruto's hand seals were too fast for the naked eye. When he brought his hands together, it was evident that he was going to perform a fire technique. Katon. Gukaku no Jutsu. The flames incinerated about one third of the ninjas at the camp. Naruto gripped his sword. He unsheathed the sword and ran at the ninjas with blinding speeds. They never knew what hit them. Blood was flying everywhere as he cut through ninja after ninja. 
His movements were so fluid and graceful that he made a massacre look like a thing of beauty. One ninja shot water spikes at Naruto. The spikes hit him in the back, causing him to drop to his knees. Aoi and the 20 or so ninjas that were left surrounded him. Aoi walked up to him. I have to admit, you're good for doing what you did. You reduced us to only 23 ninjas before we stopped you. Aoi pulled the sword off of his back and pointed it at Naruto's face. This sword belongs to the Leaf's second Hokage. It's the legendary chakra sword. You should feel honored to die by it since I rarely use it on opponents. But you killed close to 100 of my men. So, you will die here. Naruto laughed at the man. I don't think I'll be dying, but before I go, you should look to your left. Naruto disappeared in a cloud of smoke. He always side flipped avoiding the water dragon that engulfed 20 of his ninjas, leaving him with two. Naruto looked at Aoi. He motioned for the others to attack. They ran at Naruto. When they got close to Naruto, he then blew up in front of them, causing them to be obliterated. Aoi narrowed his eyes, knowing the real Naruto was behind him. So, you know the Shadow Clones. And the Bushin Bakula. Impressive. But, you won't win. This sword will be red with your blood. Aoi licked his lips when he finished. Naruto wasted no time attacking Aoi. Both engaged in a sword duel. Aoi swung at Naruto who dodged and blurred out of sight. Before Aoi could act, he felt a sharp pain in his side. His eyes widened. He coughed up blood. When he looked down, he knew the reason why he was coughing up blood. It was because Naruto's sword was sticking through the right side of his abdomen. Naruto pulled out his sword, causing Aoi to drop to the ground. Naruto stepped with the man and headed in the direction of the land of Earth. The field he was leaving would have made anyone lose their lunch. Arms, legs, heads, and bodies decorated the field a few feet away from the camp. The grass was now red with the blood of ninjas. Naruto continued to walk when he noticed that a teen about his age, injured to the point that he couldn't defend himself. Naruto looked at him. You will tell me what happened here. The young ninja nodded vigorously. Naruto body flicker, leaving behind smoke. Around nightfall, Naruto arrived at a stream. His body was covered with the blood of the shinobi he killed at about noon. Naruto washed himself and changed into clean clothes that he pulled out from his backpack. Naruto put the clothes on. He sat by the edge of the stream and cleansed his sword. Naruto knew that he had the advantage. Naruto had traced the ninjas from rain. His guess as to why they left behind trails was because they didn't think anyone would follow them. Naruto had decided to rest for three hours before heading out again. Naruto woke up the following morning and continued. He began to run into traps around midnight, which meant that the ninjas were probably resting. Finally, he was close. Now, he would have to cover ground. Naruto figured he would close the gap while they slept. Naruto dug in his pouch to retrieve a soldier pill. When he finished swallowing the soldier pill, he immediately headed out. Naruto arrived at another campsite around 7 in the morning and saw that they were getting ready to leave. Naruto smiled when he saw one of the ninjas carry the girl out of the tents. He found her, and that was all that mattered. Naruto positioned himself in the bushes so he could hear what was being said. We're heading to the village today. There will be no more stops. Okay men, clean the site up and let's head out. The ninjas pulled out scrolls and did a couple of hand seals causing the tents to be sucked into the scrolls. They placed the scrolls back in their pouches. The junior Naruto figured to be the leader looked at Hayami with a sick smile. Your father will have to do what we say or you will die. Are you afraid of me, child? The man asked the little girl in his arms. The girl looked at him with no fear in her eyes. No, my brother will come for me and beat you guys up. He promised me that no matter what, he would be there to help me whenever I was in danger. Watch, Big Brother Naruto will deal with you. You just wait. It angered him that this child was unafraid of him. He raised his hand and slapped her hard. She grabbed her face and started to cry. Naruto was now furious, but he didn't move because he wanted to keep the element of surprise. The rock ninja gave a grin of satisfaction. Your friend will not be saving you, girl. He lied to you. The sad reality is that you're going to die if your father doesn't comply. 
Do you know who will have the pleasure of killing you? Me. And you will die a slow and painful death. The leader of the Rock Ninja felt something behind him. Sensing danger, he threw the girl to his left while jumping to his right to avoid the sword that was aimed at his head. Naruto landed, then jumped next to Ayami. He knew that the ninja would release the girl to save his own life. Naruto smirked at the ninja. She's not going to die. Not today, anyway. The girl looked up to see the boy who promised to protect her. Her mouth opened in a wide grin of happiness. Big Brother Naruto, you came! Of course. I never go back at my word. Naruto smiled at the girl. Naruto bent down to the girl's height. I am proud of you, Ayami. You are brave. Now, let me deal with them. Naruto raised his glowing hand by her heart. He then touched the girl, causing her to pass out. He then formed hand seals, causing a barrier to form over her. Once the squared purple barrier had encased her, Naruto's smile turned into an evil glare as he turned to the leader. You all will die in my hands. Naruto unsheathed his sword. He got into a stance and continued to glare at the ninjas. All of you are going to witness why the Minashu clan is revered among the greatest when it comes to Kenjutsus. Since you would go as far as to kidnap an innocent girl to learn a few techniques, I will show you one. Get ready, because school is about to begin. Naruto's body started to glow with chakra. The chakra extended to his sword. Naruto vanished, and suddenly appeared behind a ninja he slashed. The ninja tried to evade the blade, but was cut by a trail of chakra that extended from the sword. Amasu Kenjutsu! Kanshina no Sakiza! Using this technique in conjunction with his speed made the technique difficult for the ninjas to avoid. In a matter of minutes, Naruto had cut down over 100 ninjas. The Joni leader was the last one standing when Naruto was done. The glow from the chakra that covered Naruto's sword and body faded away. Naruto looked at the leader who showed signs of fear. For slapping her, you will feel what she felt ten times over. But for threatening her life, you have forfeit your own. Naruto extended the sword in his right hand, channeling chakra through it. Amatsu Kenjutsu, Kamisori Eji. Naruto did random flashes in the air, causing visible blades of chakra to fly towards the ninja. The rock ninja didn't know what hit him. The ninja looked at Naruto before falling to pieces. It would take a long time to identify him when their bodies were discovered. Naruto dropped the barrier that Hayami was in and walked over. He then picked her up gently. He quickly left the scene, fearing that she might wake up and see all those bodies. He didn't want her to see people missing upper slash lower torsos, heads, arms, and legs. Naruto was glad that he got to her before anything bad happened. He smiled and continued walking with the sleeping girl in his arms. Naruto was now far from the campsite. The girl in his arms opened her eyes slightly to see that Naruto was carrying her. He looked down at her and smiled. She snuggled up into his chest. I knew you would protect me, big brother Naruto. I'm so glad that you... She went back to sleep before she could finish. He just continued to look at her with a smile. I'm glad that I came to. End of flashback. Wow, big brother Naruto, you took them all down with your sword? That's so cool, Konohamaru said. Sasuke studied Naruto. He wondered what type of kenjutsu that he could have learned that would allow him to eliminate over 100 ninjas. Naruto killing that many ninjas didn't impress Sasuke, because he knew that he could do the same thing if the situation called for it. He just wished he knew more about Naruto's sword style. Naruto let the details about his training with all of his sensei out, which angered Sasuke Uchiha. Naruto was now a mystery. He had no idea how strong he was, and that frustrated him. It was decided. When he got back, he was going to up his training. You have surpassed me, dope, but the gap will be closed soon. Sasuke thought to himself. Hinata spoke. Naruto, how did you get out of the land of Earth without running into rock and rain, ninja? Naruto responded to Hinata. I cut through the bird country and headed to Suna. Gar helped me to get on a ship to the tea country, where we hopped on another boat that took us to the land of sea. We arrived after about a week after I killed those ninja. Her father and her cousins will be closely watching her and the other kids so something like this won't happen again. 
However, if it does, then she knows that I will be there. A captain came into the room that the group is in. We should be arriving in the land of rice in 10 minutes. Everyone gave him a nod and he headed back to the deck. 20 minutes. Naruto and company arrived in the land of rice. They stayed at a town near the docks and decided to head out at 4 a.m. back to Konoha. It was now 11 p.m. and everyone was asleep except Naruto. He was sitting on the roof of the hotel looking at the starry sky. Good night, Ayami. At the same time, at the Minashu Mansion. Good night, big brother Naruto. A girl touched her fox necklace before rolling over on her side to get some sleep. Her brother would always be there for her. And that thought made her happy. Matsu Kenjutsu. Kan Shisha no Sekiza. Meaning, Heavenly Sword Technique, Guardian of the Gate, Amatsu Kenjutsu, Kamisori Eji, Heavenly Sword Technique, Razor Edge. On 11am the next day, a squad led by Sasuke arrived at the village gates. The team had left the land of rice at about 4 in the morning. Surprisingly, they didn't run into enemy territory. A squad walked up to the gates and was greeted by the two guards. Sasuke, I see you and your team have made it back safely. Lady Hokage requests that you and your squad see her immediately. One of the guards said, informing the Uchiha. Sasuke nodded. Then he and his squad continued, passing the guards who bowed and extended their hands, signaling them to go. Everyone continued towards the Hokage Tower. Kunohamaru looked at Hanabi, who gave him uh, a curious look. What do you want? Slightly nervous, Kunohamaru said. Well, I was just wondering, I don't know, just maybe. Just come out with it, I don't have all day, the young Yuka said in a slightly aggravated tone. I was wondering if you want to get some ramen with me after we go see Lady Hokage, Kunohamaru asked. No, Hanabi simply stated, causing Kunohamaru to slouch in defeat. Udon whispered in his best friend's ear. Why continue after the Hyuga when Mogi likes you? It's not like she's ugly. Mogi's like a sister, man. Konamaru snapped at his friend. I'm just saying that there are other fish in the sea. You should try looking at the others, Udon suggested to Konohamaru. After 10 minutes of walking, the team finally arrived at Tsunade's office. Shizune escorted them in. Lady Hokage, Sasuke and his team have returned. Yes, I can see that, Shizune. So, Sasuke, I assume the mission was successful, the Hokage asked. Yes, he reached in his scroll pouch and pulled out the scroll. Here it is, Lady Hokage. I will have a written report on your desk first thing in the morning, Sasuke stated formally. Tsunade stood up from her desk and looked at her pink-haired apprentice. Okay, Sakura, I expect you at the hospital by three. Shizune, take that scroll to intelligence and have it examined. Also, tell that lazy-ass strategist of mine that I expect a written report on advantages, disadvantages, and possible attack patterns. Tell him I want it on my desk by tomorrow. Shizune nodded and left to complete the task that Tsunade assigned her. Tsunade looked at Naruto. You come with me. The rest of you are dismissed. Everyone filed out of the office, Naruto and Tsunade being the last. Tsunade and Naruto were walking towards the council room. Naruto looked at Tsunade. Granny, what the hell is this about? Why do I need to see that council again? Naruto, they're concerned about what you did to those rain and rock ninjas last year, and they want an explanation. I told them that you don't have to give one, but after knowing your reason, I think they should hear it. So, I ordered this meeting so you can tell them, Tsunade informed the blonde. Whatever, it doesn't matter if they know or not. It seems like they're going to hate me no matter what I do. That might be true, but what you did was something that any decent person would have done, the Hokage said uh, to offer him some comfort. Tsunade and Naruto entered the chambers. Naruto and Tsunade both took their seats. Tsunade looked around the room to see that all the attention was focused on her. Everyone, I called this meeting today so you could all hear Naruto's reasons for what he did in the land of rain and the land of earth. All of you have issues with what he did and only know part of the story because Jiraiya wished not to tell you, for it was not his place to do so. I already know the reason and I feel that it was more than justifiable. 
However, this meeting is to put your minds at ease. If you have questions, ask him now because this will be the last time I call him before the council. Sumi Inazuka was the first to speak. Naruto, Jiraiya has told us that you slaughtered all of those ninjas because a girl was taken hostage. Who exactly is this girl? She's my sensei's Ryuho Minashu's daughter, Naruto answered. There are murmurs among the group. Shikaku decided to ask another question. Was it necessary to kill all those ninjas? Yes. They wouldn't have given her up if I asked, Naruto responded. Inoichi asked his question. Do you feel any remorse for killing those ninjas? Do you feel any remorse for killing all the ninjas you have killed? Naruto asked with a hint of annoyance and anger in his voice. Naruto, Inoichi has asked you a question. Answer it, Koharu demanded. I thought I told you that you do not command me. If you request something of me, then ask nicely, Naruto said, causing the old lady to narrow her eyes. Well, Naruto, do you? Inoichi continued with his question. No, the matter of the fact is that I would do it again if faced with the same situation, Naruto answered Inoichi. Hiyashi spoke next. Naruto, the blonde turned to the Hyuga. Hypothetically speaking, if it was leaf ninjas instead of rock ninjas, would you have taken the same course of action? All heads turned to face Naruto. I will tell you like I told Sasuke. Had it been leaf ninjas, there would be close to 300 leaf ninjas dead. It's as simple as that. Naruto's answer caused everyone in the room to go into shock. You can't be serious, Naruto, Sonati asked. I'm very serious. Besides, I think the third wouldn't be mad either. He would never use children as leverage in hopes to better his troops. If Konoha did that, then they would be disrespecting everything that he stood for. You all can get mad, but I stand by what I said. This is not an issue because the Leaf would never do something like that. I mean, if you guys did, then you would be showing little faith in your clans. Especially the Hyuga who is said to be the strongest in Konoha. Am I right, Lord Hiyashi? Naruto said in the last part mockingly. Do any of you have any more questions? Tsunade asked the council. Shibi, who was almost quiet in every meeting, spoke. Naruto, I think that everyone here would like to know whether you remain loyal to Konoha. Only until this war is over. After that, I'm returning to my life with my fiancé in the Land of Sun. I'm going to live out my days enjoying my life, Naruto answered Shino's dad. I think that's all for the questions. Naruto, you, and Hinata will be teamed up to do missions. You two will join others on missions, but for the most part, she will be in your team, Tsunade stated, informing Naruto of the decision forced on her by the council yesterday. Naruto looked at the council to see only a few of them smirking. Mainly Koharu Utante, Hiyashi Hyuga, Siki Huwaido, Koi Karai, Waga Kataki, and Hamura Mitokado. Naruto looked back at Tsunade and narrowed his eyes. He knew exactly what they were trying to do. I get it. You want me to take on the suicide missions and hope that you can get rid of me. And you put Hinata on my team because Broom in the ass over here feels she's unworthy to be in the main family. Two birds with one stone, eh? Naruto finished off glaring at the Hyuga. We thought it would be in your best interest to have a Hyuga. Hinata can make a good scout and can alert you of danger. There would be a lot of situations where her Byakugan could be useful, Hiyashi said, uh, trying not to seem suspicious. Naruto stood up and slammed his hand against the table. Then why not Neji? He has the seal, and if he dies, the Byakugan will be sealed forever. After finishing his statement, his eyes widened with realization. He now knew the reason, and he illustrated to Hiyashi that he didn't like it one bit. You are going to put the cage seal on Hinata, aren't you? Yashi gave the boy a slight smirk. She's weak and doesn't deserve to be in the main house. Naruto looked down at the table. His fist was clenched and he was shaking his head. How could you? How could you do that to your own daughter, you bastard? Naruto went to punch Yashi but was restrained by Jiraiya who appeared out of nowhere. Let me go so I can kick his pompous ass and we'll see if he deserves to be a Hyuga. Let go, Purvy Sage. Naruto is struggling as Jiraiya had him in a full Nelson. Naruto, this is not the forum for this type of behavior. 
Just calm down. Calm down. Naruto heeded his words and did just that. Naruto dropped back in a seat. Tsunade, who was now massaging the area above her eyebrows, spoke. Jiraiya, I thought I told you that you can't just barge in on council meetings. If I wasn't here, Hiyashi would be heading to the hospital. Anyway, I just wanted to see what was going on. Don't mind me, Jiraiya said. Naruto stood up. I'm done. I'm going back to the hotel. I didn't end this meeting yet, Naruto, Sonade informed the blonde. That's the end for me, Naruto said as he burst open the doors. Sonade just sighed. She was stressed, and it seemed like this day was only going to get longer. This meeting is over. You are all dismissed. Everyone got up and filed out of the room. Jiraiya looked at Sonade, who returned the look. He smiled at her. Sake? I thought you would never ask, she replied with a smile of her own. Naruto was walking down the streets. It was now noon, and he was hungry. He figured he'd swing to pick Yumi up and take her out for lunch. Naruto was walking along when he saw Ino and Yumi walking together. Yumi spotted him instantly. She ran up to him and gave him a hug. Naruto, I really missed you. I was only gone for about three days. It wasn't long. Anyway, where are you heading? Naruto asked. Ino finally caught up to Yumi, who took off, leaving her behind. So, we're going to grab a bite to eat at the barbecue shack. Care to join us, Naruto? I know Lee, Neji, Shikamaru, and Shoji would be pleased to see you. Naruto thought it over for a bit, then shrugged his shoulders. Eh, alright, I'll go with you guys. It gives me a chance to spend more time with Yumi and meet up with the guys. Lead the way, Ino. Ino led the way. Naruto and Yumi were behind her, holding hands and talking about stuff that Ino had no clue about. It was not like it mattered, she didn't really care anyway. The group finally arrived at the place. They were greeted by Kuranai, Asuma, Lee, Ebisu, Genma, Shizune, Yugao, Shikamaru, Choji, Neji, and Anko. Anko smirked at the sight of Naruto. So, the golden fox graces us with his presence. To what do we owe the pleasure? Naruto returned the smirk. Don't worry, Konoha is paying me 90 million Ryu for it. I guess you're right. Please sit. Anko moved over to let Naruto take a seat next to her. Naruto sat down while Yumi and Ino sat on the opposite side of the table across from him. It's great to see you, Naruto. How was your mission? Lee asked. Too easy to be an S rank if you ask me, Naruto responded. It seemed like a troublesome mission if you ask me, but you guys are safe so I guess it's okay, Shikamaru said lazily. So Naruto, how did Hinata do on the mission? Kanai asked. She did okay, I guess. She really didn't have to do much fighting. Sasuke and I pretty much handled the guards. She did help us to get past the border by using her Byakugan efficiently, Naruto stated. The waiter came by and asked everyone for their order. When he saw Naruto, he narrowed his eyes but took his order. The waiter walked away with the intention of spitting in Naruto's food, but Naruto grabbed his hand before he could get away, sensing what he was thinking. If you spit my plate, I will personally mail your body to your wife and kids. Are we clear? The waiter shook his head and hurried off. Everyone was looking at Naruto for what he just did. Neji gave Naruto a curious look. Naruto, what was that all about? Nothing, he was going to spit my plate, so I had to make sure that he didn't. Fear does a lot to people, Naruto said with a smile. Naruto, are you sure that was wise? Now, like the rest of the village, he has what he believes is a legitimate reason to hate you, Shikamaru stated. Naruto looked at Shikamaru, wondering if he knew about the fox. He decided to confirm his suspicions. No matter what I do, Shikamaru, I will always be seen as a monster. Well, I don't see you as that. In fact, I should be kissing your ass, Shikamaru stated. Naruto smiled at the pineapple hair Jonin. Shikamaru knew, and he didn't hate him for it. Everyone in Naruto's age group was confused by the conversation in between the two. Ino wanted to know what they were talking about. Naruto, what do you mean that they will always see you as a monster? Ino, answer me this. When you were little, did your parents tell you not to associate with me? Naruto asked. Ino thought about this for a moment and remembered a time when she was young. Her mother told her never to associate with him because nothing good would come from it. Yes, but why would my mother say that? Ask Granny or your parents. Anyway, can we change the subject? Naruto asked. Kern and I wondered how Naruto killed all of those ninjas. It seemed impossible, yet he did it. 
Naruto, how did you take out all those ninjas? Ebisu, who didn't really know what happened, was now listening carefully. Naruto spoke. I took them out rather easily. you think that 120 rain ninjas would give me a hard time. Even the one who had the chakra sword. But it was kind of disappointing, really. You took out 120 ninjas? Ebisu asked. No, I took out approximately 270 ninjas, Naruto answered. Why'd you do it, Naruto? And I asked. Look, I just told this story to my team yesterday. I'm not doing it again. If you want to know, I ask Hinata, Sasuke, Sakura, Udon, Hanabi, or Konohamaru. You can even ask Jiraiya, Sanade, or Yumi here, but I'm done telling the story, Naruto stated. The food arrived, and everyone started eating. A Hyuga branch family member came to the table and greeted Neji. Neji, you are requested at the Hyuga compound. What for? Neji asked. Someone from the main house will become a branch member today. This person is having the seal placed on them as we speak. The branch house is having a formal dinner to welcome this person, the Hyuga said. Who is it? Neji said, eh, grabbing the man. I don't know. The main house didn't say. We should get going, Neji. We have a lot to prepare for, the Hyuga mentioned for Neji to follow. Excuse me, everyone. I have business to take care of. Enjoy your meals, and Naruto? I expect a rematch. He said the last part smiling at the blonde. Yeah, you got it, Naruto said, eh, returning the smile. Neji walked off, and everyone at the table was curious about the whole Hyuga ordeal. Genma spoke for the first time. I wonder who it is from the main house. I don't know, but I don't think it's anyone important, Shizune responded. Everyone continued to talk while Naruto stood quiet, thinking. Yumi looked at Naruto and noticed the look on his face and wondered why he seemed so upset. Naruto, what's the matter? Are you feeling okay? Naruto looked up to Yumi. Huh? Yeah, I'm fine. Well, you don't look fine, Naruto. You haven't even told us who you think is the Hyuga receiving the cage seal, Ino stated. I already know who is receiving the seal, Naruto stood up. He looked at Yumi. Yumi, let's go. I would like to spend some time with you alone. Yumi stood up. She and Naruto proceeded to walk out of the restaurant. Naruto, who is it then? Choji's question stopped Naruto in his tracks. Naruto turned around and looked at Kurenai. Kurenai, I think Hinata is going to need you. Everyone's eyes went wide. Kurenai didn't want to believe it, but she knew that he was right. She couldn't believe that Hinata would have the seal on her head. But it was official. Her father had outright disowned her. Three hours later, at the Hyuga compound. Hinata was looking at the seal on her head in a mirror. It wasn't the seal that hurt. It was the fact that her father had disowned her. When she thought of this, a tear came to her eye. Hinata, who was in a white kimono, was preparing herself to go to the dinner and her to becoming a branch member. Her father wouldn't be there. Just her aunt and Neji. She was in her room, the room that was hers for 18 years. This would no longer be her room, because she was now going to the branch house now. Hinata heard a knock at the door and wiped her eyes to hide the fact that she was crying. Come in. The door opened to reveal her father and a couple of branch members. Her father motioned for them to collect her stuff and take it to the branch house. He looked at her and spoke. Your job will be to serve the Hyuga as a protector of the Byakugan. If you were stronger than this, wouldn't have happened. But it seems that you are not. I expect you to be out of the main house in an hour. Her father turned around and walked out of the room. The branch members collected her stuff and took it with them. Hinata broke down crying once everyone was out of her room. Hinabi, who was by the door, couldn't help but feel bad for her sister. Even though she and Hinata had problems, she would never wish the curse seal on her. Hinabi ran off to get away. She couldn't understand why her father didn't love Hinata the way he loved her. It wasn't right, and the more she thought about the way her father, herself, and the rest of the main house treated her, it made her mad. Mad at them for treating her like trash, and mad at herself for treating Hinata so badly. Hinabi needed to get out of the compound and get away. She didn't know where she was going as long as it was far away from her home, in a nearby park. Naruto and Yumi were sitting on the bench enjoying the beautiful sunny day in the village. Naruto and Yumi watched as kids were playing kickball in the field and parents watching over their kids. 
Naruto was glad to be spending time with Yumi, but he couldn't help but think of Hinata's situation. He wished there was something he could do, but this was out of his control. He just hoped that she was alright. Naruto, is it something that matter? You've been staring into space for a while now. I was just wondering about Hinata. Her family is placing that seal on her. I hope she's okay. She's too nice to have to deal with that, Naruto told Yumi. Oh, that is sad indeed, but I'm sure she'll be okay, Yumi said to reassure Naruto. I guess you're right. Anyway, what do you want to do? Naruto asked. I don't know, maybe we can go see a movie or something, Yumi suggested. Sounds like a plan. Let's go, Naruto said. The two walked off and headed to the theater. Naruto grabbed Yumi's hand. He looked at her and smiled. He tried to think about a way to help Hinata, but what could he do? He was at a loss and had no idea what to do. In the Cloud Village. The Raikage sat in his chair, pondering the news he had just received. From the story of the two ninjas that survived, it seemed that Sasuke Uchiha and Naruto Uzumaki were the ones that led the assault on the base. He had no choice but to do what he was about to do. It made him mad, but at the same time, it made him happy. He looked at one of his jonins. Have a carrier hawk deliver a message to the rain in rock villages. Tell them to cease all attacks for now. Send a letter to the mist, informing the Mizukage that I wish to hold a summit there, since they're a neutral country. Last but not least, send a letter to the leaf and sand, informing them of my intentions. Send our fastest hawk to the mist. Lord Raikage, do you think this is wise? One of the Junins asked. Yes, it vexes me that they hit us and left us without a scratch. But this is a blessing in disguise, the Raikage told his Jonin. How so, sir? the Jonin asked. This is the perfect time to get the mist to ally with us. Orochimaru showed us the way, and we shall do the same. If everything goes according to plan, the cloud along with the rock, mist, and rain will crush the leaf. Sir, what... Has he shown us? The Jonin asked. With or without the mist, I can get Tsunade to show good faith and hold the Junin exams. We will do what Orochimaru did and attack then. Although he had a good idea, the fool didn't have the tactical knowledge or know-how. Maybe he did, but he didn't have three villages attacking one. How will we get the mist to join us? The Jonin asked. A golden fox has solved that problem for us. The Mizukage wants Kaito Saichi dead. He fears that Kaito will kill him and take over his reign. If we can promise him that killing Naruto would draw him out, then he would gladly accept, the Raikage stated. Sir, he is extremely good, maybe even better than the Sanin. How do you suppose we are going to kill him? asked the Jonin. I don't expect us to. I just want to get the mist to fight alongside us. Besides, if it comes down to it, I'll kill him myself, need be. The kid is strong, but he isn't on my level. The Raikage sat down back in his chair. He opened his drawer and pulled out a leaf headband that he had in his possession. There is only one person that is on my level. I was hoping that this war would draw him out, but it is not. Once he is dead, I won't have anything to worry about. Our village will rule among all the villages. Maybe I should bring this headman with me. That would stir up some emotions, surely, the Raikage said with a smirk. Leave me and send in Cohen Nenshu. The guard bowed and obeyed the Raikage. Cohen, a young man with blue hair and yellow eyes, entered into the room. The Raikage motioned for him to take a seat. Cohen, you are my best Jonin, and possibly my successor. It seems that I have a mission for you, but this mission will not start until I say so. Your mission will be to kill Sasuke Uchiha and Naruto Uzumaki. Hmm, the last of the Uchiha clan and the Golden Fox himself. I will enjoy this greatly, Lord Raikage. But I ask, sir, why me? Cohen asked. I chose you because uh, you have the power necessary to deal with them. 
I'm sure that Gopi sealed inside of you will give you the power necessary to deal with them. You are this village's trump card. When the time comes, you will show them the power of the Gopi no Hogo, Rakage said with a sinister smile. They won't stand a chance, sir. The power of the demon will allow me to do what is necessary. They will fall at my feet, Cohen said, very sure of himself. I don't doubt you, Cohen. I would like you to accompany me to the land of water when I go. I'm sure you'll see those two there. Tsunade will surely have them both as her bodyguards, along with the infamous copy ninja Kakashi. Here is the file that I have on Naruto, Sasuke, and Kakashi. It's old, gathered from our intelligence during the tuning exam six years ago. Rikage hands Conan the file. Why give me an old file, and what is the purpose of it? Conan wondered. Well, we heard that Kakashi Hatage had a team in the exams that year. Open it, and tell me what you see. Rikage motioned for him to open the file. Cohen opened the file and looked at it intensely. I see, Kakashi Hatage was their joining instructor, along with some pink-haired girl. I bet she's dead now. Actually, she's alive. In fact, she's Tsunade's apprentice. All of them had trained with Asanin. Naruto had trained with Jiraiya, and Sasuke trained with Orochimaru. My girl probably won't accompany them to the meeting, but from what we hear, She's just as good as Tsunade when it comes to being a medical ninja. She can hold her own in a fight, but clearly Naruto and Sasuke are stronger, Raikage told Cohen. Well, Lord Raikage, thanks for showing me this. If you didn't wish, I wouldn't have taken them serious. This should prove interesting. Indeed it should, indeed it should, Raikage said with an evil smirk. Back in the Leaf Village. It was now night in the village. Naruto and Yumi decided to get ramen before going back to the hotel. Naruto was now on his sixth bowl and Yumi felt embarrassed by her pig of a fiance. Naruto, how is it that you're still hungry? You're already on your sixth bowl. I think you should stop before you clean them out of their weekly stock, Yumi suggested. What can I say? Ichiraku ramen is the best, isn't that right, Ayame? Naruto asked the lady behind the stand. Yes, I suppose that is. Do you want another bowl, Naruto? Ayame asked her favorite long-lost customer. Nah, I think this will do. Thanks for offering. By the way, where's the old man? Naruto asked. He went on vacation for a week while I run the shop. He works so hard, he really deserves it, Ayame told Naruto. Well, I think we should be heading back to the hotel. Thanks for the ramen, it was delicious, Naruto said. Yes, Ayame, the ramen was excellent, and I hope to see you again. Later, Ayame, Yumi waved to the girl as her and Naruto headed back to the hotel they were to stay at. When Naruto and Yumi were walking, two chunin level ninjas appeared in front of them. A young teen girl with long flowing orange hair landed in front of Naruto, along with a girl with long and tangled brown hair. The girl stood up from their crouching positions. Big Brother Naruto, it's good to see you. All is well, I hope, the girl said, smiling at Naruto. Ogi, is that you? Wow, you grew up to be a beautiful Konoichi, I see. Who's your friend? Naruto asked. The girl extended her hand for Naruto to shake. My name is Matsuri, and it's nice to meet you, Naruto. Likewise, but may I ask why you two are here? Naruto asked. Well, Shinade requests to see you. She told us to escort you to the Hokage Tower, Mogi stated. Yumi slightly nudged Naruto. Oh, where are my manners? Mogi and Matsuri? I would like you to meet Yumi, my fiance. It's nice to meet you girls. Naruto, you go ahead. I'll go to the hotel and wait for you to finish, Yumi said. Okay, later, sweetie. Naruto kissed her, then walked off with Mogi and Matsuri. You guys have any idea what she wants? Naruto asked. I'm not sure, but it seems like all of the Junins are there. We'll see when we get there, Matsuri stated. So, Big Brother Naruto, did anything happen between Konohamaru and the Ice Queen? Mogi asked. Does Mogi have a crush on Konohamaru? Naruto said with a smirk. No, that's not it at all. I'm just curious, that's all. She put up her hands in defense. She's lying, she has a major crush on Konohamaru, Matsuri informed the blonde. 
Well, at least I'm not a member of the Sasuke Uchiha fan club, Loki shot back. So what if I like Sasuke? So hot and dreamy and mysterious, Monster said with hearts in her eyes. Ah, oh, God, please tell me you're joking, Naruto said to the girl. Joking about loving Sasuke? Nope, he is the greatest. Don't tell him you're jealous of Sasuke, Naruto, Matri said. Nope, not at all. It's just funny to see that his fan club stretches down the end of the youth. So besides your obvious crush on my former teammates, who else do you like? Naruto asked. Well, I do like Udon. Wait a minute, you were on Sasuke's team as a Genin, Matri stated. Yes, and no, I will not put in a good word for you. The fact of the matter is that we're not on good terms, and never really had been. Besides, my other former teammate has a major crush on him as well, Naruto informed the girl. She then slumped her shoulders in defeat. I wonder who his other teammate was, Matri thought. Sakura was Naruto's other teammate. I told you to go for Udon instead of Sasuke, Mogi said to her friend. I guess you're right. Besides, I'm only 15. Sasuke, clearly, would want someone his age or older. Well, it doesn't hurt to admire his beauty, Matri said with a smile. Mogi giggled at her friend's comment. I suppose not. Anyway, we're here. Naruto and the two girls entered the meeting room. In the meeting room, there are three chairs in the front, while there are chairs and desks in the room for the Jonins and Chunis to sit. Naruto saw Kiba and Shino next to Kurenai. He looked to his left and saw Shikamaru resting his head on the desk. He saw Inu and Sagara talking to Tenten and Lee, while Guy was talking to Genma and Asuma. Naruto saw Sasuke leaning against a wall in the corner of the room, waiting for what looked to be a meeting to begin. The rest of the Jonins were chatting amongst each other. Kiba turned to notice Naruto observing his surroundings. Hey Naruto, over here man! Naruto walked over to Kiba. Hey Kiba, she know, and Kurenai. Everyone greeted Naruto. Naruto looked at Kurenai. Did you get any word on Hinata? Neji told us earlier that the seal was already placed in her. Right now, she's at a welcome dinner with the Branch family, Kurenai said sadly. That bastard Hiyashi, I should kick his ass to kingdom come, Kiba said with anger and energy. Harming him won't help Hinata. The best that we can do is be there for her in her time of need, Shino said. Hinabi saw Hinata's teammates and walked up to them. Kiba, Shino, Kurenai, Naruto, she greeted them. What do you want, Kiba said with anger in his voice. I know you're probably mad at me, but I didn't know until after it happened. I would never wish to seal on anybody. The fact of the matter is, there's nothing I can do. And Abby said with a defeated expression. If you really want to do something, then become the head of the Hyuga and ban the curse seal, Naruto suggested. I won't go against the method that has ensured our survival for generations, and Abby said. Then you don't deserve to be a leader. A leader does what is right not what is right for him. He pushed the wants and needs of his people before him, and that is what a leader is. You Hugas are so worried about someone attaining the secrets of the Byakugan that it's tearing your family apart, Naruto said to the girl. She was about to respond, but Tsunade walked in with Koharu and Hamura. She took the seat in the middle, while Koharu took the seat on her left, and Hamura the seat on her right. She motioned for all the Jonins to sit down. A couple of hours ago, I received a letter that the Cloud, Rock, and Rain Villages will cease the attacks for now. Another message was sent to me two hours after that, informing me that a summit is to be held in the Mist Village in three days. And I'll be going to this meeting, but I want you all to stand high alert while I'm away from this village. One of the Jonins raised his hand. Lady Tsunade, who will be accompanying you on your trip? Don't worry. I have selected five of the best ninjas to accompany me, Tsunade answered the man. Genma raised his hand next. If you don't mind me asking, Lady Hokage, who are they? Kakashi Hatake, Sasuke Uchiha, Neji Hyuga, Sakura Haruno, and Naruto Uzumaki, Tsunade informed everyone. One of the older ninjas who was around when the Kyuubi attacked and then like Naruto spoke. Lady Hokage, shouldn't you select someone other than Uzumaki? I mean... He isn't even a ninja of this village, for all we know he could be. Before the ninja could finish, Naruto was on the guy's desk with a kunai at his throat. Everyone, uh, with the exception of a few Jonins and Tsunade, was shocked by his speed. Sasuke smirked. 
you should be more worried about your skills than about whether or not I'm worthy to play bodyguard to the old hag. Also, if you have issues with me, take them up with me. Don't hide behind your words, you pathetic excuse for a ninja, Naruto said to the guy who was shaking. Naruto, please take your seat. This isn't the time or the form for this. As for you, Gendo Sawado, the people I selected are highly capable. I'm sure you can see that, Sonata said to the Jonin. Naruto moved back to his seat across the room as Sonata continued to speak. Like I was saying, those people I named will be accompanying me. I expect the rest of you to be on alert and protect this village. While I'm gone, Shizune will be acting as Hokage. Are there any questions? Naruto raised his hand. Sonata motioned for him to speak. Granny, why did you select the other people? I know why you selected me, but why the others? Well, Naruto, it's to show that I'm not to be trifled with. You, Sasuke, Kakashi, Sakura, and Neji are probably the strongest ninjas in the village next to myself. Also, Sasuke being an Uchiha, Neji being a Hyuga, Kakashi's reputations and your action in the rain and rock will make them think twice about trying anything funny, Shinade informed Naruto. You mentioned the reason for everyone going but Sakura. Is she just going for show or what? Naruto asked. Sakura stood up and turned to face Naruto's direction. I think you're seriously interesting my skills, Naruto, Sakura said. I'm not underestimating you. I'm sure you improved as much as you could. What I wonder is if it's good enough, Naruto said with a smirk. Sakura walked up to Naruto, who stood up when she got near. Sakura smiled at him and punched with all her might, sending him flying through a wall. Still think I'm not good enough, Naruto? No, you're not good enough. Everyone looked up to see Naruto standing on the ceiling. You had the strength, I give you that. But what good is power if you can't hit your opponent or see them in this case, Naruto stated. Sakura looked up with anger in her eyes. When did you switch? He switched with the desk in the far corner when you cocked back your punch, Sasuke informed her. I see we're the observant one. Hey, Sasuke, Naruto said to the Uchiha. Naruto, if you don't get back in your seats, I guarantee that my punch will connect. And Sakura, you owe me a wall. They went back to their seats. Tsunade continued. Like I was saying, Sakura is going for her skills as well. Although she may not be as skilled as you, she is very skilled. Udon raised his hands next. I noticed that you said Gukashi and Neji are going too. Why aren't they here at this meeting? Kakashi is on a mission, and Neji is tending to family business. Kakashi will be informed upon his return. As for Neji, he will be informed later on tonight. Are there any other questions on this matter? Sonati asked. What do you think made them cease all attacks? Another Jenin asked. Well, I think it has something to do with the mission that was led by Sasuke Uchiha. He and his team obtained blueprints for a ninja base in the Land of Lightning. This base had battle strategies, and I think the Raikage feared that if we obtained their plans, then we could swing the war in our favor. He could use this meeting to give him time to think up of a new strategy, Sonata informed the Jonin. So in other words, we got the king in check, and they're looking for a move on the board to get them out of check, Shikamaru asked. Great analogy, Shikamaru, and yes, we do have them in check, so to speak. But anything can happen. Anyway, this meeting is now adjourned. All missions are suspended until after I return from the Land of Water. Sonata got up and left, followed by Homura and Koharu. Everyone left. Naruto headed back to the hotel. He entered his room to hear the shower running. Naruto took off his shirt and laid on the bed. He stared at the ceiling for 10 minutes. Yumi snapped him out of his daze. Naruto, Earth to Naruto. Hey, sweetie, he smelled great. Is that apple scent? Naruto asked while Yumi lay next to him. Actually, it is. I thought you would like it. She said eh, while circling her finger on his chest. Naruto got up. I'm going to take a shower. You want to join? I mean, I could always use someone to wash my back. Yumi grabbed his hand while giving him a seductive look. She led him to the shower. Naruto followed and closed the shower behind him. Midnight, Yuga House. Hinata lay in the bed thinking about the events of her day. Neji, his mother, and the rest of the branch members welcomed her with open arms. The dinner in her honor 
of becoming a branch member was nice, but she still felt out of place. She wished she was stronger. She hated the seal and wished she could free everyone from it. Hinata decided not to think about it anymore. She closed her eyes and decided to go to sleep. Suddenly, her eyes shot open. Hinata saw a person in all black. The said person had a tissue filled with chloroform in his hand. The tissue was placed over her mouth and nose. The darkness had consumed her. 7 a.m. in Konoha. Naruto laid in the bed with Yumi snuggled up to his chest. He jolted up when he heard banging on his door. What the? Naruto sat up. Yumi sat up and slowly started rubbing her eyes. Uh, who the hell could that be banging on the door this early in the morning? Yumi asked out loud. Naruto got up and placed a towel around his waist. He opened the door to see Sakura and Kiba standing at the door. Sakura and Kiba saw Naruto with a towel around his waist. Sakura blushed, putting two and two together. Kiba just gave him a knowing smirk. Naruto, I can see that you're busy, or at least were busy, but the Hokage requests your presence at the tower, Kiba said. What is this about? Naruto asked. Last night, Hinata was kidnapped, Sakura said. Naruto closed his eyes for a second. Give me a minute to get dressed, and I'll be out. Naruto quickly threw on a pair of sweats and an orange short sleeve shirt. He quickly left the room. Him, Sakura, and Kiba all took off immediately. They arrived at the Hokage's office. Everyone from the Rookie 9 and Guy's team were there. Tsunade looked at the new arrivals. Now that everyone is here, I will speak. Last night, Hinata Hyuga was kidnapped. I chose you guys because all of you were the closest to her. Did the kidnapper leave any clues? And any demands, Naruto asked. All that was found at the scene was a letter saying that the kidnapper wants 200,000 Ryu. The kidnapper demanded that we meet him at the border of wind and river country. It is at least a day's travel, so you guys will leave now. I want Hinata brought back, whether she's dead or alive. I know you guys don't want to think about it, but we have to expect the worst. Also, Gara and his siblings will meet up with you guys at the border. You will escort them back as well. Gara will be accompanying me on my trip to Mist. Anyway, your mission starts now. Leave. Everyone left except Naruto. Naruto, why are you still here? Tsunade asked. Do you think she's alright? Naruto asked. I don't know, Tsunade replied. Naruto left the office immediately in the same fashion as everyone else. Naruto caught up with everyone. Kiba and Neji were in the lead, going faster than everyone else. Shikamaru sighed. Kiba, Neji, slow down. You guys are going too fast. Hinata is in danger and you're telling me to slow down? Piss off, lazy ass. Kiba replied. Do you think Hinata is okay? Ino asked. Don't worry, Ino. I'm sure Hinata is perfectly fine. We tried to reassure Ino. I hope that she's okay, Sakura said. Sasuke looked behind him and smirked. So, you finally decided to join us. Hey, dope. You're still calling me a dope even after I kicked your ass? Naruto said. Yep, because the next time, the outcome will be different. I just upped my training. Next time we fight, you're going to lose, Sasuke stated. Whatever you say, Sasuke, the fact of the matter is that you lost. Anyway, we need to be looking for Hinata, not fighting. Not like you're much of a challenge anyway, sauce gay. Choji let out a laugh. Ino laughed slightly, and Shikamaru smirked. Kiba, who was in the front, couldn't help but laugh loud and hard. Sasuke narrowed his eyes at the blonde behind him. I can assure you that I'm not gay. Don't confuse me with yourself, idiot. You have fan clubs of females, and yet you don't date any of them, or anyone for that matter. It looks like a duck, walks like a duck, talks like a duck. It smells like a duck. Then, it's a duck, Naruto said. Sasuke isn't gay, Sakura shouted. I didn't know that, Sakura. Hmm? Naruto asked. Well, I... Sakura tried to say something. You guys are so busted, Naruto said. What, you didn't think that I knew about you two? Sasuke, you are so obvious by dissing yourself from Sakura. While we were on the mission, and Sakura, you just confirmed it by coming to his defense. Don't worry, nobody here will tell, right guys? Naruto asked. It's too troublesome, and besides, I already know, Shikamaru said. I did too, Sakura. You shouldn't put an Uchiha t-shirt in your laundry, Ino stated. 
sneaking into the Uchiha compound at night was a dead giveaway, Neji stated. How did you know about Sakura caught herself before she finished? Sasuke was mad and went ahead of Kiba. Naruto smiled and spoke in a baby voice. I guess Sasuke was a little mad that his real secret was exposed. I guess so, but it's too troublesome to stress over it, Shikamaru stated. You say that to everything, you lazy bum. I wonder if I told Tamari that you said it was too troublesome to take her out while she was in the village. What would she do to you? You know, said to a friend. You know, you wouldn't do that, would you? Shikamaru said with a slightly nervous voice. No, I just wanted to see your reaction, you know, said and smiled. You know, it's so troublesome. I swear that you can be such an annoying bitch at times, Shikamaru thought. Naruto looked at Shino, who was quiet during their 20 minutes of travel. Shino, are you okay? Naruto, I'm fine. We shouldn't panic because Hinata is fine, I'm sure. But she's stronger than she and everyone else thinks. If she had confidence, then she would be really strong. I hope she finds her inner strength. Naruto looked at Shino for a minute, then smiled. He really cares for her, like a big brother. He's right though, Hinata is strong. I hope that she sees that. The group continued to their destination. They were a day away from knowing the fate of their comrade. Somewhere unknown. She okay? Yes, but she's been out for a while. That's good to know. She's, uh, Hinata Hugo of the branch house? Yes, she is. What are you asking me to do is going to cost you. I know. Can you do it? Of course I can. I'm the best. Hinata was a little disoriented, but she heard a voice that sounded like a woman and a man. She grabbed her head. My head, it hurts. It would seem that her guest is up, the lady said. Hinata couldn't make out who she was. Her eyes still trying to focus. Yes, it seems so. How do you feel, the man asked Hinata. I'm... Hinata tried to answer, but was too focused on getting her eyes adjusted. Don't worry about it. If I wanted you dead, then you'd be dead, the man said. What is wrong with my eyes? Why is everything blurry? Hinata asked. I injected you with a sleep drug when you got here around 3 this morning. Anyway, here's some water. Drink up. The lady handed her the drink. Hinata's vision started to clear. She now saw that a beautiful lady stood before her. What shocked her even more was that the person that was standing in front of her. She couldn't believe her eyes. Why did he kidnap her? What did he have to gain from it? Hinata's eyes were wide in shock when she said in a low tone, eh, Naruto? Hinata was shocked to see Naruto standing over her. He extended his hand and gave her a smile of assurance. From that point, she knew that he wouldn't harm her. She took his hand and used it as support. Hinata stood, but wobbled a little before Naruto grabbed. Are you okay? Naruto asked with concern. I'm fine, Naruto. Just a little weak, that's all. By the way, where am I? Hinata asked out of curiosity. You're at my house, Hinata. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Naya Hawaito. Naya extended her hand for Hinata to shake. Hinata took the lady's hand and shook it. Nice to meet you, Naya. I remember hearing your name from a guy. He said that you were known as the Steel Mistress. If I'm here, then that means... Hinata was caught off by Naruto. I asked Naya to remove the seal from your head, Naruto answered. Hinata looked at Naruto with sad eyes. Naruto, thanks, but... I can't let this be done. It would be going against my family. Besides, it's better for everyone this way. Naruto looked at Hinata and shook his head. Here I thought you were smart, but you're dumber and weaker than I thought. Hinata's eyes went wide. Naruto's words had shocked and hurt her at the same time. The one person she cared for now saw her as everyone else did. She put her head down. Mm. I'm sorry, Naruto. Naruto grabbed her and threw her against the wall. This frightened Hinata. He looked deep into her eyes. Tell me, Hinata. 
Is this what you want? Do you really think that it's better that your father disowned you? Do you think that it's for the better that you are now a slave in your own home? Do you think it's better to have a division in your family? Huh? Naruto punched the wall next to Hinata's head. Tell me, goddammit! Naruto screamed. Tears started to fall out of Hinata's eyes. She was scared and confused by Naruto's actions. Naruto saw her fear and tears. He immediately let her go, causing her to fall to the floor. He looked away from her, then, in a low tone, he said, Hinata, you're too nice of a person. If I learned anything, is that when you are too nice to people, they will walk all over you. I know you're not happy, and I know you don't think having the seal is for the best. So tell me, Hinata, what do you want? Naruto asked. Hinata thought about what he said for a minute. She stood up and wiped her tears. I want to be strong. Strong like you, Naruto. Naruto chuckled at that. You think I'm strong? Yeah, I can beat a few people, and I can. Hinata quickly cut him off. That's not what I meant. I mean... You never gave up even when people would put you down. You stand up for what you believe in and you are willing to fight for it. The strength that you have isn't physical, it's more in your attitude. To be more precise, it is your confidence and utter belief in yourself that makes you strong. So when I say I want to be strong like you, that's what I meant. Naruto looked at Hinata with a serious expression. Then why not just stand up for what you believe in? Not that things aren't going to change if all you do is wish them to. You want to make a change, you gotta do it yourself. Hinata, you're stronger than you think. I think what's holding you back is that you're trying to live up to everyone's expectations but your own. Hinata thought about what Naruto was saying. She hated her lack of confidence, but she also hated the division and the Hyuka clan. She always wanted to change the Hyuka clan and become Naruto's girlfriend. Seeing that the latter was out of the option, she decided then and there to focus on the former. Hinata realized what Naruto did for her. He wasn't trying to be mean. He wasn't trying to insult her. No, he was trying to make her see that crying all day about her family issues wasn't going to change it. Action would. Hinata hugged Naruto, who was a bit shocked by the embrace. Thank you, Naruto. I think that removing the seal will be the first step to change. I don't know how I'm going to change my family, but this is a start. Hinata, I told Neji that if I became Hokage, I would change the Hyuga. That isn't going to happen, but by helping you, I would be helping just a little to make that change. Hinata, if the Hyuga clan is to change, then it'll be on you to do so. Naruto told Hinata. I know, Hinata responded. Well, if you guys are done with all that touchy crap about making changes, can we get on with removing the seal? This isn't an easy process by no means, you know, Naya said, tapping her foot impatiently. Naya, will it be painful, and how long will it take? Well, I'm not going to lie, it might hurt. I don't know, because you're the first that I've removed the seal from. It isn't easy to do, but it is removable. Also, the process will take anywhere from 3 to 7 hours. Follow me, Hinata. I will take you to one of my sealing rooms. Naya motioned Hinata to follow. Hinata did, but looked back when Naruto didn't follow. Naruto, aren't you coming? No, Hinata. I will wait out here until the process is done. I got word from my clone via radio. After my clone left Hinata's office, I was informed that she put together a team consisting of everyone from our graduating class and Neji's squad to go look for you. When you're done having the seals removed, we're going to meet them at the border. I will inform them of my actions and we will devise a plan from there. I'm sure they will go along, Kiba, Shino, and Neji especially. Naruto flashed Hinata a reassuring smile. Hinata nodded in understanding and followed Naya, who told her to hurry. Naya and Hinata entered her seal room. On the floor was a seal that Hinata never seen before. The room was slightly illuminated. It reminded her of being in a cave with a torch. Naya went to the far end of the room and came back to where Hinata was standing. She had what looked like blood in a valve. 
some other containers with various colors of dye, and a syringe. Okay, Hinata, lay down in the middle of that seal. Hinata did as she said. Naya placed the items on the floor outside of the seal. She grabbed the blood and syringe. She placed the blood down and a green liquid down next to Hinata. She took the syringe and grabbed Hinata's arm. Hinata, I'm going to need your blood. The seal is tied to you by your blood, so in order to free it, I'm going to mix your blood with the hawk's blood over there. I'm sure you're aware that hawk's blood is used for the seal. I'm also sure that whoever placed the seal in you liquefied a leaf and then drew the cage seal. They then used the hawk's blood mixed with your own and traced over the markings in the middle of the seal. Yes, but when my father did the hand seals to activate it, I felt the searing pain in my body. Then I passed out, Hinata informed her. The hawk's blood represents the caging of the bird. The thing with this seal is that it's connected to your eyes and brain. The seal is a mark of servitude and slavery. I don't know who designed it, but whoever did didn't want anyone to know the secrets of removing it. It took me nearly five years of studying the cage seal when I was a leaf ninja to figure out how to remove it, Naya informed Hinata. Naya placed a small dab of the liquefied leaf on her index and middle finger. She traced over the seal with the liquefied leaf. Next, she then proceeded to mix Hinata's blood with the hawk's blood. She did the same process with the liquefied leaf that she did with the hawk's blood. Naya stepped out of the seal and drew a mark at the top of the seal. She then walked to the opposite side where Hinata's feet faced and drew another mark. She did this also on the right and left of Hinata. Naya stepped back in the seal and formed numerous hand seals. When she finished, her hand started to glow blue. She then placed her hand on Hinata's head. A flame erupted from Hinata's seal, causing her to scream in pain. Now that the easy part's over, it's time for the hard part. Naya formed a couple more hand seals. When she finished the seal underneath her and Hinata started glowing sky blue. The seal mistress stepped outside of the seal and formed more hand seals. When she finished, she extended her arms lateral. She then dropped down on her knees and touched the marking outside of the seal at the base of Hinata's head. The seal started glowing, then a circular line connected to form around the seal Hinata was under, connecting the markings that she drew. She then sat Indian style and then brought her hands together as if she was praying. Focus Naya, if you lose control for an instant, you can damage her eyes and or her brain. Damn, I should have gotten some sleep first before doing this. Naya, who's looking at Hinata, smirked. I wonder if that idiot knows that fixing her clan wasn't the only thing she wanted. It's too bad that he already has someone, because those two would make a cute couple. Naya cleared her thoughts and focused on the task at hand. Six hours and 34 minutes later, Naruto was taking a nap on the couch. Naya walked into the living room. Naruto heard her footsteps and sat up, stretching his arms out. You've been in there forever, is everything okay? Yes, the removal was a success. I finished the process of removing the seals 10 minutes ago. It took me another 10 minutes to draw and activate the gravity seals I placed in her. She's sleeping right now. She passed out after the removal process due to the pain. She has a scar on her forehead shaped like the seal, but in two weeks, it'll seem as if she never had a mark there. She informed Naruto. That's good. How long will she be out? Naruto asked. I don't know, she might be out for an hour or two days, Naya replied. Well, Naruto, I completed my part of the bargain. Yeah, I know I owe you, right? Naruto asked. Yep. However, I don't know what I want right now, but when I figure it out, I'll tell you. You'll have to get it, no questions asked, she replied. Okay, lead the way to Naruto. I should be heading with her to the land of wind's border. Naya led Naruto to where Hinata was. Before he picked her up, Naruto summoned Gamakichi. Hey Naruto, give me candy if you want me to do something. I don't have time for that, Gamakichi. I need you to deliver a message to Tsunade and Tsunade only. Got it? She'll give you the candy you want when you get there, okay? Naruto said to the frog. Is that all? The young frog asked. 
Yes, that's all, Naruto informed the frog. Naruto tied the scroll on Gamakichi's back. The frog headed out of the room and found its way out of the house. Naruto then picked up Hinata and placed her over his shoulder. Thanks, Naya. I'll be back to visit when I can. In a poof of smoke, Naruto disappeared. Naya walked out of the room, closing the door behind her. 11 p.m. Somewhere in River Country. Hinata woke up to see that she was no longer at Naya's place. She looked around and immediately concluded that she was in a hotel. She went to touch the area where the seal was at to feel a slight pain, withdrawing her hand quickly. Naruto walked into the room, seeing Hinata up. Hey, how are you feeling? My head hurts a little. Where are we? Hinata asked. Naruto responded, we're in river country now. We're actually about four hours away from the border. We will leave about two or three in the morning. There, we will meet up with everyone. I have a plan to cover up your seal being removed. What is the plan? Hinata asked. Well, I sent Gamakichi, my frog summoned to Sanade. He will inform her of what I did, and when we return, we will rush you to the hospital immediately. We're going to keep you out of the sight of your family for about two weeks. Then, you will return to the Hyuga compound. If I were you, I would get used to those gravity seals, Naruto stated. I have seals? No wonder I had to struggle to sit up. Hinata said to herself out loud. Well, Hinata, this is the seal to activate and deactivate the seals. You can also elevate or lower the seals with the same hand seal. When you want to elevate or lower the gravity, just think of the level you want to lower it or increase it to. Right now, you're on level 1, but you should get used to this level fairly easily. Naruto explained to Hinata. Oh, okay. Well, Naruto, I'm still kind of sleepy, so I'm gonna go back to sleep. Again, thank you, Naruto. I will not fail you, Hinata said to the man she loved. Naruto looked directly in her eyes. Don't worry about failing me, Hinata. The only person you can fail is yourself. Get some sleep, okay? Hinata turned over and went to sleep. Naruto laid back in the recliner chair that he was sitting in and closed his eyes, drifting off into sleep. 7 a.m. The border of the land of wind and river country. Sasuke and company arrived at the border, and waited for the sand siblings as well as the person who kidnapped Hinata. Sakura looked at Neji, who had his Byakugan. on. Neji, do you see anything? No, not yet. Wait, I think I see someone coming, Neji replied. Really, can you see who it is? Tenten asked. Yes, it's one, two, no, three people. Looks like Gara and his family has arrived, Neji informed the group. This is going to be troublesome. I just can feel it. The sand trio started to come into everyone's view. After a few minutes, they approached the group. Gara was the first to speak. Why did the Hokage send out all of you? Actually, we're on a mission to retrieve Hinata Hyuge. She was kidnapped, and the kidnapper informed us to meet us here, he answered Gara. I see, she did this so we could help you out just in case something goes wrong, Konkuro stated. Nothing will go wrong, that much I can promise you, Naruto informed Konkuro. Well, if it isn't Naruto Uzumaki. How long has it been, Naruto? Tamari asked. It's been about a year when I had Hayami with me, Naruto replied. Yes, it has, so it's true that you're fighting for the leaf. How much are they paying you? Tamari asked with a smile. More than they want to, Naruto replied. Everyone was interrupted by a man appearing in all black, wearing a mask covering his face. He had Hinata on his shoulder. Kibo was about to rush him when Shikamaru's shadow held him back. Attacking the enemy when he has something we want is foolish. You know better, fool, Shikamaru scolded Kiba. He has Hinata. We have to get her back. Come on, Neji, you agree with me, right? Kiba stated. Yes, I agree, but we don't have to worry. Hinata isn't in any harm from what I can tell. The only question is why, Neji stated with a smirk. That's what I'm trying to figure out as well, Shino stated. Shikamaru struggled. It's obvious, but it's too troublesome to explain. Sasuke spoke, looking dead at the man in the mask. Well, Naruto, cared to explain. Before anyone could turn around, a kunai came flying from Sasuke's hand and pierced Naruto in the heart. Everyone, with the exception of Shino, Neji, and Shikamaru's eyes, went wide. What the hell did you do that for, Sasuke? Ino screamed at the Uchiha. She, like everyone else, was surprised to see Naruto disappear in a poof of smoke. What? You mean we've been traveling with the Shadow Clone? 
Where the hell is the real Naruto? Asked Naruto. He's standing over there with Hinata. Niji replied. You know Sakura, Tintin, Lee, and Shoji were surprised. The Sand siblings wore no expressions that betrayed their emotions. Naruto pulled off his mask. I should have known I couldn't pull a fast one on you, Shikamaru, Sasuke, Shino, and Neji. When did you guys figure it out? When we all stopped to set up camp around the campfire, Kipo went to slap you on the back for a joke you made, but quickly avoided being hit. Instantly, Shino, Neji, Sasuke, and I looked at each other. That's when we knew. When everyone went to sleep, we came to the conclusion to play this out and see where it went. So Naruto, did you get the seal mistress to remove her seal? Sasuke, Shino, and Neji, along with the rest of the group, looked at Shikamaru with stunned expressions. Naruto smiled at Shikamaru. You're too smart for your own good, Shikamaru. Yes, her seal is gone. You know so much. Can you figure out what's my next move? You need us to say that we defeated and killed the person that took Hinata. But she was injured and will need to spend some time in the hospital. Correct? Shikamaru waited for a response. Damn, Shikamaru, how can a lazy ass like you be so perspective? Naruto asked. When I figured out what you did, I thought of many possible moves you could make. Forget it. It's too trouble. My fan hit him over the head before he could finish that word. If you say troubles him again, so help me I will. Tamari was cut off by Sasuke. I assume Sonata is in on this, the Uchiha asked. Yes, I informed her of it yesterday, Naruto answered. That's good going. We should arrive there by tomorrow morning. We have only one day to rest there before we go to water country, Gar informed everyone. Kiba walked up to Naruto. I'll take her if you don't mind. Naruto handed Hinata to Kiba. We took off, leaving everyone behind. Everyone followed suit except for Neji, who stayed behind, lost in his thoughts. So, the seal can be removed. I think I should talk to Naruto about it while we're in water country. Neji disappeared where he was from and headed in the same direction as his team, somewhere in the land of tea. Kakashi and his squad, which consisted of Yamato, Sai, Aoba, and Raido, were walking along a dirt road on their way back to the leaf village. Shinari assigned Kakashi and everyone else in the A rank mission. Their mission was to protect Jirocho Wasabari, the head of the Wasabari clan as they escorted him to and from the land of earth. They ran into a couple of rock ninjas, but nothing too serious. It was a long mission and everyone couldn't wait to get back to Konoha. I'm sure glad that this mission is over with. I can't wait to get back home and just relax, Yoba said in a tone that illustrated his relief. Yes, I can't wait to get back home either, but I can't really complain. The mission wasn't that hard, Yamato stated. I suppose not. That could have been worse, Raido stated. Raido, Ayoba, and Yamato were chatting, while Kakashi was reading his book. Sai, who wasn't really paying any attention to them, had his eyes fixed on the sky. Yamato, who was laughing at a joke that Ayoba made, turned to look at Sai. Hey Sai, what's the matter? That bird, it's gorgeous, Sai said. Yamato looked at Sai, then let his eyes trace Sai's line of sight. When he saw what Sai was looking at, his eyes widened in shock. Ayoba and Raido looked at him as well, both curious as to what the two were looking at looked at the sky. The two instantly became shocked as well. Kakashi was still walking when he realized that everyone got quiet. He turned around to see everyone fixated on the sky. Kakashi, curious, looked up to see what they were looking at. His right eye showed his visible shock. Kakashi. You see that. Raido was the first to speak. Yes, but I don't believe it. We have to tell the Hokage what we saw. No more wasting time. Let's hurry and get moving. Kakashi ordered. Sai looked at Kakashi. Kakashi, do you know what type of bird that is? Kakashi, I focused on Sai. Yes, that bird is the god of all birds. It is the legendary phoenix. Kakashi turned around and disappeared from view. Everyone else did the same except for Sai. He continued to look at the enormous bird, covered in blue flames flying miles overhead. I will draw that bird when I get back home. A creature of such a beauty needs a portrait in its honor. Sai took his eyes off of the sky and followed suit, vanishing into nothingness. Cloud Village. The Raikage sat at his desk. 
He got word back from a Misokage who was willing to hold the meeting. Narakage smiled at this knowing that his plan was coming along. His assistant came into his office. Sir, Cohen, Komoko, and Kadon are here to see you. Send them in, Momiji. Narakage motioned for her to send them in. Cohen followed by Komoko, a girl in her early 20s who had long flowing red hair and blue eyes, and Kadan, a man who looked to be around the same age as Komoko, had short brown hair and brown eyes. All of them were dressed in the standard Jonin uniform. The Raikage motioned for them to grab a chair and sit in front of his desk. I'm sure Cohen has given you all the details about you two being here, the Raikage asked the two other Jonins. Yes, sir. He informed us that we will be your personal escort to the Land of Water. Sir, I was wondering if Naruto Uzumaki was going to be there. He looked at Komoko and smirked. Yes, however, you are not going to go near him while we are there. We will not attack anyone from the leaf or anyone connected to them while we are there. Is that understood, Komoko? But sir, he's the one who- Komoko was cut short by the Raikage. Yes. He was the one who killed your father, I know. No offense to you, but your father, mild sensei, was a fool. Had he became Raikage, he could have had the back end of a village to carry out his dealings. I didn't know the complete purpose of the Akatsuki, but I do know that 9 or 10 people, no matter how elite they are, don't equate to the power of a village. Your father forgot that when he decided to retire to pursue his quest for power, Murakage stated. Sir, let me take him out. This is all that I request, sir. I have never requested anything from you, sir. Nothing, Komoko pleaded. I'm sorry, Komoko. You will not try to kill him while we are there, Murakage informed the girl. Murakage is right, Komoko. Besides, what good are you to the cloud dead? Kadan said with a smirk. What the hell are you trying to say? Every word was said through the gritting of her teeth. He's trying to say that if you go up against the golden fox, you are going to die. Komoko granted you are a strong, but you still don't compare to your father. That man killed your father. Face him would mean certain death, Cohen answered for Kadon. She tore her gaze from Cohen back to the Raikage. Sir, if I can't kill him there, can I kill him when we move to the final phase of the plan? Raikage leaned back in his chair. Seems Cohen told you the plan, but he felt to mention that I have given him the assignment of killing Naruto Uzumaki and Sasuke Uchiha. I don't know if he has anyone close to him. Wait a minute. Yes, yes, this is perfect. Komoko, you won't kill Uzumaki, but you will take someone that is precious from him away. Cohen smiled at what the Raikage was implying. You mean Ryuho's little girl, don't you, sir? Yes, for a man to slaughter close to 300 ninjas for a little girl reveals his deep care for the girl, does it not? The Raikage asked, not really expecting an answer. Kanan spoke up. Sir, are you forgetting that she is Ryuho's daughter? Getting to her will not be an easy task, sir. Yes, I'm well aware of that, however. If it is something that can be done, it's like you said, this will not be an easy task. That's why it will take precise planning to make it happen. Once I get Tsunade to hold the tuning exams in the leaf, we will prepare a strategy and an elite team. Including us four, we will go to the land of sea. If we succeed, Komoko, I will give you the pleasure of killing the girl and sending her head to Uzumaki, the Rakage stated to the female Jonin. You said if we succeed. What do you mean by that, sir? I mean, if your coming success is guaranteed, is it not? Kadon questioned. Success isn't guaranteed. This is Ryuho, in the Minashu clan. Their sword style rivals my wicked wind style. Remember, Ryuho isn't the only one that knows it. Everyone in that compound does. He might not rival my power, but he might, to some degree. Anyway, we will discuss this in more detail tomorrow. Remember, we leave the day after tomorrow. Raikage reminded the group. Cohen decided to speak. Sir, I was wondering if maybe Komoko here could confront Uzumaki. I mean, I know he can use the Minashu's clan style, but it would be good to see what he is capable of. 
and not to mention, she would see that she is no match. The Raikage stroked his chin. Hmm. Okay, Kamoko. I will allow you to do this. I know you're not satisfied with the plan I formulated and would rather kill Uzumaki. But, I'm only looking out for the safety of my soldiers. I'm going to need all the manpower I can get if I wish to crush the leaf. Well, if that is all, you guys are dismissed. Also, if you see Daki and Robo, let those two guys know that they are also coming on this mission as well. I think appearing with my five best ninjas will show our village's superiority. They all nodded and then proceeded out of the room. The Raikage leaned back in his chair, counting the days until the meeting in the mist. 9am, Konoha the next day. Naruto and everyone else arrived quickly at the hospital. Naruto along with everyone else escorted an unconscious Hinata to the hospital. Shinade and Shizune, who awaited their return, had them rush Hinata to the ICU wing. After escorting her to the hospital, Naruto along with Sasuke and the sand trio left. Shinade was informed of Naruto's plan. She didn't know why he did it, but she was going to find out when she got him alone. When Shinade reached the room with Shizune and the medical staff in tow, she informed everyone that she and Shizune alone would be handling this case personally. She also informed them that nobody besides her or Shizune is to enter the room. Tenten, Lee, Shino, Kiba, Neji, and Kurenai were waiting in the meeting room. After an hour or two of waiting, Shinade, followed by Shizune and Tantan, who were not too far behind, looked at the group. Don't worry, she's just asleep. I checked her for poison and stuff of that nature. Kurenai gave a sigh of relief. While Tenten, Lee, Shino, Kiba, and Neji already knew what she was up to, Kurenai stepped from her chair. Lady Hokage, can I go see her now? No, no one is to go see her but Shizune. Is that understood? You'll see her when she is fully recovered, the Hokage stated with a tone. Finality. Kurenai nodded in understanding. The silence was broken when they heard a voice. I heard that my pathetic excuse of a daughter was retrieved. Where is she? I wish to see her. Kiba looked at Hiyashi with a look of hate. You won't go near her. All you're going to do is berate her and tell her how worthless she is. I won't let you do that. Hiyashi, who was standing next to Hanabi, looked at Kiba and smirked. Dogs should stay in their place. That was Kiba needed before throwing himself at Hiyashi. Kiba went to swing, but Lee interfered and blocked his path. Kiba still with his eyes focused on Hiyashi. What the hell are you doing, Lee? Get out of my way so I can beat his ass. I'm sorry, Kiba, but you won't stand a chance against him. Lord Hiyashi. He isn't the head of the Hyuga for nothing, you know. Besides, this isn't the place. We are here to give our support to Hinata, not to start a fight, B said in hopes it would calm Kiba down. Kiba let out a grunt and then walked away. Lee went back to sit next to Tenten. Hiyashi looked at Tsunade. Well, can I see her? No, she said flatly. His eyes narrowed. What do you mean, no? I mean, you're not going to see her. You will see her like everyone else when she is fully recovered. I don't care if you're her father or the head of the Hyuga. I said no, and that's that. Tsunade told Hiyashi. Hanabi looked at Tsunade with worried eyes. Lady Hokage, is Hinata okay? Yes, she will be from what I can tell. Just give her time to recover. Hanabi was now breathing a sigh of relief. Hiyashi motioned for Hanabi to follow. Tsunade looked at the group. I think you guys should leave. Besides, I expect you all in my office in the next hour. I'll be going over the duties while I'm gone, okay? They all nodded. Shinade followed by Shizune and Tauntaun left at the hotel. Naruto knew he had to meet Tsunade in her office in an hour. She informed him and everyone else before they left. Naruto was glad to be back with her with Yumi. Naruto was looking around the room for Yumi, but couldn't find her anywhere. So, he decided to go next door to where Mai was staying. Naruto knocked on the door and Mai opened up. Upon entering, he saw Yumi and Jiraiya. So, what are you guys doing in Mai's room? Well, we're just relaxing. We just came from breakfast. Jiraiya treated surprisingly, Yumi informed Naruto. You have money to pay for the breakfast. What about the money you owe me from the time we went looking for Granny, huh? Naruto asked. Jiraiya put his hand to his chin as he was thinking. Hmm, what money? Naruto was about to choke his sensei, but Jiraiya looked at him with a serious expression. How did it go? Naruto looked at the sensei. It went okay. 
She'd probably be asleep for a couple more days. She woke up when we were in river country, but fell back asleep soon after. You were there when Gamakichi informed Shinade, I presume. Yes, I was. Naruto, take a walk with me. We need to talk. Jiraiya stood up and walked to the door. I just got back, and during my time in this village, I haven't really spent any time with Yumi. Naruto told Jiraiya with an expression on his face that displayed his unhappiness. Tough. If you wanted to spend time with her, then you should have never decided to get involved in this conflict. Besides, Yumi isn't going anywhere. You'll have the rest of the day to spend with her. Naruto thought about what he said. Okay, I have to meet Tsunade in an hour, so we can walk and talk on the way there. Both of the men exited Mai's room. Naruto, you should really watch out for Yumi and Mai. When I took them to lunch, I saw the looks they got from the villagers that know about the Kibi inside of you. Naruto, I will look after them as much as I can while you're gone, but I can't always keep an eye on them. I have other matters to tend to. I thought I should let you know. Naruto absorbed every word. I'm aware that some idiot will try something while I'm gone. Don't worry, Purby Sage. I'll figure out what to do. Thanks for informing me. Naruto and Jiraiya walked in silence. Jiraiya glanced at Naruto. Should I tell him now? No. It isn't the right time. I'll tell him when he gets back from his mission. Yes, me and Tsunade will sit down and tell him. He's old enough and strong enough now to ward off the enemies you may have made, Arashi. We will tell him soon. He deserves to know. Naruto and Jiraiya arrived at the building. Jiraiya looked at Naruto. We have at least another 45 minutes. What's the rush? There's no rush. It doesn't make sense to go back and see Yumi. So I'll go upstairs and wait. You coming? Naruto asked. No, actually, I have to go and take care of that business I was talking about. Later, Jiraiya disappeared in a poof of smoke. Naruto wondered what he had to deal with, but just shrugged it off and went upstairs. Thirty minutes later, Naruto sat in Tsunade's office by himself just waiting. The first person that walked in was Shizune. She was startled by Naruto. Oh, Naruto, you scared me. I wasn't expecting anyone to be in here, you know? Shizune, where's Granny? I thought we were going to meet her here. Shouldn't she be early? Naruto asked the medical ninja. She usually comes just on time. I'm just here setting things up. I know it's not your job, but would you mind helping me? Naruto shook his head and got up to help Shizune place mats around the room. During those ten minutes, a number of Jonins filled into the room. Tsunade came in with Koharu and Homura. They all sat on the mats placed around the room. Tsunade began. Okay, everyone, I'll be giving out your assignments while I'm gone. I expect all the Jonins to be stationed over the village in critical areas. Have sent notices informing Jonins of their tasks, which will be to patrol the village. If they see something suspicious, they are to report to the Jonins stationed in that sector. As for the Genins, their instructor will give them the orders to watch over the hospital, the ninja academy, and the civilians. Ibiki, you are to inform all Anbu members that they are to patrol the outside of the village. If a sneak attack comes while I'm gone, I want to show that our village will not fall, even in my absence. Kurnai raised her hand to speak. Are you going to divide the Jonins into squads or what? Everyone has shifts. When the Genins go off duty for the nights, I expect my Jonins to pick up their slack. However, you will be divided into groups. The group placements is in the pamphlet that Shizune is passing around. This was designed in accordance to your skills and how well you work with one another. It's not a answer to the Jonin. Another Jonin raised his hand. Lady Hokage, why are we doing a 5 hour rotation instead of an 8? I thought it'd be obvious. It's because the door to the room busted open revealing Kakashi, Raido, Yamato, Sai, and Ayoba. It's not a at Kakashi. What is the meaning of this Kakashi? Lady Tsunade, you're never going to guess what we saw on our mission, Kakashi said. I don't have time for this now, Kakashi. You're interrupting a very important... It was a phoenix. Shinade, Shizune, Kurnai, Gai, Asma, and just about all of the Jonians who are old enough to remember the Third Great Shinobi War went wide-eyed. The older Jonians started whispering to themselves. Kaharu spoke. Quiet. Everyone went into a deep silence. She focused on Kakashi. Are you sure it was a phoenix, Kakashi? Yes, I'm 100% sure. Sasuke looked at Kakashi. 
What's the big deal about seeing a phoenix? Kakashi looked at Sasuke. A phoenix is not common. The only way to see a phoenix is if someone has the contract. Tsunade concluded, turning everyone's attention to her. A phoenix contract? I come up never heard of it, Naruto asked. It's a rare contract. The phoenix contract and the dragon contract are the two summoning contracts of legend. Their contracts are greater than the snake, the toad, the slug, and the monkey contracts. It is said that they are equal in power. But to get either one of these contracts, one has to go through certain trials. But first, you must find the caves to their layers in order to go through the trials. Like the snake contract that Sasuke and Anko have. The holders of these contracts are also granted swords. These swords, like the Kusanagi, is a part of the four swords of legend. There's the Dragon's Fang, the Phoenix Claw, Grass Cutter, and Heaven's Blade. Naruto, I'm sure you've seen the Heaven's Blade. Yes, but Ryuho Sensei never uses it, Naruto informs Nade. A Junin raised her hand. So that means Anko has the Grass Cutter, right? Anko answered. No, I don't. Sasuke does. Even though I had the contract before him, Nanda is the one that decides who is fit to wield the grass cutter, and he chose Sasuke because he is stronger. Kurnai stood up. Kashi, did you by any chance see someone riding the phoenix? Kurnai asked with hope in her eyes. No, Kakashi answered. Kurnai ran out of the room. Asuma was about to go after her when Kakashi placed a hand on his shoulder and just shook his head. Shinari stood up. Everyone has their assignments. This meeting is done. Shinade hurried out of the office and headed to her personal office. Shizune, with soft eyes, looked at Shinade, while Tantan was in her arms. Tantan looked up to Shizune. Bui bui bui. Shizune looked down at Tantan and back at where the exit Shinade left through. I know, but I think she should be alone right now. Come on, Tantan. Let's look for Kurnai, okay? Asuma walked up to Shizune. I'll go with you. Kakashi walked up next to her too. Well, seeing as I don't have anything better to do, I guess I'll help you look for her as well. In the Hokage's office. Tsunade was sitting in her chair, looking at her pictures. She looked at the picture that her and Naruto, Jiraiya, and Shizune took on their way back to the leaf. She then looked at the one with her, Jiraiya, Orochimaru, and the third. Good times, she thought. Then, the next picture she looked at was when she was younger, with her brother, Nawaki. The next picture she came up with was her, Don, a four-year-old Jizune, and a boy about the same age, with black spiky hair, and stopped at his cheek. Think of Gundam's wing hero Yui hairstyle. His eyes bared a strong resemblance of hers. So now that he closed her eyes, tears slid down her cheeks, hitting the picture. Somewhere in the village, Naruto was curious about Tsunade and Kurenai's actions. He knew that Kakashi, Shizune, or Asuma knew something, so he decided to follow them. Kakashi stopped. Naruto, if you want something, you can just come and ask. You don't need to stalk around. Naruto appeared in front of Kakashi. Something's up. What is that? And I missed. Kakashi looked at Asuma, who looked away. He then looked at Shizune, who looked at the ground. Kakashi turned his head back to Naruto. It's complicated, Naruto. I think Shizune and Asuma can tell the story better than I can. Naruto looked at Shizune. Shizune, what's going on? Why did Granny seem sad, and why did Kur and I run out of the meeting? Well, Naruto, you remember the story I told you about how Shinadi's brother and my uncle were killed because of the necklace? Well, those two were the only ones that she lost to that necklace, Shizune explained. Naruto looked at her, slightly confused. What do you mean, weren't the only people that she lost to the necklace? Who was the other person? her son. Timer and Naruto stopped when he heard uh, what Shizune said. Shizune gathered herself, then continued. You see, Naruto, Tsunade and my Uncle Don had a son. His name was Senzuru. Not many people know that. Well, not the younger generation anyway, because he died 18 years ago. He was the reason why Tsunade left the village. When my uncle died, she was sad. Sad beyond belief. But my cousin and I filled the void. He more so than I, because he was our child. Oh, so that explains Granny. What about Kurnai? Naruto asked. He was on our team, Asuma answered. 
He pulled out a cigarette, lit it, and took a long as he closed his eyes. He blew out the smoke and continued. You see, Kurenai, Shizune, and Senzu, and myself all graduated the academy at nine. We weren't the best students, but we weren't the worst either. Senzu, Kurenai, and I were placed in the same Genin squad. It's funny when I look back at how much he liked Kurenai back then. But she ignored him and treated him badly. History does repeat itself, in a sense. However, when we were 11, we were on a mission. Kurt and I was in danger. I was low on chakra, and somehow, Senzuru saved her. He gave this big ninja monologue about how he would protect her with his life and such. Never did remember that speech. That was the turning point of their relationship. Kurt and I, and he, were joined at the hip. Oh, I see. He has the Phoenix contract, doesn't he? Naruto asked. Yes, no one knows how he got it, but all I remember is him requesting for some time off. This was when he was 12. He was missing for about two... How many weeks, Shizune? Three weeks, five days, four hours, 22 minutes, 11 seconds. Everyone gave her a weird look. What? That's what Tsunade kept saying while she scolded him in the hospital. Asuma slowly turned away from Shizune. Okay. Anyway, he was missing for three weeks. But he came back bruised and injured. Turns out that he has the Phoenix contract, which was nothing more than a bedtime story that Ninja told their kids. Asuma continued, Over the next year, we took the tuning exams and passed at the age of 13. Senzu's skill was rising. Some say that he was on his way to becoming a Jonin. and might possibly pass the Sanin. In fact, he turned down Anbu numerous times. His chakra control and Taijutsu were excellent. Benefits of being a Sanin, who is a medic ninja's son. His ninjutsu was excellent, and his genjutsu was fairly decent, but nothing like Kurenai, who was an expert in it. During the next two years, his relationship with Kurenai developed. It wasn't puppy love, those two actually loved each other. During this time, we also fought in the Third Great Shinobi War. The funny thing about that war is that you always lose something close to you. Shizune lost a cousin. Kashi and I lost our best friend. And Kur and I, a lover. And Tsunade, a son. So, how did he die? Naruto finally asked the dreaded question. Shizune spoke up. Asuma, Kur and I, Genma, and Shikaku, Asuma's, Kur and I's, and Senju's junior instructor. We were placed in their squad for supports. Me as the medic, and Genma for his physical skills. We had a mission that brought us near the land of lightning. We were confronted by a couple of ninjas from the cloud. We were fighting for our lives. Shikaku was busy fighting off a Jonin. While we were stuck taking on the other three ninjas. We took down two ninjas at the cost of injury. Kurenai, Genma, Asuma, and I were out of the fight. Senjuru, as good as he was, was up against a ninja who seemed to have more experience. But Senjuru did a move that she was working on in secret to ensure our survival. Flashback. In a grassy field, two warriors stood about to face off. The young kid looked tired, like he was doing all he could to stand. The slightly older man was panting, but he wasn't as bad as the kid. The cloud ninja looked at the kid. It's over. It ends here. Senjuru closed his eyes and smiled. Either way, it does end here. Senjuru brought his hands together with only the index fingers pointing upwards. Shizune, Kurenai, and Genma were on the ground behind him. He turned his head and looked at Shizune. Shizune. Balkasan, I'm sorry. I have to do this. Asuma, take care of Kurenai for me. Kurenai, I want you to know that I'm doing this for you. Remember that I swore to protect you. Well, that's what I'm going to do. Goodbye, everyone. Senjuru disappeared from sight and was in the air. The cloud ninja looked up to see the boy in front, high above him, was glowing white. The light was shining so bright, it looked like an angel who came down from the heavens. Before the cloud ninja could react, the kanji of death appeared on his chest. Senjuru, who had his eyes closed throughout the whole process, opened them suddenly. He then shouted, ANGEL OF DEATH! Everything in the immediate area was covered by a blinding white light. The light died down after five minutes. It took everyone a while to see clearly. Kurenai, despite the pain in her legs, stood up. Senzuru! 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 Asuma slowly walked up to her and put a hand on her shoulder. 
Osma slowly walked up to her and put a hand on her shoulder. Connor and I, he is gone. He's not gone, it's just one of his sick jokes. He'll come out any minute. You'll see. You'll see. She fell to the ground and broke down crying. Shizune was crying hysterically. Genma went to comfort her. Shikaku walked back to the group. His fight was over. The ninja he was fighting faded into the light. He looked at his group and saw Sensuru missing. Genma, who was holding a crying Shizune in his arms, looked at Shikaku and shook his head. Shikaku looked at the ground when a gleam in the grass caught his eye. He walked to the spot to find the first Hokage's necklace. He put it in his pocket. He was not looking for it to tell Tsunade that her son was dead. He didn't tell the team to come on. He let them stay there and mourn the loss of a friend and a teammate and a flashback. So he sacrificed himself for you guys, Naruto asked. Yes, that's why his name is on the memory stone. When Tsunade got the news, she immediately left the village. I followed her as well. I left my home, but it was hard staying in a place that was a constant reminder, Shizune told Naruto. Kashi spoke. I doubt that another person has found the Phoenix Lair. I didn't want to give Tsunade a current eye false hope, but I didn't think it would be right to hide what I saw. This is very enlightening. I'll be going. Thanks for the info, guys. Naruto disappeared. Kakashi looked at Asuma and Shizume. Let's find Kurenai. They nodded and continued walking. In another part of town. Genma was telling a similar story to Guy and the squad and the group from the Rookie Nine, excluding Naruto and Hinata. She never said anything, Sakura said, feeling bad for her sensei. No, it's a touchy subject for her and Shizune. But if what Raido, Kakashi, Yamato, and Sai saw is true, and either he's alive, which is impossible, or someone else has a contract, Genma replied. Why is it so hard to believe that he might be alive? Sasuke asked. You're a Jonin. Take a look at the technique called uh, the Angel of Death in the scroll library. It's an S-rank jutsu that is hard to perform. The technique is a self-sacrificing jutsu, but it will take out anyone once it locks on the target. There is no escaping it, and no way of surviving it. Genma said so Sasuke would understand. What do you think is going to happen now? Neji asked. I don't know. I guess the truth will come to light. We'll find out soon enough if he's dead or if he's alive. That will determine whether there is a new user of the contract, Genma told him. Guy was a bit skeptical about Senjuru being dead. He never did recover the body, but the technique is believed to erase the person from existence. I don't know. Something is telling me that... He is alive, but it's like Genma said, eh, we'll find out soon enough. Minashu compound in the land of sea. Ryuho is outside in the back with Hayami. They are practicing with wooden swords. Hayami lost balance when she went to swing at her father. He sidestepped and tripped her. She fell to the ground face first. He pulled the wooden sword to her neck. Hayami, that makes this the third time today you would have been killed. You're getting better, but your footwork needs fine to me. He extended his hand for the girl to support. She didn't take his hand. Instead, she got up on her own. She jumped three feet away and positioned herself. Father, let's go on. He looked at his daughter and saw that she wasn't going to take no for an answer. Okay, but this is the last time for today. The girl immediately charged at her father. He went on the defensive, blocking every blow from her. He was smiling to himself, glad to see her improvement. Naomi jumped in the air and swung the sword at her father's head. He leant back. The wood blade came an inch away from his nose. She did a couple more strikes, which he blocked. Fifteen minutes later, Hayami found herself in the same position. That's enough, Hayami. Get up and go clean yourself up. We will continue this tomorrow, Ryuho said to his daughter. She nodded, then headed off to the house. Ryuho smiled at her as she ran to the house. He turned to his left. It's been a long time, hasn't it, Sanzaru? The man with the black cloak removed the hood. Yes, it has, Ryuho. You do know why I've come. Ryuho walked up to the man. I can only guess that it has something to do with this war. Yes, old friend. Just like me, you're going to get pulled into a war that you don't want to be involved in. Ryuho turned to look at the sky. I know. Someone will come for my blade. And I'll have to fight to protect my family. Can I ask you a question, Senjuru? Sure. Why are you getting involved? Ryuho asked. No one can deal with him but me. What about Tsunade? Ryuho questioned. He has suppressed my mother, and she isn't trained for years. If she fights him, she'll die. 
I will not allow that to happen. My student Naruto can do it. No. No, he cannot. He has the nine tails inside of him. I know. That cloud is a Jinchuriki as well. Naruto and he might be on the same level, but... Aisu, Yakia, and I are in a whole different class. I and Asu clashed twice already. The first time was when I was 15. And the last time was about 8 years ago. We both walked away from that battle, but injured. I think you should know that he is the inheritor of the Wicked Wind style, and rivals my divine wrath and your heavenly sword. To top it all off, he has the dragon contract, which makes him the wielder of the dragon's fang. I haven't really trained hard in years. I know I'm rusty, but I'm sure you came here to tell me that the worst is coming. More or less. He's using this war to draw me out. He wants to kill me. With me dead, there will be no one that can rival his power. You're forgetting that I'm still around, Ryuho said with a sulky expression. Sensor laughed. No, I'm not, but it's like you said, you're rusty. My real reason for coming here is about Naruto, actually. It's about Heaven's Blade. Yes. What will we decide? Sensor asked. He will have to go through the trials. I will send word to him because he will need it soon. That's unnecessary. I will tell him. Well, I'm in Water Country. I want to keep a close eye on Aisu. Also, I want to assess his skills. I heard the kids fast. Can he use the Hiroshin? Sensor waited for a response. No. Well, if he could, he would be unstoppable, even without the Kibi. Riho informed Sensor. Grab your skills? Sensor wondered. Yes, why are you asking all this? Sensor looked at the sky. Because if I just so happen to lose, he's going to be the only one that can defeat him. You may be right, but the last time he was here, his level was times two. I don't know much about gravity seals, but I have an idea about the levels. So what level are you on? Riho questioned. Sensor looked at him and smiled. I'm currently at level 6. Impressive as always, eh, Sensor? Riho and Sensor turned to face Jiraiya. Sensor gave the old man a warm smile. It's been a while, or Jiraiya. Yes, it has. So this war is about confronting you and world domination, so to speak, Jiraiya asked. You were listening in on us for the last five minutes. You already know the answer to that. So, how is she? Sensor asked. He gave the man a smile. She's better now, but seeing you will be definitely be a shock to her system. It's been 18 years since anyone has last seen you. Are you going back? Yes. As the heir, I have to protect the leaf. I will also go to see Kuranai, Shizune, Asma, and Kasan again. But, I'm not going back now. I have things to do and discover. Sensor bit his thumb and rubbed his blood uh, on the tribal looking phoenix tattoo on his left forearm. He placed his hand at the ground, revealing a large phoenix with purple flames. He jumped on the phoenix's back and motioned for it to take off. While in the air, he looked at Jiraiya and Riho. I'll see you guys soon. The phoenix vanished in a burst of beautiful purple flames, leaving behind purple fiery feathers that burn out when they hit the ground. Jiraiya looked at Riho. He sure has grown from the last time I saw him 18 years ago. Far more than you know. I battled him about 8 years ago while in the land of wind. He actually confronted me. I had to use it, and still, we were dead even. I never tied with anyone to battle. That was 8 years ago. Out of the fact that he's been training this whole time. He is something to be feared, even by me. Ryuho informed Jiraiya. You're right. But if anything, the event to come will be interesting. Jiraiya and Ryuho both looked to the setting sun. Ryuho smiled. That it will. That it will. It was early morning, 6 o'clock to be exact. And it was the departure day for the Okage and her party, along with the Kasakage and his party. The meeting would be held tomorrow in the Mist Village. Tsunade, still in her pajamas, was looking outside the window in her bedroom, in her two-story house near the Hokage Monument. A memento of her grandfather passed down to her parents, and now to her. She watched the village from her window. She could see Lee and Guy doing their daily laps around the village. She laughed to herself. Those two didn't come any weirder. The Hokage was thinking about the information that Kakashi gave her yesterday. She couldn't stop thinking that there was a possibility that her son, Senzuru, was still alive. 
on top of trying to get Naruto to stay in the village, the nagging council, this upcoming meeting in the mist, and possibly the return of her son. Sonate was getting a little stressed. She walked away from the window to go and prepare for the day ahead. After 20 minutes of preparation, which included showering and getting dressed, Tsunade walked in the kitchen to see Shizune making breakfast. Hello, Lady Tsunade. I thought you'd be hungry, so I took the liberty of making you something to eat. Tsunade pulled out a chair and sat. This looks good, Shizune, but you didn't have to go through the trouble of fixing me anything, you know. Shizune brought Tsunade her plate, then took a seat right next to hers. It's the least I can do. After all, you've been working really hard lately. Tsunade swallowed her food before speaking. Yes, I have been working hard, but that's not why you made this breakfast. Shizune, I'm not upset. You don't have to try and cheer me up, okay? Shizune met Tsunade's eyes. I'm sorry, Lee Tsunade. However, you can't deny with all the recent events that you don't deserve something nice. I guess you're right. Anyway, thanks for breakfast. I must be heading to the tower. I also have to do a few things before I leave. Also, have Naruto come to my office immediately. I need to talk to him. Tsunade ordered the younger girl. Yes, Lady Tsunade, I will do that. Shizune went to clean the dishes. Okage office, 10 minutes. Tsunade entered her office to see Jiraiya sitting on the couch. I haven't seen you for a couple of days. Where have you been? Tsunade asked while walking to her desk to take a seat. Jiraiya watched her as she sat. I actually went to the land of sea to see Ryuho. I'm back now, and I think it's time. We tell Naruto. You sure you want to tell him now? I don't know if it's a good idea, Jiraiya. I mean, he deserves to know, but at the same time, the timing isn't right. Besides, I called him here to inform him that he and his guest will be staying with me for the remainder of his stay, Tsunade informed her former teammate. You gave up on convincing him to rejoin the village? Jiraiya asked. No. I haven't given up, but let's face it, you and I both know that Naruto staying in this village is a long shot. After we reveal his lineage to him, he's going to hate this village even more. I don't blame him if he does either. Tsunade said in a voice tinged with anger, thinking about the villagers' treatment of Naruto. Jiraiya spoke. I see you notice the dirty looks that Mai and Yumi have received. Tsunade gave a slight nod. Even though I have tons of paperwork, it doesn't mean that I'm blind. Yes, I have. Seen the looks that some villagers and even some of my own ninjas have given them. I figure that someone will try something while Naruto is away. They won't try anything while Mai and Yumi are at the Hokage's house. I will also have one of the shinobi that doesn't hate Naruto for being the cubic container to protect Yumi and Mai. That's a good idea. I was trying to think of something, but this is perfect, Jiraiya said. A young Chunin walked in the office. Lady Tsunade, Naruto is here like you asked. Send him in. The Chunin stepped aside to let Naruto in. Tell me, Granny, what was so important that you couldn't wait to tell me later? Naruto was obviously irritated at being in the Hokage's office this early. Tsunade looked at Naruto and motioned for him to sit down. Naruto, we have something to tell you. Jiraiya got up off of the couch and walked over to Naruto. He took his hand in the inner part of his jacket and handed Naruto a letter. Naruto, this letter should tell you everything. Before you read this, please understand that this was done for your own protection. Naruto eyed Jiraiya suspiciously. He looked at the letter that Jiraiya handed him. He glanced at Tsunade, then back to Jiraiya. So, what is this about? Naruto. Please just read the letter, okay? Naruto looked at Tsunade and did what she told him to do. He opened the letter and began to read. Dear Naruto, if you're reading this, then that means that I'm dead. It also means that you're old enough and strong enough to take care of yourself, which makes me proud. I'm sorry that I couldn't be there for you, but life is like that sometimes, you know? I think I'm rambling, but what do you say to a son that you will never watch grow? And then you can never be there to protect. I guess it doesn't matter anymore. You can now protect yourself and your loved ones, I'm sure. Sitting here, writing this letter, it pains me. Neither will I or your mother, whom just passed giving birth to you, will be there to watch you take your first steps, to go with you on your first day to the academy, or congratulate you from graduating from the academy. I know you're going to be a great ninja. You know your old man wasn't a slouch either, but I'm sure you will hear all about my accolades in the history books. One of my accomplishments will involve you greatly. Naruto, what I'm about to do is something that I have to do. After I finish writing this letter, I will take you with me to the battlefield and seal the QB inside of you. 
understand that I had to do this. As a Hokage, I couldn't ask anyone in my village to make a sacrifice that I wouldn't make myself. I sincerely hope that people will see you as a hero. However, I'm a realist and a little bit skeptical about this happening. Naruto. Hopefully people will do as I wish, but if they don't, then I want you to be strong. If you hate me for what I'm about to do, then I understand. I just want you to know that there is no one that I would trust to harbor the power of the QB other than my own son. Also, you need to know that your mother and I love you dearly. Don't be mad at Jiraiya, Sarutobi, and Kakashi for not telling you of your heritage. I told them not to tell you until you were ready. Jiraiya was ordered to give you the letter when you were ready for it. Sarutobi was to keep you secret and give you your mother's maiden name. And Kakashi? Well, you should see him after reading this. He is something that I told him to give you. I just want you to know that both of your parents love you and would never leave you unless it was absolutely necessary. I'm giving up everything for my village, and the only thing I want is for everyone to treat my son like the hero that he is, not some monster that they might believe he'd be. You are Naruto Amakaze, son of the fourth Hokage. Protect what is dear to you, and never give up. Never give up. Never go back on your word. That is my Nindo. My ninja way. I hope you can gain something from it. They are calling me, son. I have to leave now. Don't worry, Naruto. I'm always with you. In spirit. Your loving father, Minato Namikaze. Naruto looked at the letter with a look of indifference. Shinade and Jiraiya were trying to gauge his reaction. They were waiting for him to explode any second now, but he never did. Naruto slowly tore his gaze from the letter to focus on Tsunade. How long have you known? Tsunade heard the seriousness in Naruto's tone. I found out a couple months after you left. Naruto turned to Jiraiya with a venomous look in his eyes. You knew all along and you didn't tell me? Why? How could you? Naruto, your father asked me a favor. If I told you, I would be breaking a dying man's wish. Please understand. Jiraiya hoped his student would understand. I understand. I understand that my father sacrificed me to protect a village that shunned me. I was left to fend for myself, and I spent countless nights wondering if my parents abandoned me. All I ever wanted to know was who my parents were. You want to know what the lady at the orphanage told me once? She said that my parents had abandoned me because I was a good-for-nothing monster. Naruto vented his anger. Jiraiya gave Naruto a sympathetic look. I know you suffered, Naruto, but Naruto laughed mockingly. Suffered? What do you know about my suffering? I have a question for you, Jiraiya. Why not take me with you if you felt you owed the fourth? Hmm? Sarutobi ordered that you not leave the village until you became a Genin. I fought, but he wouldn't budge. I'm sorry, Naruto. There is nothing I can do, Jiraiya said to his student. Naruto narrowed his eyes. Excuses. He then took his gaze off Jiraiya and turned to Tsunade. Don't think you're off the hook. You may not have known from the beginning, but why didn't you inform the council? If they knew I was the son of the fourth, then Tsunade cut off Naruto. They already knew. They all knew before me. Naruto was now fuming. You mean to tell me that they know and they still treat me as if I'm a plague? I'm sorry, Naruto. It's hard for them to understand that you aren't the QB. You're just Naruto. Tsunade gave the blonde a smile, hoping it would lighten the mood. Naruto just got up and headed to the door. Where are you going? Jiraiya asked. Kakashi is something that belongs to me. I'm going to get it. Naruto stopped at the door. He then looked back at the Hokage. When this war is completely over and finished, I'm done with Konoha. My family sacrificed too much and has not gotten anything in return. Not even a thank you. I should have charged more, but no amount of money could pay the debt that Konoha owes. Naruto walked out of the office, leaving Tsunade and Jiraiya behind. Tsunade looked at her former teammate. He took that better than I thought. Jiraiya nodded. Yes, he did. He's right, though. Konoha owes him more than they can count. Getting him to stay in the village is going to be harder now, Tsunade. I'm not going to try. The blonde Hokage informed her teammate. Really? 
I thought that you said you wanted him to become a member of this village again. I did, uh, but he, more than anyone, deserves to be happy. Before I contacted him, I'm sure he was happy. This village has been hell for him, and selfish to ask him back knowing that he suffered here for far too long. No, Jiraiya, I'm not going to ask him to stay. Jiraiya looked at the door that Naruto left through and just sighed. <sighs> Should I go make sure Kakashi is still alive or what? Tsunade looked at her teammate. Do what you want. Kakashi is a big boy, he can take care of himself. Jiraiya sat back down on the couch. I guess you're right. So you're leaving for the mist later on today, I see. Yes, the meeting is tomorrow at noon. We should arrive in mist about 7 p.m. today. At least it gives us some time to get adjusted. I just want to put an end to this pathetic war. It seems like we're fighting over nothing, Hokage stated. This war is not what you might think it to be, Sonate. I hate being cryptic, but you will soon find out what this war is all about. Real soon. It's not a quirked an eyebrow at Jirai's comment. You know what this war is about, don't you? Your trip to the land of sea had a purpose. Tell me, Jirai. Why did you go to the land of sea? Jirai responded. My trip to the land of sea was to see Ryuho. I had to find out something that concerns Naruto. However, what I found was something more than I expected. All I'm going to say is keep your eyes open while I'm missed. You will definitely miss something if you don't. Sonata stood up and slammed her hand against the table. What the hell is that supposed to mean, you goddamn- Jiraiya body flickered, leaving a trail of smoke where he was once sitting. God damn it, he knew something. I swear, when I see that frog-loving bastard, I'm going to kick his ass. Sonata sat back in her chair and started to massage her eyebrows. I'm getting too old for this shit. I really need a drink right now. The medic ninja pulled out a glass and poured a cup of sake. Kakashi's apartment building. Naruto was knocking on the door of Kakashi's apartment. The knocks were so loud that the person next door came out. Would you keep it down? Some of us are trying to sleep here. Naruto slowly turned his head to face the person that was telling him to keep it down. Oh Naruto, it's just you. Why the hell are you knocking so loud? Naruto just looked at Ino. She saw the anger in his eyes and wondered what had him up and pissed this early. Ino decided to be nice. Naruto, come in. I'm sure Kakashi isn't in right now and you look like you haven't eaten, so come on in and let me fix you a meal. Naruto thought it over for a second, he decided to eat at her apartment. After all, he could just wait there until Kakashi returned. Naruto walked over and entered Ino's apartment. Ino motioned for Naruto to follow her to the kitchen. She motioned for him to take a seat at the table. Ino went into the fridge to get some stuff to prepare breakfast. Why are you knocking on Kakashi's door so early anyway? He has something that belongs to me, and I want it right now, Naruto informed the Kunoichi. Whatever, Sakura, get your lazy ass out here. Ino looked at Naruto. She had a long night at the hospital, but maybe she can tell you where Kakashi is. Sakura came out of her room in a long white t-shirt and pink slippers on. Rubbing her eyes, she walked into the kitchen. Damn, Ino, you're gonna let me sleep a little longer. Why the hell did you wake me? Ino pointed in Naruto's direction, causing Sakura to turn and face him. She saw Naruto and jumped back slightly. Uh, Naruto, you scared me. What brings you here? I came looking for Kakashi, but when he wasn't there, and Ino offered to make me breakfast. You wouldn't happen to know where he's at, Naruto asked his former teammate. Sakura put her hand on her chin. Well, he's usually training with Sasuke inside this time of the morning. They usually train until about 9. Why are you looking for Kakashi-sensei? Naruto stood up. Like I told Ino, he has something that belongs to me. Naruto body flickered out of the room, leaving the girls behind. Ino tightened her fist. That bastard! How dare he not stay for my breakfast? Doesn't he know that I don't just cook for anyone? How oh, that Naruto's going to pay when I catch him. I'm going to make him this breakfast, cook his ass, and shove it down his throat. You hear that, Naruto? Consider your ass kicked, you bastard! Ino looked around to see that Sakura had already slipped out of the room. This pissed her off even more. Ino just pumped her fist in the air to vent her frustration. Ino looked out of the window and saw Choji walking with Lee. Choji, me, I'm making a big breakfast and can't possibly finish off by myself. Would you guys care to join me? Choji and Lee looked at each other before their mouths filled with saliva. Before Ino knew it, the two Jonians were sitting at our table. Ino forced a smile. Sakura and Naruto, you two are so dead. Team 7 training ground. 
Sasuke was sparring with Sai and getting the better of him. Kakashi was looking at the members of the new Team 7 spar. Sai was losing and Kakashi decided it was enough. Okay Sasuke and Sai, that's enough. We're done sparring for today. Sasuke looked at Kakashi and narrowed his eyes. He was pissed at the fact that Kakashi stopped him from pummeling Sai some more. Sasuke's attitude changed when he saw Naruto walking towards them. Kakashi saw the sudden mood change in Sasuke. This caused him to turn around. What Kakashi saw was a pissed off looking Naruto. As Naruto walked up, Kakashi waved. Hey Naruto, how's everything? Cut the formalities, Kakashi. I've come to get what rightfully belongs to me. Sasuke stepped up. Looks like I might get a good spar, unless you're scared to fight, dope. Naruto cut his eyes at Sasuke. I don't have time to use you as a punching bag right now, Sasuke. Maybe some other time. Naruto turns attentions back to Kakashi. You know why I'm here, Kakashi. Let's go. Now. Uh, I guess Jiraiya told you. Well, Naruto, for what it's worth, I'm sorry I didn't inform you of this news. Let's go. I think I should give you what is rightfully yours, Kakashi said. Naruto and Kakashi walked off, with Kakashi leading the way. Sai walked up to Sasuke, who was still mad at Naruto. So, that was Naruto's Maki, eh? He doesn't look strong, but I guess he's something if he kicked your ass. When Sasuke turned around to face Sai, he had disappeared, leaving Sasuke alone. Sasuke decided to go home and shower up. Maybe a little R&R &R would cool him down, just a little. Ten minutes later, in Kakashi's apartment, Kakashi motioned for Naruto to sit. However, he opted to stand. Kakashi shrugged and went back to his room. The copy ninja came back with a scroll and a kunai. He handed the two items to Naruto. Naruto looked at the items curiously, trying to figure out their purpose. Kakashi spoke. I have no idea what's in the scroll. However, that kunai is a special kunai. Your father used that kunai to perform arguably the greatest technique ever created. Naruto, do you know why your father was called the Yellow Flash? Naruto shook his head. Kakashi began to explain. The fourth was famous for a technique called the Flying Raijin Jutsu. With this technique, he could move at the speed of light. This technique made him feared throughout all of the ninja villages. Your father was a great man, Naruto. I'm truly sorry you had to find out this way. Naruto just looked at Kakashi. Kakashi couldn't tell what Naruto was thinking, which made him uneasy. The silence thickened. After a minute, Naruto spoke. What was your connection with the fourth, Kakashi? I was his student. Naruto's eyes narrowed at the copy ninja. Before he did something to Kakashi, Naruto just turned around and walked out of his apartment. Kakashi knew that fact made Naruto mad. He knew that Naruto felt that he should have taught him. After all, his father did teach Kakashi. Naruto just walked down the hall. Ino opened her door to let Lee and Choji out. Lee and Choji turned to see Naruto walk past them. Lee called out to the blonde. Naruto, how's it going? Lee got no response from the blonde. Lee looked dejected. I wonder what happened to Naruto. I don't know, but he was looking for Kakashi earlier, you know, stated. Whatever it is, he looks really pissed, Choji said. Pissed is an understatement. He's mad at me for keeping a secret from him. Kakashi informed the trio, who jumped at his presence. Ino's brow elevated slightly. What did you do? I knew who his parents were, and I kept the secret from him. A copy ninja informed the trio. Why would you do that? Ino said with a slightly elevated voice. Kakashi just turned around and walked back to his apartment. When he closed the door, the trio looked at each other. Shoji, Ino, and Lee took off to find out what was up with Naruto. Naruto was walking down the streets, looking at the scroll and the kunai that Kakashi had given him. He was studying it. He had to admit that craftsmanship was top notch. Naruto put the kunai in his pouch. He decided to go to a place where he could think. He decided to go to the one place that would bring him comfort in this village. The top of the fourth said. He laughed at the irony. I guess the kids will always stake out their parents when they need comfort. Naruto went to sit on top of the fourth head to think things over. Ino, Lee, and Shoji were looking for the blonde. Instead of finding him, they ran to Asma. Hey guys, did any of you see Kurenai? Lee shook his head. No, Asma, we did not. Did you happen to see Naruto? No, I haven't. Did you guys check his hotel? If he's not there, then I would check the Hokage's tower or the Ichiraku ramen stand. If you guys don't find him there, then I don't know what to tell you. By the way, why are you guys looking for Naruto? Questioned the son of the third. Ino spoke. 
Well, he just came out of Kakashi's apartment, mad. He had a weird kunai with him, and a scroll. The mentioning of the kunai caught Asuma's attention. Wait, did you say he had a weird kunai with him? Yes, it's quite irregular. It had two pointy hilts at the base of the kunai. Why, what's so important about a kunai? You know, asked her former instructor. Asuma tried to choose his next words carefully. It's complicated, you know. If you see Kunai, tell her that I'm looking for her. Asuma walked off, leaving the group behind. So, Naruto finally knows. I'm surprised that he didn't beat Kakashi in the ground. But the day is still early. I better find Kunai. I hope she's okay. Top of the Hokage Monument. Naruto sat on the fourth head, processing the new information he just received. He just kept asking himself, why didn't anyone tell him? He already knew the answer, but it wasn't good enough for him. Naruto just looked into the sky. The only thing is why didn't the third tell him he had parents? The old man could have said that his parents died fighting the Kibi. Anything would have been better than growing up thinking he was abandoned by them. Naruto stood up on top of his father's head and looked down at the village. He just shook his head. He decided to go back to the hotel and spend a couple of hours with Yumi before he headed to Mist. As he was walking away, he stopped and looked at the sky. I wonder, I wonder how different things would have been if you were alive. 11 a.m. Konoha. You know Choji and Lee decided to give up on finding Naruto. They went to the hotel right after they left Asuma. Yumi informed them that Naruto wasn't there. They checked Ichiraku and found out that Ayame hadn't seen him either. The group walked side by side in defeat. Choji broke the silence. That guy is hard as hell to find. Yes, Naruto is hard to track down. Lee stayed in an agreement with his friend. We have to find out what's wrong with Naruto, guys. We can't give up. I know he's going with the Hokage today. We can talk to him before he leaves, Eno you know, told the boys. Uh, what the hell are you babbling about, Eno? I bet as troublesome as usual. Eno turned around to see Shikamaru and Tamari walking side by side. She glared at her teammate. Everything's always troublesome for you, but if you must know, you're looking for Naruto. This caught Shikamaru's interest. Why are you looking for Naruto? Joji spoke. We caught him leaving Akashi's house after Inu was kind enough to serve me and Lee a delicious breakfast. He was pretty mad at Kakashi. Shikamaru thought it over for a minute. Hmm, that's interesting. Ino raised her index finger. Yes, that's what I thought too. He was knocking at Kakashi's door around 8 this morning. I told him to come in so I could fix him something to eat, but he left when Sakura told him where Kakashi was. About 10 to 20 minutes later, we see him storming out of Kakashi's place with a scroll and a weird kunai. Tell me, Ino, how does this kunai look? Shikamaru had an idea what happened, but still asked Ino to confirm it. Well, it had two points at the end of the hilt. Why are you asking me this? Asuma sensei asked me this as well. What the hell is so special about a kunai? Ino asked the lazy Jonin. It's complicated, Ino, and too troublesome to explain. Frankly, I don't have the time to start from the beginning, but I will say this. The kunai that Naruto had should answer any questions you may have. Anyway, from what you tell me and what I've concluded, I would warn you guys to let Naruto be. If anything, you might just piss him off even more. So don't try and find out from him. Look underneath the underneath. Shikamaru and Tamari walked off, leaving the trio looking at each other. Tamari looked at Shikamaru. Now I'm curious, what the hell is the connection between Naruto and Weird Kunai? The Kunai, let's just say, is his heritage, Shikamaru answered. You're being cryptic. What the hell does that mean? Tamari was getting slightly angry. I can't tell you. The only person who can it should tell you is Naruto. Tamari, I have to find Naruto. You should head back to the hotel. What? No, I'm coming. There is something that you're not telling me, and I want to know. Would you just go back to the hotel? Shikamaru raised his voice, causing Tamari to jump. He calmed and spoke again. I'm sorry for raising my voice, but please Tamari, this is important. I need to confirm something, and this is a village secret. She looked in his eyes and saw that he was serious about this. Okay, but you're going to make this up to me when I get back, Shikamaru sighed. Uh, what is it I have to do exactly? She whispered something into Shikamaru's ear, which caused his eyes to bulge out of his head. You want me to do that? What, you have a problem with that? She asked. No, not at all. 
I thought you were going to have me do something else, but this is great. It's not troublesome. Nope, not troublesome at all. I figure you would say that. Well, I guess I'll see you before we set off. Later. She kissed him on the lips, then walked off. Shikamaru headed in the direction of the hotel that Naruto was staying at, thinking happy thoughts. 11.45 p.m. Hotel. Naruto kissed Yumi. I have to go. Naruto turned around to open the door, but Yumi grabbed his arm and turned him back around. Naruto, when you get back, we'll talk more about this, okay? I really don't want to talk about it anymore, but if it'll make you feel any better, then I guess it couldn't hurt, Naruto said. Naruto, it's good for you to let it out and not bottle things up. I just wanted to be happy, that's all, Yumi said while caressing his cheek. I know. Yumi, I have to go. I'll see you when I get back. Naruto kissed her one last time. He then left the hotel. Naruto was on his way to the docks when he spotted Shikamaru leaning against the wall of the building. So, you finally decided to head to the ship. Let's walk together. That's alright. I'll walk alone, Naruto told Shikamaru. What Ino tells me, Kakashi has given you your father's kunai. Naruto froze. Naruto didn't turn around when he spoke. How did you know? Shikamaru walked up to Naruto. Let's walk and talk. Naruto nodded and they continued to the docks. Shikamaru spoke. I put two and two together. I found out a couple of weeks after your banishment. I wondered why are you being banished for a mission that wasn't your fault. To me, it seemed like the council had it out for you. And that got me thinking. Naruto gave Shikamaru a side glance. Are you going to tell me how you figured it out? Well, it wasn't hard if you opened your eyes. The thing I was trying to figure out was why did all the adults hate you? So, I proceeded to find out, and that led me to more than I ever expected. When I confronted Tsunade, I told her that I thought back to a time when Hinata asked Ruka about your birthday. You came to a class sporting goggles the next day, I believe. When I thought back to that time, I put it all together. I figured that you were hated for something that had to do with the Nine Tails, Shikamaru stated. Naruto spoke once more. Still, you're not telling me how you figured it out. Shikamaru spoke. You're right. I guess in the interest of time, I should speed it up. Anyway, I asked Tamari about Gara's demon. And how come uh, they couldn't kill it? When the fourth killed the QB. Let me guess, she told you that there is no way for a human to kill a demon, Naruto stated. Yes, exactly what she said. Then, I put it together. Your weird chakra at the tuning funnels, the whisker marks, and the hatred you received, it was because you're the jailer of the QB. That led me to ask, why would the force sail a QB inside of you? Based on the stories that everyone tells about him being a noble man, I figured he wouldn't ask anyone else to sacrifice their child, which is why he sacrificed his own. Naruto shook his head. You're too smart for your own good, Shikamaru. You should just let things be. Shikamaru shrugged his shoulders. It was troublesome, but as the leader of the mission to retrieve Sasuke, I figure the blame should be passed all around, not just to you. In fact, I believe nobody should have been blamed. He wasn't kidnapped. He went out on his own accord, and you suffered for his actions. It sucks that he's going to be a Hokage. I know you would have been a great one. Maybe you would have, but we will never know. I hate asking, but could you do me a favor, Shikamaru? Naruto asked the pineapple hair Jonin. What is it? Shikamaru asked the fourth son. You mean her mother had been getting funny looks from the villagers and some of the shinobi here. If you could, would you? I'll keep a close eye on them, Naruto. Shikamaru answered the question Naruto was about to ask. The two arrived at the docks to see Gara, Sasuke, Sakura, Konkuro, Tsunade, Neji, Kashi, Tamari, and four Anbu guards. Naruto and Shikamaru walked up to the crowd. Naruto walked past them and went onto the ship. Everyone looked at Naruto, then back at Shikamaru. What? It's too troublesome to explain. I'm sure Kakashi and Lady Tsunade knows why he's acting the way he's acting. Anyway, I have paperwork to do. He proceeded to walk off. He turned back to look at Tamari. Don't do anything troublesome. She smiled. I'm trying not to do anything troublesome. Cry, baby. Shikamaru turned around and headed towards the administration building. Tsunade motioned for everyone to get on the ship. After 15 minutes, the ship sailed off. Destination, Mist Village. 7 p.m. Water Country. The ship docked in the Mist Village's docks. During the whole ride, Naruto, Neji, Gara, and Sasuke were off by themselves. Tamari, Konkuro, and Sakura were entertaining each other. Tsunade and Kakashi were in her private quarters until a crew member informed them that they had arrived. 
Around five minutes later, Sonati and Gara, dressed in their respective Kage outfits, were greeted by a couple of mist ninjas. Welcome, uh, Lady Hokage, Lord Kazakage. We've been expecting you and your guests. If you will, please follow us. The group followed the mist ninjas. One of the mist ninjas spoke. Lady Hokage, Lord Kazakage, you and your guests have been invited to have dinner with the Mizukage, the Rai Kage, and the Suchi Kage, and their respective entourages. Sonati spoke. If you would gladly inform me how many guests are with the Rai Kage and the Suchi Kage, the ninja turned back to Sonati. Well, there are four guests that came with the Suchi Kage, and five guests that came with the Rai Kage. They've been awaiting your arrival. The group of Miss Ninjas led them to a nice restaurant. When they entered, the group from the leaf in the sand saw that they, along with the group from the mist, the group from the rock, and the group from the cloud, were the only ones there. The Mizukage stood up. Welcome, guests. How are you doing, Lady Hokage? Lord Kazakage. Sonati spoke up. I'm great. And yourself? I'm good as well. And you all please sit. There are seats all over. He motioned for them to sit. Everyone took a seat at the table. Naruto could feel the stairs directly at him. They were coming from all the cloud ninjas and rock ninjas. The waiter came to the table and asked everyone for their dinner orders. Once the waiter took their orders, he left. The Mizukake spoke. So, I see you brought the golden fox, Sasuke Uchiha, the copy ninja Kakashi. A Hyuga, and I'm not familiar with this lovely lady. Lady Hokage, who is she, if you don't mind me asking? Sonati spoke up. This is Sakura Haruno, my apprentice. The Rakage spoke. Bringing this many skilled shinobi makes one think you're preparing to kill someone. Sonati looked at the Rakage. Well, you never know what type of protection you might need. It's a dangerous world we live in. I guess you're right, so why bring Uzumaki? He is an elite ninja, is he? The Rakage asked. Gara spoke. Doesn't matter, his presence here is really none of your concern. The Rakage narrowed his eyes at Gara. I suppose it isn't. I'm just curious, that's all. The Tsujikage spoke. I see you're not worried about being attacked, Lord Kazakage. To only travel two people, he must be pretty confident. Conqueror spoke. Gara doesn't need us here. The fact of the matter is, we signed on for this mission. It's not like your forces are a real threat anyway. A rock ninja with a bald head and brown eyes clenched up his fist on the table. He wanted to pound that makeup wearing freak. His anger turned into confusion when he heard laughter coming from the Tsujikage. <laughs> yeah, I suppose you're right. It's not like any of us really need people to guard us. I mean, what type of Kages would we be if we needed to be guarded? Naruto was getting bored. The dinner, in his mind, was pointless, and the stares that he was receiving just made him matter. A female rock ninja who looked to be in her late 20s looked at Naruto. So, Uzumaki, did you kill any rock ninjas lately? Naruto looked at the girl. Doesn't matter, I'm sure you want to kill me. If you're going to try anything, I would seriously think about it. I already took out over 100 of your ninjas, effortlessly I might add. So, what do you think? The girl eyed Naruto with anger. There's no need for that now, Uzumaki. Your time will come. Naruto didn't ever respond to the girl. Cohen looked at the girl who spoke. It seems that your village is always having problems with blondes, eh? The Tsuchikage gave a slight laugh. True. Last time, it was the Yellow Flash. Now, it's the Golden Fox. Not only are they blondies, they kind of look alike as well. He wouldn't happen to be his son. Sonata and Kakashi didn't let their emotions betray them, and neither did Naruto. Naruto stayed quiet for a couple of minutes before speaking. The only thing that we have in common is our eye and hair color. The comparison stopped there. I know if he had a kid, it would have been known, the Tsujikage stated. If he did have a kid, what did you plan on doing to that child? Ninji asked. Narakage looked at Ninji. So, that Hyuga speaks. Ninji glanced at him, and then back to the Tsujikage, awaiting his answer. Well, to be quite blunt with you, the child would have been killed. The yellow flash's skill was beyond belief. Sonate slammed the table. Do you think your pathetic village could have done anything to belief? If Naruto here was able to kill all the ninjas effortlessly, was it Naruto? Effortlessly, Naruto confirmed. Effortlessly. Do you think you could have even killed a fourth kid if he had one? Sonate demanded. Yes, the Tsuchikage stated. Sasuke smirked the Tsuchikage. You forget that the Uchiha clan and the Hyuga clan and protect the leaf. Let's say he had a kid. You would have gone nowhere near the child. 
you have been signing your own death warrants. The mighty Uchiha clan, I forgot. Wasn't your clan wiped out by a single ninja? A rock ninja with black hair and brown eyes who was clearly older than Kakashi, but younger than Tsunade said. You're right, the Uchiha clan was wiped out by one lone ninja. But if you must know, that ninja was an Uchiha. You will do well to remember that, Sasuke responded with a smirk. The Mizukage spoke up. Come people, let's all try to get along. Isn't that why we're all here? Naruto spoke. The reason we are here is because Sasuke, Sakura, and I just waltzed into a ninja base in the Land of Lightning and recovered some secret documents. Isn't that right, Raikage? The Raikage looked at Tsunade. He had spunk, doesn't he? And there was this leaf ninja who also had spunk. He pulled out a black headband with a symbol on it and tossed it to Tsunade. It seems spunk was all he had. Tsunade analyzed the headband. She looked on the back to see something, and that she had wrote years ago. The inscription said, Become strong. Protect what is dear to you. She gripped the headband and looked at the Raikage with hatred in her eyes. The Raikage noticed the look and continued. Poor kid, really. He would have been a promising ninja if his parents had taught him better. Kakashi knew that would set Tsunade off. He placed his hand on her balled up fist that was under the table. She looked at Kakashi. He just shook his head. Tsunade collected herself. Well, Lord Raikage, I'm sure you were so kind enough to return the headband of a leaf ninja. Don't mention it, the Raikage said eh, with a grin. If you would excuse me, I lost my appetite, Mizukage. If you would have someone show me and my guests to our hotel rooms, I would be grateful. The Mizukage motioned for one of his guards to escort Tsunade and her guests. Garo stood up. Tamari and Konkuro quickly followed. He looked at the Mizukage. Do I even need to ask? Mizukage motioned for one of his guards to escort the Kazukage and his guests to their hotel rooms. When they got outside, Naruto left the group. Sakura yelled at him. Naruto, where are you going? He didn't even look back to acknowledge her. He just kept walking. Tsunade looked at Sasuke and Neji. Go follow him. I know he can take care of himself, but those ninjas were looking at him funny in there. I'm quite sure that they will try something. Sakura, Kakashi, follow me. Gara looked at Tamari and Kankuro. Did you pick up on that vibe that I picked up in there? Tamari responded. Yes, I did. There's something out of place. Gara, what do you want us to do? Kankuro asked. Gara thought about Kankuro's question. I would have said follow Naruto, but he's more than capable. Besides, that wouldn't give me insight on what is wrong here. I want you guys to watch that guy from the cloud with the blue hair and that bald-headed guy from the rock. Do not engage those two in combat. Just observe and report your findings back to me, okay? Naruto was walking through the village. Young Mist Ninjas watched him as he walked by. Older Mist Ninjas were whispering about who he was. Naruto paid them no mind. He was still coming to grips with the fact that he was the fourth son. Naruto turned down a deserted street. He was deep in thought. I wonder who my mother was. I'm sure that perverted bastard knows. Kakashi would definitely know. I'll ask him about it. I have to ask him, Snade or Jiraiya, about something in the scroll. I'm sure they know the location of the Namikaze house. Naruto's thoughts were broken when shurikens flew at him. Naruto flipped and avoided them. He looked up to see the female cloud ninja. She gave him a sinister smile. Naruto Uzumaki, today is the day that you die. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Kimoko Sucho, third strongest in the cloud. We can do this two ways. One, you can lie down and die. Or two, you can fight and die. The choice is yours. Naruto turned around to walk away from her. Get lost. I have a lot of shit in my mind. If you're the third strongest in the cloud, then your village is pathetic. The Kanoichi appeared in front of him. You're not going anywhere. She threw a punch to Naruto's face. Instead of dodging it, Naruto took it full force. His head snapped back to the right. She smirked. But his laughter caused her to raise an eyebrow in question. Naruto slowly turned his head back to face her. <laughs> you really want to kill me, don't you? Okay. I gave you a chance to leave here alive. Naruto blurred out of sight. The Kanoichi from the cloud couldn't believe he was this fast. She was looking around to find Naruto. A fist connected to the left side of her jaw, sending her flying and skidding to the ground. She jumped up quickly to see where he went. A sharp kick was planted in her chin, sending her in the air. While in the air, a kick in the back from one of his clones sent her upward. 
Another kick followed from her left side, which was followed by a kick from her right side, which was followed by a kick to her stomach, sent her towards the sky. She looked up to see Naruto coming down with a kick aimed at her head. She knew that she couldn't dodge it. The kick landed, sending her crashing to the ground. Naruto formed her Rasengan in his hand as he approached her slowly. I was walking, trying to mind my business, but no, you come here and disturb my peace because of some grudge. I'm sure you have your reasons, but you really picked the wrong fucking time to mess with me. I gave you an out, but it looks like the cloud is going back, minus one. Naruto's killer intent scarred the Konoichi from the cloud. Before Naruto got close to her, lightning struck the ground, causing him to jump back. He dispersed through a Sengon and looked up to see four more cloud Jonians. Naruto looked at the cloud ninja with blue hair. Something about that guy made Naruto wondered. He then looked at the other three, one of whom, Kadon, decided to go help Komoko. The other remaining two stood beside the man with blue hair. The one on the right was close to seven feet. He had long black hair, black eyes, and a complexion similar to Naruto's. The other man, the one on the left, was the same height as the one in the middle. His brown hair and emerald eyes were fixed in the blonde before him. The one in the middle motioned for the two to go next to Komoko. The two men landed next to Komoko and Kadon. Komoko placed an arm around Kadon's shoulder for support. Naruto saw the other ninja move from his position on the roof to in front of Naruto. The blue haired ninja smiled at Naruto. I'm sorry for attacking you. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Koen Nenshu. Naruto Uzumaki. Koen continued. This tall gentleman here is Roba. The brown haired gentleman over there is Daki and the guy holding up the girl has caught on. Why did she attack me? Naruto asked Cohen. Well, you killed her father, the clouds, red lightning. She just wanted to avenge her father's death. It doesn't matter, people die and fight all the time. We can't let a little thing like revenge consume us, Cohen informed Naruto. If it's any consolation, her father tried to kill me. I was only protecting myself. He did, however, put up a good fight, Naruto said emotionlessly. Cohen smiled. I'm sure he did. Well, Naruto, you won't have to worry about dying here today. I'll kill you another time. Naruto smiled. <laughs> Why do you not do it now and get it over with? Cohen responded. It isn't the time for that. However, my men here will rough you up a bit while I watch. If you don't mind, that is. Naruto got into a fighting stance. I need to let off some steam anyway. I can use these two idiots as punching bags. The two men flanking Cohen charge Naruto. But two kunai implanted in the ground caused him to stop mid-stride. Naruto turned around to see Sasuke and Neji standing over him with their arms folded. Sasuke smirked at Naruto. You disappoint me, dope. I was expecting to come here and find five cloud ninjas dead or heavily injured. But what I find is one girl injured and four guys getting ready to kick your ass. Pathetic. Naruto turned his gaze back on the cloud ninjas. Well, if you waited a bit longer, you would have gotten a good show. You interfered because you wanted a piece of the action. Sasuke closed his eyes with a grin in his face. <laughs> I guess you're right. Since you're too scared to fight me, I guess I can use these fools for sport. Sasuke and Neji disappeared from the roof and appeared right next to Naruto. Neji looked at the ninjas from the cloud. Unless you want to die, I suggest you turn around and go about your business. Daki narrowed his eyes at Neji and Sasuke. This doesn't involve you, Hyuga, or you, Uchiha. Actually, it does involve the Uchiha as well, Cohen stated. What involves me? Cohen began to explain. Well, you see, I was telling Naruto that I was going to be the one to kill him. I also made you one of the people that I want to kill. You should feel honored. It's not every day that you get someone with my skill to play the role of Executioner. Sasuke activated his Sharingan. Oh, Executioner. Well, I suggest you kill me now, if you can. Cohen smiled at the raven-haired man in front of him. Not now, Sasuke. You will die soon, that much I promise. Well, it looks like I won't get to see how strong you are, Naruto. It's okay, though. I'm sure I'll find out shortly. Kadon, Doggy, Roba, Komoko, we're leaving. Farewell, Naruto, Sasuke, and Hyuga. We will definitely meet again. The cloud ninjas disappeared in a cloud of smoke. Neji turned to Naruto. What was that all about? Naruto spoke. I don't know. The girl attacked me first. When I went in to finish her off, the other four appeared. The other three seemed to be strong. Not very, but still strong in their own right. But that one with blue hair. Something is off about him. Sasuke looked at the spot where the cloud ninjas disappeared. 
You're right. Well, we probably won't find out right now. The best thing to do is you just watch and observe, Nitty stated. A clapping sound that caused all of them to turn around. What they saw was a man sitting at the edge of the roof with a black cloak. The man with a black cloak spoke. That would be the best thing to do, Hyuga. Oh, and before you guys get defensive, I'm not an enemy. In fact, I'm an ally. Sasuke narrowed his eyes at the man. We don't need you as an ally. Get lost, loser. Are all Uchiha's arrogant? It doesn't matter. I'm here just to compliment you guys on your course of action. But I'm here actually for you, Naruto. The man in the black cloak stated, It seems that Ryuho was right about you. The mentioning of a sensei caught Naruto's attention. You know Ryuho sensei? Yes, I know Ryuho. I was actually at his house yesterday, the cloaked man said. The man in the cloak removed his hood to reveal his black hair and his golden brown eyes. His look was nothing short of serious. Naruto, I'm here to pass along a message. Well, I'm here to pass along two messages. The first is to you, Naruto. Ryuho said it's time you take the trials. I'm sure you know what that means. The next message is to be relayed to the Hokage. Tell her sake is not water. I also think she would be pleased to know the phoenix has risen from the ashes. The group's eyes bugged. They knew who this man was. Naruto was the first to break the silence. You're Senseru, aren't you? So you know who I am. Just be sure to relay the message. Oh, Naruto, what level are your gravity seals on? Senseru asked. How did you know I had gravity seals? Naruto asked. I spoke to Ryuho. Remember? Senseru stated. Naruto responded. I'm currently at time 3. I can only assume that you have them, so what level are you on? Sensor smirked. I'm currently on time 6. Later, guys. Sensor disappeared in a blue flame. His voice echoed throughout the area. Remember, I'm watching you guys. Naruto, Sasuke, and Neji knew that they had to go back and inform Tsunade of this info. 10 minutes later at the hotel. Sasuke and Neji informed Tsunade of everything that transpired. Tsunade was in utter shock but happy at the same time. Sakura spoke. So, did he say anything else? Neji shook his head. He didn't say anything else. I'm not really worried about him. I'm more worried about that cloud Joni with the blue hair. Sakura was curious. Why is that Neji? Do you believe he's that strong? Akashi spoke. Something is definitely off with him. I hate to admit it, but I'm certain that I probably couldn't beat him. Really, Kakashi-sensei? This guy must be something then. Sakura thought out loud. Sasuke looked at Sakura. He's not that impressive, but he is definitely stronger than the rest of those cloud idiots. He wants to kill me and the dope. By the way, where the hell is he? Naruto was on the balcony of Sinati's room. He was looking down at the village. Sinati decided to join Naruto. Naruto, are you okay? I'm fine. Naruto kept his gaze on the village. Sinati gave him a sad look, then turned to walk away. Granny, can I ask you something? Sinati turned back around to face Naruto, who was still looking down at the village. Sure, Naruto. What do you want? My mother. I know about my father. But what was my mother's name? Naruto asked. Sinati gave him a joy smile. Her name was Kushina Uzumaki. Her maiden name was Uzumaki, which is where you got your name. I didn't know your mother that well. You would have to ask Akashi about her. He knows more. However, I can tell you what I do know about her. Would you tell me what you know? Well, Naruto, I met her only a handful of times in my life, but she was a very nice lady. She had long, beautiful red hair and mesmerizing blue eyes. Your mother was a beautiful woman. She seemed nice the times we met. Every time we met, she was scolding your father about eating too much ramen. Sonata laughed at the memory of the woman chastising the fourth. She walked up and placed a hand on Naruto's shoulder. Naruto, I am truly sorry that we told you now, but it was the perfect time to do so. If it were my decision, you would have found out when you were able to talk. Naruto, I'm not going to ask you to join the village again. You have truly sacrificed too much and helped the village numerous times. If it means anything, I want you to know that I'm proud of you. Naruto continued to look at the village. I know you are. Naruto looked away from the city and turned to face Tsunade. Granny, there's something in the scroll Kashi gave me about the Namikaze house. Do you know where it's located? When we get back to the village, I will show you personally. 
Sonata turned the gaze upon the mist village. Naruto turned his eye back in the village as well. The two stood there in silence. One thinking of what to say to her son when she finally saw him. The other worrying about what the message given to him by Senjuru and the scroll Kakashi had given him. So, Ryuho Sensei wants me to take the trials. If he's willing to pass his sword down to me, something bad is going to happen soon. I also have to go to the Namakaze house to get the scroll as mentioned in the scroll Kakashi gave me. Naruto took the kunai out of his pouch and examined it. Maybe that scroll will give me how to perform the flying raijin. The scroll you gave Kakashi was too cryptic, father. What is it that you're trying to tell me? Naruto looked at the full moon. The days ahead of him were going to challenge him like he had never been challenged before. That much he knew for certain. 5 a.m. Destination unknown. Hinata was sleeping in the bed in the room provided to her by Naya. The young lady was comfortable. The expression was shown in her face during sleep. All of this was about to change. Naya dumped a bucket of ice water on Hinata. This jolted her out of her sleep. Hinata sat up looking around with a vacant expression. She looked up to see Naya standing at the foot of the bed with her arms folded and an aggravated facial expression. I thought I said five in the morning. Get dressed and meet me in the third room on the right of this floor. We will start with basic ceiling techniques. Yes, Naya Sensei. Naya walked off with a smile on her face. Naya Sensei. That has really a nice ring to it. A really nice ring to it. A couple of minutes passed. Hinata walked into a nicely painted yellow room with a wooden floor. Hinata was looking around the room, which had cases of shells on all of the room walls. All of the shells were filled with neatly stacked scrolls. Hinata continued to study the room until Naya walked back in with floor mats for both her and Hinata. The Hyuga girl also noticed that the woman was dressed differently from when she saw her about 5 minutes ago. Naya's hair now was in a ponytail with two long bangs on the side. She now had on a purple helter top with purple spandex to match. She didn't have on the sandals most ninjas wore. She had on black shoes, kung fu rubber toe, with white ankle warmers that were more fashionable than guys. Naya placed the mats on the floor. She positioned them so that she and Hinata would be facing each other. She motioned for Hinata to sit down while she went to one of the shelves and grabbed a bunch of scrolls. The seal mistress placed the seals on the side of her and Hinata. She then took a seat on the mat. Okay, Hinata, I will start off by asking. What is the purpose of seals? Naya asked. Well, according to what we learned from the academy and little information I read about seals, I would have to say that they can be used to seal stuff in other objects. They can be used as a form of control. Hinata said as if she wasn't sure that the two answers she gave were correct. Naya raised her index finger and responded. That is correct. The seals are used for other things as well. Seals can be used to contain other seals. Seals can also be used to grant power. A perfect example would be the curse seal mark. This curse seal mark gives power to the user, but it also destroys the body if it is used for too long. This is the reason why it is a kinjutsu. A curse seal that is. Hinata, have you ever heard of the fourth famous technique? Hinata looked down, searching for something her father once said. She looked back up to meet Naya's eyes. Yes. It was called a uh, Hiroshin, if I'm not mistaken. My father told me it made him so fast that he was a force to be reckoned with. I don't know too much about it though. Well, he used seals to teleport himself from location to location. He created the technique himself, which is quite a feat. Anyway, the technique works like a summoning. The marker, whether it is a sticker or a kunai, the person can summon themselves to the location of the marker. Do you understand what I'm saying, Hinata? Naya asked the girl in front of her. Hinata nodded. Yes, I understand completely, Naya Sensei. If you don't mind me asking, what are we going to do today? Naya placed her hand on her knees. Well, I want you to get a basic understanding of seals and the possibilities of their use. We will work on basic sealing. Do you know how to seal weapons and scrolls, Hinata? No, my friend Tenten, who is a Jonin, knows how to though. I would love to learn how to. I thought that it would be beneficial. Hinata answered, honestly. 
it would be very useful indeed. Many people fail to realize how much items you can carry if they were sealed. Okay, let's get started. Naya said the last part with enthusiasm. The seal mistress picked up a blank scroll that was on the side of her. She laid it flat in front of her. Naya then took a brush and dipped it in the ink that was also on the side of her. She began to write weird symbols and characters on the blank paper. When she was finished, she took another scroll and opened it. She summoned the weapons that were sealed inside of it. She placed a Fuma Shuriken, a kunai, and a sword inside of the paper. She looked up at Hinata. You see, this scroll isn't that long, so it limits the amount of items that can be sealed inside of it. For a scroll of this size, it would take about 3 items. However, it is possible to seal items, but that would require a very long scroll. That would benefit the characters required. Now, that I have placed the items inside the scroll, I will do the necessary hand seals. Watch carefully. They are as followed. Monkey, serpent, horse, hare, bird, boar, and tiger. Once you do these hand seals, gather your chakra in your hands, and make sure that your chakra spreads throughout the paper. You not to perform the seal slowly. Once she finished, Hinata gathered chakra in her hands. She then placed her hands on the scroll and proceeded to spread the chakra through the scroll. When Hinata finished spreading the chakra, the symbols and the characters in the paper started to glow. Soon after the weapons began to glow, Hinata saw the weapons disappear. New, big, and bolder characters formed within the symbols on the paper. Naya clapped. Congratulations, you know how to seal weapons. Hinata was happy at her accomplishment. She decided to ride the wave confidence flowing through her. Naya Sensei, I would like to try another, but this time, I would like to draw the characters and the necessary symbols. Looking at what you did, I have a general idea of what to do. Naya reached to her side to give Hinata another blank scroll. She then stood up. Well, I'm going to do a couple of things, so you practice on that. You can use those weapons to practice sealing items. I'll be back around 11.30. If you need more things to seal, the shelves next to the door on the left has weapons and other items sealed inside of it. You can open those seals to remove the weapons. The shelves are color-coded, as well as the scrolls to indicate which belongs to which. The weapons are too. I expect you to reseal all the weapons you use in the rightful scrolls. Later. Hinata nodded and started drawing characters and symbols on the scrolls. Naya was at the door, then she stopped and turned to look at Hinata, who was oblivious of her gaze. The girl got it in one try. It took me two tries. But I was about five years younger than she is. But still, she picked it up fairly fast. I wonder how far she'll advance in a month. She'll probably be an above average beginner. I guess only time will tell. Sea Country Inside a dojo in the compound, Naruto stood before about 20 to 25 clan members. Ryuho was in the center of the group. He stepped forward and spoke. I have been the wielder of the Heaven's Blade since I was 23. I call you all here to tell you I have selected Naruto to take the trials. Should he succeed, he will become the Blade's new wielder. The males ranging from 24 to 60 looked at one another, then back at Ryuho. The eldest male spoke. Ryuho, shouldn't a member of our house take the trials? No offense to Naruto, but he is only an honorary member of this clan. Ryuho answered. Someone in this house has already taken the trials. Shinji, my nephew, the strongest in the clan, only second to me, took the trials a year ago and failed. You didn't know this because you weren't selected to be part of the trials. I don't see another wielder coming along for years. I believe that Naruto is the one to wield the sword. Shinji stepped forward. I did indeed failed. My uncle's logic is correct. Although I would love to have become the wielder, the sword didn't accept me. There is no harm in Naruto trying to become a wielder. If he succeeds, then he was meant to wield it. If he doesn't, then Lord Ryuho remains the wielder until someone worthy comes along to wield it. The old man nodded. I see. I guess you're right, Shinji. Ryuho addressed everyone. The trials will begin today at noon. His eyes focused on Naruto. Naruto, there will be three tests. The first one will test your will. The second one will test your faith. And the last test will test your heart. To wield the sword, you must pass all three tests. I suggest you get some rest, Naruto. But knowing you, you will probably go do something else. Either way, I want you here by noon. Ryuho looked at his clansmen. You guys go prepare the cave. You are all dismissed. Everyone exited except for Shinji and Ryuho. 
Shinji walked up to his uncle. Uncle, do you believe that he can pass the trials? I don't know, Shinji. We will see you soon. It really depends on him to tell you the truth. The test will show everyone, Naruto included, what he is truly made of. 11 a.m. Konoha. Senderu was standing before Shinade, Homura, and Koharu. Shinade addressed her son. Senderu, you have been thought to be dead for the last 18 years. A shinobi whom is thought to be dead and returns. It is a mandatory procedure to ask certain questions. Do you understand? Senderu nodded. Yes. Okay then, where have you been for the last 18 years? Shinade asked, already knowing the story. It was mandatory that the Hokage and the two senior advisors be present when questioning a shinobi that has returned to the village after such a long time. Well, I was training under a swordsman up until I was 22. After that, I wandered around studying techniques and strengthening my skills. In order to be a valuable asset to this village, I felt my reason for not returning right away was justified. Senzuru informed three before him. Goharu spoke. Well, your reason was just, by not even informing the Hokage of your status is not becoming of a ninja. However, it's not like you turned on Kona. In fact, you risked your life to save the lives of your comrades. Hamura finished up. That is what makes Konoha the strongest of the five nations, unity, and sacrificing our lives for our fellow man. It's the close family unity that our ninjas and villagers develop that makes us strong and gives us strength. Family? Unity? Fucking hypocrites, Snotty broke from her thoughts and smiled at her son. Well, on behalf of myself and Konoha, welcome back, Senseru. You will be reinstated to the position you held. If you feel that you are above that, then you can allow me to evaluate you and make a decision based on that. Lady Hokage, wasn't my performance yesterday good enough? Snotty placed her hand on her lower hip and looked up to recall their battle. Well, if I went on that alone, yes, I would say that you are definitely Jonin level. I will call in five other Jonin and ask their opinion. If three out of five feel that you are Jonin level, then I will consider it. But remember, the decision is still up to me. You are free to go. Senzuru nodded. He then bowed to the three officials before him. Senzuru proceeded to head out of the office. Raido and Genma, Snotty called out. Both Jonins appeared in an instant. She continued. Raido, retrieved Kakashi, Asuma, Aoba, Katetsu, and Izumo. Genma, retrieved Sasuke, Sakura, Neji, and Giba. They nodded, then phased out of sight. Location unknown. Hinata was busy putting everything in the color-coded order that they were in. Hinata started to understand the concept behind sealing things inside of scrolls, and was getting better. So, that is why 1010 scroll is so huge. Sealing is time-consuming. Naya walked in to see Hinata straightening up things. I see that you are almost finished putting everything back. Yes, I decided to put everything back now. Well, the scroll is the last. So, what are we going to do next? Naya sensei, the curious Yuka asked. Naya walked around Hinata, looking her up and down. Well first, you are going to change. That long overcoat just won't do. I place clothes in your bed, similar to mine's. The only thing different is the color, which is a sky blue with white ankle warmers. I don't know your shoe size, so you will have to wear your sandals today, or you can wear them for the duration. Whatever makes you comfortable. What is your shoe size anyway? I'll get you a pair just in case. I wear four shoes, not to inform the older lady. Perfect, that's my size. I have tons of shoes like the ones I'm sporting that I have yet to wear. I'll go get you the shoe that matches that outfit. You not to raise her hand to signal her sensei to stop. Sensei, that isn't necessary. I mean, we're training. Passion uh, really isn't important. Naya turned and gave Hinata a serious look. Fashion is one of the most important things in this world. You don't realize it yet, but you will. After you leave here, you'll have the best fashion sense in the world. Besides, my student has to look as fabulous as her sensei, or it would be a crime to even be considered as a sensei. I'll meet you in your room with those shoes. Naya smiled and then walked off. Naya sensei and Ino will get along great. Hinata just sighed and headed to her room. Back in Konoha. Tsunade was now in her office with Sasuke, Sakura, Nechi, and Kiba. You are to go to Waterfall and inform your leader of our plans. Your mission starts now. Sasuke spoke up before everyone could turn around. Lady Hokage, I request that someone else goes in my place. We have an idea of what Cloud is trying to do. However, we're not entirely sure. I think my presence would be useful here in the village. 
Sonata stared at Sasuke, trying to see his reason for wanting to opt out of this mission. She understood now. It was because he didn't like the idea of Naruto getting stronger than him. So, he wants to train. I guess it would benefit the Leaf if he got stronger. It's not like this is a dangerous mission. Sonata spoke. Okay, I will replace you this time, Sasuke. Have Ino and Choji meet Neji's team at the gates. Sasuke nodded, then disappeared in a cloud of smoke. Sonata turned back to the remaining group. The rest of you are dismissed. Sakura tell Kakashi and the others to come in. Sakura, Kiba, and Neji exited the Hokage's office. Sakura informed Kakashi that Tsunade wanted to see them now. She waved bye to her sensei and headed out. Kakashi, followed by Aoba, Asuma, Izumo, and Kotetsu, entered her office. The Jonin's lined up side by side in front of the Hokage. Tsunade addressed the assembled Jonin. I called you here because I would like to promote a Junin to Jonin. You all know that there is three ways that a person can be promoted to Jonin. 1. He slash she must take the exams and be approved by the assembled council. 2. Challenge the Hokage, and if he slash she does good, the decision is up to the Hokage. Or 3. Be approved by 3 out of 5 Jonin. Asuma spoke. I assume you called us here for the latter. This is about Senderu, isn't it? Yes, I want your opinions on what you thought about him yesterday. Based on what you saw, do you think he is qualified to be a Jonin? Sonata responded. Kakashi was the first to speak. Well, he didn't last with you for five minutes. That is something only a handful of ninja could do. So I, Kakashi Hatake, placed my vote for the Chunin Norisantaru to be promoted to Jonin status. Aoba spoke. I, Aoba Yamashiro, placed my vote for the Chunin Norisantaru to be promoted to Jonin status. He beat me kind of easy, and I'm a Jonin, so it would be foolish not to recommend him. I, Izumu Kamizuki, placed my vote for the Junin Norisenzaru to be promoted to Jonin status. Gotetsu looked at Izumu and nodded. Izumu was right. He took us out effortlessly. I, Gotetsu Hagane, placed my vote for the Junin Norisenzaru to be promoted to Jonin status. Shinade moved her eyes to Asma. Well, he did take out two Jonins pretty easy, and he held his own against you. As a former teammate, I knew what he was capable of. So I, Asuma Saratobi, placed my vote for the Junin known as Senderu to be promoted to Jonin status. Sonade looked at her subordinates. She nodded. Okay, it seems that you all believe that he is capable. I will promote him to Jonin status. Asuma, find Senderu and have him in my office ASAP. I will inform him of his promotion to Jonin. All of you are free to go, except you, Kakashi. Everyone left except Kakashi. I want you to tell Gara to meet me in my office at 4 p.m. I want to talk to him before we leave. If you don't mind me asking Tsunade, what is it that you wish to talk to him about? Kakashi wondered. This is Kage business, Kakashi. Nothing to concern you with. Also, the academy graduation is in a week. I'm asking that the best Jonians take on a team and have them ready for the Jonian exams in six months. So what do you say, Kakashi? Care to take on a team? Sonata asked. The last time I took on a team, it didn't go so well. I kept on preaching teamwork when all I did was focus on one student who betrayed the village, another got banished, and another I helped slightly. Nope, I took on a Genin squad already. Besides, it would be pretty hard for any Genin to live up to what those three have accomplished, Kakashi stated. Sonata smiled at Kakashi. Well, I suppose you were right. I had to try anyway. I guess Guy, Karnai, and Asuma's answer will be the same as yours. I guess I'll have to ask Genma, Yamato, and Aoba. Well, Kakashi, I will see you then. Kakashi nodded and disappeared in a poop of smoke. Sonata placed her hand on her chin. She looked very bored, to say the least. Sonata looked to her left, then to her right. She opened her drawer and pulled out the latest edition of Ichi Ichi Paradise. Jiraiya, I must admit, this is a damn good book. But you're still a pervert. A good writer you are, but a pervert nonetheless. Hmm, so that's why Yuki and Rokua broke up. I knew Uye was a slut. Though Kage looked up every so often to make sure that no one barged in on her and one of her guilty pleasures. Sasuke was walking through the village looking for Choji. He had seen Ino and informed her to meet Sakura and the rest at the gate. On his way looking for Choji, he ran into Shikamaru and Tamari. To his surprise, Shikamaru had no idea where Choji was at.
Sasuke continued to walk, looking for the Jonin. Sasuke was walking when he saw Joji walking down the street with a grocery bag. Sasuke called to get his attention. Joji. Joji turned around to see who was calling him. When he saw Sasuke, he narrowed his eyes. When he wanted Uchiha. Lady Tsunade ordered me to inform you that you have a mission. You are to meet Inu, Sakura, Neji, and Kipa at the North Gate ASAP. Sasuke informed Joji. Alright, if there isn't anything else, I'm off. Joji walked off, heading towards its house. Sasuke went in the opposite direction. His destination was the Uchiha compound. I have to get stronger. Since I've copied Naruto's speed with my Sharingan, it should take me no time to catch up to his speed. The next time I use Susano, it should put me over the edge with speed and power to beat him. But I'll have to save our fight for after this war. I will catch up to you, Naruto. That is something you can count on. Sasuke smirked and continued to the Uchiha compound. Sea Country. Naruto and Hayami were heading towards the dojo. She decided to tag along Naruto, who really didn't mind. Naruto was dressed in a thin, long-sleeve orange shirt with black sweats and matching color sandals. The sword that Ryuho had given him was strapped over his back. He had changed from his previous outfit to get more comfort. He knew that whatever the training entailed, it was going to be hard. Hayami tapped Naruto. He looked down at the girl. You want something, Hayami? Big Brother Naruto, do you think you can do this training? From what I hear, it isn't easy. Father told me that it was dangerous. The little girl put her head down. Naruto bent down on one knee and lifted up her chin. I heard it was going to be dangerous too. But aren't you scared? The girl asked. Scared, not really, just uncertain. You see, I don't know what to expect. People sometimes confuse that with fear, but it's not the same. Even if I did fear the training, wouldn't it be better to face it than to avoid it? I guess. The girl spoke a low tone. It's alright to be afraid. Right now, you're afraid for me, but I promise that I will be alright. In truth, fear is something that can make you stronger. When I was 12, I was afraid of this kid who seemed stronger than me. But to protect my friends at the time, I overcame it. I do fear things. I mean, everyone does, even if they don't show it. It's what you do that either makes you one of the cowards or one of the brave. Anyway, I'm sure your father wouldn't let anything bad happen, Naruto said, reassuring the girl. She looked up and smiled at him. Okay, do your best, big brother Naruto. Naruto got up off of his knee and touched the girl's shoulder. I will give my all. You have training to do. You should get to it so you can become stronger. You're right. Well, I have to go. I will see you later, big brother Naruto. The girl ran off in the direction that they came from. Naruto looked at the girl and went off and smiled. He turned back to see Ryuho sitting at the door to the dojo. Ryuho's face illustrated his seriousness. Naruto only saw a sensei like this on rare occasions. Naruto continued to walk until he reached the dojo. When he arrived in front of his sensei, Ryuho spoke. It is time. Are you ready? I'm as ready as I'm going to be, Naruto answered. Ryuho turned around and walked into the dojo. Follow me. Naruto followed Ryuho's lead. Naruto saw that the leader of the Minashu clan was heading towards the basement stairs on the far end of the dojo. Naruto saw two samurai standing opposite side of the hole in the floor. Ryuho continued to walk, eventually going down the stairs. Naruto followed him down the stairs into the tunnel. When Naruto and Ryuho reached the bottom of the steps, Naruto looked back to see the two samurai that were standing on both sides of the opening, closing it up. The little cave-like entrance was dimly lit by candles. The two continued down the stairs without saying much. Three minutes passed and they were still heading downstairs. Naruto was sure that they were going to the center of the earth, but they finally reached the end of the stairs. Naruto saw three doors. He noted that they each said different things. The door on the left said Will, the door on the right said Faith, and the one in the center said Heart. Ryuho motioned for Naruto to follow him. Ryuho went to the door on the left. Ryuho and Naruto walked through the door. Naruto was shocked to say the least. The room was a landscape. Naruto looked up in it to see how could this place be bright as if it were daytime. He was more shocked that he didn't see artificial sunlight. Ryuho put a hand on her shoulder. Amazing, isn't it? This room was created over 400 years ago. The landscape and everything is real. We're deep under the compound. This room amazes me, even after every time I see it. I understand where the water comes from. I even understand the trees and how the mini mountains were formed. But I will never understand how it is always bright here. My father tried to explain it to me once. 
He said that his father told him there is a gem in the form of a stone somewhere outside of the compound that channels the sunlight to the gems in the mountains, providing the light. He said that the gems hold the light energy, storing it, which is why it never gets dark in this room. I never really did understand, but whatever. Naruto nodded, not really understanding, but that wasn't really important at the moment. Naruto took his eyes uh, off of his surroundings and turned to his sensei. I'm guessing uh, the training will start soon, sensei. Yes, it'll begin now. Ryuho snapped his fingers. The clan members that Naruto saw in the dojo earlier had appeared uh, all around him. Everyone was dressed in the same garbs. All of the members of the Minashu clan had on black keiko gi, a black hakama, and the traditional open toe sandals with a white tabi. Ryuho had a white sleeveless robe over his keiko gi. Unlike everyone else who had a white waist sash, Ryuho's was gold and his tabi were black. Shinji stepped forward with a black robe. He handed it to his uncle. Ryuho took the robe from his nephew and he held it out for Naruto to take. Naruto, you will have to put this on. Also, you must give me your sword for a moment. Naruto handed Ryuho his sword, while Ryuho handed Naruto the black robe. Ryuho tied a white string at the hilt of the sword. At the end of the string, a medal with the words, Will, written on it, hung from it. Ryuho handed Naruto back his sword. Naruto just shrugged, he didn't see what was so special by doing this. Shinji looked at one of the samurai behind Naruto and nodded. The man walked up to Naruto and placed his sash around Naruto's waist with the same words. Naruto looked down at the sash and then back to his sensei. So, what happens now? Ryuho smirked. This. Ryuho took out a silver pendant. He then threw the pendant to the ground. He then unsheathed Heaven's Blade. Few got to see the sword. For many, it was the first time. But, it was a sight to behold. The sword was crystal clear. The hilt was the only thing that everyone saw. And, that was amazing as well. A white gold pommel, a porcelain grip, and a white gold cross guard that took the form of angel wings. The sword was gorgeous. It was as if God forged it himself. Ryuho brought the sword down on the pendant. A blue light covered the whole landscape. The light died down after a couple of seconds. Ryuho placed his sword back into its sheath. Naruto felt the difference not only in his sword, but also in the robe that he was wearing. Ryuho smirked when he see Naruto drop down to one knee. Allow me to explain, Naruto. The pendant that I just struck created a field throughout the whole landscape that activates the artifacts and judging by your position, you now see what has happened. The weight of your sword has increased, as well as your robe, Ryuho informed him. Naruto grimacing from the weight, but gave his sensei a smirk. I get it. This will help me increase my speed and power, right? Wrong. That is not the purpose of this trial, Ryuho answered. Naruto was now confused. If that isn't the purpose, then what is? Ryuho closed his eyes and smirked at his apprentice. I told you already. It's to test your will. Ryuho opened his eyes and unsheathed the sword he had before obtaining the Heaven's Blade. The other samurai followed suit. Stand, Naruto, and defend yourself, Ryuho said in a commanding tone. Naruto struggled to stand. Naruto got into a defensive position with his sword. Naruto was about to release his gravity seals, but Ryuho interrupted him before he did so. I almost forgot. You are not to release your gravity seals. You will fight as is. Is that understood? Naruto nodded. He looked to his left to see everyone was in an attack stance. So, everyone will attack me. I don't have the speed to keep up, and I can't release my seals to gain the speed that I need. I'm in one hell of a spot. Oh well, I just have to deal with it. Naruto was patiently waiting for someone to attack. His eyes shot from person to person. He gripped his sword tighter. Ryuho inched forward, preparing to attack. However, a samurai from Naruto's right jumped at him. Before Naruto knew it, everyone was coming at him, full force. Location unknown. Hinata and Naya were now outside in the back of the house. The two were standing opposite each other. The Hyuga was now dressed in the clothes that Naya had given her. Hinata, we will now start the second part of the training. I told you before that I might not be as strong as Nade, but I am pretty strong. I will not hold back against you, so don't hold back against me, Hinata nodded. Both women shifted into a fighting stance. Hinata activated Byakugan and shifted into the Jukin stance. Naya studied Hinata. She's using her Jukin. I have to be careful and counter palm strikes by sending Chakra to my hands to dispense hers. I can't hold back, simply because of the potential that Byakugan holds. 
not at charge that Hinata is confused at Hinata greatly. Doesn't she know of the Juki and what it is capable of? I won't try to harm her. Hinata thrust her pump forward, aiming for Naya's shoulder. Her intention was to stop the chakra flow from in her arm, leaving her at a disadvantage. Hinata's plan didn't work. Naya dipped under the strike, aimed for her shoulder. This left Hinata off balance and unable to defend. She brought back her fist and struck the girl in the ribs, then followed up with a spinning back heel kick, sending Hinata flying and crashing, landing a few yards away. Hinata slowly got up and wiped the blood from her lip. Compassion for your enemy can lead to a ninja's demise. You could have easily struck me in the heart, but you chose to cut the flow of chakra from my arm. I told you to fight with everything you had. Don't worry about if you can hurt me with your Jukin. Just worry about winning, Naya said, hoping that this would make Hinata fight her seriously. Hinata shifted back into her fighting stance. Naya waited for the girl to attack, but she never did. She decided to attack to speed things up. Naya disappeared and appeared behind Hinata, who blocked the kick aimed for her head. Hinata tried to strike Naya in the left side of her chest, but Naya countered with her palm. Hinata's eyes went wide, realizing what her sensei did. She jumped back to create distance between them. Are you surprised? I told you not to worry about using your Jukin on me, Naya said to the shocked girl. You can't tell my Jukin. You dispersed the chakra in my hand by forming chakra in your own, Hinata stated. She can cancel my Jukin. I probably can use it if she slips, but that isn't likely. I hope she doesn't slip. I really don't want to hurt Naya Sensei. Hinata shifted back into her fighting stance. Naya didn't take one. She waited for the girl to attack. Hinata attacked Naya, but Naya could sense that the girl was still pulling some punches. Why is she still holding back? She's too soft. Naya backflipped to avoid Hinata's leg sweep. When she landed, she did the necessary hand seals to perform the katana Yusenka no Jutsu. Hinata jumped in the air to evade the technique, but Naya was above her. The seal mistress performed a front flip back heel kick, which sent the girl crashing to the ground. Hinata was about to get up, but Naya landed on top of her with a kunai to her throat. See what happens when you hold back. You put yourself in a danger as well as others. If this was a mission, you would be dead because of your unwillingness to cause harm. There is a time to be nice, Hinata, and there is a time not to be. Being nice all the time doesn't work, as I'm sure you've seen. Your own father placed a caged bird seal on you because of your weakness. This is the real world, Hinata. Being nice all the time will get you killed. I'm curious, you're the oldest that your father placed a seal on you. Why is that? Naya asked after giving her speech. My sister, who is five years younger, and I is stronger. My father sees me as weak and unworthy of being clan head and his daughter. Hinata informed the woman, who held a kunai to her throat with a sad look. Pitying yourself for not being daddy's favorite and living up to his standards. You truly are weak. Naya got off of Hinata. She then turned her back on the girl and walked away. I don't have time to train with someone who holds back. When you're ready to fight, let me know. Hinata put her head down, ashamed of her actions. She clenched her fist and closed her eyes, forcing some tears to fall. Why? Why am I so weak? First father, now Naya Sensei. I let everyone down and I placed their faith in me. Why? All I ever wanted was to change and become stronger. Even after working as hard as I did, the results were the same. I'm still that weak little girl. Hinata had a flashback of the scene that transpired when she was 12. Kurenai came to tell her father that she was taking Hinata under her wing, and that her missions would be dangerous. What her father said was something that always stayed with her. Flashback. Do as you like with her. A defect who is even weaker than Hanabi. Someone five years her junior is not needed in the Hyuga. End of flashback. Hinata fist clenched tighter as the memory of Neji and herself in the Chunin prelims came to her. Flashback. You're not suited to become a ninja. People cannot change. A failure is a failure. End of flashback. Her fist clenched even tighter at a recent memory for her father. Flashback. All you ever do is try and fail miserably. In my eyes, you are pathetic. End of flashback. Blood was now coming from Hinata's fists. The memory of her last time here with Naruto came to her. Flashback. Hinata, you're too nice of a person. If I learned anything, is that when you're too nice, people will walk all over you. I know you're not happy, and I know you don't think that having the seals for the best. So tell me, Hinata, what do you want? End of flashback. Hinata's head shot up, her eyes now focused on their treating Naya. 
She said in a low tone to herself, answering Naruto's question. I want to be strong. Strong like you, Naruto. Hinata grabbed a kunai from her pouch and threw it at Naya. Naya was heading back to the house when she heard the sound of the kunai in the air heading straight for her head. Naya jumped out of the way, avoiding the kunai. Landing in a crouching position on the ground, Naya looked up to see the young girl glaring at her. Hinata spoke in a low but serious tone. We're not done yet. I promise I will give my all in this training, and I never go back on my word. That's my ninjo, my ninja way. Naya stood up from her crouching position. So, she shares the same ninja as Naruto. I can see that she won't be holding back anymore. Good. Now, I can see how strong she really is. Hinata wasted no time blurring out of sight and appearing in front of Naya. Naya was the defensive, and Hinata was giving it everything. The seal mistress was evading palm strikes, and countering when she could. Naya was impressed with Hinata. This girl is giving it her all, so this is what she's like when she isn't holding back. The leaf definitely has a diamond in the rough. The only thing holding her back was her confidence and her unwillingness to hurt. I don't know where either went, but something changed. Hinata kept striking. I'm not weak, I'm not pathetic, and I'm not worthless. I will prove to everyone that I can be strong too. Hinata didn't realize that her drive allowed her to place a kick in Naya's stomach. Naya's eyes went wide, and she doubled over. Hinata stopped her onslaught. She went to comfort her sensei. Nai sensei, I'm sorry, I didn't. Hinata was sent flying when a fist connected to her face. Don't ever stop again, Naya said. Hinata rose and got back in her fighting stance. Naya studied Hinata to see if she lost her edge, but she hadn't, so her resolve hasn't changed, which is good. But she's still that caring person. I guess it'll take time to get her to fight without worrying about hurting someone she's not friendly termed with. Hinata went on the attack again. Naya smiled. Come on, girl. Show me what you got. Konoha, later in the afternoon. Tsunade was sitting at her desk. Shizune, Anko, Kakashi, Ibiki, Yoba, Gai, Kurnai, Asuma, Shinu, Izumo, Kotetsu, Genma, Yamato, and a couple of other Jonians were standing in the background. Senjuru stood before Tsunade in a black tunic with match coloring sweats and sandals. His headband was around his forehead. Tsunade had given it back to him last night. Everyone was smiling, except Kurnai, who had avoided making eye contact with him. On behalf of the village hidden in the leaves, I, the fifth Hokage, hereby promote you to Junin. On a more personal note, welcome back, son. Tsunade gave him a genuine smile when she returned. I'm glad to be back, but I don't feel right without the vest, Senju told Tsunade. While well, Asuma asked permission to give you the vest, he said he wanted to customize it. You will have to talk to him about that. Everyone turned to Osma to see how he would respond to the question that he predicted Sanjuru would ask. I had a tailor customize your vest personally. It should be ready soon. Don't worry. I think you're going to like it. So I spoke once more, gaining everyone's attention. This promotion ceremony wasn't the only reason why I called you all here. You all know that the Chunin exams are coming up in six months, and a new batch of Ganyans will be graduating from the academy in about a week. I need some volunteers for Jonin instructors. Any volunteers? Asuma spoke first. I wouldn't want to take on another Ganyin team. I had a hard time dealing with the last one I had. Guy spoke next. I had the perfect Ganyin team, and I don't think it would live up to the standards that my youthful students have set. However, if Kakashi takes on a team, I'll have to make sure my rival doesn't upstage me. Well, that excludes you. Kakashi turned down my offer earlier. It's not I said in the green spandex wearing ninja. Kern I spoke. I declined. Anko gave a sinister smile. I don't mind taking on a Ganyin squad. I think it would be fun. She finished by licking her lips. Kakashi glanced at Anko. Anko with the team. I pray for the unlucky souls placed in our squad. Aoba spoke next. I guess I could try to take on a Ganyin squad. I'm in as well. Genma switched the toothpick in his mouth from one side to the other before responding. Jeez, I guess I should take on a team. I've been avoiding it for a while now, but best to get it over with. I'm in. Yamato was the next to respond. Well, I guess it couldn't hurt to take on a squad. Shino spoke next. I decline. I'm not as experienced, and I don't feel I would be good as a Jonin sensei at the moment. Sonate spoke once more. I have four. I need at least five more, seeing as all 27 students need to be divided into groups of three. That leaves a total of nine potential instructors. Who else is willing to step up? Sensory spoke. If it isn't too much trouble, I would like to take on a team. 
I know you want the Genians to be trained and ready to take on the exams. I feel that I can do that. So, I'm in. Everyone was quiet. Snade finally broke the silence. You just got back. Are you sure that you want to take on a team? If it helps the village, then I am positive. Sentry answered. Snade nodded. Very well. Anyone else? Four other Junians volunteered to take on a team. Snade spoke. Okay, it seems I filled the spots for the Junian instructors. We will all meet here in one week, and I will give you the details of your squads. Should they pass or fail, it is up to you. You are dismissed. All of the assembled Junians left her office except Shizune. Send for Gara. I would like to speak to him. Yes, Lady Tsunade. I'll get right on it. Shizune exited and headed off to find Gara, leaving the fifth by herself. Sanjuro was looking for Karnai, but she immediately disappeared when they exited Tsunade's office. He was walking down the street, thinking what he would say to her. He turned around when he heard Asuma call his name. He said, Jiru, come walk with me. I was on the way to pick up your vest. Well, I'm not doing anything else. Sure, let's walk. We can catch up. Both Jonians headed towards the tailor. Senjuru spoke first. So, what's been going on since I've been away? Well, I'm sure you know about our village being attacked by sound and sand. Also, we had to deal with that and an organization known as the Akoski. Since we allied them with the Sand and the fact that their Kazakage is a Jinchuriki, we aided them in defeating the Akatsuki. The war between this village and the Cloud is the only thing that's been going on, Asuma informed his teammate. What about the people in this village? I didn't see Rin. What happened to her? Sentry questioned. She left the village years ago, but to get the details, he had to question Kakashi. He is the only one that knows what really happened, Asuma informed him. Oh, what about... What about Kurnai? Tell me about her, Sentry asked. Kurnai, well, when you were assumed dead, it took her a long time to recover. She chose to avoid missions and remained a Chunin until she was 27. She has changed a lot, but she still is the same, if that makes sense. Asuma informed him. I see, Asuma, you know where she is? The newly appointed Jonin asked in an almost pleading tone. Nope, let's not worry about that, shall we? We have to go get your vest, Asuma said, changing the subject of Kurnai. Senjuru gave the star Toby a slight smile, but his mind was still on Kurnai. Asuma's mind was thinking about Senjuru and Kurnai as well. Senjuru, I know you care for Kurnai, but so do I. I said not much has changed, but there is something that has. You are one of my good friends, but I won't step aside just because you're back in the picture. I'm sorry, friend, but I love her just as much as you do. The two kept walking, oblivious of the other's thoughts. The two arrived at the tailor. The tailor smiled at Asma. Asma, that vest you asked for is ready. Here you go. The tailor handed Asma the Junid vest. The only visible difference between Asma's vest and the vest that was to be Senjuru's was the color. Unlike the traditional green, this vest was black. In the red swirl on the back, there was a design of a black phoenix. Asma handed the vest to Senjuru. This vest is yours. What do you think? Sentry looked all over the vest. I like it a lot. Thanks, man. You didn't have to do this. The newly appointed Joni put on the vest. Asuma turned to the tailor. Thanks, Rito. You did a good job. It was nothing. By the way, who's your friend? Oh, this is Sentry. Sentry, this is Harito. He started his tailoring business about eight years ago, and he's one of the best. When I need a patch-up job, I go to him. Asuma said proudly. Harito blushed at the comment Asuma gave him. I'm not the best, but I put my best effort into what I do. Well, I have a lot more to do before I close today. But if you guys need my services, then don't hesitate to come to me. Both men nodded and headed to the door. They waved goodbye to Harito and went on their way. When they got outside of the shop, Asma looked at Senjuru. Well, I have other things to tend to. I don't think I'm going to be free for the rest of the day, so I'll probably see you tomorrow. Later. Yeah, later, man. And thanks for the vest. I really like it. Don't mention it. Asuma walked off. Senjuru watched his friend walk off. He turned around and headed in the opposite direction. His goal was to find Kurunai. Northwest of Konoha, the team comprised of Neji, Sakura, Kiba, Hino, and Choji headed for Waterfall Village. Neji stopped and everyone followed suit. He pulled out a map. Everyone gathered around. Sakura, you've been to the Waterfall Country and the Hidden Waterfall Village before. I've never been to the village, but I know where it is located. According to sources, it's located next to a large waterfall. However, not many have seen it. My question is, where is it exactly? Neji asked. 
It's located exactly where you said, Sakura answered. How is that so, Sakura? Kiba asked. The village is reached by traveling inside the waterfall, and like every other village, the waterfall village is truly hidden. Your Byakugan will be very useful for this mission, Niji. The village is hidden to the naked eye, but not to Byakugan. I think that's why Sonate selected you for this mission, Sakura informed him. The village is really hidden inside the waterfall, Choji asked. Yes, there are pathways at the base of the waterfall that allows one to enter the village. However, taking the wrong path can be deadly, Sakura informed them. Here, I thought this was going to be an easy mission, Ino complained. Well, we can't dwell on that. We should be heading out before it gets too late to travel, Neji said to his team. The group agreed. They continued their trek to Waterfall, Sea Country. About five hours passed since Naruto entered the chamber. Naruto was on one knee, using his sword to hold him up. He was looking around to see if he could see anyone. Everyone was hiding from him. His clothes were ragged. He had cut marks all over his body. A cut on his cheek was slowly leaking blood. Naruto stood up and got back into a fighting stance. Ryuho was observing his student from afar. He's still standing after our attacks. His will to not give up truly is strong. Naruto kept looking around. One of the samurai appeared above him. The samurai aimed his strike for the top of Naruto's head. Naruto blocked the attack, causing the samurai to jump back. Another warrior came at him from the right. Naruto blocked his attack and quickly had to block an attack on his left. He was unsuccessful at blocking an attack from behind. The slash to the back caused him to fall forward. Shinji, who caused the slash, looked at the fallen warrior. Ryuho and the rest of the samurai landed next to Shinji. Ryuho addressed Naruto. Give him Naruto. You are at your wit's end. The only way you can get out of this bind is if you call on the fox, which I forbid you to do. You're probably wondering how I know. Let's just say I know your other sensei. So, what are you going to do, Naruto? Naruto struggled to get on his feet. He had to use his sword as a crutch. When he finally stood, Naruto got back in his stance. I don't need the power of the fox. I can do this on my own. I promised myself I would never give up a long time ago, and I never take back my word. That's my nindo, my ninja way. Ryuho smiled at his students, will to continue in spite of the situation being bleak for him. Ryuho looked to his left and right, signaling everyone to surround Naruto. Naruto watched himself being surrounded. He looked at his sensei. Am I supposed to be scared shitless and back down? Bring it on, you bastards. Naruto is a monkey, doesn't run from everyone. They all rushed Naruto. They attacked with everything they had. He blocked and took more damage to the body. Naruto was being held up on his will alone. Ryuho stood back and watched his student be attacked. Naruto was doing the best he could to block an attack, but the reduce in speed forced him to stay on the defensive. Ryuho felt the pulse come from his sword. When he looked down at the sword, it was glowing. So, it seems you approve of his will. Very well. He passes the test. Ryuho placed his hand on the hilt and in blinding speed appeared in front of Naruto. He did one swift upward strike cutting Naruto across the chest and Naruto flying to the right. Naruto hit the ground with a loud thud. Everyone was looking at Ryuho in awe. He sheathed the sword again and walked up to Naruto's unconscious form. The samurai warriors appeared on both sides of him. Shinji, who was next to Ryuho, spoke. It looks like he passed the first trial. Yes, the sword has acknowledged his strong will. The boy refuses to give up. No matter how long or how bad his odds were, is the reason why he passed. Ryuho bent down and smiled at Naruto. He passed the first trial, Naruto. The true purpose of this test was to prove your will to never give up. In my eyes, he passed with flying colors, and I couldn't be more proud. Your next test will be just as hard, Naruto. I hope you are ready. Ryuho threw the unconscious Naruto over his shoulder. He turned to everyone with Naruto over his shoulder. Come, everyone. We are heading back to the compound. When he wakes up, he will take the next test. How long do you think he will be out, Lord Ryuho? One of the younger samurai asked. I don't know. It could be anywhere from a day to a week. Let's just get his wounds tended to. Ryuho and everyone headed back to the compound. An hour later, Naruto was now wrapped in bandages. He had gauzes on his face, covering up cuts. He lay in the bed of the room that was provided for him. Hayami was by his side crying. Her father walked in to check on her. The girl looked up. Big brother Naruto will be okay, right? Her father gave her a reassuring smile. Yes, he'll be fine. Don't worry, he'll be back on his feet before you know it. Besides, what would Naruto think of you sitting here crying? The little girl wiped her eyes. 
He wouldn't want me to cry. No, he wouldn't. Come, Hayami, and let Naruto rest. Hayami followed her father, but stopped at the door to look back at Naruto. She looked closely to see that he had a smile on his face. She smiled and then followed her father to let her brother rest. 9 p.m. in Kona. Sanjiro was still looking for Kurnai. He made a stop at the memorial stone to see if anyone he knew was on it. He found a few names that he knew. He even found his own. He put his hand in his pockets and walked away from the stone. He decided to try and talk to her in the morning. He walked through the training grounds back to the village. Sanjiro was walking when he heard someone training nearby. He decided to head in the direction where he heard the training come from. He decided to hide in the bushes as to not alert the person. When he peeked through the bushes, he saw Kurnai going to work on the post. Kurnai kept kicking and punching the post. I hate him. What about me? He could have told me he was alive. Was I that important to the bastard? Love me. <laughs> what a total crock of bull. He doesn't love me if he did. Kurnai stopped paying the post and fell to her knees with tears in her eyes. If he did, he would have come back to me. Sanjuru stepped out of the bushes. I have. Kurnai turned in the direction of the voice, her eyes narrowed. You. She charged him. She aimed a kick at his head and that was blocked with little effort. Kurnai kept punching and kicking, but he blocked everything with ease. Kurnai distanced himself from him. Sanjuru looked at her with an apologetic look. Kurnai said in a low tone, Why? Why didn't you come back to me? Why did you leave me alone? I'm not going to make excuses, but I couldn't come back. If you will allow me to, I would tell you what I was up to and my reason for not coming back until now. Please, Karnai, all I want is to explain the events up to when I disappeared. Please. Karnai reluctantly nodded. Fine. Talk. It's a long story. Bear with me, Sanjuru told her. I have the time. Well, I guess I should start at the beginning. Sanjuru started to tell Karnai his story. He hoped she would understand why he couldn't come back to her, his family, and home. Back in sea country. Hayami went back to Naruto's room after dinner and her bath. She propped his pillow. She then strained his sheets. She was trying to make him as comfortable as possible. Her mother and her father walked in, but there was a guy with him she didn't recognize. The white-haired man walked up to Naruto and looked over him. It looks horrible, Ryuho. Don't worry, he should be up in about two to three days. Hayami looked at the man. Are you a doctor, sir? Dry looked at the little girl who was on the other side of Naruto's bed. Me. No, I'm just checking up on my student. I'm Jiraiya. What is your name, sweetie? I'm Hayami. Nice to meet you, sir. I have a question, sir. What is it? Jiraiya asked. Are you certain that Big Brother Naruto will be okay in two to three days? Well, I'm not certain. You see, Naruto's healing ability is different from everyone else. He recovers from injuries at a remarkable pace. His injuries don't seem to be too serious. So, I expect he should be up and running in two to three days, Jiraiya told the little girl. That's good to hear, the girl said with relief. You should be going to bed, young lady, Kiori told her daughter. Mom, can I sleep in here tonight? I won't bother, big brother. I'll be quiet, I promise, the girl pleaded. No, dear, if you stay, you won't get any sleep. I'll be up all night watching him. Sorry, dear, it's your bedtime. Okay, I'll go. The girl slumped her shoulders in defeat and walked out of the room. Jiraiya looked at the girl, exit, then at Kiori. She must really care for him. Yes, she does. Do you think he'll be up in two to three days? Kiori asked. Yes, he will. When he wakes up, I will seal off the Gibi power. You did say you didn't want him having access to the chakra, right? Yes, but it is a part of him. Don't seal it off. It will make the next test that much harder, Ryuho said. Jiraiya wondered what Ryuho meant. Do you care to explain why? He told me that Naruto chose not to use the fox's chakra. Today, when he was in need and desperate, he almost used it. Now I'm not saying that using it is bad, but it showed his lack of faith in himself. Which is why I decided to not have you seal off the fox's chakra, Ryuho explained his reason. Jiraiya understood what she was getting at. Looks like he has a rough trial ahead of him, it seems. Yes, he does, but if he is remotely close to the Naruto that I've seen today, when we did the final assault, then he should be fine, Ryuho told Asani. Jiraiya looked back at Naruto's unconscious form. I don't doubt you at all. Dawn in the Hidden Leaf was always a sight to behold. Kurunai was sitting on the roof of her apartment complex with her knees buried into her chest. She was thinking over what happened last night and the story that Senzuru had told her. She really wanted to hate him, but she was now confused more than any other time in her life. She loves Asma that much she knows. 
However, her love for Senderu never faded. Flashback. Senderu took a step closer towards her. That battle, I didn't expect to survive. The technique didn't go through properly, because I was also trying to take out Shikaku's sensei opponent as well. My guess as to what happened is that I was blown hundreds of yards away for not executing it correctly. The next thing I remember is waking up in a hut and being tended to by an old man. I was informed that I was out for weeks. He was surprised that I even survived. I was too. He told me that when he came upon my body that my breathing was shallow, but the tattoo on my left arm was glowing orange. I didn't know why until I had enough strength to summon a phoenix, which wasn't for about two weeks. He healed me and I had intended to come home, but he knew what my tattoo represented and he made me an offer. Kerr and I looked at him with a questioning look. What was that offer? He said that if I wanted to get stronger, he would take me to a man he knew to help train. At first, I was about to say no, but then I thought about Mother, Shizune, Asuma, Sensei, and you. So I decided to take him up on its offer. A means to an end, eh? Senju laughed to try and lighten the mood. It didn't work. Her and I narrowed her eyes. He quickly spoke in hopes of not making her mad. Well, moving along, he took me to his friend, Gogyo Taizen, who was skilled in Taijutsu and Kenjutsu. In fact, his sword style, my style, Divine Wrath, is the brother style of the Heavenly Sword. Similar principles, but different in many ways. So, what happened while training with this Gogyu guy? Karn I asked, seemingly interested. I trained under him until I was about 22. It took me up until I was about 20 to master his sword style, and his fighting style about another two years. It wasn't hard since Taijutsu was always one of my strong points, plus training with my mother since I could walk helped too. He informed the woman he cared deeply for. Why didn't you come back after your training? What is your reason for that? She asked him with a hint of anger in her voice. Not really a reason, just something I had to do. What was so important that you couldn't let your family and your friends know you were alive? She asked. Sendru looked down at the ground as if he was angry with it while clenching his fist. My vow, my vow to uphold my master's dying words. After my training was complete, I was going to return to the village. I went to a town about two days away from my master's location to stock up on goods for the trip back to Konoha. When I got back, he was cut up and bleeding. He told me while he was dying that a cloud ninja named Aisu with the legendary dragon fang had attacked him using the wicked wind style. My master then told me his reason for training me. He told me that his friend saw the tattoo on my arm and knew that I had the phoenix contract. It was his duty as the user of the divine wrath to protect the map and keep the location of the map hidden. It was also the duty to protect the location of the dragon slayer, but that was lost in the destruction of his people about 20 years prior. He told me of the legendary Phoenix Claw, which was my first time hearing about it. So what did you do next? Kern I asked. He told me that he had a map with the location to the Phoenix Nest. He told me where it was and that I should burn it when I get it. He also told me that I needed to return to the nest. And after that, seek out Ryuho Minashu. I knew going to the nest was for the purpose of getting the sword. I didn't know what the other part was for. With his last words, he told me that I had to get stronger because the look in that cloud ninja's eyes showed nothing but evil and destruction. He then died in my arms. Sinjur said the last part in a low tone. Kerr and I couldn't respond. Losing someone close to you was always painful, she knew that. However, she had to press on to find out more. I'm sorry about your sensei, but could you tell me what did you do for the next 12 years? Well, I did what my sensei said and went back to the cave known as the Phoenix Nest. This time, I summoned the boss of the Phoenix, Xenos. He presented me with the sword. He told me it would be a while as in years to learn how to use a sword to its full capacity, and that I should train within the lair to learn how. I didn't have time for years, my objective was to fulfill my sensei's dying wish. I left after two months of training. 
I thought that was all the time I needed to master the sword. I was wrong, but I wouldn't learn that lesson until two years later. I traveled around for about a year and a half, honing my skills. Then, I did what my sensei said. I sought out Ryuho. When I went to see country, I found out that he had just left for the wind country on clan business. I decided to track him down, he told Kur and I. Did you meet him in wind country? Yes, I confronted him and told him the story of what happened to my sensei, and that my sensei ordered me to seek him out. I asked why. He told me the history of both clans, their purpose and of the Taizen clan and the Minashu clan's duty to the world. The Taizen clan was to protect the locations of the mythical contracts. The Minashu clan was entrusted with the Heaven Blade. Unlike Heaven's Blade in the Phoenix Summon, the Dragon Summon didn't select its wielder based on their good-hearted nature. The Dragon Contract selected the person based on their power to wield it alone which is why it needed to be protected from falling into the wrong hands. He told me he knew when my sensei asked him to seek me out. He told me it was to see if I was ready to go up against a user of the Wicked Wind, who took out my master. So, you had to fight him? Kur and I questioned Senzuru. Senzuru answered, Yes, the battle was very intense. I didn't realize how strong I had become in that nine year span away from Konoha. The battle was intense, but in the end, we drew even. He told me that I was good enough to take on the user of that style, and left me in the field. I always wanted to finish that fight, but we never did. The next thing that needed to be done was to confront Aisu, but I couldn't just walk into the cloud and confront one of their own. Did you ever find the ninja? He smiled. It is funny how fate works out. I was actually in bird country. I was trying to formulate a plan on how I could locate this ninja. My next stop was rain country, but I would never get there. I was ambushed by a couple of clown ninjas who mistook me for a missing ninja. They attacked me, but I dispatched them rather quickly. However, I was then confronted by the face that I used my angel of death technique on. Kur and I was shocked beyond belief. He survived, but how? I told you that I didn't execute it correctly, because I focused on taking out Shikaku Sensei's enemy as well. Anyway, that's not the shocking part. The shocking part is that he pulled out the blade that my sensei described. I told you how it's funny fate works out. Senzer informed her. Did you fulfill your sensei's dying wish? Kur and I wanted to know if he killed the ninja that she last saw him fight. No, in fact, he is very much alive. But our last battle put him on the edge. He had more experience using his sword than I did, but I was skilled enough to make him retreat. I realized that if I had stayed and held my skills with the sword like Zeno suggested, I would have won that battle. I knew it was pointless to pursue a ninja, so I decided to go and do what Zeno suggested to do in the first place. The next six years, I trained in the Phoenix Nest, learning all I needed to know about the sword as well as honing my skills with it. So you finished training two years ago? What did you do during the past two years, Kern I asked. He gave his response. Observing events unfold. You remember a year ago when Naruto slaughtered all those ninjas in the land of earth and rain? She nodded, causing him to continue. The cloud was behind the whole thing. After they informed their alliances with the rain and rock, the Rikage suggested that they could strengthen their nations. By learning the technique of the Minashu clan, he suggested that they kidnap the daughter of the clan head. So that's why Naruto killed all those ninjas, Kurnai said to himself, finally understanding his actions. Yes, but the goal was to strengthen the rock and the rain, so they could attack the leaf alongside the cloud. Naruto spoiled their plans by bringing her back home safely, Sender informed her. But the cloud still declared war on us, Kurnai informed him. Yes, and they would have regardless. Aisu, the fifth Raikage, is interested in controlling all of the nations. The reason he attacked Konoha was because of the potential threat it posed and to draw me out. I was trying to catch him, but he decided to catch me. I'm sure Kasan informed all Jonins and Junins yesterday of what will happen in the exams coming in six months. Kern I nodded. Yes, she believes that it'll be the sand and sound invasion all over again. I figured out his actions, so I decided it was time to return home. 
He walked up to her and stroked her cheek. It was time to come back and protect everything that I love. Kerr and I backed away. You can't just come back and expect us to pick up where we left off. I know. He looked up to the star-decorated sky. Do you remember the night we spent under the Sakura tree in the woods? Kerr and I wondered where he was going with this. How could he question her like that? It was the night she lost her virginity to the man she vowed to always love. The night was one of the fondest memories of her life. She remembers the two of them lying under the petals, looking at the starlight sky. He looked at her. I was just thinking about what you said. Kerr and I remember the night and everything about it like it was yesterday. But she decided to play dumb. What did I say? He looked back at the sky and gazed upon the moon with a sad look. I broke two promises, one that I made to myself, and the one that I made to you. When we were little, I knew you were special, even though you treated me like I was a nuisance. I was glad when we got put on the same team, it was like a dream come true for me. When your father died on a mission a year into us being on the same squad, I remember the sadness and how you would cry every time you were alone. You were in pain, and I promised myself I would protect you from experiencing pain like that again. The night we spent under the tree, you asked me to promise that I would never leave you, and I promised I wouldn't. That night was the first time that I told you that I loved you, and I would always be there for you. Kerr and I was in tears. Why? Why are you doing this? He looked back at her and smiled. Because uh, I love you. He placed his hand under her chin and elevated her head. Looking into her teary eyes, he inched closer to her. Kerr and I closed her eyes and did the same. When they got an inch away from each other's lips, Kerr and I broke free from the hand that held her chin. I can't do this. A lot has changed while you were gone, you know. I'm dating Osma now. I can't. We can't. Things aren't what they used to be. Senju felt like a knife had gone into his heart when he heard Osma's name. But how could he really get mad? No, he couldn't, and he knew Kerr and I was right. But his heart didn't care about what was right, it just wanted Kerr and I. Kerr and I decided she needed to get away. I have things to do in the morning, I have to go. She turned around and started to walk away. Do you still love me? Zendru yelled out, freezing her in her tracks. How could she not say yes? Deep in her heart, she still loved him. However, she loved Osma too. With her back to him, she spoke. Yes, I never stopped, but I also love Asuma. Kerr and I walked away, leaving one of the men that she loved, and a flashback. Kerr and I brought her knees further into her chest as she recapped last night's events. She loved them both, but which one did she love more? Kerr and I sat on the roof trying to figure out the answer to a question that she couldn't find an answer to. Waterfall country. Neji had his squad up at least two hours before the sun had risen. He wanted to arrive in Waterfall before noon. Although they were in water country, there was a chance that ninjas from Rock was still in the country. Shinobi from the Rock had been patrolling the area. Neji glanced at Kiba, who was next to Akamaru. Kiba, have you heard any word on Hinata? Kiba shook his head. No, she still isn't allowed any visitors. I tried to go see her yesterday before I went to the Hokage's office, but Lady Sonata's order is still in effect. Ino overheard their conversation and decided to add her two cents. I wonder if she's okay. Joji turned to Sakura. Sakura, don't you have any idea on Hinata's status? No. Sonata is tending to her case personally. It's unlike Sensei to do something of this nature, but I trust her judgment. Sakura said with the utmost confidence in her Sensei's decision. Ino asked Sakura a question that had been bugging her, since Sakura and everyone came back from the mist. Sakura, how come I didn't see Naruto with you guys yesterday? Neji decided to answer. Naruto had other business to take care of. We haven't seen him since we parted ways in the mist. He said something about going to sea country. Kipa wanted to know how the meeting in mist went. Sakura and Neji, would you guys give me the details about what happened in the mist? Nothing, except that Naruto was attacked by ninjas from Kumo. I don't know what the cloud has against him, but they attacked him nonetheless. Neji informed Ino, Kiba, and Choji. Ino, who was walking next to her best friend and roommate, gave her a slight nudge on the arm to get her attention. Hey Sakura, between us girls, what do you think of Lady Tsunade's son? Well, as far as looks go, he is attractive. 
I only met him briefly yesterday before we left, so I don't know. I'm not sure what type of personality he has. Personality is important. You know, looks aren't everything. Sakura gave her assessment. Kiba, who was walking ahead of them, sort of, and then whispered to Choji, who overheard it as well. I guess Sasuke is Mr. Personality, eh, Choji? Look at me. I'm Sasuke Uchiha. Now bow down to my greatness. That's really the personality. Choji snickered at Kiba's comment. Sakura and Ino heard the two guys laugh. Ino was curious at what they were laughing at. What's so funny, guys? Nothing, you know, it's just an inside joke, Choji informed his friend. Neji was scouting the area for enemy ninjas or waterfall ninjas that could provide safe passage to the hidden waterfall village. But his mind was all over the place. It kept going back to Inata, the upcoming war, the cloud ninja, among other things. You know, saw the look on Neji's face. To anyone else, his expression would seem like its typical look of indifference. But not to Ino. You know. Being on quite a few missions with him in Anbu, she knew. He was concerned about something. Neji being concerned was never a good thing. Neji, what's the matter? I can tell by the look that you are worried about something. Neji looked at Ino. This whole upcoming war, but most of all, I'm concerned about the clown ninja, who has made Sasuke and Naruto targets. Why, those two can take care of themselves, Ino said, trying to ease his worry. Neji spoke once more. I'm well aware of that, but to try and repeat what Orochimaru did, knowing we would be prepared and having a geographical advantage is a bit odd, don't you think? Also, if Naruto or Sasuke were to get killed before the war, then we would be losing two valuable shinobi. Although those two are highly skilled, they're not immortal. Neji is right, Ino, but I think Snare has it covered, Neji. Besides, are you suggesting that we keep tabs on those two and keep them in the village away from missions? You know well as I do that they would never go for it. Their pride wouldn't allow it. The best we can do is to be prepared for what's to come. It was now close to noon and Neji's squad was approaching the area near the waterfall on the map. During this time, they were discussing stuff in their personal life and previous missions. Well, Sakura, Ino, Choji, and Kiba anyway, Neji on the other hand, remained silent, making sure that nothing escaped his Byakugan. Sakura, Ino, Kiba, and Choji were all talking when Neji stopped. According to the map, this is the waterfall. Sakura looked at the waterfall that Neji had pointed out. Looks like we have arrived. That cave over there is the entrance. We're going to have to swim through the tunnels in that cave to get the villa. Sakura and everyone else jumped out of the way to avoid the kunai and shuriken that came at them. Neji searched for the ninjas, who had attacked. The group was surrounded by approximately 20 ninjas from the hidden waterfall. A tall man with long brown hair saw the headbands of the approaching shinobi. Stand down, they're not our enemies. He appeared in front of Neji via Shunchi no Jutsu. State your purpose, or else I cannot permit you to go any further. Regardless if you are allies, you do understand the protocols that we must abide by to protect our village. I understand completely. Our reason for coming today is by a special request of the Hokage. The letter that I have here is for your village leader. The Hokage has ordered that I put this letter in his hand personally, so if you will allow us permission to enter, we will complete our mission and be on our way. Nijin informed the waterfall shinobi of his mission. The shinobi motioned for two of his men to come next to him. They appeared next to him and awaited his orders. Make sure that our guests have safe passage to the village. He turned his attention back to Neji. My men will escort you to Lord Shibuki. Neji and company followed their two escorts. All they had to do was inform the leader of the hidden waterfall, and they would be on their way home. As far as Neji was concerned, the mission was by far one of the easiest missions he had in a while, but he was still on guard. Even though this village was allied with the Leaf, you never knew what could happen. He just hopes that things would go smoothly for once. Sea Country It was a beautiful afternoon in Sea Country. The sun was shining bright over the land. Hayami stretched and yawned as she sat up in her bed. The girl was worried about Naruto, and didn't get to sleep until very late. Instantly realizing that it was the next day, she jumped out of the bed. And with her pajamas still on, she ran straight to Naruto's room. The girl got to his door and opened it slowly. Her eyes widened in shock as she looked at the bed. Naruto was gone. Below the compound. 
Ryuho and Naruto were standing in front of the three doors which contained the trials. Ryuho went to check up on Naruto in the middle of the night. Naruto was taking out the bandages on his body when Ryuho walked in on him. He informed him that he was ready to take the next test. Ryuho didn't argue with Naruto. He then told him that the next trial would begin at noon. Naruto was now standing next to his sensei. In front of the door on the far right was the word FAITH written on it. Ryuho placed a hand on Naruto's shoulder. Are you ready? Naruto turned his head slightly. Yes, let's get this test done with. Ryuho opened the door, gesturing with his hands for Naruto to go before him. Naruto walked past his sensei into a room that was nothing like the last one. This room was just a very large dojo with lanterns providing a minute amount of light. The lighting reminded him of the lighting in the cave beyond the entrance. Ryuho got Naruto's attention when he opened his mouth to speak. This test is a one-on-one -on -one battle between you and me. Fight me with everything you have, Naruto. You might want to release your gravity seals now. The head of the Minashu clan pulled the Heaven's Blade from its sheath. He then got into his stance. Naruto complied and did what his sensei suggested. He could feel the difference, but he knew it wouldn't help him. Not in his current condition, even if he was healed. Ryuho was still the superior fighter among the two. Also, add Ryuho's legendary sword to the mix. Naruto wasn't sure if he could win. He would definitely fight regardless of the situation. He just wasn't sure if he could win. Naruto grabbed the blade that was on his back. He removed it from the sheath and slipped into a fighting stance as well. Come at me, Naruto. Show me how far you've come in three years. Ryuho said, eh, hoping to get his student to attack. It worked to perfection. Naruto came at Ryuho. Naruto brought back a sword and swung it with as much force as he could muster. Ryuho blocked it with a sword with little effort. Naruto swung again, but this time Ryuho blurred out of sight, appearing behind the vessel of the Kyuubi. He went to strike, but Naruto blocked the blow. Naruto blurred out of his sight, and was now kicking out the ceiling in the dojo. By doing this, he was accelerating towards Ryuho with the intent to pierce him. Ryuho jumped towards Naruto and slashed at his chest. The brightness of the sword shined so brightly at that moment that it couldn't be determined who was injured until both warriors landed a few yards away with their backs facing towards one another. It was apparent who was in the short end. Naruto fell to the ground with a gash across his stomach. Blood was all over his blue shirt. Ryuho turned around to address Naruto. Is this all you have? Please tell me that my training you was not a waste of time. You do realize you can't beat me with simple attacks such as that. You can't beat me as you are now. You are not strong enough. Since quitting is against your nindo, what will you do, Naruto? Naruto turned around to face his sensei with a smirk on his face. You asked that question, already knowing what I'm going to say. This is far from over, sensei. I'm coming at you with everything I have. Riho smiled at his students' will to continue. Naruto, on the other hand, was talking to the fox in the back of his mind. You are weak, boy. You do not have the strength to fight this man. Allow me to lend you my power. Together, we can crush this fool. The fox tried his best to convince Naruto that using his chakra was the only way to win. No, I can do this by myself. I don't need your power, Naruto said, hoping his tenant would stop pestering him. Just like you didn't need my power to get you out of that Uchiha boy's genjutsu. Face it, Naruto. You need my power. You may have gotten stronger, but you need my power to win this battle. And you know it. Stop procrastinating and draw on my chakra. Elevating his voice to say that last part, he knew, and it was working because the boy had no response. Naruto knew that Kyuubi was right. He couldn't win this battle without drawing on his chakra. Naruto didn't want to use the fox's power, but he couldn't win without it. Facing off with someone of Ryuho's caliber was just impossible to do, especially when you're weak and not completely healed. Naruto made a decision to wait and see how things went before using the Kyuubi's power. Right now, he wanted to do it for himself in Konoha. Though Kagi was walking the streets of the village, she actually had enough time to take a break from her paperwork. She decided to go to a local restaurant that served some dango and sake. On her way there, she saw her son walking in the opposite direction. Senjuro had no particular direction he was going in. He was just going over what Kuranai had told him. She was with Osma now. He really wanted to be with her. But he always wanted her to be happy. His thoughts were broke by a familiar voice. Deep in thought, I see. He looked up to see that his mother was standing directly in front of him. 
Kasan, what are you doing outside of the office? I thought you had a lot of work to do. I completed most of it, so decided to get something to eat. Come with me, I could use a company. Send her nothing important to do, so we followed the Hokage. About five minutes later, they were in the restaurant talking and eating. He banged his head against the table. Kasan, Mom, what am I supposed to do? I don't know. Do you still care for her deeply? Sonata asked. Yes, but she's happy now, and I don't want to come between that. But at the same time, he paused and looked away from his mother. Sonata finished his thought. At the same time, you want to be with her. Yes, yes I do. I'm torn on what course of action I should take. Sonata analyzed the situation for a moment before offering her advice. If you really care for her, then you'll let her make the decision. You told me that she still loves you. However, she also said that she is in love with Ozma now, as well. I think that you should just let her decide what she wants. Sanjuro knew what his mother said was true. He decided to change the subject because it was too painful to deal with at the moment. So, can you tell me about the Genin candidates? Well, according to Aruka, we have some outstanding candidates. There is a Hyuga from the branch house who is pretty good, according to Aruka. He also mentioned a girl who is strong in Taijutsu, and a boy who is of no prestigious background of any kind, but is well rounded and his ninjutsu is slightly above that of a Genin. Other than that three that I've mentioned, everyone else is average at best. It's not I gave him the answer to the question he asked. That doesn't bode well for Konoha, now does it, Mom? She let out a sigh. I know, but I didn't expect this batch to be the next rookie nine. That would be a tough act to follow. His eyebrow elevated slightly. Rookie nine? What do you mean by that? Six years ago, nine rookies straight out of the academy were selected by their Jonin instructors to take the getting exams. All of them advanced to the second round, and four advanced to the finals. After hearing what his mother had told him, he was now curious as to who were the Jonin instructors responsible for preparing their Genins for the Chunin exams. Who were the Jonin instructors responsible for this? Sonata smiled, knowing that he would be surprised at the mentioning the two Jonins who was on his team. Kakashi, Asuma, and Kurnai. Really? That is an amazing feat. Truly. Do I know any of the rookies that were trained by Kakashi, Asuma, and Kurnai? Sensor asked, not knowing that he knew who five of them were. I believe you met Naruto and Sasuke and Mist. Uh, Shino was the young Jonin with the sunglasses and hood uh, on at your Jonin ceremony. You also met Sakura and Eno yesterday. They're members of the Rookie Nine. Sensor slapped his forehead at the mention of Eno. That girl, she flirted with me the whole time you introduced me to Sakura. I wondered if she's more concerned with boys than being a ninja. So then I chuckled uh, at Senju's comment. I think she has a slight crush, but don't let that fool you. He knows an Anbu, along with most of the Rookie Nine, so that should speak the volume of her skills. The only members that you haven't met yet are Shikamaru Nara, Kiba Inazuka, Joji Akamichi, and Hinata Hyuga. Everyone from the Rookie Nine are joining except for her and Naruto. The latter didn't make Jonin for obvious reasons, and I think it affected uh, the Hyuga girl. How so? She had a crush on the boy. When he was banished, she closed herself off. I think if she didn't feel obligated to her family, she would have led with him. She became a Junin at 14, and she only took the Jonin exams once. I would get into it more, but let's just say being the daughter of Hiyashi Hyuga is not the best thing in the world for her. So then I said, hoping her son would understand without her saying too much. Kiyashi always seemed like a nice guy when he was still with Yuri. On the way, how is Yuri? Does she still make great healing herbs? Senseru asked. Yuri died 12 years ago, so then I said, in an almost sad town. Oh, I didn't know. Senseru was surprised by the information as well, but he decided to change the subject. So, what about the Nara? How is he related to Shikaku Sensei? She knew the information would please him to hear. He's Shikaku son. The two of them are nothing alike. I have to practically yell that lazy ass son of his just to get something done. However, he is one of the smartest shinobi with an IQ over 200. He's currently our lead strategist. Wow, it seems like most of them came from prestigious backgrounds. So, mom, when do I get my first mission? Senju asked with excitement in his voice. Then I took a sip of a drink before responding. Come by the office tomorrow and I will assign you a mission. 
However, don't expect to go anywhere outside the borders of Kona. Senju slumped his shoulders after hearing the news. So, I'm restricted to admissions within Fire Country. Why didn't you just say that I can go outside but I can't leave the front yard? Sonata giggled at his childish antics. It reminded her of when she told him he couldn't play Ninja Tag because he didn't do his chores. Some things just never change. Six hours later, at Minashu Compound. The battle between Ryuho and Naruto waged on, but Naruto was on the losing end. He couldn't keep this up much longer, and he knew it. Ryuho was fast, stronger, and to top it off, he had a legendary sword. Naruto knew that the fox was right. God damn it, boy, why don't you just draw my power? You can't beat him without me. Look at yourself. You are heavily bruised and barely standing. Without me, you will lose. Come, Naruto. Let's show him what we can do with our power. The QB knew the boy was injured. The fact of the matter was that he hated his vessel losing because it would make him look weak. When Naruto was younger, the boy called on his chakra all the time, and it was usually because he needed it to win. When Naruto got older, he stopped calling on the fox altogether in battles. The boy only called on his power when he was training, getting his body used to its power. He remembered the last time the boy bit off more than he could chew. He was hoping the boy would call on his chakra so he could take over like he did when the boy trained with the Toad Hermit. The boy told him he would use the fox when he needed and that it wouldn't be likely because he would train himself more so he wouldn't have to. Nakibi laughed when the boy told him that. He knew the boy called him again. It was just only a matter of time and now was that time. He just had to push a little more and Naruto would cave in. Naruto would never admit it, but he hated losing just as much as Sasuke. Ryuho studied his student. He was impressed that the boy went this long, considering that he wasn't fully healed when he told him that he was ready for the second trial. As impressive as he was, he knew Naruto was losing faith in his ability. If Naruto lost complete faith in himself and his abilities, then he would surely fail this trial. Ryuho smirked at Naruto who was panting and glaring at him at the same time. What's the matter, Naruto? Getting weak? You want to call the fox power, eh? Go ahead. You as yourself are not strong enough to face me as you are. You're weak, Naruto. In the end, you will always have to rely on that crutch to bail you out. Mikimi knew what the man was trying to do. He couldn't let this man succeed. It was his chance to take over the kid's body. Don't listen to him, Naruto. He knows that the two of us together could win. You do want to win, Naruto, don't you? Use your power so we can do that. Naruto was listening to the fox and his sensei. Naruto came to a decision. His sensei was right. The fox was always a crutch. He used that crutch against Sasuke at the Valley of the End. He used it against Neji in the Chunin exams. And he also used it against Sasuke in his last battle without anyone knowing. Although he didn't use the Kyuubi's chakra when he got older. He still always used it when he was in need or in a bind. No, Naruto said out loud to the fox. His sensei gave him a curious look. No, what is he talking about? The fox kept trying to persuade Naruto. Come Naruto, what happened to the kid who said please give me power or break this genjutsu? This is no time to act tough, you're going to lose. Naruto smirked while responding, he was breathing hard. I said no. I don't need you for this. I can do this by myself. You might as well shut up now because no matter what you say, I will not draw from your power. So you might as well keep your ass quiet, furball. Why you little bass- Kibi was angry at Naruto's comment. I said shut your fucking mouth. You're breaking my concentration. Riho thought that Naruto was crazy. He seemed to be having a conversation with himself. Riho raised an eyebrow. You ready or do you need some more time? Naruto placed both his hands on his sword and shifted into a fighting stance. I don't need any more time. Let's do this. Blue chakra erupted from Naruto's body. The chakra surrounded his body. This lasted for about a couple seconds before it died down. So, he's using the last bit of his chakra to fight me. Riho thought as he prepared himself by slipping into a fighting stance as well. Naruto didn't waste any time jumping at Riho. Naruto brought his blade down, aiming for a sensei's head. Riho blocked the sword, but he noticed that the blow had more power in it than before. 
His attacks are getting stronger. He's starting to believe. Naruto continued his attack. The blonde shinobi appeared behind his master with the intention of slashing his back. Ryuho blurred out of Naruto's view before he could connect. Naruto looked up to see Ryuho coming at him with the sword raised above his head. Naruto jumped to his left to avoid the strike from the sword that was in Ryuho's right hand. The force that he used caused the sword to become stuck in the ground. Ryuho, being able to adapt, pushed off his sword with his right hand. He quickly spun around, while using the sword as a support for his left hand, landing a kick with his right foot into Naruto's face. As Naruto flew a couple of yards back, Ryuho removed the sword and charged at Naruto. Naruto used the palm of his free hand to touch the ground causing him to backflip back into his stance. Naruto had little time to react and not enough chakra to keep this up. He placed his remaining chakra into his sword and swung it at Riho. Riho placed chakra in his sword and swung it to counter Naruto's attack. There was an explosion of blue chakra throughout the dojo. The explosion was so bright that it was hard to see anything. When the dust and smoke cleared from the explosion, Riho was standing with the sword only an inch away from Naruto's eyes. He was smiling at a student, who had a shocked expression on his face and half of a sword in his hand. Riho held the glowing blade for a little longer before saying anything. It looks like you have passed this exam as well, Naruto. I must say that no one in our documented history has ever completed the first two trials in just two days. This is truly an unprecedented feat. He moved the blade that was inches away from Naruto's head and placed it back in its sheath. Let's go back to the compound and get you cleaned up and fed. You will only have four hours to prepare for the next test. We could go as soon as you wish, but I suggest you get some food in your system. You're going to need it. Naruto nodded. Food sounds really good. Naruto smirked before he passed out. Ryuho walked up to the boy. He saw that Naruto was smiling. This in turn made him smile as well. Must have passed out from chakra exhaustion. He should be up in an hour or so. You don't have to worry about fighting like the other trials. Well, not against an opponent such as myself. You come this far in two days, Naruto. Don't disappoint me now. Riho bent down and threw Naruto over his shoulder. An hour and a half later, Naruto was lying in the bed. Unlike yesterday, he didn't require most of his body to be bandaged. He had a few bandages in his body, his face and chest. The blonde Janobi heard muffled voices. He slowly opened his eyes to see that he was in his room with Ryuho, Kayori, Hayami, and Jiraiya. Naruto sat up. How long have I been out? Hayami jumped and embraced him into a hug. Big brother, you're awake. I'm so glad. Are you hurt anywhere, big brother? Do you need anything, big brother? Huh, big brother? Water? Food? Air. Naruto said in hope that the girl would soften her hug. She pulled back, releasing her hug after seeing that Naruto was turning blue in the face. Naruto took a deep breath, then exhaled. Naruto rubbed the little girl's head. I'm kind of hungry. I'll get you some ramen right away. The girl jumped off the bed and ran to the kitchen to make some instant ramen for Naruto. Naruto turned to Riho. How long have I been out? An hour plus, don't worry. You have three hours before the final trial. Riho stated to Naruto. Naruto looked at Jiraiya. What are you doing here? Riho asked me to come here, but then he said that he didn't need me. I'm here now, because I decided to stick around. You look like shit, kid, Jiraiya said to the fourth legacy. I'll be fine, how is Yumi? I don't know, I haven't been in the leaf. I've been trying to finish my book and meeting up with some old friends. Anybody I know? Naruto asked. Naya and Hinata, Jirai answered. Being curious, what is Hinata doing with Naya? Jirai shrugged. I don't really know, but if I had to guess, I would say that Naya is training her. Oh. Hayami came back into the room with a tray of ramen. She handed Naruto the tray. He wasted no time discarding the contents in the bowl. Everyone looked disgusted by how Naruto was scoffing down the ramen. Hayami shook her head. Naruto, big brother, really needs to work on his manners. Kiori, still looking at Naruto in disgust, responded. You would think that being with us for a year would have rubbed off on the kid. Memories of his deceased friend came in his head. He smiled at the thought. Some things never change, eh, Jiraiya? Nope, I guess not. The boy reminds me of his father in so many ways that it's scary. Naruto heard everyone talking now while looking at him. When he lifted his head up with a mouthful of noodles, he saw everyone staring at him. Boy, is something wrong? Kaori let out a sigh. 
Naruto, don't talk with food in your mouth. It makes it hard for people to understand you, and it's rude. Naruto slurped up the noodles. Sorry, I said, is there something wrong? Nothing's wrong, just looking at you, eat your food, that's all. Putting that aside, Naruto, are you okay? Yari asked, out of concern for Naruto's well-being. I'm fine, a little sore, but nothing too serious. Naruto put the train aside and got out of bed. He then turned his attention to Riho. If it's not too much to ask, I'm ready for the final trial. Riho closed his eyes to signify his disagreement. Naruto, use the three hours you have to recuperate. The next test isn't like the last two tests. I don't care, I want to get this over with already, Naruto said to his sensei. Riho looked into Naruto's eyes. He saw the unwavering determination in them. The boy would just keep bugging him until he caved. Alright, but change out of that rope and into some clothes. He know where to meet. Big brother Naruto, you can't go. You're not even healed completely. You should wait until it's time to go, the girl pleaded, hoping he would see reason. Don't worry, I'll be fine. Right that I told you, there's nothing to worry about, Naruto said, hoping to reassure the girl. Riho laughed. Is that what you really think? This next trial will be anything but easy. I never had it easy. Hard has, in fact, always been my easy. Kiori observed the young man before her. Riho told her of his trials when he was younger. If it was like anything Riho told her, then Naruto was going to have his work cut out for him. She followed her husband out of the room. Jiraiya knew there was no convincing Naruto once his mind was made up. I'll be heading back to Kona, Naruto. I guess I'll see you when you get back. Good luck. Save your luck for Rani Sinade. We both know she needs it more than anyone. I'll be fine. Jiraiya exited the room, leaving Naruto and Tayami. She smiled at Naruto. I won't worry about you, big brother. You said that you would be okay, so I believe you. She then exited the room. Naruto closed the door for privacy. He changed it into a black denim jacket with an orange t-shirt under it. The sweatpants and the sandals he had on matched the color of his jacket. Naruto was dressed and ready to take the final trial. Under the compound, 20 minutes later, Naruto was standing beside Riho in front of the door that had the word heart on it. Riho turned to Naruto. If you wish to back out and use the remaining time you have, now is the time. I'm not backing out, Naruto said with anger towards his sensei for even suggesting that. Very well. Riho opened the door and then entered the room. Naruto followed. The room wasn't what Naruto expected. Well, he really didn't know what to expect, but this wasn't it. The room was looked like a throne room made of marble. Naruto noticed a pillar in the center of the room. Embedded in the center of the pillar was none other than the Heaven's Blade. Naruto looked to Riho's side and back at the pillar. What's the sword doing there? It's the final test, Naruto. Your next trial is to remove that sword from the pillar. If you let go of the sword at any time, you will automatically fail. It may look easy, but this is the last trial for a reason, Naruto. Getting his attention. Riho pointed to the stairs on the left side of the room that led up to the balcony. The balcony was about five stories high, and it ended on the opposite side with the beginning of the stairs on the right side. I will be on that balcony watching you. I will not be leaving this room until you complete this test. You can begin whenever you like. Naruto nodded, and then he slowly walked to the pillar. Riho walked up to the stairs to watch Naruto from high above. Naruto walked up to the steps that led to the pillar. He studied the sword in front of him. I guess it's now or never. Naruto reached out for the sword slowly. Both of his hands were wrapped around the sword. Naruto started to feel weird. Suddenly, he was covered by a greenish light. Riho smirked. So it begins. Naruto looked around to see that he was in a completely different room. The room was completely white. Didn't he just grab the sword? Must be some kind of an illusion. An illusion, you say? Naruto looked all over, trying to find the voice. Who are you and where the hell am I? Naruto asked as he kept searching for the voice. So much anger and hate. I can see it in you, Naruto, the voice said. What the hell are you talking about? Are you going to be a coward and stay hidden, or are you going to show yourself? Naruto was getting annoyed. Do you really want to see me, Naruto? Do you really want to see the one who knows all of your desires, your ambitions, your likes, and your dislikes? Do you really want to see me? Well, do you? The voice echoed throughout the room. Naruto smirked. 
enough with the dramatics and just show yourself already. If you really want to see me, Naruto, why don't you just... Naruto is getting beyond annoyed. If I want to see you, why don't I just what? Why don't you just look in a mirror? Naruto's eyes widened. The voice came directly from behind him. Naruto slowly turned around only to be shocked to see who stood before him. It was himself. He was wearing everything Naruto had on. However, his shirt, sandals, and sweats were black while his jacket was red. Who are you? Naruto asked. I'm you, Naruto, the part that you hide. I've always been a part of you. We are one, and nothing will change that. You can't deny what you keep bottled in your heart, Naruto, the Naruto clone said. Naruto charged the Naruto clone out of anger. Stop saying that you are me, bastard. Naruto went to punch, but only hit air. The clone appeared behind Naruto. He leaned forward and whispered into Naruto's ear. Hate and anger is what drives you. The hate in your heart for the leaf. The anger towards Kakashi favoring Sasuke over you. Your hate for Sakura and your anger at Tsunade and the council for banishing you is why you are as strong as you are now. Your recent anger and what your father did and your hatred for him will drive you to be strong if you just accept me. Naruto went to swing again, but his doppelganger disappeared into thin air. Naruto screamed at the sky, Get back here, you fucking coward! The voice echoed throughout the room. Hey Naruto, do you remember the day that you first entered the orphanage? Naruto looked around to see the scene change. He was now in the orphanage. He looked at his younger self, who was four years old at the time. He remembered this day perfectly. He was upbeat about going to the orphanage. He remembered that his previous caretaker treated him like crap. He was hoping that it would all change here. He was wrong. After a couple Junians who really didn't like him as far as he knew, dropped him off in the presence of the head of the orphanage. She immediately began mistreating him. Naruto watched as the lady with brown hair who looked to be in her thirties snatched the hand of his younger self. Come with me, child. I'll show you to your room. But monsters like you deserve to be on the street. The younger Naruto put his head down. The present Naruto knew what the boy was thinking. Why did everyone call him a monster? Why did he do that? That was so wrong. Naruto waited, knowing what was going to come out of his four-year-old's mouth. Yes, please, everyone calls me a monster. I don't remember doing anything that would hurt people. Please tell me what I did, and I will apologize. I just want to be forgiven for whatever I did. The kid was waiting for her to help him. If she told him what he did, then he could make it up to the people, right? Wrong again. The lady was so enraged that the boy would ask for forgiveness for what he did. She slapped him hard, causing him to fall to the ground. Naruto was holding his cheek. The lady looked upon him with cold eyes. You will never be forgiven for what you've done, you monster. Okage should have ended your life. Then we would all be happy. President Naruto opened his closed eyes in memory. It was one of the most painful experiences in his life. His doppelganger appeared on the side of him. It hurts, doesn't it? It makes you angry. Because all you ever wanted was to be normal, and they rejected you. Your own home, crying out loud, it made you. Naruto opened his eyes and completed the sentence. Angry. His clone walked around him while speaking. Yes, it made you angry, and for the first time in your life, you hated someone. She was the first person that you truly hated. You even tried to be nice and friendly, and it didn't work, did it? Naruto had a sad look on his face. No, it didn't. Those three years in the orphanage were hell for me. I hated everyone there because they treated me like I was nothing. It didn't even change when you entered the academy, now did it? His laugh echoed throughout the room. As he faded out of sight, the scenery before Naruto had changed again. This time, Naruto was seven. It was his first day at the academy. He'd been living on his own for the past three weeks, and he couldn't have been happier. The old man stopped by four times a week to check up on Naruto, and to make sure that he was okay. Naruto was happy, because today, he would start his quest to become a ninja. Naruto arrived at the academy in time for the Hokage speech. Most of the parents were looking at him and whispering, but he didn't care. Today, he would start his path to becoming a great ninja. After the speech, the students had to go to the class that they were assigned to. The students knew of their class because they were sent letters informing them of their class schedule. Naruto went to the class that his letter said. The teacher, a chunin with red hair, gave Naruto a look of hate. Those were the same eyes that everyone looked upon him with. 
not here too. It was lunchtime, and all the students were in the yard, playing or practicing shuriken techniques. Naruto decided to go make friends. He walked up to a group of girls and guys. As he approached them, he waved. Hello, my name is Naruto Uzumaki. What's yours? You know Yamanaka, the girl smiled at the boy. Naruto noticed that everyone else next to Ino was whispering about something. One of the girls whispered into Ino's ear. After the girl finished whispering into her ear, Ino looked at him. Sorry Naruto, but our parents told us that we can't play with you because you're nothing but a troublemaking monster. Ino looked at the kids in a group. Come on everybody, let's play ninja. All the kids cheered and ran away, leaving Naruto alone. He walked up to the empty swing on the other side of the park and sat on it. He watched how the other kids played. He sat there and cried. The voice echoed throughout the room again. Even your peers hated you. Naruto couldn't say anything. Seeing these past memories that he thought he had gone over were reopened. Wounds that he thought he had healed. You can't deny that you felt the hate and anger, Naruto. Why do you repress me? Is it because you fear the side of you that I represent? Beer. If you release me, then you would be a monster? Well, you don't have to worry about that, because you are. Naruto clenched his fist. He was getting angry, but at the same time, his double was right. Ryuho was looking down at Naruto holding the sword. The look in his face showed Ryuho that he was going through a lot of pain. Ryuho noticed that the balcony was becoming filled with members of his clan. Some of the female members as well as the male members had come to see if Naruto was the next successor. He was so focused on Naruto that he didn't even see his wife and his daughter come up next to him. His wife was witnessing the test for the second time. She was there when Shinji took the test and failed. She hoped that Naruto didn't share the same fate. She talked low enough so only her husband could hear. Do you think he's okay? I don't know, he's been through a lot, so it's safe to say that this trial is by far the hardest for him. He's facing all the negativity in his heart, which includes all the anger, hatred, and jealousy that is built up in it. When I faced this trial, I was confronted with the anger and hate towards the man that killed Jinji's father. Compare that to the hatred for the villagers and the anger of his friend betraying him, and it's safe to say that I had it easy. Naruto must confront those feelings in his heart and face them. Riho gave his wife his honest opinion. You said that it took you three days to complete this task. How long do you think it'll take Naruto considering what he's been through? Kiori waited for him to answer. Who knows? I suspect that it'll be longer than it took me. That much is certain. Let's just pray that he can do it, Riho stated. He will. They both looked down at their daughter. Riho asked. How do you know? Big Brother Naruto said that he would be okay and that he would pass his test. I believe in him, Yami said without ever taking her eyes off Naruto. Kiori and Riho looked at each other and smiled. They hoped she was right. Midnight in Konoha. Yumi suddenly jumped out of her sleep. She was now sitting up in her bed, breathing hard. She placed her hands over her heart. Naruto is in pain. Tears started to fall from her eyes. Naruto, what is happening to you? a.m. Konoha, Fire Country. Shinade was sitting in her office doing more tedious clerical work. She was reading mission requests from various countries. As she sipped on the cup of tea she had beside her, she came across a mission that was perfect for Senzuru. She also had Hanabi in mind, as well as a few others. She heard a knock on the door. Come in. Shizune opened the door. Lady Shinade, Senzuru is here to see you for his mission assignment. Okay, send him in. Shinade gestured for the girl to allow him into the office. Shizune opened up the door wide enough for him to enter. Senjuru glanced at Shizune. You know, you don't have to be so formal when it's just me, Shizu. She gave him a, a warning glare. Don't call me that again. Before she left the office, she heard his voice. Okay, I'll stop calling you that, Shizu. Shizune was cursing him as she left the office. He turned his attention to the Hokage. I'm reporting for my mission assignment, Lady Hokage. Shinade looked up from the mission assignment she was reading. Your mission will be a C rank. Your mission is to patrol the southern regions of Fire Country and its borders. I have assigned Hanabi Yuga to your squad, along with Izumu Kamizuki, a medical ninja by the name of Kazushi, and Kurna Yuhi. When he heard the last name, he was surprised. 
He told his mother about Kerr and I and his situation, yet she still put them on a mission together. He opened his mouth to speak, requesting that Kerr and I Yuki be dropped from this mission, Lady Okage. Okage knew his reasons, but she had to do this. Request denied. But mom, he was interrupted by Tsunade. Whatever is going on in your personal lives should have no effect on your mission. She put her hand on her forehead and gave him a sympathetic look. Senzuru, you two have to learn how to put your differences aside. I put Kerr and I on the squad for a reason. He nodded, understanding that what she said was true. The two turned around when they heard the door open up slightly. Shizune was holding the door open for the four ninjas so they could enter the room. Kurna was the first to walk in, and she noticed Sanjiro immediately. She took her eyes off of him and looked at the Hokage. Hanabi walked in next, followed by Kamizuki, Izumu, and Kazushi. Tsunade looked at the ninjas that entered. Great, you're all here. Now I can tell you when I told Sanjiro. All of you will be patrolling the southern region of Fire Country, and its borders. Your mission will be one week long, so you guys should head home and pack your things. You are to report to the south gate in an hour. Everyone turned around to hear Shizune fussing with someone behind the door. Suddenly the door burst open, Tsunade knew this was coming. She just wondered why it took as long as it did. Konohamaru came through the door with Moigi and Udon, who were pleading with him to reconsider what he was about to do. Hey old woman, why haven't you given me a decent mission since I came back from my last mission? I can't take any more of these escort missions that Genin could do, Konohamaru complained. Moigi and Udon saw the vein on her forehead bulging. They had the unfortunate pleasure of being in the room the last time he called her an old woman. The two Chunins feared for their friend. Konohamaru, don't demand missions from the Hokage. Remember what happened last time, Moigi reminded him of his last encounter. Please, Konohamaru, stop this. She had us scrubbing toilets and chasing the daimyo's wife's god-awful cat for two months, Udon pleaded with his friend. I don't give a shit, I'm a Chunin who wants to do real missions. Tsunade was about to get up and pound the boy for calling her old. However, she thought of the perfect plan to get him out of her hair and make both of them happy. Well, at least until he figured out the mission. She gave the boy a forced smile. Your rudeness is not becoming of a shinobi, but I will forgive you this time. It turns out that I have the perfect mission for you. In fact, this mission will be a week long, and there is a possibility of running into enemy ninjas and bandits. It's a C-Rank mission. Do you accept? Konohamaru was jumping up and down at the news. Of course I accept. What is this awesome mission? You, Moigi, and Udon will join Senzuru and his squad. Your job is to go to the southern region of Fire Country and look for anything suspicious. Konohamaru was pumping his fist in victory. Yes, this is the perfect victory to test my abilities. I must say that you have come through again, old woman. Tsunade gave herself a pat on the back. Sucker. He really doesn't know what this mission entails, her and I thought. The way mom worded it, it would be hard for someone excited about a tough mission to read between the lines. Hanabi rolled her eyes, and he calls himself the grandson of the third. Moiki and Udon slumped their shoulders and hung their heads in defeat. How could you fall for that, Konohamaru? You just got us patrol booty for who knows how long. Konohamaru stopped his celebrating and looked at his friends. Come on guys, this is a great mission to test our ability. Come on, let's prepare for our mission. He grabbed both of them by the hand and dragged them out of the office. Senator decided to head back home to prepare for the trip. Everyone else followed him out, except Kur and I. When everyone was gone, Kur and I spoke. Hokage, I- er, Tsunade knew what she was going to say and cut her off before she could finish. Request denied. You two have to put whatever is going on between you aside. I'm going to need 100% for my shinobi when this war starts, not 50%. Putting you two together will help you deal with each other while you're on duty. My decision is final. You are to report to the south gate in an hour. Kur and I turned around and left. She knew it would be pointless to argue with the Hokage. It would do her best to prepare. Sea Country, below the Minashu compound. Ryuho was on the balcony by himself. Everyone that was there left last night when it started to get late. His eyes never left Naruto. The boy was standing, unconscious, while gripping the sword. He wondered how Naruto was doing. Naruto was looking at more memories of his past. He was looking at a memory from when he was 10 years old. 
and it was a painful memory because it was his birthday and the 10th anniversary of the QB's defeat. Everyone was celebrating. Naruto, on the other hand, was trying to hide in the shadows and stay out of people's way. For some reason unknown to him, people were extra mean to him on his birthday. Naruto decided to walk down a street that was deserted to avoid people. Little did he know that he was being followed by a couple of Chunin, who had seen him looking at the celebration from an alleyway. Naruto cut through the alley he was in and was walking down the deserted street. He decided to go home and just wait until his day was over. The Hokage always visited him after the ceremony on his birthday. He thought it would be best to just go and wait until the old man came. Naruto was walking when a couple ninjas dropped in front of him. Naruto saw the look in their eyes. He immediately knew that he was in danger. The first ninja spoke. Where do you think you're going? Naruto answered, trying not to show his fear. Home. The ninja beside the ninja that spoke whispered in his friend's ear. The first ninja seemed to nod. Don't worry. We're just going to rough him up a little bit. The ninja kicked Naruto into the wall of the building to their right. The other ninjas were kicking him as well. Then the leader of the group picked Naruto up by his collar. Then it threw him hard to the pavement. He pulled out a kunai. His friends were getting nervous. Hey man, we said uh, we're just going to rough him up a bit, that's all. The ninja who was standing over Naruto with the kunai turned and screamed at his friends. I don't care about that. He will die for what he did. He turned back to Naruto with a smirk filled with malice. Your time has come, monster. You will die now. Naruto was scared for his life. The knife was getting closer to his heart. He knew this was it. He closed his eyes and prepared for the worst. Naruto had his eyes closed for a couple of seconds. He wondered why it was taking so long for the kunai to stab him. He opened his eyes to see that he was in the arms of an Anbu member with white hair and a dog mask. The present day Naruto looked at the masked man closely. Although he couldn't see his face behind the mask, he was certain who it was. That's Kakashi. He was a good foot away from the ninjas that were attacking him. They were surrounded by Anbu members. Kakashi, unknown to the ten-year-old, had placed Naruto on the ground. He looked at the boy. Are you alright? Naruto nodded, confirming that he was okay. Kakashi turned at the purple-haired female of his group of five, who was standing in the shop behind the ninjas. The four others were spread out over the area. One was on the little shop behind Naruto. The other two were on the ground a few feet away, on opposite sides of the ninjas. The Anbu were wearing the dog mask. When Naruto had concluded to be Kakashi, signaled for the purple-haired ninja to stand next to him. She appeared next to him almost instantly. Take Naruto home, and watch over him until the Hokage or I relieve you of command. She nodded. Understood, sir. She grabbed Naruto and blurred out of sight. She was leaping from rooftop to rooftop with Naruto in her arms. She spoke to the boy in a soft voice. Don't worry, I'm not going to harm you, Naruto. You also don't have to worry about those shinobi or any others from this village attacking you again. My captain will make sure that he sends a message to those and whoever think about harming a fellow citizen of Kanaha. Naruto felt safe in her arms. Thank you, big sister. He fell asleep in the girl's arms. That memory wasn't as bad as the others. In fact, he didn't expect Kakashi to save him. Eh, yeah, must have been Okage's orders, Naruto said sadly. The voice echoed throughout the room. You are absolutely right. Why would he care about you? He didn't when you were on his guinea team, did he? Naruto simply said, uh, No. Because he praised the Uchiha, just like everyone else at the academy did. His doppelganger appeared in front of him with an evil expression on his face. The doppelganger faded again. Naruto knew that another memory was coming, and that would only fuel the anger and hatred that he was feeling towards the leaf. Ryuho was studying Naruto for the last half hour. Shinji, Hayami, and his wife Kiyori were walking up the stairs to join him on the top of the balcony. He turned to see his family. He then turned his gaze back onto Naruto. Shinji walked up and stood on his right while his wife and his daughter were on his left. Kiyori and Hayami just looked on without saying a word. Shinji on the other hand had something to say. How has he been faring, uncle? It seems like he's in between. I really don't know, to tell you the truth, Riho said. The exhaustion in his voice was evident. Shinji looked at his uncle, and could tell that the man was tired. Uncle, why don't you go sit against the wall and get some sleep? I will wake you if anything happens. Riho decided to listen to his nephew's advice. He sat up against the wall and closed his eyes. His last thoughts were of Naruto. Konoha, half an hour later. 
It was now 10 o'clock in Kona. Everyone was at the south gate, ready to leave. Everyone was in their tuning uniforms. Konohamaru, Moigi, Udon, Izumu, and Kusishi were wearing the standard green vest with a blue long sleeve tunic, blue sweatpants, and blue sandals. Karanai and Senju's outfits were completely different from the rest. Senju had on the vest that Asuma had made for him, along with a black long sleeve tunic, sweats, and sandals. Karanai was wearing the standard green Joni vest, but she had on a sleeveless crimson colored tunic and pants to match and black sandals. Senjuru addressed the group. Okay everyone, this is my first mission in a long time. Although it isn't the mission that any of us could possibly want. We will have to manage. Konohamaru gave him a curious look. What do you mean? This is going to be a cool mission. We might run into enemy ninjas while searching for anything suspicious. Hanabi shook her head. You do know the purpose of this mission, right? Yes, Hanabi. The old woman explained it to us. We're going to go and look for anything suspicious in the southern region of Fire Country. Moiki tapped him. He turned to face the teen with long flowing orange hair. Konohamaru, that's not the purpose of this mission. You guys have a mission? How troublesome. Everyone turned to see Shikamaru, Tamari, Konkuro, and the Kazakage. We don't just have a mission, Shikamaru. We have a great mission. We had to check for anything suspicious in the southern region of Fire Country, Konohamaru said with excitement. What the hell is so exciting about patrol duty? Shikamaru asked. Patrol duty? No, Shikamaru, we have to go. A light bulb went off in Konohamaru's head when he read between the lines of Tsunade's words. He put his hand on his head and shouted, Oh no, not patrol duty! Konohamaru hung his head. He was duped by the Hokage. Karanai spoke to Gara. Nor Kazukage, I thought you left the day before yesterday. I had decided to talk over with your Hokage. And, I decided to stay in the village for an extra day, Gara answered. We're heading back to the sand now. We have to make preparations as well, Konkuro added. Senjuru spoke. Well, I wish you a safe trip back to Suna. He looked at the members of his squad. Let's head out. Everyone nodded. Konohamaru, on the other hand, was still hanging his head. When Senjuru blurred out of sight, everyone else followed. Gara and Konkuro walked through the gate and continued on. Tamari was at the gate with Shikamaru. Well, I don't know when I'm going to be back here. I might not see you for six months. Shikamaru understood that it was a possibility. They had a war to prepare for, and, like her, he was going to be busy during these next six months as well. I know, we both have a lot of troublesome things to do. I suppose, she said with a hint of sadness in her voice. Shikamaru placed a hand under her chin and kissed her. When he broke the kiss, he smiled at her. Don't worry about it, we will have our time. Your brothers are waiting. You should catch up, you troublesome woman. She kissed him on the cheek. Don't want me to see you shed tears over me, you cry baby. Shikamaru just smiled as she turned away. She caught up to Gara and Konkuro, who were walking slowly so she could catch up. Once she caught up, they blurred out of his vision. Shikamaru turned around and walked away from the gate. He was right. They would have their time. But right now, they both had jobs and obligations in the woods of Fire Country. The squad led by Senjuru was moving through the trees at top speed, with him in the lead, followed by Izumu, Nabi, Kurnai, Kazushi, Konohamaru, Moiki, and Udon. Izumu looked at their squad leader. Senjuru, sir, don't you think we should have a special formation? You don't have to be so formal, just call me Senjuru. Nabi was curious about how Senjuru didn't form a pattern. Every mission she had been on outside of Kunha, the squad leader had formed travel patterns to counter attacks and go on the offensive. She had to wonder if he was Captain Material, or if Tsunade had just put him in charge because it was her son. She caught up with him. Senjuru, was it? Our travel pattern is all wrong. What I mean is, we have no particular pattern. How are we supposed to counter and form attacks? Senjuru sighed. Hanabi, was it? We're only patrolling. Attacks are almost non-existent on patrol duty. However, if you are so concerned about traveling in a pattern that would protect us, then you don't have to worry. The medical ninja isn't in the front, so it doesn't really matter. Besides, Karanai specializes in genjutsu, which means she could create an illusion for everyone behind her. You have the Byakugan, which means you can see a great distance and see traps and attacks before we even come to them. As for Izumo, he's a Jonin and he has me in front of him. I might not look it, but I'm pretty strong, Hanabi-chan. Hanabi scowled at him for calling her Chan. However, she did have to admit that he was right. The medic ninja was behind Kuranai, who was the best Genjutsu user in the Leaf. 
He was also right about her Byakugan. The only thing she wasn't too sure about was his confidence and his strength. But why is he so confident? Her and I who's been a Jonin for a lot longer isn't complaining. She must feel he is capable. Whatever, I will keep a lookout. Kurnai heard what Senju said, and he was right about her covering the last four members of the squad. But there were too many variables in his theory, and the Hugo girl was right. They needed to have a formal formation. Senju, I think we should stop. Senju looked at Kurnai knowingly what she was going to already say. He dropped to the ground with the rest of the group following suit. Everyone was standing in a circle. Senju addressed Kurnai. Why did you wish to stop Kurnai? Hanabi is right. You are right about me being able to cover the medic Konohamaru, Moigi, and Udon. However, what about yourself and Izumo? Yes, Hanabi has her eyes, so she should be fine, but you and Izumo don't have a specialty like the Byakugan, and your skill might not be as what you claim it to be. So what formation are you going to form? Karnai looked at him, almost demanding he design a formation. He decided to stand his ground. The formation will remain as it is. Kurnai was getting frustrated that he was still going to stick to his plan. So, you don't care if your squad dies? You have to think of your squad's safety, you know that. I understand, but formations can be easily read by the enemy if they are alerted by scouts ahead. Moving in random patterns is much harder to counter. Besides, it is the leader's decision in the squad's formation, and I decided that we don't need one. He said hoping she would drop it. Kurnai was giving him a glare. What the hell are you trying to prove? Are you trying to show how much better you got during your absence? He took insult to that comment. Did she really think he was trying to show off? His anger was rising. Do you think I've become a person who shows off? You're acting like this is my first time as a squad leader. I know what I'm doing and this is the best course of action. She let out a shriek in frustration. How can you be so unreasonable? Your whole squad feels that you should form a pattern and you aren't listening. What type of leader does that? He turned and walked away from her. After a few steps, he stopped and turned his head around slightly. A leader does what is right, not what everyone wants. A leader also protects the people under his command, even if it means he has to give his life to do so. Also, a leader uses the best course of action to make sure no one is harmed under his command. I know what I'm doing, Karnai, and my decision is final. He then blurred out of sight. Everyone else took to the trees. Karnai just shook her head. She then took to the trees after her team. Midday in Kona, Neji and his team were walking through the north gate. He had expected something to go wrong during that mission, but to his surprise, nothing did. The waterfall ninjas actually led them to Shibuki. Neji and his group delivered the message and immediately left, even though he had offered them that they could stay and join him for lunch. The group would arrive at the Hokage Tower in a matter of minutes. Tsunade was sitting in her office doing her regular routine of looking at mission requests. She heard a knock at the door, and judging by the sound of the knock, she knew it was Shizune. Come in. Shizune opened the door to reveal Neji and his squad walking through. Neji was the first to approach the desk. The mission to Waterfall was a success, Lady Hokage. Here is a written letter from Lord Shibuki. Neji handed her the letter. Tsunade took the letter and put it in her desk drawer so she could read it later. The fifth turned to see her apprentice who began to speak. Shibuki said whatever you need. Just let him know. Other than that, he said everything that you would need to know is in the letter. Okay, is there anything else that any of you would like to ask before I dismiss you? Sonic glanced at everyone to see if they had any questions for her. Her eyes fell on Kiba, who raised his hand. Yes, Kiba, what's your question? Lady Tsunade, how long will it be until we can visit Hinata? It's been a week since she's been out. Is she okay? Kiba said, showing his concern for his teammate and close friend. Tsunade sat back in her chair and brought her folded hands close to her mouth. All who were in her office knew that Hinata's seal was removed. She had forbidden everyone there to talk about that and she had closed off the girl from everyone so she could talk to the girl and figure out what she was going to do to keep it a secret from her family. However, Hinata had a plan and Tsunade had no idea where she was but she figured Naruto did. She sat back up now, prepared to tell them about Hinata. What I'm about to say is not to leave this room. Is that understood? They all nodded. She turned to Kiba. You don't have to worry. Hinata is fine. Well, according to this anyway. Stani decided to show them the letter that Shizune had given her. She reached in her drawer to retrieve the letter. She pulled it out and handed it to Kiba. He passed it down the line so everyone else could see it. 
Mino being the last one to see it, returned it to Tsunade. Lady Tsunade, do you know where she is? Neji asked, wondering where his cousin was. She shrugged. I don't really know. This all happened while we were in mist, and the letter is very vague. I guess we have to wait until Naruto gets back from sea country. I guess he has an idea of where she went. The door to the Hokage office opened, causing everyone to turn around. They saw the signing Jiraiya standing before them with a smile on his face. He's not a work getting you down. What do you want, Jiraiya? Sanai asked in an annoyed tone. I actually came here to share some of my sake. This stuff from Sea Country, I tell you, is great. It's nothing like Rice Country's, but it sure is good. Jiraiya informed his former teammates. Sanai knew that was Jiraiya's way of saying that he was in Sea Country checking up on their favorite blonde. Why were you in Sea Country? Are you checking up on Naruto? Actually, Ryuho asked me to come so I could play a role in the trials. The last time I saw him, it looked like shit. Ryuho did a number on him in the first two trials from the look of things, Jiraiya informed Sonata. Sonata was curious about the role he asked Jiraiya to play. Tell me, why did he need you there? Maybe later, when we're in private. By the way Jiraiya answered, she knew it had something to do with Naruto and the QB. She would find out more about it later. Neji wondered when the blonde would be back so he could get some answers. He turned to the frog hermit. Lord Jiraiya, do you have any idea when Naruto will be back from sea country? Jiraiya shook his head. No, I don't. Damn, you don't know where Hinata is and the time for Naruto to return is undetermined. Kiba is letting his emotions get the better of him. Jiraiya looked at the boy and smirked. He knew where the young Hyuga was. Sonata caught the look. Where is she, Jiraiya? Everyone turned to Jiraiya. He scratched the back of his head before responding to Tsunade. Well, let's just say that she's probably in the safest place in the world. Tsunade closed her eyes and gave a smirk that caused the younger ninjas to wonder. I knew you were lying when you told me that you had no idea where Naya was. Hinata is with her, isn't she? His ear-to-ear -ear grin confirmed everything she needed to know. Sakura was surprised to hear that name. She turned her gaze from her sensei back to Jiraiya. Lord Jiraiya, why is Hinata with the seal mistress? Neji was smiling, speaking to himself. He caused everyone to look at him. So, that's your plan, Hinata. I must say, I never did expect this from you. A confused Ino addressed Neji. What are you talking about, Neji? What plan could she possibly have? Sonata answered before Neji and Sakura had the chance. She's going to try to change the Hyuga clan. Ino turned to Sonata. How, Lady Sonata? Neji gave Ino a look that she's never really saw on Neji's face before. It was a look between happiness and relief. I think she's learning how to remove the seal. He turned to the Hokage. Lady Hokage, I have other things to tend to. Is this meeting over with? She nodded. Yes, this meeting is over. You all may leave. With that said, everyone left the office, except Jiraiya. Sonata sat back on her chair and put her feet on the desk. Jiraiya sat on the couch in her office. She looked at her friend. So, why didn't you tell me that you knew where Naya was located? He gave her a silly grin. She asked me to promise that I wouldn't reveal her location to anyone. Just keeping a promise to a former student is all that I was doing. So now I let out a sigh. <sighs> Naya was a good ninja. She could find a way to put her talent to good use. That much she knew. But she didn't have any time to worry about that. She had a war to prepare for. Also, she was concerned about Naruto. Jiraiya, what did Ryuho want to see you about? She asked, knowing that it had to do with Naruto. He wanted me to seal off the Kibi's chakra for Naruto's second trial. However, he decided that doing it would be unnecessary. He said something about Naruto and how he was tempted to use the Kibi's chakra during his first trial. He wanted to make sure that Naruto had access to it for the second exam. He wanted to see if he would rely on himself or the QB for the second test, which was to test his faith in himself. I guess he passed, because before I left, he was taking the final test, Jiraiya replied. Sonata smiled upon hearing the information. She knew that Naruto could do it. He had a heart and a will of fire like no one else. Deep down, she was proud of him and couldn't wait until he was back. So, it only took him two days. I don't know why, but... I thought a test for something so legendary would at least take weeks. I guess he'll be back in Konoha with a sword in two days. Jiraiya noticed her overconfidence in the only other person in the world that she saw as family, besides Shizune, himself, and Senjuru. He shook his head. Normally, I would agree with you. 
But knowing the details of this trial, it's safe to say that he won't be back in two days. For anyone else, this trial might not be too difficult. However, Naruto is a different case for a reason. She didn't know what he was getting at. What do you mean by that? Jiraiya looked at her with an unreadable expression. It's simple. This trial is a test where Naruto will have to face his heart and all the negativity in it. Think about it, Tsunade. Regardless of how caring a person is and upbeat about life they are, tell me, what will living in a village that shunned and mistreated you during your childhood do to your heart? Tsunade understood what he was getting at. Even though she would never peg Naruto as a person that could ever be evil or do evil things, she knew that the village's mistreatment caused hatred deep in his heart that he had hidden. If Jiraiya was right, which she knew he was, then this test would be tougher on Naruto than anyone else. She hoped that the boy she saw as her second son would be okay. She smiled because she knew he would be fine. Jiraiya gave her an odd look. Why are you smiling? She looked at him, still smiling. Let's make a bet. I bet you that Naruto will pass this trial. Jiraiya put his hand to his chin. If Snotty was willing to bet on Naruto, then chances are his student wasn't going to pass. Damn her for jinxing his students, but he couldn't pass up the opportunity for free money. Sure, I'll take that bet. Good luck. I don't need good luck. It's a sure thing, she replied in a cocky tone. Really, according to Naruto, he said uh, I should save the good luck that I had wished for him to you. He said uh, he would need it more. Jiraiya was amused by the contortion of her facial features. To him, she looked like a bulldog, but for some reason, no one but Tsunade could make that look good. Tsunade shook her fist, while mumbling something about idiots, a whisker face blonde and 1,000 years of pain, which caused Jiraiya to wince. Uchiha compound. Sasuke was training in the backyard of his compound, which he turned into a training ground. Right now, he was working on taijutsu. Naruto's speed was amazing, and without his Sharingan eyes, Sasuke would never have a chance at catching Naruto. Sasuke continued to kick and punch the post before him. The beads of sweat on his forehead were clear indicators of how hard he was turning his body. Sasuke stopped when he felt a familiar presence behind him. What do you want, Sakura? She just looked at Sasuke, who had his back to her. I just got back, and I wanted to see you. He gave a sideways glance. I don't need to be checked up on right now, like I'm some child. What do you really want? He could read her like a book. She did want to see him, but that wasn't her real reason for coming here. She knew why Sasuke opted out of the mission. It was to train, so he went loose to Naruto again. She needed to know. Why? He didn't know where she was going with this. Why what? Why? Why must you always try to be better than Naruto? I don't understand, Sasuke. You completed one of your life goals, and yet you still have an inferiority complex. I could see if you were training for the upcoming war, but we both know that the only reason you're training is to fight Naruto again. Why? Sakura gave him a pleading look, so he would tell her. He turned away from her and continued to punch the log. You wouldn't understand. Don't give me that, Sasuke. Tell me why. She asked again, slightly raising her voice. He didn't answer. Sakura shook her head and turned around to walk away. Sasuke was stubborn, and she knew that she wasn't going to get an answer. I don't understand it. Sakura turned around to see Sasuke talking to her with his back still turned to her. Understand what? She asked. Sasuke clenched his fist. How he seemed to always surpass me. Not only that, when I think about how he saved us on missions, defeated enemies that you and I could not, it makes me wonder how he always seemed to be ahead when he was such a dope. Sasuke, he continued. It's just that no matter how hard I tried, Naruto was always in front of me. He was the one that freed us when we fought Haku. He was also the one that saved you from Gara when I couldn't do anything but watch. Even when we fought at the Valley of the End, he held back attacks that would have gained him the victory. In all of those fights, he was exhausted, but he never gave in, not even once. Since my clan's death, I searched for the power that he possessed. I wondered what made him so strong. Even now, I stand in his shadow, always chasing him. Our last fight proved that I don't want to chase him anymore. I want to find the strength that he has. I want to discover what makes him so strong. It was very seldom that Sakura got to see the side of Sasuke. Even though they were intimate, Sasuke rarely opened up. 
She hated that he always kept things bottled inside. She was finally getting to see a side of him that she never saw. Sasuke turned to Sakura and said in a calm and soft voice, You should get going. I have things I need to do. Sakura nodded. She knew that he wanted to be alone. So she did Shuin Shinojutsu, leaving him alone. She appeared on a street a block away from his compound. She continued to walk. She had nothing really to do. Then she wasn't due back in the hospital until tomorrow. Sakura understood Sasuke. In fact, she couldn't believe it. She couldn't believe that Sasuke Uchiha was actually jealous of Naruto. Naruto wasn't liked or praised for his ability like Sasuke. Any other person wouldn't be jealous, but all of those things are things that Sasuke didn't care about. She now knew that ever since he met Naruto, he has been searching for that thing that made Naruto so strong. Not even she knew what made her former teammate so strong. Maybe it was his hatred for the village, Sasuke, Kakashi Sensei, or even herself. Who knows? She was, however, curious as to what made her former teammate strong. Perhaps it was a question that she would never get an answer to. She decided to head for the hot springs. She had a free day and she was going to relax if it was the last thing she did. Across town, Yumi sat at the ramen shop with a sad expression. Her thoughts kept going back to Naruto. She couldn't explain this feeling, but she knew he was in pain. He didn't return with the others when they came back from water country, but the Hokage informed her that he was in sea country. She figured it was something to do with the Minashi gland. Yumi just sat there, twirling the soup around with her spoon. She didn't even notice Inu, Choji, and Kiba walk into the restaurant. Inu and Kiba were having a heated debate over what was a better weapon, a kunai or a shuriken. Inu stopped in the middle of her explanation as to why kunais were better, when she noticed Yumi sitting at the stool with a sad look on her face. She walked up and tapped the girl. Hey Yumi, how's it going? She looked up and gave Inu a fake smile that was obvious to everyone. Hello well, Inu, how's everything? Inu and the others heard what happened to the girl. Word around Konoha tends to get around quick. She was hoping that she wasn't depressed over that situation because it could have been a lot worse. Inu pointed to Kiba. Yumi, this is my friend Kiba, and you already met Choji. Kiba stepped up and offered his hand. Hello there, I'm Kiba, and the dog on my side is my best friend Akamaru. Akamaru barked his form of a greeting. Inu took a seat next to Yumi. Kiba sat down next to Ino, and Choji sat next down to him. Ino, Kiba, and Choji ordered their food. Ino took three bites, then looked at Yumi, who was still playing with her soup. Hey Yumi, what's the matter? Ino asked out of concern. Yumi continued playing with her soup. Well, since last night, I have this feeling that Naruto isn't okay. I can't explain it, but, but I just know that he is hurt. I don't know, maybe I'm just worrying too much, I guess. Ino nodded. Yeah, you're probably right. I think you are worrying too much. I'm sure Naruto will be back here soon. Besides, we saw Lord Jiraiya who informed us that Naruto is going to be doing some type of trial thing in Sea Country. I'm sure he's fine. Yumi felt relief, but she still could feel in her heart that Naruto was in some type of turmoil. She decided to leave it alone. She also decided to change the subject. So, you know, do you guys have a mission or something? Well, no, we just came back from a mission. I decided to treat these two. Akamaru barked at Ino. Ino looked at the dog, then back to Yumi. Sorry about that, I meant three, to a meal at Ichiraku. After this, I'll probably go to the hot springs to relax. You wanna come with me? That's okay, I think I'll pass Ino. You'll probably run into Mom there, Yumi told Ino. Really? Mom was fun to talk to when we first went to the springs. Mother can be fun at times, but I'm glad she's taking it easy. She worked hard on her little farm for years. It's nice to see her relax. She leaned in and whispered into Ino's ear. But, if you ask me, she's relaxing too much. They both shared a laugh. Kiba, who finished his meal, spoke. So, you're a farmer. That's cool. Yumi shook her head. No, it isn't cool. To put it plainly, it sucks. I like gardening, though, and literature. I try to get Naruto to read, but he just doesn't like to unless it has something to do with jutsus. Inu was beaming with joy after hearing what Yumi said. You like gardening, really? My family owns the best flower shop here in Konoha. I knew I liked you for a reason. We fellow gardeners are just drawn together like magnets. Yumi smiled at the girl. I guess so. That's just one of my hobbies, but I really hope to be an established writer someday. Joji, after eating his tenth bowl, looked at Yumi. So, if you were to write a book someday, what would it be about? 
Keep a spoke before Yumi had a chance. If it's anything like Ichi Ichi Paradise, then I would rate it for sure. Did you read the last edition, Joji? Joji nodded in excitement. Yes, it was fantastic. Why well, totally deserves to get bitch slapped by Yuki. I just hope Yuki finds happiness. Yeah, it's sad, but that scene between Wei and Roka tell me that was the hottest scene ever. Akiba said she would excitement. A vein appeared on Ina's forehead. She then hit both of them over the head. You goddamn perverts. I can't believe you're talking about that filth in front of girls, no less. Yumi held back a snicker. She knew about the scene they were talking about, and she had to admit it was quite intriguing. However, the type of writing she wanted to do was nothing like Jiraiya's. His writing was mostly about romance and sexual fantasies. Even though his book was one of her guilty pleasures, one that she would never admit, she just didn't want to write a book like it. She looked at this village and Naruto's treatment here, and an idea came to her head, which caused her to smile. Fire Country, five hours later. Sanjuro and his squad were traveling at top speed towards their intended destination. He estimated that they would be there in about an hour. It was perfect. They would have enough time to set up camp and assign patrol teams. He could sense the group wasn't too keen on what he decided. He just wished they saw his logic, but they probably didn't. Nabi saw wires coming at Sanjuro from all directions. Her instinct caused her to scream, Watch out! He didn't have time to react. Before he knew it, wires wrapped around him and ripped him to shreds. Izumu and Hanabi jumped back to get into battle formation. Kurenai did her part and cast a genjutsu to cover up the tracks of the three behind her. Izumu and Hanabi were back to back, both were looking around frantically for their enemies. Hanabi and Izumu were surrounded by about eight shinobi from Iwa. The man on top of the branch in front of them, who they confirmed to be the leader, was giving them a sadistic smile. The smile looked even more evil because of his red eyes and snow white hair. Well, 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 look what we have here. A pathetic leaf ninja and a Hyuga. Her eyes are worth a lot on the black market. Jizu, Ronko, kill him and collect her. You five go and look for the other five that disappeared. The two in front of Hanabi and Izumu. Hanabi activated her Byakugan and got into her fighting stance. Izumu also got into his fighting stance. He didn't like what was happening. He and Hanabi were outnumbered, and he recognized this guy. He was Moretsu Kihoen, an A-class pissing ninja from Iwa Gekir. Kihoen spoke again. You guys are outnumbered, and outclassed. The fact of the matter is, my group would have passed you, but we saw the Hyuga, and we couldn't resist. You guys had a weak leader, and your other members are hiding. You have no chance. Kurenai, Konohamaru, Moigi, Udon, and Kusishi were hiding not too far under Genjutsu. Kurenai couldn't think about Zenzuru. Her first priority was to come up with a plan. She looked at the group and spoke in a low voice. Okay, this guy isn't some chump. He is a missing ninja from Iwa, and he is as bad as they come. The sad truth is, I don't think I can even beat him. Moigi and Udon look after Kusishi. Konohamaru, I need you to try and draw the five that are looking for us to a different location. Konohamaru nodded. You can count on me. The two moved out. Karanai was looking at the fight between Hanabi and the ninja from Iwa. Hanabi used her Jukin to kill the ninja in front of her as quickly as possible. Izumo had taken his fight with the other ninja elsewhere. Gihoen shook his head as Jizu hit the ground. She was one of his best soldiers. He had enough. He decided to subdue the Yuga. He appeared in front of Hanabi and said with a sick smile still plastered on his face, We can do this the easy way or the hard way. Your choice. Hanabi slipped back into her fighting stance with a smirk. Don't underestimate the Hyuka clan. Kern and I knew that was suicide. Hanabi was good, but she had no chance. Her plan was to get Hanabi out of harm's way so they could retreat back to Konoha. An Anbu squad was more than enough to deal with this renegade group. Her squad consisted of mostly Chunins who didn't have the experience or the power to fight someone of this caliber. Kurenai did a couple of hand signs and cast a Genjutsu. The surrounding area, according to Koen, started to get cloudy. He knew immediately that it was a Genjutsu, but when he cancelled it, Hanabi was gone. Kurenai had gone Hanabi out of harm's way, much to the girl's protest, and brought her back to the area that Moigi and the medic were at. Hanabi narrowed her eyes at Kurenai. Why did you take me away? I could have taken that guy. Kurenai looked at the girl and simply said, No, you could not have taken him. 
He's an A-class ninja from Iwagekir, and in 101 combat, only a few of our ninjas can take him on, and you are not one of them. We will wait here until Konamaru shakes them, and Abi snorted. That fool will only get himself killed. Noigi clenched her fist. What's your problem? He led those ninjas away so we would be safe. He did an admirable thing. Don't look down your nose at him for that. And Abi looked at the girl as if she were a nobody. I don't remember saying anything to you. Your idiot friend is going to get himself killed trying to play hero. Kerr and I decided to nip it in the butt before things started to escalate. That's enough. We have to make up a plan. We will have to. Kerr and I's eyes widened when she saw that Kehoen was only ten feet away. His evil smirk never left his face as he looked at them. Kerr and I knew that this was going to be troublesome. Konohamaru had led them away, but the squad had him surrounded. These guys are good. I couldn't debate them. Oh well, I'm always complaining about having no good fight. Guess I'll definitely get that and more. One of the ninjas spoke. You will die here, little boy. Sad, really. But that is your fate. And yours is death. The ninja and his fellow comrades charged at Konamaru. He knew that he wasn't going to be able to survive. But he knew he was taking someone with him. Before the ninjas got within a foot of Konohamaru, wires attached to kunais started wrapping around them, and various trees. Before they knew it, they were pinned in nearby trees. As soon as they were pinned, kunais and shurikens hit them in various critical spots. Konohamaru traced the wire on his right hand that led to a high tree branch. On top of it, Sinjuru was looking down at him with a smile. Konohamaru was relieved to see that he was still alive. Sinjuru let go of the wire and spoke. Go after Izumo, he's about two minutes west of here. I'll go and take care of the leader. With that, Senjuru disappeared in a swirl of leaves. Kanahamaru did as he was told, and headed west. Gehoen was studying everyone. All of them took fighting stances, but judging by the stances, he was certain that the stance the one on his far right took proved he was a medic. Perfect, he would go after the medic, who would be saved by the pretty red-eyed Jonin, who he determined was the leader. He then would pick the rest apart by himself. This was going to be fun. Karnai saw that look in his eyes. She moved quickly in front of Kusishi. When he blinked, he saw Karnai in front of him, taking an upper slash from a kunai. She fell to her knees before him. Damn, he did that on purpose. If I had enough time to counterattack, I could have avoided getting hurt. The things we do as ninja. Karnai was holding her chest as Kohoan towered over her. Hanabi saw her chance and went to strike when she thought his guard was down. Her hand thrust forward, aiming for his head, but she missed. He sidestepped her attack and did a reverse roundhouse kick, sending her into a nearby tree. The impact caused her to lose conscious. I will deal with you shortly, Hyuga. Moigi and Kusishi went to tend to Hinabi. Now, for you, beautiful. It's sad I don't have the time to show you a great time, but that girl's eyes are worth a lot of money and you are in my way. Udon threw a kunai, but Kehoen avoided it. He turned to see Udon. He did a bind jutsu. Udon was stuck in place, unable to move. He knew that if he didn't get loose, Kurenai would be dead. He turned back to Kurenai. Sorry for that. He looked to see that she was no longer in her spot. He looked around until he saw her in the arms of the man he thought his squad had killed. Senjuro was holding her bridal style. Kurenai looked up to see him looking at her. He saw the pain in her face, so he gently put her down and looked at Kusishi. Heal her wounds. Moigi, watch over them. Udon, we'll be with you in a second. Senjuro did a hand seal while looking at Udon. Udon, get over here and aid Moigi. Udon was about to say he couldn't move, but he realized he could. He was able to run, but Kohan appeared behind him with a kunai. He was about to stick it in Udon's back, but Senjuro blocked it with his kunai. This surprised Kohan. This guy's fast. To be over there and move over here that quickly to protect his comrade. A worthwhile opponent, Cohen thought. The two ninjas jumped back for distance. Senju glanced over at Kurnai, who was being healed. He turned back to the ninja. We don't have time to waste. I will finish this fast and give you a painless death. Cohen smiled. Painless? Take this. Senju saw that a wall made from the ground had risen in front of the ninja. The wall broke into jagged edged rocks. The ninja motioned with his hand for the rocks to go forth. All of the razor sharp, jagged pieces of rock were aimed at the golden slash brown eyed leaf jonin. Sandro just looked at the oncoming attack. The technique came down on him, leaving a huge smoke pile. When the smoke cleared, he was laying on the ground, disfigured. The arrogant ninja smirked. 
That was too easy. Yes. Yes, it was. Cohen's eyes widened when he heard the voice behind him. He didn't have time to react. A kunai was lodged on the side of his throat where the jugular vein is located. He immediately fell to the ground, dead. Sandro looked at the ninja for a moment. His confidence led to his demise. Arrogance and skill tends to blind people. He forgot the life old lesson that you will always find someone that is your better. Unlucky for him, he had to learn it the hard way. He stepped over the dead missing ninja and walked back over to the group. Izumo and Konohamaru landed next to him, panting. He glanced at both of them and smiled. I'm glad you guys are okay. Yeah, but I wouldn't have been if it wasn't for Konohamaru. He waited for the perfect time and then pinned the guy I was facing against a tree with wire. That gave me the time I needed to slit his throat. Izumo informed his leader. Sandro looked at Konohamaru, taking a page out of my book, I see. Konohamaru gave him a huge grin. Sandro spoke again but this time, his voice was serious. Traveling with that formation worked for us, but now we have no choice but to use one. That ninja was smart by injuring Kur and I first. We once had the element of surprise, but we don't have that because Hanabi is out and Kur and I is injured. We will continue our trek, but Izumo, you will be the lead. I will be behind you with Kur and I. Konohamaru, you will carry Hanabi. Kusushi will be behind Konohamaru, while Moigi is behind him, scouting the sides. Udon will be in the back doing the same. This is the best I can come up with while traveling with five Chunins. One which is injured and a Jonin who is injured as well. We will set up camp when we arrive at the border and then we will assign patrol teams. Is that clear? Everyone nodded. Good. He picked up Kurnai bridal style. Konohamaru did the same with Hanabi. Kurnai may have been healed but the cut could reopen and he didn't want to take the chance. The squad headed out. The red-eyed Joni looked at Senju. Hey, I just want to say that I'm sorry for questioning your ability and skill as a leader. You were right. A proper formation would have left this vulnerable. He continued to look ahead. It's not a matter of who's right and who's wrong. I just believed it would be best to do it my way. Things could have turned out the same had we followed your way as well. How is your chest feeling? It's okay. I'll be fine in the morning, she informed him. He smiled. She knew that the smile on his face was a smile of happiness and relief. She couldn't help but feel safe in his arms. She snuggled up close to him. She didn't think about Asma, her current issues with Senjuru. All that mattered was at this very moment is that she felt safe, and she had to admit, it felt good. An hour later, the group had arrived at the southern border. Karnai was sitting around the fire with everyone. Hanabi, who was in one of the five tents, came out of the tent a little groggy. What, what happened? Senjuru, who was sitting next to Konohamaru, spoke. From what Moigi told me, you were knocked out by the missing ninja that I killed. I had Konohamaru carry you back here. Konohamaru blushed when Hanabi looked at him. She didn't say anything. She just took a seat next to Izumo. Konohamaru got up. I think I'll go collect some firewood. Konohamaru got up and walked off to collect more firewood. Hanabi's eyes followed him. She was looking at him returning back. She got up. I'll go look after him, make sure he doesn't get hurt. Senju shrugged, illustrating that he didn't really care. Five minutes away from the camp, Konohamaru was collecting firewood. Hanabi stepped from behind a tree, startling him. He looked up at her while stacking a log on top of the stacks he held. Oh, I didn't expect you to come out here. Hanabi, did you come to help me? She just shook her head. No, I just wanted to ask you something. Why are you so nice to me? I mean... I know you like me, that isn't hard to see, but I always insult you, so why are you always nice? Konohamaru put down the wood and looked Tanabi dead in the eye. She had never seen the boy look this serious. Well, part of the reason I am nice to you is because I do like you. Even when I get angry at your insults, I just can't seem to stay mad at you. When I look at you, Hanabi, I don't see Hanabi Huga, heir to the Huga clan, or the number one rookie of our graduating class. I see someone like me, who everyone likes only because of who they are related to. I know what it feels like to have people see you as what they want you to be, and not as the individual that you are. I guess that's why I like you, because you're alike, yet so different at the same time. I just thought you could uh, use a friend. Navi couldn't believe what she was hearing. Of all people, she didn't expect him to understand her, and Navi turned away. We're nothing alike, you and I. He put his head down, knowing that an insult was coming next. However, what came next shocked him. But I could use a friend. Konohamaru looked at Hanabi. 
who was looking at him with a rare smile on her face. He smiled back, thinking to himself that maybe this wasn't going to be such a bad mission after all.